The Gloriana Set by Theba Moon Read by Ella Max Mabella Summary The war is won and Hermione Granger is back at Hogwarts as an eighth year, feeling reckless and determined to shed her prim bookworm persona. She will do as she pleases and anyone who doesn't like it will see the business end of her wand. Also returning is Draco Malfoy, universally hated but determined to restore his family's name. Hermione's hopes for a quiet school year are quickly dashed as she contends with mischievous first-year skiller plants and gendered higher accessoires, a totally inappropriate morning myrtle, renegade Death Eaters, a nice vampire, a poorly named study group, a depraved party and mysterious threatening blood messages on the castle walls. We have redemption, partial redemption and, sadly or hilariously, no redemption at all. Throw in a snarky, disturbingly attractive Draco with his own secret agenda, and we have a very slow burn Dramini with a side of Who Done It? A Dramini fanfiction. Chapter 1 Mine. The station was empty. A small stretch of wooden platform and a stone peaked roof building and a creaking sign. Hogsmeade. Money landed with a thunk of her heels against wood a trunk in one hand and a cat carrier in the other. She had never really noticed the station before, the platforms, the tracks, the creaking sign, the wooden benches painted in alternating colors of red, green, blue and yellow. She had always arrived by train, too busy frantically rechecking her bags and robes, gathering stray candy, quills and carts that Ron had dropped or forgotten. Then she'd be pushed into a swirling swarm of teenagers, borne helplessly towards the carriages and driven away. Not once had she ever looked back at the station. Her eyes were always fastened ahead, heart pounding with excitement. Not this time. She had chosen to operate to the station instead, avoiding the train and the crowd. She was here to finish her education and sit for her news. Not relive her Hogwarts days. She didn't feel like a student anymore, not even an eighth year. The special class the new headmistress had created for the returning seventh years. She envied Harry, who'd chosen to enter aura training instead of returning. Ron tried to do the same, but his grades weren't high enough. He needed nudes to qualify. He'd sulked for days over the letter from the ministry. Imani herself had no desire to become an aura, although she received a personal letter from Shacklebolt inviting her into the training program. She sat on the nearest bench, trunk and cat carrier settling obediently beside her and tilted her head backwards to catch the warm sun. Odd how clear and warm the weather was. Quite unlike Scotland. Odd to be at Hogwarts Station sitting alone in a too heavy uniform and robe, bathed in warm sunshine and silence. A loud crack shattered the stillness, and her money leaped to her feet, warned out, eyes wide. Another student, also in uniform, also holding one handle of a trunk, his back to her. He stood facing the tracks, head drooping, fists clenched. She knew that profile, that shock of blonde hair, that long, thin frame. For a moment, the only sound was the creaking sign, and the boy's, man's really, ragged breath. She gasped, and now it was his turn to leap to attention. Wild-eyed, warned out. Grey eyes fastened on her instantly, then rolled dramatically, and Hermione knew his thoughts as clearly as if he'd spoken out loud. Of course it was her, of course she'd be here, of course he wouldn't get two seconds alone to steal himself. She almost sympathized, since she felt the same. She hadn't purposely apparated herself here early so she could stand on a Hogsmeade station platform with Draco Malfoy. The light breeze from the mountains suddenly strengthened, carrying the faint call of a train whistle, and Hermione turned her head to see the scarlet engine burst out of a far-off tunnel and shoot towards the station with impossible speed. A fainter beating of wings from the opposite direction shifted her gaze back towards Malfoy, and the two silently watched a black line of skeletal thestrals wind down from the heights in a single file, each pulling a black, low-slung carriage. Another blast from the train was on, this one almost deafening, and Hermione felt a strong urge to avoid the mob that would soon swarm the station. She walked down the platform, brushing past Malfoy, Crookshank's carrier floating behind her. Her trunk she left to be brought with the baggage. The Thestral's carriages were now lined up alongside the tracks and she had her eyes on the last and smallest one. Hopefully it would fill up quickly and whisk her to the castle with the least fuss. Again, she wasn't the only one with such thoughts. 
Manfoy's long legs quickly outpaced hers, and he leaped inside the last carriage in one fluid motion. Then he leaned back, arms slung over the back of the seat, insufferably smug, looking at her over the carriage's folded down top. Mine, his eyes said darkly, a familiar look for him. Mine, his eyes seemed to say, everything I want is mine, even after the war, after the failure and defeat, destruction and the hatred. You are still a mudblood. I am still a Malfoy. I am still free, and anything I want is still mine. Hermione froze, her hyperactive sense of justice instantly kindled. She was here first. He purposely cut in front of her to take that carriage. Suddenly everything the man had done, the horror and tragedy he personally caused, paled in comparison to this one bold action. She was here first. Now she'd have to be the better person half away to a larger carriage, red-faced with righteous indignation, because that was what Hermione Granger did, not lower herself to his level. Then she blinked slowly, remembering. Remembering a trapped beetle, a scared girl, an innocent couple obliviated and exiled for the crime of loving her. Malfoy, you have no idea what levels I've descended to. Her face must have changed because Malfoy's eyes widened slightly. Hermione awkwardly hopped into the small carriage sitting opposite him, and her staggered expression swelled her heart with satisfaction. Crookshank's carrier dropped beside her on the seat. She could hear her familiar's low growl. Smart cat. She zipped open the carrier and a fluffy orange head bobbed out, hissing. Manners, Crookie, Hermione crooned, petting his fur. There is nothing to fear here, snoggy woggums. Get out, Malfoy said, his growl matching the cat's. Did you hear something, Crookie? Hermione asked, basking in the heat of Malfoy's glare. Did anyone of importance say something? No, <laughs> I didn't think so, my boo-boo kitty. The train had stopped in an explosion of steam and squealing brakes, and the first wave of students rushed the carriages. Hermione's back was to the station platform, but she could clearly hear the gas and shouts behind her. It's Granger and Malfoy in the last carriage. Look, look! The news shot through the crowd, and their names, coupled in disbelief, rang repeatedly in their ears. Hermione grimaced, keeping her eyes on the cat. Maybe she hadn't thought this through. Then another name rippled through the crowd. There's Weasley! One Weasley! Weasley! Hermione refused to turn around. Why should she? Just so she could watch him stride down the path, beaming from the acclaim of being one of the golden trio who saved the wizarding world. She risked a look at Malfoy, who looked smug again. Hermione! Ron was so tall that he could look straight into the carriage from the ground. Are you mental? What are you doing there with him? It's not safe. Nonsense, Ronald. It's perfectly safe, she said. Are you sure, Granger? Malfoy shifted to the center of his seat and stretched his leg slightly one foot against hers. Ron flushed. Go away from her. Hermione, get out of there. Did you hear something, Granger? Malfoy asked. Did somebody of importance say anything? Hermione suppressed a snort of amusement. I'm not going to get out, Ronald. Well, I'm not sitting with him, Ron snapped. Nobody's going to sit with a death eater, Hermione. Malfoy's eyes glittered and his fists clenched. Hermione tried very hard not to sigh. Ron had actually stumbled onto something resembling a point. Malfoy was a death eater to most of the students and a blood traitor to the rest. The curse of the last-minute defector, reviled by both sides. She had no sympathy, but now they were just wasting time. You're right, Ronald, she said. The carriage may be considered full. Her voice rang out, the last sentence, the chain of command, and the carriage's thestral immediately leaped into the air, thrusting Hermione back into her seat and drawing an outraged yo from Crookshank. Malfoy braced himself with his legs to keep from falling on top of her, and Hermione looked down at a rapidly shrinking Ron, his dumbfounded face upturned as the carriage sailed beyond a line of trees and over the lake. Hermione, oh Hermione, you're all right. Of course I'm all right, Hermione huffed at the Gryffindor table. Have we met? I can handle a carriage right with Draco Malfoy. But why would you want to? Ron asked as she dropped into the seat opposite him. It's Malfoy. Who? Hermione asked. Mel. Ron stopped himself and glared. Why weren't you on the train? Hermione shrugged. I oh, overslept. She had stayed with her parents in a month following Voldemort's defeat, helping them to readjust to the life in England again. 
while she had mostly reversed the memory charms she had placed on them in Australia, there were still gaps and fuzziness in her parents' minds, mostly regarding anything related to magic. Which was probably for the best. They had picked up their dental practice again well enough, and didn't object to her returning to Hogwarts. Another ripple shuddered through the Gryffindor table. Hermione overslept? On the first day at Hogwarts, our Hermione! Her friends looked practically bordered on betrayal. Missing classmates and still shattered castle walls they took in stride, but Hermione Granger was never tardy. Hermione put a napkin on her lap and tried not to sigh. Again, she understood she really did. They just wanted security and peace and the feeling of normality, whatever that was. Would it kill her to give it to them? I was up too late reading my patient textbook, she lied. The salt of the earth powder can temporarily nullify all magic within. Relieved murmurs all around. Ron smiled and shook his head. That was our Hermione. Staying up all night and needless study. All was well. The chattering and squabbling resumed and Hermione stared into her goblet. She really hated pumpkin juice. Run! breathed Romilda Vane, shifting close to his side with a sweep of long black hair. That was a wonderful interview you gave the prophet. With Harry's absence, Vane was happy to move on to another war hero. Everyone needs to know the truth. Hermione snorted softly. The interview revealed only a passing resemblance to the truth. Dwelling on Ron's exploits and minimizing Hermione's and even Harry's roles and failing to mention Neville at all. She met Neville's eyes, expecting to see her at a snub, but he was talking softly to Ginny, flashing his newly sexy smile. Somebody had certainly grown up over the past year, she realized with a shock. A long way from her first journey to Hogwarts, when Hermione had roamed the compartments looking for Neville's toad, she felt an almost maternal pride. The day she met Harry and Ron, doing some rubbish magic, and met Malfoy too, she realized suddenly, remembering his sneer when she burst innocently into the Slytherin's compartment and met only ridicule. She looked over at Malfoy now, sitting a bit apart at the Slytherin table, expecting to see that same sneer, but he just lounged on his bench, ignored by his housemates. It would take more than total ostracization to humble that man. A dragon with a meat cleaver couldn't humble that man. Hermione was actually glad to see it. A chestnut Malfoy would be almost as horrific as an irresponsible Granger. Perhaps her fellow Gryffindors weren't the only ones eager for normalcy. The entire Great Hall clapped a seemingly endless line of first years. This year's class, plus all the Muggleborns banned from attending the year before, followed Hagrid up the center aisle. The Sorting Hats sang a long song about peace and friendship and house unity, then divided all the children up. The Gryffindors groaned each time a student was placed into Slytherin, Ron loudest of all, which irritated Hermione. Stop it, Ronald, she hissed. They're just children. They're Slytherins, Ron cried. They're eleven years old. Now they think the whole school hates them. Hermione's voice cut through the babble of voices. They need our support. Ron's eyes narrowed. You seem mighty fond of Slytherins all of a sudden. Have you forgotten? I haven't forgotten anything. But what do you want to do? Create a new generation of vicious snakes? They killed Colin. Dennis Creevy's voice was hot, and Hermione turned to look more closely at a dark-haired fifth year. He was still small and spindly, with his bangs falling into his eyes. But those dark eyes were narrowed and burned with an almost fanatical hate. Those children... Hermione said, pointing to a group of youngsters now nervously seated in the empty spaces around a board Malfoy. Didn't kill anybody. But if you treat him like criminals... Hermione! Ron cried, obviously convinced that if he repeated her name often enough, she would suddenly adopt whatever misguided opinion he held at that moment. She's right, Never put in. They're just kids. Dennis and Ron glared, but blessedly shut up, and the groaning at the next leather and sorting was a bit more subdued. Hermione risked another glance at Malfoy, who was now amusing himself by floating juice pitches just out of the first year's reach and ignoring her completely. Had Mistress McGonagall stood to give the welcome speed, drawing Hermione's eyes to the teacher's table. Slughorn's face was hidden by his enormous silver goblet. Beside him was an empty chair, undoubtedly for the next defense against a dark arts teacher. Madam Hooge, the new head of Gryffindor House, sat on McGonagall's ride, an arresting figure with white blonde spiky hair, 
a multicolored Quidditch jersey clearly revealed by open black robes and a bright red eye patch. She had lost an eye during the final battle, Hermione remembered, flying above the melee, casting curses until she was brought down by a curse from the ground. Hooch wasn't the only one. Professor Sprout bore a burn scar on her forehead and McGonagall herself was still limping. Hermione thought of the faint silver lines on her own neck and raised red letters on her arm of Lavender, who had miraculously lived through Fenrir's attack and even Malfoy and his dark mark. They were all scarred, teachers and students alike. McGonagall's welcome speech expanded on the topic of house unity. When Hogwarts got hold of an idea, she knew from experience the teachers pushed it hard. Many students, especially Ron and Dennis, were shifting in their seats, flushing with anger, but the appearance of the feast on their plates cooled everyone down. She managed to dodge Ron in the chaotic race to the house dorms, but he captured her hand in the Gryffindor common room and pulled her to a large window sill. Hermione, he said huskily, his other hand tangled in her curls. I haven't seen you in weeks. Missed me? She looked up at him levelly. Sleeping with Ron in the days after the last battle when they were wrecked with grief and guilt had been a truly impulsive move. They had cheated death and odd rules and mods simply didn't seem to apply. Sex was a way to feel better and had certainly worked spectacularly for Ron. His tears for Fred and the other victims had vanished as if she'd waved a wand, which perhaps she did in a way, only to reappear when a little extra wheedling was required. She'd finally broken it all off, saying she was too sad and overwhelmed with worry over her parents for a serious relationship. But now he believed returning to Hogwarts meant everything was back to normal. Hermione knew what Ron was thinking. They, he, had won the war and it was time for the spoil. Heroes would bask in women in adoration while the defeated Slytherins lay crumbled and broken. Ron was in for a rude awakening and she didn't look forward to dishing it out. Honestly, was there truly no one else around to deliver unpleasant truths to the masses? She knew what was ahead for Ron, though. The public adulation would inevitably die down even a Merlin second-class medal couldn't change a bad nude score, and none of the Slytherins she saw tonight looked particularly broken. No, Ronald, she said, drawing back. We talked about this. Oh, I know you want it, he breathed. I oh, remember. He pressed her against the edge of the window sill. Remember Dad's muggle shack, Hermione? Well, oh, yes. He'd taken her on a splintery wooden floor, surrounded by broken clocks and blenders, her head pressed against the shop vac. She remembered the heat and excitement in her blood singing, and for a few seconds, Ron's touch brought it all back, the wanton need, and her hand around his wrist tightened. But then it all fizzled out somehow, and she saw only Ron's shocked face at a thestral carriage demanding that she leave the big bad man in his big bad shoe and return to Ron's protective arms. No, Ronald, she repeated. Honestly, she didn't even need to argue any more. The two of them could simply repeat each other's names back and forth. I'm going to bed, she announced loudly, stepping away with a less than graceful swerve as Ron's arm shot out to block her. The man was so fucking physical whenever he was thwarted. Harry in such situations would probably look reproachful but try to understand and never would likely just crumble with hurt. Well, maybe not anymore. He changed considerably, but Neville certainly wouldn't be grabbing at a girl trying to get away. She couldn't even imagine Malfoy doing that. Such an action would be beneath his dignity. No, Martha would probably just arch an eyebrow. Such a timid, sad girl, denying herself such unparalleled pleasure. Hermione chuckled at the last thought as she hurried towards the girl's stairs, dismissing the rest of the common room with a wave. Ron would recover soon enough. Plenty of girls were eager to sleep with a war hero. They could have him. Tucked into bed in her pajamas, printed with dancing penguins, with crookshanks curled up on her bed, Hermione watched the moonlight peeping through the curtains long after her roommate came to bed. Wind rattled the windows. Finally, she pulled her wand from under her pillows and set wards around her bed, repelling any intruders. Old habits died hard. Perhaps eighth year wouldn't be so bad. It would be nice to be responsible only for herself. She had already turned down McGonagall's invitation to be head girl. Padma Patil would do a fine job. Hermione didn't even want to be a prefect. She'd done her bit for the Wizarding World, and for now, anyway, Hermione was the only cause she was interested in. To be continued. So, as I loved Hermione very, very much, and I especially love eighth-year stories, 
I'm super happy to present to you this new series I'm doing, which is The Gloriana Set by Theba Moon. Um, thanks to them for letting me read their story. I'm super honored. I'm super happy. I really hope you enjoy it and you will follow along. The uploading schedule will probably be a bit irregular, but I have a lot more time on my hands again now. So there will be quite regular updates, I would say. Anyways, I hope you all enjoy. And as always, you can follow me on YouTube, on Spotify, on Instagram or on Tumblr if you would like to stay up to date. And I hope you all have a great day. Chapter 2. Translations. It was still dark when Hermione woke the next morning. She felt for a wand and pointed it at the watch she'd attached to the bedpost with a sticking charm. 6 a.m. Excellent. 30 minutes to record her thoughts and plan her day. It was important to keep a disciplined mind. She pulled out a muggle notebook and held a lit wand over the cover's black letter spelling out LOOP for Life Organization Optimization Plan. How quiet it was, only the faintest sighing of trees outside, the rattle of casements. She breathed slowly, five seconds in, count five seconds, out. I am an unruffled pond. A relaxation technique? Hermione blinked. Why did she need a relaxation technique? She'd just woken up, for Merlin's sake. She looked at the watch again, 6.10. What happened to that ten minute? Now she was behind. She cracked open her loop journal, writing the date and time. All right now, five things to look forward to today. One, a Hogwarts breakfast with sausage and fried tomatoes. Two, advanced ancient runes. A new 30-minute seminar taught by McGonagall before first period each morning. An excellent way to start the day. Three, lunch. No, not lunch. She'd already written breakfast. A walk around the lake. Yes, she would walk around the lake. Four. A visit to Hagrid with Ron. Or maybe without Ron. But Hagrid would expect Ron too. Well, he'd just have to deal with it. It wasn't her job to make Ron do things anymore. The money gnawed on her mucker pen cap. What would it be like to be with someone she didn't feel responsible for? Who sometimes felt responsible for her? She could hardly imagine it. She turned her attention back to the journal, trying to think of a fifth thing to look forward to. You couldn't just leave it blank. Ah, oh, yes, five. The library's forbidden section. She had a list of dark topics she wanted to research. Blood potions, mind labyrinths, screaming rain. It was a pretty sparse list, bleak even. Breakfast, class, a walk, a visit, the library. She sighed, wishing she could just take her nudes now and be done with it. Well, she had to do more than study for nudes. She couldn't just drift along this year muttering about screaming rain. Just because she didn't want to be Hogwarts' official bossy know it all anymore didn't mean she wanted to be the creepy shadow that sighed all the damn time. She needed to find a way to make this year count. Energized, Hermione pulled herself out of bed and prepared for the day. Her hair took some extra time to get ready, but she wanted to make the effort. Fleur had found some magical potion that smoothed her dark curls into soft ringlets if she applied it evenly enough. A swipe of lipstick, a quick pressing charm to a uniform shirt. Appearances were important. She'd had enough of sloppiness, running around disheveled, too busy studying to eat properly. She was finished with that. Nobody was going to take her seriously if she didn't take herself seriously. She used to believe if she just worked harder than anyone else, was more stubborn than anyone else, people would recognize her merit. She knew better now. A string of outstandings wouldn't make her blood any less muddy to some people. Fuck them! She was finished, driving herself for others' approval. That wasn't how she'd get what she wanted. Not that she knew what she wanted. She had no idea, really. Well, she'd figure it out eventually. She envied Ron and Ginny, actually. Weasleys always knew exactly what they wanted, where they belonged. There was no ambivalence. Even Harry knew what he wanted. To be an aura to capture the evil and protect the weak, and perhaps then justify the fact that he had lived. As if defeating Voldemort wasn't enough. Even after all her primping, it was only 7.30, and Hermione knew from experience that Lavender and Ginny, her two roommates, would shoot out of bed at 8 a.m. in a panic, dashing from bathroom to trunk. She fed Crookshanks, then drifted to the window, overlooking the Quidditch pitch. Its broad green lawn, shining with dew, the sun pecking over the mountains beyond. She put her elbows on the still, holding her chin in her hands, watching the tree sway. What was that? A small black form shot out from behind a tower, a figure in a black cloak, its hood up on a broom. 
Marnie had a wand out without realizing it, bracing herself for attack, but the figure merrily looped and swirled in the air, apparently randomly. Ah, of course, a Quidditch player. Probably getting some last-minute practice before the trials this first week. Ginny had talked of nothing else. She was the Gryffindor Quidditch captain this year, another letter that had irritated Ron, who felt he deserved the position. Hermione smiled at the very thought of Ron leading a Quidditch team, red-faced and shouting, Or you mental, hit the bull, I said. Her eyes continued to follow the flyer's graceful patterns. Quidditch bored her stupid, but even she could tell this was no slouch. The flyer reminded her of Harry and Ginny, those complicated loops and sudden descents. She saw no pattern to it. What was the flyer chasing? She had her answer. A silver snitch suddenly appeared, hitting the window and bouncing off, then hovering just inches from the glass. Hermione ducked behind the curtain, not wanting to be seen. Oh, what was that? asked a sleepy voice. Ginny's hat stuck out of her bed curtains. Nothing, Hermione said, slipping her wand into her skirt pocket and picking up her black robe. What time is it? Eight o'clock. Shit! Ginny leaped out of bed, wearing one of Harry's Quidditch shirts. Eleven! It's eight! Shit! She grabbed the toiletries bag and towel and ran out of the room. Eek! Lavender cried, leaping out of bed, frantically digging in her trunk. The kissed Crookshanks on the head, picked up her book and headed downstairs. Her toes tapped the steady rhythm on the curving stone staircase to the common room, where only Neville stood, rooting through his own bag. Hey, uh, Hermione, lend me a quill? he asked, offering up that new slow smile. Not a bad way to start the moaning. I can't, I only have two, she said. She made a conscious effort that morning not to pack a dozen extra quills for forgetful friends. I'll wait here for you, she said with a smile. Oh. She pulled out a wand and transfigured a crumbled ball of parchment into a quill. Why didn't I think of that? Thanks, Hermione. Never slung an arm around her shoulder. Since when was he tall enough to do that? And she smiled up at him. What are you looking forward to today? She asked as they walked towards the Great Hall. Maybe she'd get some ideas for tomorrow's list. I don't know. Breakfast? Me too, she grinned. I know. Double advanced topologies this afternoon, he said. We're going to grow poison pansies and fire-breathing snapdragons. They're both pretty tricky. The pansy seeds can't be touched, and when they bloom, you can't breathe the pollen. The money felt better. He wasn't the only one with a lame list. The great hall was fairly quiet as usual, filled with heavy-eyed students spooning porridge and munching toast. Money had nearly finished when Ron, Ginny and Lavender appeared, and Ron was too busy eating to give her more than one baleful look. She smiled brightly, which drew his pale red eyes down further, but he said nothing. She slowly peeled an orange, her legs crossed at the ankles and swinging under the table, looking around the great hall, eyes travelling over the Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff tables. A tall, dark Slytherin, Blake Sabini, walked past with a fluid grace. Her gaze turned upwards at the hall's yellow and orange-streaked magical sky. You're not reading, Hermione, said Ginny beside her. Hmm? You always read at breakfast, preparing for morning classes. Hermione shrugged. I'm perfectly prepared. She popped an orange slice into her mouth. Ron's jaw sagged, revealing half-chewed sausage. Ginny's eyes narrowed. Are you feeling all right? Perfectly all right, Hermione said, her attention suddenly drawn by a tussle at the door. Malfoy had apparently finished eating and now stood facing the tables with his back to the great hall's open doorway, finically straightening his left cuff. A crowd of first years peered through a doorway beyond him, wanting to enter but too afraid to pass the dreaded Death Eater. Malfoy looked around the hall with hooded eyes and noticed Hermione watching. He winked at her, then began straightening the other cuff as the crowd behind him grew. Hermione looked at the teacher's table, but even McGonagall was absorbed by her porridge and didn't look inclined to get involved. Malfoy, Ginny hissed, eyes still narrow. Somebody should do something, Neville said. Head boy Ernie McMillan stomped over to the door and began remonstrating with Malfoy. Time to get a move on, old chap. No need to be contrary. You're quite fortunate to be here, you know. Malfoy meant no move to leave, and his response appeared anything but conciliatory. Hermione left the table, slinging her back over her shoulder. I simply don't see the difficulty here, Malfoy was saying as she approached the door. There's plenty of rooms for students to pass. He glanced back at the restive crowd outside the door. 
Hermione rolled her eyes. Excuse me. She stepped between Ernie and Malfoy and out of the great hall, brushing against Malfoy's shoulder. See? She heard Malfoy say. She glared at the students huddled in the entrance hall. Honestly, you're all going to let him keep you from breakfast. This wall of terror surrounding Malfoy was beginning to try her already. Ten house points from each student still out here when I've counted to three. Hermione had no authority to dock house points, but that didn't stop a mob of panicked students from stampeding through the doors, knocking both Malfoy and Ernie aside and emptying the entrance hall in seconds. You, Granger, are no fun, Malfoy said, stepping into the entrance hall to join her. I am extremely fun, Hermione said, looking up at him. Wait until you read my ancient runes essay. How can you have an ancient runes essay? We haven't even had classes yet. I wrote it for fun. Malfoy's upper lip quirked. You haven't changed at all. Hermione rubbed a thumb over the ridges on her left arm that she refused to glamour. I've changed enough. His amuse looked faded and she turned away, feeling strangely guilty as she mounted the staircase on the way to ancient runes. Malfoy wasn't evil, no matter what a pack of idiot students thought. His mother had saved Harry's life, and Harry had spoken for the defense at Narcissa's and Draco's trials. Money herself had written a confidential letter to the judge in support of Draco. Both Narcissa and Draco had received probation and a year of house arrest, and Draco had the option to serve his year at Hogwarts. She thought suddenly of Narcissa, now alone at the manor since Lucius was in Azkaban for life. The ruins classroom was closed and locked, so she leaned against the tapestry and resisted the urge to review the first chapter of a textbook. Let me see it, Malfoy said. Money blinked at a tall blonde leaning against the wall opposite her. This fun ancient runes essay, Malfoy explained in a too patient tone. Let me see it. She stared at him a moment, then flipped open her bag, extracted a scroll tied with a blue ribbon, all her scrolls were color-coded, and handed it over. He left the wall to take it, tugging the ribbon free with long fingers and unfurling the scroll. It's written in runes, he said. Hermione smiled thinly. Trust me, it's funny. It really isn't, Malfoy said, looking over the parchment. Her mouth fell open. You can read it. If you can write it, Granger, I can read it. I don't believe you. It took me a month to translate that essay into runes. The textbook is rubbish, Malfoy said. My family's library has a rune manuscript. He chuckled slightly. All right, that bit about the frog is a little funny. Hermione was staggered. The pompous kid had actually taught himself ancient runes, likely from some impossibly rare book at that godric damned manor. She could hardly believe it, but there it was. He obviously knew runes, or at least the rune for frog. She eyed Malfoy thoughtfully as he leaned against the wall again, an impeccable figure in new robe, right down to his silver cufflinks and polished black shoes. A far cry from the haunted figure from his trial. Dark lashes veiled grey eyes as he scanned the pages. He wore his attractiveness like polished armour on a murmuring battlefield. Hermione frowned and looked away. Get a hold of yourself for Merlin's sake. Malfoy straightened and rolled up the sheave of parchment. You got some shades of meaning wrong, he said, retying the ribbon. I could mark it up for you if you like. Nonsense, it's perfectly correct. Malfoy stepped closer, opening her right hand with his and placing the scroll inside. He wrapped her hand around the scroll, covering it with warm fingers before stepping back. It's not, he said. Look at it again. Hermione glared. If her runes were incorrect, which she didn't entertain for a minute, it was the fault of that stupid textbook which was maddeningly vague and so badly printed that what looked like a dot was often just an ink blot. Not everyone had ancient rune manuscripts lying around. I brought it to Hogwarts, you know. He went on, sounding bored. The manuscript? Of course. She tossed her head. I don't care. Malfoy smiled mockingly and returned to his own wall as chattering voices echoed through the corridor. McGonagall was sailing towards them, black pointed hat bobbing, trailed by a handful of elder students, mostly Ravenclaws and a few Hufflepuffs. If the headmistress was surprised to see the two of them standing there, she didn't show it. Miss Granger? Mr. Malfoy? was all she said, opening the door with a wave of her wand. Another wave vanished half the desk in the classroom, leaving the rest for the ten students taking advanced ancient runes.
The runic alphabet, as you all know, she began, is an ancient branch of linguistics, once used by muggles as well, but in our world bearing magical properties. Hermione scratched a few notes, only half listening. Errors in her essay. Impossible. He was just toying with her. Perhaps McGonagall had some text she could look at. She'd ask after class. Anything to avoid asking Malfoy. He was seated across the aisle from her, folded into a laughably small desk, writing on his own bit of parchment, and she could see the writing was in runes. Malfoy was taking notes in runes? That might be a good way to practice. She leaned closer to see better, but then he turned his head and raised an eyebrow. Hermione flushed and straightened. Fine. She didn't care what he was writing. She approached McGonagall at the end of class, waving her textbook indignantly, and the headmistress sympathized with Hermione's plight. It's a new advanced subject, Miss Granger. Subsequent volumes will be more precise, I'm sure, McGonagall said. Perhaps you would like to have revised the textbook after your notes. Really? Hermione's post jumped. I've already marked portions of the textbook. Yes, yes, McGonagall said absently. You had better run along, Miss Granger. Your next class is in the dungeons, is it not? Advanced patience, yes, Hermione said. But I wanted to show this essay. Another time, Miss Granger. You wouldn't want to be late now, would you? Hermione would have been perfectly fine with being late to advanced patience. Slughorn wasn't going to dock house points from one of his best students, likely his top student now that Harry was no longer around with his cheating textbook. But McGonagall's tone brooked no argument, and she walked briskly out of the classroom and down the stairs, ignoring the constant warnings from paintings for her tardiness. She was the last one in the classroom, with all the stools taken except, of course, for a single one beside Malfoy at a two-person table. Apparently, his splendid isolation extended to seventh and eighth years, people old enough to know better. She pulled a stool further from him with a loud scrape of metal against stone and sat down, slamming her books on the table. And just to make a party of it, Ron was staring at them, shocked from his own table with lavender. What did Ron have to be shocked about? That she was late to patience? That she was sitting with Malfoy? Did she continue to resist Ron's luring seduction techniques? Maybe all three. Malfoy gave every appearance of ignoring her, but when Hermione's eyes flickered to their tabletop, she saw a small scroll beside her books, tied with a green ribbon and marked with the rune for eight. Chapter 3 The Mood Mix Slughorn droned about patient safety, and Hermione dutifully scribbled down the rules. She had no intention of reading notes in class, Certainly not notes from Draco Malfoy, and she ignored both scroll and student as long as she could, at least until they had to clear the table for the potion making. The scroll swept itself into her open book bag, earning Malfoy a small glare from Hermione. This won't do, Stockhorn was saying, looking around the room. We will need four tablecloths. He waved his wand and students leaped off their stools as tables spun and slammed together. Hermione watched in horror as her and Malfoy's table connected solidly with Ron's and Lavender's. Very good, Slughorn went on. We'll keep those tables for the term. But, Professor, Ron choked. Slughorn raised his bushy grey eyebrows. Yes, my boy. It's, it's him, Ron pointed at Malfoy. Him! Well said, Ronald, the miner remarked. Malfoy snickered. Surely you brave Gryffindors are not afraid to work with someone from my house? Slughorn said, the faintest hint of steer creeping into his jovial voice. Ron flushed a deep red. No, no, Professor. His glare at Malfoy could burn through stone. Manny rolled her eyes. There were endless reasons to dislike the Slytherin, but he wasn't doing anything objectionable at the moment, just looking smug again. A month in Azkaban would have done Malfoy a world of good. Just on general principles. Maybe two months. To make things worse, Hermione had to sit opposite Malfoy so they could cover both sides of their cauldron, which meant she sat next to Ron and Lavender was beside Malfoy. Lavender's hand shook so bad she could hardly slice her guardy root. Hermione couldn't blame her. The girl's face still bore the scars from Fenris. You didn't have to be an evil person to commit deeds with evil consequences. Hermione gave Malfoy a stern look, tilting her slightly toward Lavender. 
Let me help you with that, Lavender, Malfoy said softly. Those roots can be tricky. Stay away from her, summing his knife perilously close to his own fingers. He's just trying to help, Ronald, Hermione said. Would you like to sit next to him? Lavender took a deep breath and nodded, pushing the board of roots closer to Malfoy. The Slytherin sliced them quickly and precisely. There, he said in the same soft voice, sliding the board back to her. All done. I, I'm sorry, she stammered to Malfoy, quailing under Ron's clear. No, Malfoy murmured. I'm sorry. Silence reigned at the table after that, and only the sound of chopping and plopping and bubbling was heard. Ron's shrivel fix looked like they'd been pounded with a mallet instead of sliced, but he dumped them into the cauldron anyway. Money opened her mouth to object, then thought better of it. She knew what the class was concocting, although Slughorn hadn't revealed the potion's name, and a few mashed shrivel figs made little difference. Ron and Lavender's potion didn't look too bad in the end. It didn't have the same pearly silver sheen of Hermione and Malfoy's, but the slow counterclockwise swirls were correct, and the pale colour was almost right. Why is of Stockholm to start with a relatively easy potion? Everyone could use a little encouragement. Well done, well done, Slughorn boomed. The lazy curls of steam from the cauldrons were gathered on the ceiling like soft storm clouds. Can anybody tell me what potion we just created? Hermione raised her hand immediately, but Malfoy called out. Oromatis. She spun to glare at him. He hadn't raised his hand, but he just curled his lip at her. Excellent, Slughorn said. Ten points to Slytherin. And can anyone give me the potion's other name? The moot mix, Hermione said loudly. If Slughorn wanted to ignore hands and encourage recital chaos, that was his prerogative. Oh, very good, Miss Granger. Slughorn's eyebrows had practically climbed to his hairline. And what does the mood mix do? And reflects your mood, sir. The patient changes colour according to the mood of the person stirring it. Yes, yes. Ten points to Gryffindor. Slughorn waved his wand at a chalkboard, and the list appeared in various colours. Red for anger, yellow for happiness, black for fear, purple for sadness, green for confusion, and silver for desire. There was some sniggering at the last colour, which Slughorn ignored and asked. And can anyone tell me what the shade of the potion's colour signifies? Intensity, Hermione and Malfoy called out as one. This, Hermione thought, is why we raise our hands. Yes, quite, Slughorn sighed. The brighter the colour, the more intense the mood. Now each of you will stir your potion. Well, go on now. This is ridiculous, Hermione muttered. A person's emotion can be summed up with a single colour. She stirred the card room before her and the mood mix turned pale pink. She glared at it, stirred it again, and the mixture turned redder. Lovely. Ooh, let me try, Lavender said. She stirred her potion and giggled at the pale yellow steam swirling towards the ceiling. Oh, we did it, she stirred again and the steam grew a brighter yellow. Malfoy actually smiled at her. Well done. Lavender beamed, while Ron snatched a spoon from her and stirred. The mixture instantly turned black and he dropped the spoon with a clatter. Hermione couldn't believe her eyes. Fear? Why would Ron feel fear? Bottles? Ron snapped and left the table. Hermione looked back at his potion, noticing faint swells of silver in its inky depths before the liquid returned to its original pearly sheen. Huh. She then turned to Malfoy who hesitated before reluctantly taking the spoon. His face frowned in concentration. Of course, Hermione thought, no Slytherin would want to broadcast his or her emotion for all to see. Malfoy gave the potion the most cursory of stirs, and the liquid in the cauldron turned green. Confusion. Malfoy looked quite satisfied with that, recording the colour on parchment, his right hand still lightly holding the spoon. You're not playing fair, she told him. Oh, yes, if I only was in better touch with my emotions, he said mockingly. Am I angry? Am I sad? Am I? His voice dropped. Aroused. He drew out the last word like a challenge, and without thinking, Hermione grabbed his wrist, moving his arm in a circle. The potion flashed green again, this time with strong streaks of silver, and Malfoy wrenched his arm from Hermione's grip and stepped back. The potion returned to its original pearly white, 
and Hermione also stepped back, blushing. What's wrong, Hermione? asked Lavender, who had been excitedly comparing her colour with the next table over. Malfoy, what colour was your patient? Green, Malfoy said through gritted teeth. Lavender stared at his tone. Green, he repeated more gently. A large clatter broke the tension. Ron had returned with two large glass jars and slammed them onto the desk. The two men glared at their tabletops, leaving Hermione and Lavender to tip their cauldron contents into jars and then label them. Glass is missed, Slughorn boomed. Just leave your jars and cauldrons on the table. Hermione slung her book bag over her shoulder and looked at her patient's partner. Really, Malfoy, she teased. You shouldn't be ashamed of your feelings. His eyes glittered. Oh, I'm not. I remember, Granger. I didn't stay up that last colour all by myself. He walked out of the glass room, leaving her standing with her smile sliding off her face. Hermione's next class, advanced arithmancy, was blessedly free of either Malfoy or Ron. The first morning of school and she felt like she could sleep for a week. Ron kept to himself during lunch, eating silently and then stomping out of the great hall, not even pausing to chat up his war hero groupies. Malfoy sat a bit apart from his housemates at a Slytherin table and managed to make it look like he wanted it that way. Ginny rattled on about Quidditch, Neville about the new special advanced herbology greenhouse and Luna joined their table to chase Rex birds off their plates with a fan made of palm fronds. So much negative energy, she said dreamily. I can scatter them a bit, but they'll be back. Hermione left lunch early, determined to have a walk by the lake. Number three. Defense against the dark arts didn't start until tomorrow, so she was free until double herbology. She made an entire circuit, then sat on the warm grass and pulled out Malfoy's scroll. She took out her wand, intending to incendio it, but found herself tugging at the green ribbon instead and letting it slither to the ground. The parchment held only a few lines of elegant runes, each marking a small work of art. Granger? Yes, I have the manuscript here, and the runestone. 8 p.m. at the old Chomps classroom. D.L.M. Below his name, he had sketched a small stone with tiny markings, and chanted so they changed repeatedly. A nice little charm, that. Who knew he could draw? Hermione suddenly dropped the parchment. A runestone? How did those Malfoy gits get their hands on a runestone? Stole it, likely. Probably murdered for it. A priceless artifact like that. If Malfoy really had a runestone, it should be in a museum. She should report him. I did you couldn't use it, whispered a voice. Imagine it. He of ancient runes with a real runestone. Maybe he would let her copy the stone's markings. He might, but ye gods, he would be insufferable. Oh well, the man was insufferable anyway, stirring that potion and... Hermione. A shadow had fallen over her and she looked up to see Ron looming above, black robes billowing. He didn't look angry though, he looked... Anxious? Hermione snatched up Malfoy's scroll and stuffed it away. Silly, really. It wasn't like Ron could even read it. Can I sit down? he asked. She nodded and he fell beside her. They looked at the lake in silence. You know, Hermione, seventh and eighth year can go to Hogsmeade any weekend. His voice quavered slightly. I thought maybe we... we could go to dinner. J just the two of us at the three broomsticks. Dinner? You want to take me to dinner? He dragged a hand through his hair. I want to make it up to you. For yelling at you and telling you... telling you what to do. Oh, I trust you. I really do, but that Malfoy... His fists clenched. She frowned. You trust me? Trust me to do what? Not to do anything stupid. Define stupid. One let out a gusty sigh. I... I don't know. Like, something stupid with Malfoy. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't either, really. He sighed. I don't like him near you, and it seems every time I turn around he's there being Malfoy. And you don't seem to mind. Oh, of course I mind. He's a kid. But unlike some people, I don't throw obnoxious tantrums and yell and slam things when I don't like something. He sighed again. Oh, I know. I want to make it up to you. Let's go to dinner Saturday. Hermione tilted her hair, just looking at him. He must have gotten some good advice and was actually taking it. I don't know, Ron, she said finally. This is my worry. We will go to dinner and everything will be fine. He would probably try to kiss her, she knew, and she would probably let him. 
then I'll do something else you don't approve of. I don't know. Dare to have a different reaction or opinion from yours, and you'll flip out again. I can't live like that. It's been a hard year, and I'm not looking for drama. Then you'd better stay away from Malfoy, he said. He's nothing but drama. He was right about that, yet also wrong. Drama surrounded a Slytherin like a cloud, ripples extending from his very present. And he sadly stoked that drama for his own amusement. But ever since he'd arrived at Hogwarts, the man had been insulted, shunned, and watched like a hawk for signs of renegade evil, and he hadn't cracked yet. Well, look at that, she thought. Draco Malfoy is a role model. What a new world this is. Maybe, she said. But this isn't about him. It's about you and me. I want to be friends, but... Just friends? Ron asked, edging closer. Just friends, she said firmly. For now, he asked, a flash of his old, mischievous smile. For now, she answered, smiling back. She couldn't help it. Come here. She gave him a quick hug, pulling back from his arms and standing. He stood too, smiling. Hermione's heart swelled. This was what she wanted, friends and maybe more. The summer passion had faded away, likely never to return, but what did she know? Anything could happen, maybe something new. Walk me to the new greenhouses, she said. I've advanced herbology. Time flew by in advanced herbology. The snapdragon seeds bounced and spat tiny sparks before planting. Poison pansy seeds required a laborious 15-step process to safely embat them into dirt. Best of all, Malfoy was on the other side of the greenhouse, partnered with Luna, who was talking animatedly. Hermione overheard her friend while dropping off her own trays, reminiscing about her stay in the Malfoy dungeon. The torture techniques were quite interesting, Draco, Luna was saying. You might consider next time. Ron and Hermione's reconciliation made dinner more relaxed for everyone, with much chattering and teasing at the Gryffindor table. We should have a party, Jenny said, waving her goblet. Saturday night, common room. Ron, you can get the butter bee. He shook his head. I can't, Jin. I've got plans. Ooh, Jenny cried, looking for him to Hermione. A date? Not a date, she said. Just dinner. We can come afterwards. Not a date, Ron repeated, but he winked at Jenny and Neville, taking Hermione's hand. Hermione stiffened. He wasn't listening again. She pulled her hand away and tried to look anywhere else. The Hufflepuffs were celebrating as well. Their house was ahead in points, thanks to some volunteer work repairing the castle over lunch. The Slytherins, she noted, were quieter than usual, still split into various fractions. Malfoy ate alone, as usual, writing or sketching on parchment. His eyes met hers for an instant, then he returned to his work. I'm going to the library, she said, standing. Maybe there were some books on runes in the library. Then she wouldn't need that damn stone. Come out to the Quidditch pitch, Ron said. Gryffindor trials are tonight. He was a lock to be keeper, even if he couldn't be captain. Ginny nodded, her eyes bright. Hermione tried to look regretful that she couldn't spend hours shivering in the cold while Ron showed up. Too much to do. Ron frowned slightly. It would be a great way to support my your house. I'll support you at all the games, she said, turning away from Ron's frown. Then she stopped and walked back to him. We talked about this, Ronald, she whispered. Trust my choices, right? Ron sighed. Yeah. Maybe this will work, Hermione told herself as she climbed the staircase to the library. Maybe things will change. People did change. There was, of course, nothing useful on runes in the library, although she had yet to check the restricted section. That would have to wait for another evening, when she could return with the marauder's map heavy lent her. She read through her ancient runes essay twice without spotting a single error. It's probably fine. Malfoy was just winding me up. Speaking of Malfoy, it was ten minutes to eight. She decided to meet the men after all, and it was crucial to leave the library before friends came looking for her. Flitwick's old charms classroom was an inspired place to meet, she had to admit. The part of the castle had taken horrific damage during the Battle of Hogwarts, and no paintings or armor remained to keep watch. She picked carefully through the rubble, her lit wand held high, and reached a giant cracked stone arch that nearly blocked the classroom door. She skirted the archer's edge and pushed on the door, which gave way easily. Quickly, she slipped in. Then she stopped and gasped. The classroom itself was nearly untouched. Even the books and knick-knacks lining the shelves appeared undisturbed. It wasn't even dusty. 
Flitwick had cast a powerful protection charm on the space. The room's lamps shone brightly, giving the room a warm and comforting feel. Malfoy sat cross-legged on Flitwick's old desk, flipping through a charms book. He looked up, utterly unsurprised to see her there. Granger, he said. Chapter 4 Codex Runicus Madit didn't say anything, just stood looking at him. When she'd made her list of things to look forward to that morning, number six certainly wasn't secretly meeting up with Draco Malfoy in an abandoned classroom. Could the man even behave like a human being for more than five minutes? He was ignoring her now, his attention back on a charms book, the only sound in the room, the rattling of the windows and the turning of Malfoy's pages. His hair shone like another lamp in the room. She walked over to the desk to face him. Well? Grey eyes flickered up from the page. Sitting on a desk, he was still taller than she. Patience, Granger. I don't have all night. There's a curfew, you know. Martha snickered and turned another page. He looked around the room. He couldn't simply take a table in front of him, too much like he was the teacher and she the pupil. So she found a table on the other side of the room and spread out her arithmetic homework. Two could play at that game. A full half hour passed that way, with Hermione pretending to do arithmetic and Malfoy pretending to read about charms, until Malfoy finally put his book down and uncrossed his legs. This is ridiculous, Granger. For Merlin's sake, get over here. This is a very nice table. There's no reason to move. No. Malfoy pulled a square bundle out of his bag, wrapped in white cloth. He placed it on a desk. Then lay beside it another bundle of the same size, but more rounded. I think you have two reasons to come here, Granger. Not he had her. Hermione gave a long-suffering sigh and stood, picking up her runes essay and a muggle notebook and a pen. Maffa watched her walk towards him, eyes ranking her up and down, a small smile on his lips. She felt herself flush. Reaching the desk, she touched a square bundle, glancing at him for permission. These artifacts were his, after all, no matter how ill-gotten. He nodded, and she sat down her things and unwrapped the white cloth. She let out a breath she didn't know she was holding as the manuscript emerged. It was illuminated with moving figures and shifting runes. The Codex Runicus, she breathed, from the 1300s. The magical Codex Runicus, Martha corrected, one of five copies in existence. How did you ever get this? He shrugged. Nobody knows, passed down over the centuries. He probably wouldn't tell her anyway, Hermione thought, running a hand over the vellum. How amazing to be a part of a magical history in such a way. What would it be like to be born in such a family, practically magical royalty, and then... What is it? What are you thinking about? Malfoy asked suddenly. You Malfoys? She answered absently, her eyes devouring the manuscript on the desk. So much magical history, riches, ancient artifacts. And yet you hoard your legacies like dragons breathing flames, seeing nothing but enemies around you, destroying your reputation and your soul. Such a waste. Malfoy's face turned white, his hands curled into fists, but Hermione didn't notice. Her eyes were on the codex as she followed her train of thought. Go on, he said in a racked whisper. What are you thinking now? The future, Draco. What you could do with such a legacy. My legacy is nothing but evil, he said. Our hands are bloody, our very name is Black. She looked up at him now, caught by something in his voice. It doesn't have to be, she said simply. Malfoy stared at her for a moment, then leaped off the desk in a fluid motion. With a wave of his wand, he wrapped up the manuscript and both bundles flew into his bag. Curfew, he said curtly. He slung his bag over his shoulder and walked quickly out of the room. Hermione sighed and picked up her own things. She left the classroom once again, lighting her way with her wand. Look what you've done. You have all the sensitivity of a hungry Ron Weasley. She wasn't sure what she was more upset about. Malfoy's departure or the fact he took the manuscript and runestone with him. At 6am the following morning, Hermione was up again, trying to write in her journal. Five things to look forward to. One, again, breakfast. Two, visiting Hagrid's since she hadn't the day before. 3. Meeting the new defense against a dark arts teacher. 4. Walking around the lake. And 5. Well, that was a tricky one. Finally, she wrote, 5. Malfoy. Runes? 
She thought about number five all the way through showering and preparing for the day, smoothing down her hair and twisting it into a thick braid. When he talked to her again, she had cut his whole family to ribbons in a few sentences, then laid on him an almost impossible task. Her, the mudblood Hermione Granger, after six years of enmity and exactly one day of limited civil discourse. A voice whispered in her head. What right do you have to speak of such things? What? You think you belong in this world? Hermione sniffed. She refused to think that way. She wasn't about to start censoring herself for some prickly pure blood. If he couldn't take it, that was just too bad. This whole cautious circling was ridiculous anyways. They weren't friends or even study pals. Sighing, she leaned her forehead against the cold window pane, looking down at the Quidditch pitch below. Her heart leapt. There it was, a flying shadow, sailing against the rising sun. Almost impossibly graceful. Who was that? It was too long and lanky to be Ginny, and she never flew in such intricate patterns. If her mind didn't know better, she'd think it was Harry. She stepped by the window, watching the figure chase the tiny silver snitch until Ginny's wand began sounding an alarm, then grabbed her back and left. What's the matter, Hermione? Ginny asked at breakfast. Hermione gave her friend a weak smile and used her fork to nudge her tomato closer to her sausage. Never hadn't shown up to breakfast. Not that she cared. Nothing. How was Quidditch practice? Hermione asked. Perhaps she should apologize to him. For what? Speaking her mind. Brilliant, Ron cried. We have some hot new talent coming up. The Lolly twins are amazing beaters, Jenny said. Money nudged her sausage closer to her toes. Would Malfoy even accept an apology? Brother and sister, they'll be almost as good as Fred and George. Ginny choked suddenly and looked at her blade. Hermione looked up at the mention of the Wheezy twins and put her hand over Ginny's. That's great, Ginny, she said softly. Slytherin's triads are tomorrow night, Ginny said. And the first match will be Gryffindor versus Slytherin. You'll be at the match, right? Wouldn't miss it, Hermione said, smiling at Ginny and Ron as she stood. She tried to talk to Malfoy, not to apologize. He did ask her what she was thinking, but to reassure him it wasn't some kind of pet charity project. She spent the walk to the ancient ruins classroom pondering what she would say, but it was all wasted anyway because Malfoy wasn't outside the door. He arrived to class at the very last second, sliding into his seat across the aisle and ignoring her. He ignored her in potions as well, and he worked in silence, adding ingredients to their draught of peace. Slughorn, obviously, was looking for a quiet day. It almost worked. Lavender chattered happily, drawing a few polite responses from Malfoy, and the whole period would have passed without incident if it hadn't been for Ron. Ron had entered the class with his usual frown, but as it became increasingly clear that Hermione and Malfoy weren't speaking, his face cleared. He looked between them with glee, chopping his valerian root with a jaunty flick of his knife. So, Hermione he said, putting a hand on her shoulder and drawing her closer. Looking forward to Hogsmeade, I know I am. Yes, I like visiting the village, she said coolly, stirring the potion before her and sniffing the steam to calm her irritation. I like visiting the village with you, Ron murmured into her hair. She cast him a glare that clearly said, back off, and Ron moved away, still smiling. This little by-play had distracted him, though, and he'd forgotten his seven stars. Mine opened her mouth to tell him, then closed it again. You might like to stir your potion now, Lavender, Malfoy said in a low voice, drawing out the syllables of her name. He used his hand to guide Lavender's to a spoon, then withdrew it. Lavender's cheeks turned red at the sign touch. One glared at Malfoy while tossing his roots carelessly into the cauldron, then turning up the fire. A bad move. Peace draughts were supposed to simmer, not bubble. Mine said nothing, however, just poured syrup of hellebore into her and Malfoy's cauldron. Thank you, Lavender whispered to Malfoy, leaning toward him slightly and blushing. My pleasure, he said with a slow smile. A lock of fair hair fell into his eyes, slightly curled by the silvery vapor between him and Hermione. We all could use a little peace these days, don't you? Hermione snorted slightly, like a Malfoy ever brought peace to anyone. Ron was viciously stirring the draught before him, bringing up more bubbles, but Lavender had no eyes for her work, only Malfoy. Your draught smells heavenly, Lavender told the Slytherin. I find that additional porcupine quills enhances its potency, he said. 
Levener blushed at the last word, which Malfoy had of course drawn out in a most suggestive way. Ron dropped a spoon with a clutter, and Hermione edged away from his and Levener's draught, which was emitting green sparks. She picked up her wand and the clump of Asian dragon hair she kept on hand for such an event. Misbrook draught of peace could be dangerous, as in everything else superior potion-making requires patience. Mava murmured on, oblivious. Patience and a sure hand. Hermione was torn. Both Ron and his potion looked ready to explode. Quite amusing, but Malfoy's antiques now had her clenching her own one too tightly to be any use. Did nobody else notice a telltale lack of steam? The black ring in the centre? She took a deep breath and loosened her grip on her wand. Ron, you're patient, she said sharply. An entire table stepped back as Ron and Lavender Strode gave an ominous Hermione tossed in the dragon hair and flicked her wand with a string of nonverbal spells as the potion burst out of the cauldron. Lavender shrieked. The potion shot straight up, swirling into a ball and turning orange, then fell directly on Malfoy's head. Malfoy clawed at his face, eyes wide, potion dripping from his hair. You, he snarled at Hermione, you could have killed me, scarred me for life. Oh, Draco! Lavender cried, crabbing a towel. Are you all right? No thanks to her, Malfoy said, still glaring at Hermione as he wiped his face. Stop laughing, Ron, Hermione snapped. This is your fault, letting Malfoy get to you like that. We all could have been seriously burned. Are you burned, Draco? Lavender asked, pulling at his robe. Of course he isn't, Hermione said. It's just a hair potion now. She was an expert in those, and the difference between a simple hair patient and Ron's little Frankenstein mess was neglectable. Her non-verbal cooling charm was also effective. Malfoy's hair would spot orange streaks for a few hours, but he'd live. Now now, what's this? Slughorn had finally noticed the commotion and come to their table, blinking at a still dripping Malfoy. Weasley's utter incompetence, Malfoy said. May I be excused, sir? Of course, my boy. Ah. Oh. Lacan said, looking into Ron and Levinus' empty cauldron, which still smoked slightly. A bad business here. Could have been disastrous. Mr. Weasley, Miss Brown will need to come after class and brew this George again. He sniffed the cauldron before Hermione. Well done, Miss Granger. I suggest you will take a sip after such a scare. With that, the professor drifted away, and the rest of the class returned to their own patients. It was worth it, Ron said. All of it, the amazing orange ferret. Shut up, Ron. Lavender hissed. You'll never like me now. Good, Ron snapped back at her. Here, both of you, Hermione said, passing out a small metal tumbler of peace draught and taking a sip herself. Drink up. Class is dismissed, Slackon called in a relieved tone that was beginning to characterize the end of advanced patience. Leave your labor bottles on the tables. With a sweep of her wand, Hermione vanished the remainder of her and Draco's patient and whisked her books into her bag. She felt strangely unsatisfied by her behavior. As she left the classroom, Levinus' words echoed in her mind. He'll never like me now. Chapter 5 Fighting evil is fun. Lunch was a riotous affair at the Gryffindor table as Ron regaled the group with a story of the potions disaster. To hear Ron tell it, he'd purposely sabotaged his and Levinus' potion to humiliate Malfoy, a result well worth the extra words. The words orange ferret figured prominently in the tale. Nobody would listen to Hermione's word to the contrary, and she had ample time to bitterly regret not letting the damn patient blow up and kill them all. Levinus spent lunch looking around the great hall for Malfoy, who never appeared. Hermione sighed and sipped her wretched pumpkin juice. She almost felt sorry for the men, and she didn't think that was possible. It had only been two days since she'd already attacked a Malfoy where it really hurt his heritage, and his hair. Flushed with victory, Ron began lingering beside her between classes, his hand on her back and shoulders. Another dilemma. His behavior had pretty much sapped Hermione's enthusiasm for their dinner Saturday, but she hesitated to cancel it. Maybe alone and away from Malfoy, she could actually get through to Ron, get their friendship on some honest footing. Yes, she'd be mature and calm until Saturday, and they'd work things out like a doll. Stop hovering, Ron, she screeched as he touched her elbow yet again in the horse. I'm perfectly capable of walking by myself. Well, that didn't last long. Ron's face looked hurt. 
then darkened. Would even make it until the weekend. She was so irritated, she'd forgotten about the new defense against a dark arts teacher until she arrived at the classroom door. McGonagall had created a special data seminar for select 7th and 8th year, war veterans, with its own teacher. Money wondered who it was. She wasn't sure anybody could teach her adequately, except perhaps McGonagall herself, or the ghost of Snape. Do we just go in? Neville asked, shuffling slightly. The rest of the group was silent. Ron and Jenny shrugged. Lavender looked scared, and Luna just peered up at the hallway ceiling, counting blibbering humdingers or something. Even had boy Ernie Macmillan didn't look inclined to act. Well, no sense in waiting. The mind led the way into the classroom, and everyone stopped and stared. The room had been transformed into a flowery meadow without desks, chalkboards, or books. Squashy beanbag chairs formed a tight ring in the center, and giant daisies lined the walls, swaying in a non-existent wind. In the center of the ring was a small woman. Their teacher wasn't any ordinary woman, Hermione realized, but a fairy, if a rather large one. She was about the size of a four-year-old child, with golden hair, a doll face, and pink gossamer wig. She wore a flowing silvery dress, and her only concession to her role was a golden stole around her neck, with the Hogwarts crest on each end. Welcome! She squeaked, clapping her hands. Her feet hovered about a foot off the floor, and her wings fluttered slightly. I am Professor Bluebell, and welcome to my meadow. Please have a seat. Hermione and Ron exchanged looks and found seats side by side, temporarily united in shock. The others selected beanbags, with Luna sitting on Hermione's other side. Oh no, dear, please sit here by me, Bluebell ordered from her own yellow beanbag. No experts will distract you here. Luna eagerly joined her, leaving the bag beside Hermione empty. Who are we missing? the fairy asked. Ah, oh, here's a lovely boy. Come in, lovely boy. The lovely boy in the doorway was Malfoy, sliding in at last minute, and Hermione bit her lip. She was really trying to be good here, and Ron wasn't laughing enough for everyone anyway. But Malfoy looked unruffled, if a little bit hollowed-eyed. He dropped gracefully into the orange beanbag on Hermione's left, acting as if being called lovely boy by a three-foot fairy was only his due. Hermione had to admire it. Shut up, Ronald, she hissed to her right. Oh, you are all lovely, cried Professor Bluebell. She smiled at Ron. Such a melodious laugh you have, my dear boy, and your hair is a summer sunset. Ron's laugh cut off as if he'd been choked. Hermione settled back into a beanbag, stretching out her leg. The bags were pushed close together, and she resisted the urge to pull out her wand and lengthen her pleated uniform skirt. Ron was lazily eyeing her legs with a faint smile, a light flush muttling his face and neck, his end inches from her thigh. If he touches me, I'll hex him. Marigold! Headmistress McGonagall has been so kind to invite me to teach advanced defense against the dark arts this year, Bluebear continued. I'm so honored. My philosophy of defense is quite simple and can be summed up in a single phrase. She waved her hand at the chalkboard and pink letters appeared. Defense against the dark arts. Fighting evil is fun. I know you all have a bit of experience battling dark magic. Well done. Marigold has asked me to. Yes, dear, you have a question already. Dear girl, you don't have to raise your hand. Hermione brought her hand down and tried not to glare. Apparently, all her classes this year would be anarchy. Yes, Professor. Bluebell, please. Yes, Bluebell. Um, who is Marigold again? Why, the headmistress McGonagall, of course. But the headmistress's first name is Minerva, Ernie said. Ah, yes, Bluebell nodded. But your lovely headmistress is a friend of the fairies, dear boy. Friend of the fairies, Hermione repeated. Oh, yes, Luna said dreamily. I could see it in first year. She has the ring of posies over her head. Ron's hand moved closer to Hermione's thigh, prompting her to move away and bump into Malfoy's arm on the other side. Must these beanbags be so close? She shifted back again, glancing at Malfoy, whose eyes were like chipped ice. Warm sunshine, expensive cologne. Hermione cleared her throat and glowered at her teacher. Yes, indeed, my main girl. Bluebell was chirping. Marigold is a beautiful spirit and sweet as morning dew. There was a brief silence as the entire class goggled at her. Now, your first assignment, the fairy continued. 
She waved a hand and rolled parchments appeared on everyone's lap. I want you all to think of love, she went on. The love of family, of friends, of places and things, and yes, romantic love. Lavender, seated opposite Hermione, looked down and blushed. In that spirit, I would like you all to write of love. You each have a name on your scroll. Write down three things you love about that person, and he or she, in turn, will write something they love about you. Luna, dear, we shall write about each other. Hermione opened her scroll and nearly fainted from relief at the name. Lavender Brown! Ron jumped up. What? You must be mental! He shouted, waving his parchment, which clearly bore the name Draco Malfoy. Hermione choked, giggles escaping from her throat. Ron looked ready to leap over the nearest daisy and out the window. She stole another glance at Malfoy, whose face was expressionless. Now, now, dear, Bluebird said, coaxing Ron back into his beanbag. Every person has lovable qualities. Would you like me to help you? Tell me, what of Mr. Malfoy's smile? I'm sure he has a very nice smile, although I have not seen it yet. Have you two ever had a quiet talk about... Hermione literally couldn't breathe now. She doubted they'd learn anything but rubbish in Dada this year, but it just might become her favorite class. The rest of the class was crying with suppressed laughter and never was sliding off his beanbag. His long legs tangled on the floor. Hermione's eyes were irresistibly drawn to Malfoy once more, and he seemed to be trying not to smile. I, I'm fine, Ron said, horror-struck. He sank back into his beanbag, red-faced. Hermione, he whispered. Help me. His eyes, Hermione said loudly. Like a stormy sea. Not funny, he snapped and turned away from her. Hermione finished her scroll quickly and closed it with a tap of her wand. Malfoy surprisingly finished his nearly as quickly and lay back on his beanbag like a Roman emperor looking smug. Time's up, Bluebell said. Let's all read our scrolls aloud. Such fun, I'll begin. The fairy wax poetic about Luna's loveliness, sensitivity and free spirit, and Luna responded in kind. Ernie and Ginny exchanged polite compliments, and Lavender merrily listed three subjects that Hermione excelled in. I love that Lavender's brave, Hermione read. If one did something, it was always worth doing right. I love that Lavender always believes the best in people. I love that Lavender doesn't cling to old resentments. Unlike some people I know, she thought, looking at Ron significantly. Bluebell looked pleased. And Mr. Weasley? Ron shook his head, arms crossed. Nope, nothing. Surely there's something in that lovely boy. Nope, not a thing. Bluebell looked very sad. Very well, Mr. Malfoy. Malfoy opened his scroll with a flourish. I love how Weasley finds even the shockingly low standards expected of him impossible to attain. I love how Weasley thinks with every part of his body except his brain. I love how Weasley becomes enraged when he doesn't understand something, which means he is enraged nearly all the time. He looked around the room calmly. Is that enough? I can always write more. Ron leaped to his feet. You boss, are you fucking Death Eater? Immediately, a vine of flowers wound around his body, burning him fast and sending him falling back onto his beanbag. Obviously, this relationship is something we'll all need to work at, Bluebell said serenely. It's the Nargles, Luna said. They've been swarming all week. Undoubtedly, dear. Well, we'll let Mr. Weasley relax for the remainder of class, and then he and Mr. Malfoy can try again to complete the assignment. Do at our next class. Ron's face, barely visible above the flower vines wrapped around his mouth, was pale. Malfoy looked unperturbed. Hermione raised her hand halfway, then brought it down again. Bluebell, she said coolly, I fail to see how such exercises constitute a valid defense against the dark art. No, Bluebell asked. I expected more from one of Harry Potter's best friends. What saved the boy who lived when he was a baby as well as numerous times since? A mother's love? His friends love. Love soaked into his bones. And what of Mr. Malfoy? His mother's love saved Harry Potter as well, did it not? Mr. Malfoy would not be with us today if it weren't for his parents' love. She wavered her hand at the board again, and more words appeared, this time in bright yellow. Love each other or perish. Love is the only defense against the dark art, the fairy said softly. I would think this class would know that better than anyone. 
A short silence. Tears were running down Ginny's cheeks. Draco was looking down at his feet, his cheeks faintly pink. Even Hermione felt a little ashamed. It was true, of course. Unassailable logic. From a fairy. Who knew? And that's it for today, Bluebell said in a chipper tone. She rose out of her beanbag. I expect an essay next class, fourteen inches, discussing the power of love in life-threatening situations. Have a loving day. Malfoy stood and walked swiftly out of the door. Ron's flower wines disappeared, and he returned to his beanbag, red-faced. Hermione walked over to Ginny and hugged her. Come on, she said. I'll take you back to the dorm. More books, Ginny sobbed. I have your books, never said from behind them. The class streamed out, except for Ron in his beanbag, still stunned. Hermione looked back to see Bluebell hovering before him. Maybe she can help him, she thought. I certainly failed, but did I really try? Chapter 6 The Silver Snitch Hermione slept in the next morning, not waking until 6.15. She'd been up until nearly midnight, working on her love warrior's call, and didn't really like the result. It didn't help listening to Levin a rave about Bluebell or watching Ginny's silent tears as the redhead tried to write her own essay. Hermione had planned to write about Harry, how her powerful but platonic love for him gave her the strength to fight over the years. But instead, she found herself writing about her parents, how she took a terrible risk to protect them at the risk of losing them forever. She wondered what Malfa would write about, what he write about his own parents. According to his testimony at trial, it was Voldemort's hideous threats to his mother that prompted him to let Death Eaters into the castle to try to kill Dumbledore. How could love be the best defense in those circumstances? Didn't Voldemort only turn Malfoy's love into a weakness? Dark thoughts for first thing in the morning, and Hermione was in no mood to write her five things to look forward to. But again, a disciplined mind was important. One, breakfast. Two, she still hadn't visited Hagrid. Three, another walk by the leg. Four, arithmancy, where they were studying a particularly knotty seven-dimensional theorem. She couldn't think of a five. Not with Ron and Ginny depressed and Malfoy denying her his runestone and codex. Git. Finally, she wrote five. The morning flyer. She'd found a sort of peace in watching the mysterious figure and hoped he or she wouldn't stop practicing once trials were over. With that thought, she rushed through her morning routine and was at the window promptly at 7.30, scanning the sky. Her breath hitched when she saw the flyer sailing around the North Tower, silhouetted against the rising sun. The rider shot straight up, then down, before launching into a series of loops. She followed the figure, searching for a hint to his or her identity. And what was... Then she saw it. A flash outside her window. Fascinated, she watched a silver bar flit outside her window, tiny wings fluttering. It was so tiny. How could a seeker even see? A shadow flew by the window, and she nearly screamed aloud. The flyer had found the snitch, of course, had missed it by inches, and was returning for another try. The snitch continued to hover outside Hermione's window, teasing and sparkling in the growing light. Hermione was reaching to close the curtain when she saw the figure approach at high speed, hood thrown back, platinum hair shining. Hermione didn't hesitate. She grabbed her wand, pointed it at the window, vanishing a single pane of glass. A gust of cold wind whipped the room's bed curtains and she heard Ginny mutter irritably. The snitch shot through the open pane and zipped around the room, reminding Hermione of Pig. Ron's wee out. She suddenly leaped backwards, choking back another scream, for there was Malfoy on the other side of the window and he looked furious. She shivered, remembering the constant snarl from earlier years, but she had a plan and it didn't involve releasing the snitch at that time. Instead, she waved her wand and restored the glass pane. Another wave and the window curtain snapped shut, hiding the outraged Slytherin from view. Not even Malfoy would break into a girl's dorm before breakfast. Get a bad boogie hex from Ginny if he even tried. What's up? asked Lavender's sleepy voice. Nothing, Hermione said. She pointed a wand at the snitch. Akio snitch, she whispered, and the bauble fluttered into her hand. It was beautiful, really. Shining silver with DLM engraved in old English letters. A gift, probably. Yes, this would do nicely. Holding the snitch with one hand, Hermione ducked through her trunk with the other and emerged with a box her watch came in. A back-to-school gift from her parents, and the perfect size. She placed the snitch inside the box, tucked it into the rope pocket, and left the bedroom. A few minutes before breakfast was all she needed. 
Then she just had to wait. She didn't have to wait long. Malfoy stalked her all the way to ancient ruins after glaring at her through breakfast. Give me my snitch, he snarled, backing her slowly against the corridor wall. Oh, was that yours? she asked coolly. Her hand touched a wand inside her rope pocket. He noticed the movement, but didn't back off an in. Don't play with me, Granger. You've seen me practice with it. You've been watching me. Yes, she admitted readily. That move this morning was at the wonky feint. Malfoy ground his teeth. Ronsky, faint, you doffed. I think you'll make a brilliant finder. Seeker, he snapped. Hermione rolled her eyes. Too easy. A fairy calls him a lovely boy in front of the whole class and he handles us with a plump. Hermione takes a little ball and purposely garbles a few words and the man completely unravels. Now, you listen to me, Granger. Mr. Malfoy. Miss Granger, would you care to join us? Headmistress McGonagall stood in the classroom doorway, looking like she'd never seen a ring of posies in her life. Of course, Headmistress, Hermione chirped, flouncing into the classroom and sitting down. Malfoy followed more slowly, his face like stone. Hermione pulled out a fresh sheet of parchment and wrote the following in runes. Malfoy, 8 p.m. at the Ben and Charms classroom. Bring the codex and a runestone and we'll make a deal. H.J.G. P.S. Wacky Faint. She rolled it up with a tap of her wand and bound it in bright red and gold ribbon, then rendered the scroll invisible and floated it over to Malfoy's desk. The scroll reappeared in his hands and he read it swiftly, then turned to her and nodded, his face grim. Hermione smiled. Maybe ancient ruins would be fun after all. The patient's table was quiet that morning. Ron was still subdued after the last data seminar and Malfoy and Hermione worked together silently so Lavender was the only conversationalist. You slice these bats spleen so well, Draco, she cooed. I like a man who's good with his hands. Ron groaned. Honestly, Lavender, give it a rest. I'd rather not lose my breakfast. Hermione could only agree, but Malfoy's eyes were now glittering dangerously. I think it's lovely, she said loudly. A southern prince tamed by a gentle Gryffindor sweetheart. Malfoy froze in the act of preparing the spleens, looking revolted. But Milda Vane at the next table nearly fell off her stool in the effort to hear better. I think Brown knows better than that, Malfoy said quietly as he set aside the spleens and started on a pile of leeches. It's sometimes hard to admit one's feelings, Hermione told Ron. Granger, Malfoy growled. Now what have we here? boomed Slughorn who had given up his usual ammo of dozing at his desk to frequently check on their table. Very, very nice. Mr. Malfoy, remember to press the leeches gently with your knife. Don't smash them so. He moved away to check on Romilda and her partner's potion, which steamed suspiciously. Don't listen to him, Draco, Lavender said. I think you're pressing the leeches wonderfully. Malfoy's left eye twitched, but he refrained from comment. The exchange cheered Ron up, though, at least enough for him to solicit Hermione's help. The infusion of wormwood was enough to counteract the excessive doxy venom he'd used, and his and Lavender's potion now looked almost identical to Hermione's and Draco's. Ron's good mood was even more improved when Hermione pulled him aside after class and presented him with a parchment. He listed three things to love about Malfoy. His skills and potions, his patience with Lavender, and his quiet, reserved manner this year. Reserved? Ron repeated. Malfoy? Compared to the past year, I'd say so, Hermione answered. Look, there's nothing to object to here. The assignment is over, and you look like the better man. All right, Hermione, he said. Thanks. He stuffed a scroll in his pocket. Are we still on for Saturday? Why wouldn't we be? she asked. Well, you've been sort of tetchy lately. That's because you keep pushing, she said. We're friends, right? I don't know about the future, but right now we're friends. She heard repeating the words would help it sink in. Let me relax around you, Ron. She took his hand. Please. Okay, he said, looking down at their entwined fingers. It's just hard after we... I know, she said softly. I'm just not sure we're good together that way. Do you really want me bossing you around? Ron raised his eyebrows and grinned. That depends on what we're doing. She frowned and he raised his hands. Just a little fun. I'll behave. Really, friends. Hermione linked her arm through his. Friends. Ginny looked much better at dinner, chattering happily about the Hufflepuff Quidditch tryouts the night before. 
Ravenclaw trials were that evening with Slytherin the next day. Nemani let her compare the house's likely strengths and weaknesses without interruption. Then Ginny and Ron ran off to watch the Ravenclaws, and Hermione completed her transfiguration homework in a library before heading to the Ben and Charms classroom. Martha was there first, just as before, again sitting cross-legged on the desk. She supposed it was a Slytherin thing to turn up early and take command of the room in such situations. He certainly didn't bother with punctuality any other time. Well, where is it? he demanded as she entered. She dropped her back on the floor. Where's the codex and the ringstone? Malfoy crossed his arms. Oh, I didn't bring them. Too bad, no snitch for you. He hopped off the desk and moved closer, forcing Hermione to tilt her head back to keep eye contact. I want that snitch, Granger, he said. It's valuable and I won't be blackmailed with something that's rightfully mine. Get used to it. That smart mouth will get Akio snitch. Malfoy's wand was in his hand and he cast a spell before she could react. Clever. Good thing she'd surrounded a snitch with a repelling charm. Expelliarmus, she snapped, backing away her own wand in hand. Malfoy's wand nearly took off his hand with the force of her spell. Now she had both wands and felt considerably more comfortable. Run along now, Malfoy, and get that codex and stone for me. I don't have all night. Malfoy almost smiled. No. Don't make me hex you. She half expected him to lunge at her and so held her wand up chest high, back straight. Instead, with whip-quick seeker reflexes, he drew a vial out of his pocket, uncorked it, and released a cloud of fine grey dust into the air. It scattered down and disappeared, and her mind felt strange. What? What was that? She stammered, stepping back. His smile broke through his eyes, meeting hers again. Salt of the earth. Hermione blinked. How did he get that? Salt of the earth was an incredibly difficult powder to procure. The creation required, among other things, the blood of a troll and six months of brewing. Brought it from home. Just another precious asset from my ancient wizarding house, he sneered. She frowned. Salt of the earth had many uses but its most obvious effect was to temporarily nullify any use of magic within a limited radius. Hermione tried to remember how long the sword's effects lasted, but she knew almost nothing about the substance. She moved to keep a table between them, but Malfoy wasn't looking at her. Instead, he picked up her back and unceremoniously dumped it out on a teacher's desk. Books, quills and scrolls tumbled out, as well as two lipsticks, her looped notebook and a wrapped chocolate tart from dinner. The color-coded study guides blinked merrily from the floor. Where is it, Granger? He asked, tossing her back aside. I know you brought it. He stepped closer, and now he was watching her, and it took every ounce of self-control not to step back again. The table between them suddenly looked very flimsy. All this over a little snitch, she asked lightly. It's mine, he said, every inch the possessive pure blood. You stole it to force me to show you other valuable objects, Objects that are also mine. Artifacts I showed you out of... He stopped. Out of what? She asked curiously. Why did you share the codex with me? They were circling the table now, and his grey eyes were bright. Money's heart was pounding. Her wand in a tight fist. She had nothing but delaying tactics now, and the second that powder's effects expired, she was going to... It doesn't matter, he said. What matters is that I showed you the codex and you chose to insult me and my... You asked me what I was thinking. What did you expect? A little gratitude, maybe. We Malfoys don't share lightly. We don't share anything with... With mudbloods, I know, she snapped, still circling. Forgive me for not falling to my knees to the great Draco Malfoy who deigned to act like a human being to a filthy... Damn her tongue. He looked murderous now. Don't say that again, Malfoy snarled. Don't even start that shit, Granger. That kind of thinking destroyed my family, destroyed my fucking life. He stalked around the table, never breaking eye contact. The mind tried a nonverbal spell. Nothing. She thought about simply running from the room and hiding until the saw wore off, but her pride won't let her, and he would surely beat her to the door. Give me back my snitch, Malfoy growled. Tell me why you showed me the codex. If she broke eye contact for an instant, he'd be on her like a cobra. He stopped circling and smiled thinly. If the snitch isn't in the bag, it must be on your person, Granger. It isn't. I don't believe you. His tone was mocking, his eyes moving down her body. He was practically licking his lips. Hermione flushed. 
So that was his game. The prim proper bookworm trapped by the big bad sex god Slytherin. Well, she wasn't having it. She wasn't going to quail and whimper. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Stop, oh, stop. While he queued up some one-size-fits-all seduction technique to search her body, she clutched her one tighter. Nothing. Fine, Hermione said in a crisp, bossy tone. She slammed her wand on the table between them. I'll prove it, and you will apologize for questioning my word. She thinned her lips, just like McGonagall at her most disapproving, and began slowly unbuttoning her white uniform shirt. Oh, if she only had a working wand or muggle camera to capture the absolutely gobsmacked expression on Malfoy's face as she stripped off her shirt and waved it at him. See? No snitch. She pulled it back on and fastened two buttons before stepping away from the table and attacking her skirt. Damn it, the zipper was stuck again. She was losing the moment. Malfoy edged nearer. Need some help. Damn, and triple them. All right, then. Careful to keep her expression McGonagall's stern, she grabbed a skirt at the seam and pulled. It was an old skirt, and the sharp ripping of cloth echoed in the empty classroom. Malfoy blinked and froze, staring as the plaid wool fell to the floor. Nope, nothing to see, Malfoy, she said in her snippiest tone. Oh, I wouldn't say that. He gave her a slow smile as his eyes travelled down her stockinged legs, then up to the hem of her shirt. She'd called his bluff, and now he was calling hers. And he was on the move again, closing the space between them. How long did that damn powder last? Time to roll the dice. Hermione lunged for her wand, almost crying in relief when she felt a familiar warmth rushing up her arm. Protego! She shouted, and the strength of her shield charm sent Malfoy crashing back into another table. Accio, Draco's wand! She added, and the wand slapped smartly into her palm. A wordless wave and her skirt wrapped around her hips and repaired itself. Another wave, and her shirt buttoned right up to her chin. She pondered wand at Malfoy, who was just regaining his balance. Petrificus Totalus, she said, almost lovingly. Malfoy dropped to the floor, his body stood. Hermione waved the wand at her back, which packed itself up neatly and leaped onto her shoulder, then pointed the wand at the ceiling. Finita incantatum, she said, ending both the repelling charm and the sticking charm and the box with the snitch fell from its sticking point on the ceiling to land on the stone floor before Malfoy's prone body. Only his silver eyes moved, mad with rage. Satisfied, she stepped closer and laid his wand beside his hand. I've changed my mind, she said, looking down at him coldly. I don't want your snitch, or to look at any of your stupid, illegal artifacts. I don't know why you showed me that codex or appeared to care what I thought about it, but I'm through. You asked me a question, I gave you an honest answer. You couldn't take it, and then chose to punish me for my candor. She walked to the door and turned to face him. You gods, Malfoy, you're just like Ronald. The money waved her wand one last time as the door slammed shut behind her. The charmed lamps extinguished himself, leaving one shocked wizard alone in the dark. She walked briskly through the halls, heart pounding. She didn't know how long Malfoy's paralysis would last, since she'd purposely made the spell rather weak. Possibly too weak, but better to hurry now than risk leaving him frozen for a day. Vanity puffs, she told the fat lady, hopelessly trying to tame her hair and cool her cheeks. She made it halfway across the common room before anyone noticed her presence. Hermione, can you help me with... Hey, Hermione, what's the proportion of honey water with hawklump juice in the... What's the hurry? Do you know the answer to the question? Panting, Hermione ignored them all. Let them look in a fucking book for once. She pounded up the stairs, clutching the banister as she climbed. Once in her room, she changed into her penguin pajamas and watered her bed. She settled under the covers, then got out of bed and watered the windows. Twice. Back in bed, however, as Hermione's heart slowed in the quiet pace of the room, she began to chuckle at herself. Why would Malfoy chase after her anyway? He'd gotten what he wanted. He had his artifacts, his beloved snitched, and even a little strip show on the side. What did he have to complain about? Maybe she'd overreacted in the charms classroom. There she was, swanning around the castle, telling everyone not to be scared of the big bad Malfoy, and the second the man threw some powder around, she completely lost her mind. Some war heroine she was. What did she think Malfoy was going to do? Crew show the snitch out of her? It was a lack of magic, that was it. To be in a situation like that again, trapped and helpless, unable to stop. Yes, that was it. She closed her eyes, slowing her breathing, and there he was. It must be on your person, Granger. It isn't. 
I don't believe you. She turned on her side, heart suddenly pounding again. He was looking at her. It must be on your person, Granger. It isn't. I don't believe you. Back in the charms classroom, her every nerve ending had screamed like a klaxon. Flight, flight, flight! She couldn't let him touch her or... It must be on your person, Granger. It isn't. I don't believe you. Suddenly, they weren't in the classroom anymore. They were in Arthur Weasley's muggle shack with the broken appliances and the shop back. Malfoy stepped closer, whispering, It must be on your person, Granger. It isn't, she whispers back. His breath is in her ear, his hand on her hips. I don't believe you. Hermione opened her eyes. Damn it. Chapter 7. Slytherin Triad. Hermione, please. Ginny was bagging at breakfast. Hermione stared at the redhead, baffled. Why, in Godric's name, would I go to the Slytherin Quidditch Triad? You are my only hope, Ginny said. I have to scout the talent after dinner, but there is no way I'm going to the pitch alone. I mean, look at them. She tilted her head towards the Slytherin table and the great hall. It was a typical scene. The older students looking like a pack of criminal masterminds, the younger students quaking in their seats, and Malfoy eating alone like nothing in this world could ever bother him. Take Ron, Hermione said shortly. I need to study. Ron has to redo his draught of peace for Slughorn with Lavender, and the rest of my team is too chicken, Ginny said. I need somebody who's not scared of a couple of Slytherins. Luna, Hermione suggested, fishing for gulping blimpies in the Black Lake. Never helping Sprout with some special apology project for advanced students. Apparently, the seeds hate to be planted. Hermione sighed. Fine, but you owe me, you owe me big. She glared at Jenny. I'm serious. I'm giving up serious study time to watch some wacky faint. Ronsky faint, Jenny and Ron cried out. Whatever, she said, trying not to smile. Hermione spent the rest of breakfast moodily drawing runes in her transfiguration textbook as an intense Quidditch discussion raged around her. Then she joined a small pack of Ravenclaws on the way to ancient runes. She was just going to have to avoid him. Four days into the school year, and she simply needed to avoid a man who sat across the aisle in ancient runes, across the table in potions, and two inches away in defense against the dark arts. No problems here! Entering the ancient rune classrooms, Hermione saw that Malfoy seemed to have adopted the same strategy. He looked as artlessly indifferent as ever, tucked into his tiny desk, and spared her only the occasional dark glance. Later that day, at the defense against the dark arts, Hermione couldn't help but be hyperactively aware of the men to her left, that soft cologne scent drifting nearer. She leaned closer to Ron on her other side to avoid it, and by the end of the period, Ron was stroking a light pattern on her arm. Huffing, she gave Ron a sharp dig with her elbow and reluctantly shifted closer to Malfoy's beanbag, ignoring Ron's hurt look. When would this class be over? After dinner, she and Ginny left the castle to walk to the pitch, with Hermione wrapped snugly in a red and gold scarf and hat. She knew from experience that no matter how beautiful it was when one headed off to a long, dark Quidditch event, an icy wind would invariably swoop off a mountaintop before the first quacky hit a hoot. A fair number of Slytherins cheered from the stands as the aspiring players gathered on the pitch. The captain of the Quidditch team was a blonde keeper. Willowy and beautiful, she flitted between the big hoops, effortlessly blocking every hit. If Malfoy hadn't revealed himself that fatal morning outside her morning, she would have thought it was this player practicing before breakfast. She was very tall. That is Doria Greengrass, Ginny said following her gaze. Daphne's younger sister. She looks delicate, but she nearly took off my hat with a bludger last year. I've heard something about her, Hermione mused. Oh, she was betrothed to Draco Malfoy. What? Jenny looked up from the parchment she was scribbling on. Not officially, but their families were talking seriously during our fifth year. Astoria wouldn't quit bragging about it. Kept showing off some diamonds he gave her. Revolting. Is it on again now? Hermione asked. Jenny shrugged. No idea. I mean, the Malfoy names is mutt these days. Oh, I'm sorry. She looked at Hermione, her eyes wide and shocked. It's all right, Hermione said, pitting her arm, and it really was. It's a muggle term, too. Ginny smiled at her. You're the best witch I know. You're just saying that because I came to Slytherin tryouts. Ginny just grinned and went back to her parchment, 
assigning points to prospective players. Amani put a chin in her hand and watched her flying below, her cars whipping around her. The wind, as predicted, was picking up already. After nearly an hour, her butt was frozen and she was sick of doing arithmetic in her head. Amani looked enviously at Slughorn, who sat near the pitch wrapped in an enormous blanket and tucked into a comfy armchair. Why hadn't she brought a book? She was trying to calculate whether she could summon one from her bedroom window when Ginny grabbed her arm. Here comes the prospective seekers. There were only three, two six-year girls and Malfoy. Hermione's breath caught, watching those familiar loops. She had been waiting for this, she realized, without knowing she was waiting. Wow, Ginny said. That git really can fly. She began jotting numbers, plattering drops of inks in her haste. Astoria started hitting small balls out over the field, allowing the three contenders to chase them. Malfoy scooped each one up in a minute, easily outflying the sixth years. Hermione's eyes narrowed. Astoria was starting to hit them directly to one sixth-year student or another, but Malfoy stole them away. The stands were deathly silent, although Slughorn did cheer and wave his little snake flag. Huh? Ginny said, looking around. Not a lot of support for Drake, eh? One boar sailed their way, and Malfoy made a tight turn and snatched it before it entered the stands. He hung in the air five feet from them, for just an instant, his eyes meeting Hermione's before he flew away. Ginny turned to Hermione. What was that about? Hermione shrugged. Can we go? I can't feel my ass. Yeah. Ginny stood and packed away her quill and parchment. Hot chocolate in the common room? She looked back at Malfoy. Slytherin will be tough to beat with a seeker like that, she said. Miss Weasley? Madame Hooch, the Quidditch teacher in Gryffindor's new hat of house, stood by the entrance to the pitch. Her bleached white hair was windblown and her black cape snapped and swirled behind her. Hooch always wore Quidditch gear even when she wasn't flying. A moment, please, Miss Granger, you may come as well. They followed her to a grassy spot away from the stand. Miss Weasley, which said in a severe tone, it has come to my attention that the seventh and eighth year are planning a party Saturday in the common room. Uh, yes, Ginny said. Upperclassmen parties were not forbidden after curfew as long as it didn't get too out of hand. Nobody had expected Hooch to object. Excellent. I would like you to open this party beyond just Gryffindors. Into house unity and all that. You will invite eighth year Slytherins as well. Slytherins? Jenny gasped. We couldn't. Hooch's face was stern. You certainly could. Extend the invitation today. Have the fat lady issue a temporary password for the evening. Slytherins? Jenny repeated. Hermione said nothing but felt the same. Today? Mind you, Hooch repeated slinging her broomstick over her shoulder. She always carried a broomstick when on a Quidditch pitch. She stalked off. I'm not talking to Astoria, Ginny pronounced, sounding just like Ron. She can't come anyways. Seventh year, remember? Come on. Hermione led her back to the pitch. Look, there's Blaise Sabini. He's tolerable. He's creepy, Ginny said. He always tries to touch my hair. Hermione peered up at the green-cloaked figure high in the stands. I'll talk to him. He won't touch my hair. She'd heard enough Slytherin insults over the year about her hair, mostly from Malfoy, but Sabini had always considered Muggleballs unworthy of comment. In the rare times they'd been forced to interact, she'd been distantly courteous. Bugger, Jenny grumbled as they climbed. They ruin our party. Sabini sat on a topmost bench, a slender figure with wind-ruffled black hair, wearing a dark suit and a tie under his cloak. He looked down at them like a king from his throne, waiting for them to speak. Zabini, Hermione said. She was damned if he was getting an excuse me or even a hello. Regal nod. Granger, Weasley. I, we, Hermione began glancing at Jenny. God, she felt stupid. She tried to channel McGonagall again. Better to sound prim and snippy than weak and intimidated. We Gryffindors are holding a party in our common room Saturday night. Zabini's eyebrows rose, but Hermione went on doggedly. And in the interest of inter-house unity, we would like to invite us thither in eight years. All of them? Zabini asked. Of course all of them. They are what, six of you? Lloyd smiled. I thought perhaps you wouldn't care to include certain personalities. Jenny frowned, but Hermione knew exactly who Zabini meant. Everyone in eighth year, she said firmly. You may be afraid of him, Zabini, but I assure you, we are not. Zabini's mouth turned down. I believe we are otherwise engaged. All of you? Hermione asked. 
Well, this has been fun, Ginny said brightly. Sorry a lot can't make it. Maybe next time. She grabbed Hermione's arm and began tugging her back to on the stands. A moment, Zabini said. Perhaps our plans can be rearranged. Oh no, Ginny said. Don't inconvenience yourself for us. Plans are important. Ta! I will send an owl informing you of our decision, Sabini said. Don't put yourself out, snapped Hermione. Sabini's dark eyes just blinked down at us early. Jenny kept a vice grip on her arm and hauled her down the stands. What was that? Jenny hissed. Did you insist that Malfoy be invited to our party? What? No, well, maybe. Sabini irritated me. Trust me, Malfoy will irritate us a lot more. Ron will go spare. Excellent, Hermione grinned. Dinner and a show. Ginny stopped at the bottom of the stands and cocked her head slightly. What is with you this year, Hermione? It's like you want to cause trouble. I don't know what you're so worried about, Hermione said. They won't come anyway. She was utterly wrong, of course. Ginny received Sabini's owl an hour later as they sat around the Gryffindor common room, sipping hot chocolate. The night was terse. The Slytherins would be pleased to present themselves at the Gryffindor common room at 8pm Saturday and inquired if the event was black tie. Tell him yes, Ron suggested. Let him look like idiots. Tell them business casual, Hermione said. What's that? Ginny asked. It's a muggle term. Love it, Ginny cried. We need to tamper our passwords. Gryffindors are great, said Neville. Slytherins are stupid, said Ron. Charity and love, said Luna dreamily. Why are you here? Ron asked. Don't you Ravenclaws have your own common room? Luna just smiled and blew him a kiss. Ginny grinned wickedly. No, I love it. Imagine all the Slytherins repeating charity and love. Genius. She scribbled a few more lines and sent a message off. It could work, Hermione thought, moving to sit alone on a sofa by the fire. She gazed into the melted marshmallow swirls in her cocoa. The password alone might repel even Slytherin's most die-hard partiers. Hermione! Lavender slid onto the couch beside her. Can I talk to you? Hermione nodded. Lavender looked nervous and embarrassed, fidgeting with her sofa cushion. You probably think I'm stupid, Lavender said. Well, I wish you hadn't gone to Madame Hooch. You know, Lavender stared at her. Oh, of course you know. I just wanted him to come. Lavender. Hermione stopped. What could she say? The more she warned the girl of Malfoy, the more Lavender would defend him. But Hermione had to say something. She was feeling guilty about her comments at Potions. She'd been trying to deter Malfoy from flirting with Lavender, but ended up making everything worse. She tried again. Look, Lavender, I don't think Malfoy's evil. I never did. But he's cold and conceited, snide, conniving, irritating. Do you really need that? But he's so handsome. Not when he's sneering. He doesn't sneer that much anymore. Marnie considered this. She had to admit the man had banked down the sneering and name-calling. His arresting of the first years had been more mischievous than anything. Still, that didn't make him boyfriend material. You would really snog a person like that just because he's handsome, Hermione asked. Lavender nodded and giggled. Well then, best of luck, Hermione said. Don't come to me crying when he breaks your heart. Lavender's eyebrows pinched together. You're jealous. He's much more handsome than Ron. You seem to think Ron handsome enough in sixth year. That's it, you're jealous. You're so mad about Ron and now you want to ruin this for me. Hermione sniffed. I don't have to ruin it for you. Malfoy will ruin it just fine without my help. Don't you dare! Levina stopped as she and Armani suddenly realized their voices had gotten a little loud. Everyone is listening to us catfight about Ron and Malfoy. Brilliant! Hermione stood. Do what you want! She turned to the wide-eyed crowd around her. I'm going to bed. If her life kept up like this, she'd be going to bed right after dinner every night. Hermione, Ron said. It's all right, she said, smiling. Really? With the final glare for Lavender, who had tears in her eyes now, the little moron, she headed up the stairs. Chapter 8. Fiducia. Today, Slughorn announced, we will be brewing the Fiducia potion. Hermione's pulse leaped. Finally, something interesting. Can anyone tell me the primary effect of Fiducia? The professor asked. Trust, Malfoy drawled. When ingested, it makes a person trust everyone they meet. Hermione glared as she put her hand back down. Yes, it's ten points to Slytherin, Slughorn said. And as such, Fiducia is categorized as an official controlled substance by the Ministry of Magic, along with Veritaserum, the truth-telling concoction. 
It is also an excellent introduction to time brewed potions. Can anyone define a time brewed potion? It is a potion brewed under strict timing schedules. The miner recited glibly, resigned to this new world order. It is not merely enough to add the ingredients in the right order, they must also be added at particular times. Very good, ten points to Gryffindor. Sarkon waved his wand and a list of ingredients appeared on the board. Brewing a successful fiducia requires practice and exceptional teamwork, so I do not expect anyone to succeed in their first try. Today we will do a few quick runs, just to familiarize ourselves with the recipe, before attempting it throughout the next week. The professor's bushy eyebrows drew down. I should not have to say this to advanced patient student, but anyone found in possession of fiducia outside class will be severely punished. This is very powerful magic. Who can tell? Because the trust isn't earned, Hermione cut in. Sarkon looked irritated. Good, she thought. This is why we should use proper recitation procedures. This magic creates something that does not exist because real trust must be earned. That is ridiculous, Merv objected. There are plenty of fools who trust anybody without the help of a patient. Hermione shrugged. Somebody created the trust, even if he or she isn't a recipient of it. The trust was still earned. And the trust can be lost, he said darkly, and regained again. That would be even more difficult, he said. Yes, yes, such a complex topic and potion, Slughorn boomed. And you can see why its preparation and possession is strictly controlled. Time to begin. What the hell was that? Ron asked her mighty hoarsely as Malfoy and Lavender left to fetch ingredients. I don't know what you mean, she answered, taking off her watch and sticking it to the wall beside her. She fished a hair tie out of her rope pocket and pulled her curls into a messy bun out of her way. You and him, Ron waved his hands vaguely, talking. We were debating a class topic, Ronald. The miner poured a cup of rainwater into her cauldron and lit it under the fire with her wand. Lavender chats up Malfoy every day. Why don't you bother her? Hermione? Ron said, lowering his voice. Why are you trying to keep it from Malfoy? She stared at him. I really need to explain that. The man's trouble on wheels. Of course she should stay away from Malfoy. Everyone should stay away from Malfoy. Shit, I didn't mean that. She looked back at her cauldron, and of course, there he was, holding tray bottles, his eyes cold. Malfoy, I... Step one, Granger, was all he said. Malfoy, I... Step one, he said through clenched teeth. What is it? Lavender asked, stepping up with her own tray. Draco, you look a bit tense. Is she bothering? Step one. Hermione said crisply. Three teaspoons of booba tuba pus on my mark. Three, two, one. Murphy dropped in the pus and nodded. Hermione began counting backward from thirty as he swiftly weighed the doxy eggs and poured them into a small plate. Four, three, two, one, mark, she said. Murphy tipped a plate into the cauldron. Stir three times in five, four. The potion was maddeningly intricate, but its very complexity soothed Hermione's and Malfoy's nerve. This recipe meant brewing a poly juice potion look like mixing lemonade. There was no room for lapses in concentration, and they quickly fell into a rhythm, with each one knowing what the other needed without speaking. Ron and Lavender, on the other hand, ran into trouble early on. Lavender kept adding the wrong ingredients and dribbling booba tuba pus on herself. Ron constantly messed up the timing and ended up just yelling random numbers. Three times the pair had to vanish their cauldron's contents and start over, and their efforts quickly degenerated into squabbling over the recipe and fighting over the spoon. To stay focused amid the mayhem, at the other end of the table, Hermione and Malfoy bent their heads closely together as they worked. They had hit the part of the brewing process requiring simultaneous adding of ingredients, which could get a little tricky. Hermione had to maintain her count and dropped her eel eyes and not grass leaves at the same time, while Malfoy had his hands full just keeping the ingredients sorted while pouring his lineup of vials into the cauldron at regular intervals. At times, Hermione felt they were even breathing in sync and her heart began skipping beats. He was very close. It was a relief when they began to synchronize stirring. It was a little confusing with two spoons, but still easier. Hermione leaned back and caught Malfoy's eye with a smile and his lips curved slightly. Hermione blinked and almost dropped her spoon. Instead, she clutched it more tightly and tried to say it with her eyes. I didn't mean it. 
Malfoy's smile faded, but his face looked less implacable than before. Last ingredient, Hermione said, and Malfoy nodded. He mixed dragon's blood and flubberware mucus in a small vial and handed it to Hermione. Me? she asked. Almost imperceptibly, he nodded again. She glanced at a second hand on her watch, chanting, Three, two, one, then tipped a vial into the cauldron. And nothing happened. Hermione and Malfoy stared down at the mixture, then at each other, dumbstruck. Malfoy's face darkened and Hermione flushed. If Jay had done all of that for nothing. Just wait, you two, said a quiet voice. Sarkon stood beside the table, holding his huge magic pocket watch, and the whole class was silent and staring. Just wait. And the cauldron's liquid began to swirl, green and pink, like a confused and angry aromatous potion. Then an intricate pattern appeared on the surface, like that of a brocade curtain. The patient's surface stilled. Well done, Slughorn said. Now we test it. How? Malfoy asked. Hmm. Oh, Mr. Weasley, please point your wand at Mr. Malfoy. Slughorn said, a rare smirk on his broad face. For the first time, Hermione could see why the man was head of Slytherin House. Ron nearly fell over in his haste to get his wand out of his pocket, and he pointed it at Malfoy with what Hermione considered a very unattractive smile. Professor Slughorn, she began. Now, Mr. Malfoy, Slughorn said, I need you to place both hands on the table and let Mr. Weasley here tap you on the nose with his wand. Smothered laughter spread throughout the class. Malfoy raised an eyebrow. That, Professor, is simply not happening. Slughorn's eyebrow rose. Are you saying you don't trust Mr. Weasley to tap your face with his wand? If I had my way, I wouldn't trust Weasley with a wand at all. Mm, Professor, let Ron tap my face instead. Hermione said nervously. Somebody was going to get hexed here. Inadequate test. Mr. Weasley is your friend. Of course you trust him. Malfoy, then, she said in exacerbation. All signs indicate that you may trust Mr. Malfoy even more, Slughorn said. Murmurs rippled through class at that, and Ron's hand on his wand tightened. Mr. Malfoy, I insist, Slughorn said, once again that steel creeping into his voice. Frowning, Malfoy dipped a vial into the green and pink pattern and took a swig. Hermione bit her lip. It was an act of courage, she thought, for Malfoy, who by all appearance had trusted no one to leave himself open this way. Ask permission, Slughorn told Ron quietly. Can I? Can I tap your nose? Ron stammered, who had picked up on some of the tension. Malfoy was still frowning. Yes? Do you trust him to do that? Slughorn asked. Malfoy laid his hands on the table. As incompetent as Weasley is in all other respects, I trust him to carry out this simple task without an incident. Hermione couldn't help but smile. Fiducia and still trust, it didn't change personalities. His hand trembled slightly. Ron tapped his wand slightly on Malfoy's nose and pulled it back. The whole class broke into applause, although it wasn't clear whether they were clapping for Ron, Malfoy, or the potion. How long do the effects last? Hermione asked Lacan. Uh, about an hour, most likely. Slughorn said. He clapped a hand on Malfoy's shoulder. Well done. With twenty points of Slytherin, you will remain here with me until I'm convinced the effect has faded. He turned to the rest of the class. Miss Malfoy and Miss Granger have achieved something remarkable today. I've never before seen a fiducia brood perfectly on a first attempt. Fifty more points to Slytherin and fifty to Gryffindor. Slughorn walked back to his desk and faced the class again. No. Fiducia is not only a time-sensitive potion, it is what we call a circumstantial mixture. Its potency depends on the circumstances under which it was brewed. Only under conditions of complete trust between its brewers can this potion be created properly. Hermione sighed. The whole class was staring at her Malfoy now, and Ron scowled. So I trust Malfoy as a potions partner. Big deal. Class dismissed, Sarkon said, setting off a scramble to clear tables and vanished failed potions. J.K., Lavender said, moving closer. Would you like me to? Head off to your next class, Miss Brown, Slughorn called from his deck. Mr. Malfoy is not himself. Malfoy looked at him gratefully. She has class too, Lavender said, with a venomous look at Hermione. Yes, Hermione said, clearing the table with a wave of her wand. She picked up her books and eyed Malfoy for a moment. He looked straight ahead, hands folded, mouth a thin line. Are you leaving or not? Lavender snapped. Hermione didn't answer, just swept out of the room and down the corridor towards Arithmancy.
When Jenny joined Ron and Hermione for dinner that evening, she was quivering with excitement. Well, she did it, Jenny said. She fucking did it. Astoria Greengrass has handed the Coinage Cup to Gryffindor this year. Hermione blinked. Do you mean... Yes, Jenny cried. Guess who the next Slytherin seeker is. If you guessed a certain form of Death Eater with a DT complex, you'd be wrong. If you guessed a mouthy six-year who couldn't find a snitch with a compass, you'd be right. Yes. She and Ron gave each other high fives. So if they get right, Ron said. Bro, he wasn't that good anyway. Oh, he was brilliant, Jenny said. Monty tainted for Lady Astoria. Jenny loathed the young green grass. Hermione stood. I have to go to the library. You can't, Ron cried. Jenny wasn't here at lunch and we haven't told her what happened in potions. Jen, I poked Malfoy in the nose with my wand this morning and he couldn't do a thing about it. No, Jenny cried. I was there, Never said. I saw it. Malfoy and Hermione cooked up this insane potion and I poked him in the nose, Ron shouted. And he let you, Jenny asked. Well, there was this potion, as I said, Never put in. It's brew to inspire. Hey, it is more story. Ron cried. Well, you haven't said anything except I poked Malfoy in the nose, Jenny complained. Hermione took advantage of the bickering to leave the great hall and run down to the potions dungeons. Professor Suckon, she asked, sticking her head in. Miss Granger? Suckon opened his arms wide, then clasped his hands together. I'm afraid the other half of the medical duo is no longer here. He refused to throw me his wand only an hour ago, saying I was too clumsy to catch it. He beamed at her. I must say, I was relieved. I thought we'd be here into the night. Such a strong potion. Hermione got straight to the point. Professor, I saw you at the Slytherin Quidditch trials last night. Have you seen the final roster? Slughorn raised his eyebrows and nodded. Hermione almost squirmed under his gaze. Didn't the captain's choice of Seekers seem a little odd? She asked. Not at all, dear, Slughorn said. So you believe her choice of Seeker was... The best one? Sarkon frowned. Seekers are often chosen for reasons beyond simple athletic ability, especially in Slytherin House. A circumstance, I am told, that Mr. Malfoy himself has taken advantage of. The money nodded, remembering how Malfoy's father had once bought him a spot on the Slytherin team. She doubted Lucius would be sending any brooms from Azkaban this year. I'm surprised a head of house would allow one of his students to be ostracized like this, she pushed on. Sarkon leaned back in his seat, hands on his round belly, and looked at her, watery blue eyes sympathetic. Oh, I find this touching, Miss Ranger, I really do. But I cannot interfere with Captain Greengrass. Hermione huffed and crossed her arms. It isn't fair, though. Really, Miss Granger? Many would consider it extremely fair. Sarkon shook his head. You cannot change facts. Mr. Malfoy has done irreparable harm to this school, albeit for understandable reasons. While he never took a life personally... How many were injured or killed due to his actions? Many students here have lost friends and family during the war, including yourself. Mr. Malfoy is entitled to return here and finish his education safely and without harassment in the hopes that he will become a productive member of the wizarding community. I myself have great hopes for him, but he is not entitled to be a Quidditch seeker. He himself knows this, and you, my dear girl, know it as well. Hermione dropped her eyes and her arms. She fiddled with the sleeve of her robe. Sakon was right, of course. Monty hadn't seen Malfoy practice every morning. You are right, sir, she said, raising her head again. I apologize for disturbing you. Quite all right, quite all right, he said. Your heart is in the right place, eh? Hermione had her towards the door, feeling a strange heaviness in her chest. Honestly, she scolded herself, what are you doing? It's just a stupid Quidditch spot. Oh, Miss Granger, she turned to see Slughorn beaming at her. I was quite pleased to hear that eighth-year Slytherins are invited to the Gryffindor soiree tomorrow night. Stop by my office beforehand, hmm? I may have a contribution to make. Hermione stared at him in shock, then found her manners. You are welcome to attend as well, sir, she said. Oh, oh, oh. perhaps another time. Perhaps we arrived as old slug club, eh? The professor twinkled at her like a demented beardless Santa Claus in black robes. See you tomorrow. Chapter 9 Gryffindor Party, Part 1 No, Jenny pulled yet another dress out of Hermione's wardrobe. No, 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 definitely no. She held up the dress from Bill and Fleur's wedding. Maybe. No, Hermione said from her position at the windowsill. Jenny had dragged her straight up the dorm after breakfast on Saturday to look at suitable party clothes. 
Ginny eyed the dress, head tilted. We could lop off the sleeves, change the colour, load neckline. No, you're right. Wait a minute. She tossed the dress aside and held up a red skirt. This will do, she said, shortening the hem with a wave of her wand. I have a great top for this. One second. Ginny pulled out a dark gold heart top. Perfect. She looked at Hermione mischievously. For your date tonight. Hermione shook her head. It's not a date. And if I show up in that, it will look like a date, and I'm having enough trouble with one. Ginny laughed. You could show up in a Weasley sweater and he'd think it's a date. My brother, he's a bit thick. And what about the party? You want all those glossy Slytherins out shining you? Looking out the window over the Quidditch pitch, Hermione considered this. She really didn't. Oh, Ginny said, pulling out another dress. And look what I'll be wearing. Hermione blinked. The gauzy material in Ginny's hand was a shocking green. We have to be welcoming to our guests, don't we? Ginny went on, holding the wisp of clothes to herself in the mirror. You are certainly embracing inter-house unity, Hermione said. I'm considering it, Ginny answered wickedly. Ron will hate it. Another plus, Ginny said, and Hermione couldn't help but love with her. Hermione spent the rest of the day in the library, not even going to the Great Hall for dinner since she'd be dining later with Ron. She almost lost track of time reading Potion Failures and Fatalities Through the Ages. Fascinating. Who knew that a person could be sucked into a potion like that? Maybe Slughorn would let her develop some ideas after school. The fiducia had whetted her appetite. She even tied with the idea of asking Malfoy to assist. But no, that wouldn't do. He just tried to take over. Bossy people were so annoying. Returning to her dormitory, Hermione walked into total chaos. Lavender had spotted Ginny's dress hanging from the wardrobe door and hit the roof since she'd planned to wear green herself to entice a certain hard to get Slytherin. Ginny refused to change her plans, contending that it would take more than a Slytherin colour to beg a Malfoy. Face it, Lev, Ginny lectured, pointing an empty hanger at her roommate. And I say this as a friend. Malfoy has always had a very specific type. Slutty, gorgeous, rich, pure blood, bitch. And just because none of them will talk to him right now doesn't mean he'll take up with a Gryffindor. He might be down, but he'll come up on top. People like that always do. Give it a year and Astora will be begging for an invite to the manor. I don't want to marry him, Ginny, Lavender went. He's just so handsome. You want to sneak around the castle corners with him, Ginny asked, because that's all you'll get at most. Sounds pretty bleak to me. Sounds pretty bleak to Hermione too. She didn't say a word, just dropped off her books and left to take a shower to avoid hearing any more. Leave it to Ginny to sum up everything unsuitable about Malfoy in a few trenchant sentences. The redhead's years of pinning after Harry had left her with a very cynical view of men. Still, Malfoy did kind of defy easy analysis. And Lavender knew little about men too. Something about Malfoy was reeling her in. Hermione considered this as she combed detangling solutions through her hair. He didn't appear interested, but really, his personality was such a Russian nesting doll. Who knew what the man really thought? If Hermione had to guess, she'd said Lavender inspired some very thin, kind streak in the man. Lavender was so needy. She could feed off one short burst of Malfoy megawatt attention for days. Hermione had seen the man in action and it could be blinding. It must be on your person. It isn't. I don't believe you. Hermione frowned at herself in a bathroom steamy mirror. Stop it, you should be thinking about Ron. But she was sick of thinking about Ron. Like Ginny, she'd spend too much time thinking about a boy with too little result. She was simply tapped out. She had to tell Ron. She had to tell him tonight. Levina saw reason at last and laid out her purple lace dress. Hermione donned her skirt and top and Ginny helped her tame her hair. Well, not tame, but at least contained, twisting the curls up and firmly attaching them with a large gold and ruby clip. Perfect, she thought, looking in the mirror. The very picture of an unsuitable Gryffindor. She even transformed the beads on her extendable bag into red and gold. Hermione shook the little bag, listening to the echoes. Last time I used this bag, it contained a whole library, plus a painting of Phineas Nicholas Black. She and Ginny exchanged a grimace. Neither liked to think about those days when Hermione, Harry and Ron had been on the run. Lavender fingered a deep, bite-shaped scar behind her ear and sighed. Ginny finally pronounced Hermione ready for her grand entrance, sending her down the staircase alone. 
It was a wasted effort, since Ron wasn't there, but she attracted a fair number of looks and low whistles. Then she cooled her high heels for a good twenty minutes before Ron clambered down the boy's stairs, climbing Quidditch practice ran along. He looked surprisingly spruced up, actually, his long hair brushing the collar of his dark blue shirt. It was odd seeing Ron in something other than a rumpled uniform, Quidditch jersey or Weasley sweater. Jenny should have been up there, he told Hermione as she struggled into her cloak unaided. We developed this new strategy with the chasers. Ron wanted to take the Marauder's Passage to Honeyduke's cellar, but Hermione didn't fancy wobbling through a tunnel in heels, so they headed down to the castle entrance to catch a carriage to Hogsmeade. Ron kept up the Quidditch chatter as they descended the marble staircase into the entrance hall. It's a variation of the Hawkshead formation where... The double doors leading to the Great Hall were tightly shut. The hall itself had emptied after dinner. Nerva was standing by the doors with a woman draped in green. She was nearly as tall as he, and her blonde hair glittered with diamonds. Hermione halted, wrapping her dark red cloak more tightly round herself as she recognized the delicate profile. Narcissa Malfoy. The elegant witch laid a black gloved hand topped with a square emerald ring on her son's shoulder. Malfoy was frowning with concern, and Narcissa placed her other hand over one of his clenched fists. Go on, Draco dear, Narcissa said. I'll wait here for you. Ron recognized Lady Malfoy as well. Well, look at that, he said gleefully. Only a week, and Malfoy already needs his mummy. His voice carried easily in the hall, and Malfoy looked over at them. His frown replaced with dark fury, then turned away. And how many oars have you sent Molly so far, Ronald? Hermione asked, equally loud, quoting his last letter to his mother. Dear Mum, can you send over my broom polishing kit and extra underwear? The Malfoys ignored them. Ron glowered as they left the castle. You have a right sharp tongue this year, Hermione, he said. It wasn't until they were seated upstairs at the three broomsticks above the noisier pop section that Ron dialed into Hermione's general appearance. You look hot, he whispered, running one hand up her bare arm by grabbing a breadstick with the other. Hermione leaned back into her chair. Friends, Ronald, just friends. Ron waggled his eyebrows, looking much like Fred and George. For now, right? Hermione shook her head. I don't see much chance of it changing. Boy, you said. I know, I was wrong. She shook her head again. I love you, you know that, but not. There is someone else, isn't there? Who is it? No, Ronald. Then why not me for now? Ron put down the breadstick and took her hand. I know I'm rubbish at this stuff. I know you deserve better, but give me a chance. We have to thump over the back of her hand. She pulled her hand away. No. We can't date just because there aren't other people in our lives. How are we to find anybody else that way? Oh, I don't want anybody else, Ron said stubbornly. Since fourth year it's been you, even if I didn't know it. I don't know how to love anybody else. You can learn, Hermione said. I don't want to learn. Hermione's patience was starting to fray. Well, frankly, I'm not too keen on your way of loving me anyway. Your idea of love is to pass judgment on every little thing I do. And Goderick, help me if you don't understand it or resent it in some way. Ron's face grew dark. Why, excuse me for caring. Who else is there? Not one bloke in this school is good enough for you. And maybe I'm not either, but are you really going to throw all this away? What's the all this you speak of? Hermione asked, waving her hand between them. We hardly spend any time together. Because you're always in a sodding library. You're always on a quidditch pitch. You'll never pass your newts if you don't study. I'll be fine if you just help me. Hermione glared at him over her butterby glass. I don't have hours to walk you through your assignments, Ronald. I have my own work, and maybe I'd like to do something else with my free time, like brew some experimental potions. And I want to go on dates, real dates, mind you, not just sit around the Gryffindor common room waiting for you to finally take me to dinner. Practice ran along, Merlin's boss. I thought I'd lose you to Harry if I lost you to anyone. Now you're going to throw me over to play the field? Hermione Granger going around with just any guy? You're really going to stoop to that? What will people say? That's enough, Ronald, she said, clasping her hands on her lap to stop them trembling. I'm not some war harrowing goddess or genius brain. So what if I'm a little reckless? I deserve a little fun, and I don't need you looking over my shoulder. What? You're going to be reckless with men? One isn't good enough for you? One's face was red now, and his mouth had a very ugly twist. She blinked at him, considering the question. Well, he prodded, Hermione. I don't know, she said. 
Maybe. All right, then, he said, throwing down his napkin and standing. I'll leave you to it. You can pick up some right good prospects here. You're certainly dressed for it. Hermione's hands clenched. You're disgusting. Don't think I'll take you back after some bloke treats you like shit either. He snapped, wagging a finger down at her. All men are like that, you know. I'm counting on that. She hissed up at him. Ron shook his head. I knew it. My mum was right about you all along. Shrugging into his wool cloak, he turned and left the upstairs landing. Hermione turned in her chair to watch his bright red head move through the crowd and out of the door. I won't cry. This is what I wanted. I won't cry. After the row with Ron and the cold walk back to Hogwarts by herself, the last thing Hermione wanted to do was slog down to the dungeons and collect Slughorn's contribution to the party. But she had given her word, so she wrapped her cloak more tightly around her and headed towards the potion classroom. Slughorn's contribution turned out to be a bottle of good fire whiskey, and Hermione now considered the time well spent. She was certainly ready for something stronger than butterbeer. She also took the opportunity to chat with Slughorn about experimental potions, and the potions master was enthusiastic. As a professor, of course I cannot officially condone experimental potions, he said with a wink. However, if you would like to brew a bit of something for extra credit, there's a splendid little potions lab beyond the storage cupboard. Hermione smiled her thanks and left, stuffing the fire whiskey bottle into her beaded bag. On the seventh floor, she ducked into a prefect's bathroom, password courtesy of Ginny, to survey the damage from hours of hiking along dusty paths, winding stairways and musty corridors. Her hair had held up surprisingly well, but she took the time to freshen her makeup and place a cool washcloth on the back of her neck. The prospect of facing a common room full of Slytherins and Gryffindors felt overwhelming. Well, she had to make an appearance. People were probably wondering about her, and she wouldn't let Ron scare her away. Charity and love, she told Fat Lady with a smile. Very good, dear, the portrait said and swung open. The common room was packed with people. Nearly all the Gryffindor seventh and eighth years were there, and some suspiciously younger-looking students as well. The scene was spiced with a sprinkling of eighth-year Slytherins, the men in suits, the women in sheathed dresses, with jewels in their smooth tresses. The Gryffindors partied in everything from jeans and t-shirt to dress robes. Hermione! Ginny shouted, charging over. Hermione blinked at her best friends as she shed her cloak. Ginny's dress was more than a little short, and was that blaze of beanie lingering behind her? Ron was nowhere to be seen. Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas were handing out drinks, and Neville was dancing with Romilda Vane, who wore a red dress as short as Ginny's. Dennis Creevy stood half in the shadow, glowering at the Slytherins. I brought a contribution from Slughorn, Hermione said, pulling out the bottle of fire whiskey. Sabine reached out a long arm and plucked it from her hand. Mmm, Octon's very nice. Sabinis placed the bottle on the table and opened it with a tap of his wand. Three fat glasses appeared in his other hand. You must forgive Sabini here, Ginny said to Hermione. He likes to play the host even when I reserve the common room and you bring the liquor. You too provide the beauty as well, Sabini said as he handed around drinks. Cheers. Ron came through early like a freight train, Ginny went on. Tried to run down Malfoy, but Malfoy wasn't having it. Malfoy took a surprisingly dim view of Ron leaving you at Hogsmeade to make your way back alone, and Ron took a dim view of being taught menace by Malfoy. Malfoy was here, Hermione was surprised. He was, Sabini said, brought a lovely bottle of 1952 siren scotch, but few partook. Ginny drained her drink. Malfoy left after that, Lavender's still moping. Sabini refilled Ginny's glass. There is something to be said for Intel's unity. Gryffindors bring a certain energy to the festivities. And what do Slytherin Springs, Zabini? Hermione asked. Decent liquor. Hermione nodded. Help me up there, will you? she asked. Zabini responded immediately, setting down his glass and helping her to stand on the couch. Whistles broke out among the crowd. To enter house unity, Hermione said loudly, raising her glass. To new friends and old. A sea of hands holding bottles and glasses instantly shot onto the air, followed by clicking and cheering. It was a lovely sight, really. Ginny and Zabini were now dancing by the staircase, and Neville was talking to Pansy Parkinson, who wore a dress of watery green silk and two jade sticks in her dark hair. A silver flash caught the edge of Hermione's eyesight, and she turned to see Draco Malfoy enter through the portrait hall, dressed in a black suit, shirt, and tie. He looked heartily around the room, 
brushing an invisible speck off his arm, and one eyebrow rose slightly when he saw Hermione standing on the sofa. He tipped a scotch bottle in his hand toward her, a subtle greeting. Lavender immediately rushed over to meet him. Sipping her drink, Hermione watched the pair silently, adding her own dialect to the scene. Lavender. Oh, Draco, you're here again! Malfoy. Yes, I'm completely baffling this year. Lavender. Oh, Draco, you're so funny! Malfoy. I'm really not, and I rarely appreciate real humour in ancient rudeness essays. Lavender. Oh, Draco, tell me what a rudeness is. Malfoy. I'll do better than that. I'll take you to Malfoy Manor, where unpaid house elves paint the entrance in runes, spelling out Elves of the World Unite for Better Conditions. What are you doing? Ginny hissed up at her. Uh, what? Hermione looked down from her perch, startled. You're staring at Malfoy Lavender and cackling dementedly, Ginny said. Her hair was mussed, her eyes were bright, and Zabini was right behind her. I just think it's funny, Hermione said, sipping her drink. The fire whiskey seemed to smolder in her veins. Here you come, scene two. What are you? Oh, Ginny turned to see Ron lurching drunkenly down the staircase. You Weasleys cannot hold your liquor, Hermione said, taking a larger sip. A common trait of most Gryffindors, Zabini said. We'd better head him off, Ginny said. Come on, Blaze. Yes, go on, Blaze, Hermione said with a grin. The Slytherin raised an eyebrow at her, then trailed Ginny as if he'd planned to go that way all along. Hermione looked back at the portrait hall, but Malfoy and Lavender were gone. Pavati Patil had dragged Lavender away, and Malfoy, she saw, now leaned against the wall tapestry opposite Hermione's sofa. He stood alone below a flickering torch, shining in the reflected glow, no one else daring to enter his ring of yellow light. Malfoy had a glass in his hand and his bottle on the table beside him, but the grey eyes holding hers were stone sober. Need a little help? asked a voice below her. Hermione nearly tumbled off the sofa. Harry? No. The man below her had similar green eyes, dancing with mischief, and his black hair stuck up on end. But this Harry was immaculately dressed in a black suit with an emerald shirt and tie. His messy hair was an artful arrangement, and there was no glasses on his long nose. Theodore not, Hermione said faintly. She didn't know how the Slytherin was returning this year. Theo, please, he said with a smile. Into house unity, after all. Oh, Hermione, then she said absently. The man looked awfully chipper for someone whose family was weaving baskets in Azkaban. Maybe that was why he was chipper. Not Senior had been recently executed. Nott's imprisoned uncles were a pack of rabbit dogs. Despite such a background, no whisper of scandal had ever clung to Theo, who claimed ignorance of everything. The money doubted that, but you can't help your family. Theo had managed to avoid the worst of the war, packing himself off to his grandmother in Germany during seventh year. The Slytherin was looking amused now, and Hermione realized she'd been staring down at him while she mentally reviewed his dossier. She blushed. Welcome back to Hogwarts, Theo, she said politely. When did you arrive? This morning, he looked around the crowded common room. <laughs> Perfect timing. His eyes met hers. And here I am by the sofa. Again, perfect timing. I was going to look for you anyway, Hermione. Why? He waved a wide hand, studded with a silver and onyx signet ring. Hosts of reason, most of which I won't admit to, he said. But you're the brightest witch of your age. Why would I seek you out? Because you're a week late to school and need to catch up, she asked. Why not ask Zabini? Theo smirked. Hopeless. Parkinson? Even more hopeless. Hermione grinned. Malfoy? The Dark Prince himself ought soon to fail. Theo's smile widened. Let me help you down, Hermione. I'm getting a crick in my neck looking up at you. Welcome to my world. Hermione hated being short. Thank you. I like your world. Hermione glanced over at Malfoy again. Yes, still there, still alone, still drinking, and still staring. Definitely time to get off this sofa. She held out her hand, but Theo set down his drink and grasped her around the waist with both hands instead, setting her down with easy strength. He was broader framed than Harry, with a deeper chest. His faint five o'clock shadow made him look too old to be a student. Theo kept one hand on her waist, and the music and laughter flowed around them. One dance, he said, taking her right hand. For interhouse unity. Hermione laughed, and suddenly it felt very natural to be dancing with Theodore Nott in Gryffindor's common room, giggling at his quips and trying not to spill her drink. Maybe this year would be fun after all. Alas, it couldn't last.
They danced and twirled through a few songs, and then Theo spun her around, and they almost crashed into a run, standing alone and rigid in front of the boy's staircase. He glared at Theo. Get away from her, he said. Gryffindor Party, Part 2 Oh, pardon me, Theo said with an easy smile for Ron. The Slytherin slid to a halt, his hand still on Hermione's waist. A ripple ran through the Gryffindor common room as people slowed and turned to watch. Even the bouncy music from the room's magical phonograph faded away. You stop that right now, Ron growled, ignoring the sudden audience. Yes, Theo, stop dancing with me and being polite to my friends, Hermione said. Ron's eyes narrowed. Oh, Theo, is it? That's right. Theo looked him up and down, unimpressed. And you're Rick, right? Rob? Roy! Hermione giggled again. That fire whiskey really was some kind of strong. And Ron pulled out his wand. Now, mate, let's not. Theo began, his smile a little sad. You're leaving, Theo, Ron said. Theo released Hermione and moved in front of her, slipping a hand into her suit coat. Hermione rolled her eyes and stepped in front of Theo again. She pulled out her wand and pointed it at her ex-boyfriend. He is not leaving and perhaps he'd like to duel me, Ronald, she said. Hermione! She didn't move. Yes! Oi! Oi! Ron carelessly waved his wand, prompting two Gryffindors to abandon their drunken game of wizarding chess to scuttle out of the way. The room was so silent that Hermione could hear the board's tiny black queen shouting at them to return. Ron stepped closer. Hermione? When will you learn, Ron? Repeating a woman's name won't make her do what you want, she snapped. It works for me, said Zabini, who had materialized behind Theo. Shut up, Blaze, she heard Ginny say. Well, it does. Really, Hermione? Ron asked, glaring at Theo. That's what we're going to sort with, a Slytherin. Why don't you just snort the Death Eater? Into house unity, after all, she heard Malfoy say brightly. Oh, that's it, Ron snarled. He threw aside his wand and lunged sideways at Malfoy, swinging a fist. Malfoy dodged him with a daft movement, only to face Dennis Creevy. The small Gryffindor now stood beside the staircase, his feet planted wide and warmed up. Steep! Dennis' voice was cut off mid-hags as he was flung off his feet, crashing into the wall behind him. Hermione ran and knelt beside the fifth year as he groggily sat up. Even Ron was frozen in shock. Dennis, what were you thinking? She scolded. You shouldn't even be here. No fucking death eater threw me! Dennis gasped, glaring at Malfoy from under his dark bangs. Nonsense, Hermione said. He didn't even have his wand out. Can you move your arms? Well, uh, something. All right, everybody, that's enough! Ginny shouted, sounding eerily like Molly Weasley. Ron, Dennis, Malfoy, all three of you will behave or you'll leave this party now. Dennis stood up, pulling his arm from Hermione's grasp. Fine, he sped, like I'd want to stay here with a lot of twisted pure-blood bitches and assholes. That's enough, Dennis, Hermione said calmly. Then a sneer reminded her of Malfoy's at the same age. Oh yes, you're having a right good time flirting with snakes, aren't you, Hermione? Easy to forget, is it? I haven't forgotten anything, she said. We're all just trying to live our lives. Yeah, he said bitterly. Well, some people don't get the chance. Dennis gave Malfoy a last filthy look and stomped up the stairs towards the boys' dormitories. Ron stomped off in the opposite direction, shouting at the fat lady about letting in snakes, and Romilda Vane stumbled after him. Hermione stood clutching her wand as someone straightened the table and the music began once more. I like Gryffindor parties, she heard Pansy Parkinson say. Hermione's eyes met Malfoy's. He was still standing near the stairs, his mouth twisted slightly. Theo stepped into Hermione's view, and she blinked and cleared her throat. I'm sorry about Ron, she told Theo, sliding her wand into her skirt's magically expanded pocket. He's... Nothing to apologize for. You defended my honor. Theo took her hand and swept her back into the dance. The Gryffindor's magic phonograph was playing a jazzy tune, but Theo led them in a graceful twirl. My hero, he whispered in her ear. You talk a lot of nonsense, Theo, do not? Hermione said with a smile. Oh, I do, I do. Theo moved away from the staircase, continuing their dance. Without a drink to juggle, Hermione placed a hand on his shoulders, feeling the rich clothes of his suit coat. Up close, 
She could see a silk tire was stunned with tiny emeralds. These Slytherins. She tried to recapture the light-hearted feeling of their earlier dances, but it proved elusive, and Theo was looking back at the staircase, frowning slightly. I'm surprised to see Draco here, he said. At Hogwarts or at the party? Both. Theo looked into her face. Has he been bothering you? She shrugged. Define bother. Has he annoyed me and needled my friends? Yes. Has he viciously bullied me and called me mudblood? No. He's been somewhat well-behaved this year, like a half-drake god gnome. I can do something about him if you like. Hermione chuckled. I'd like to see anybody try to do anything about Draco Malfoy. Theo's eyes glittered. Is that a dare? No. Honestly, it's not worth it. And if you're going to be another run, then we can't be friends. Friends? Theo turned the words over on his tongue. Is that what we are? I hope so. Theo's hands at her waist moved up to lightly touch the bare skin of her back. No, I think not. Hermione couldn't help a slight shiver at the unexpected contact, but her voice remained steady. What are we, then? she asked. Acquaintances. Hermione eyed him with surprise. You'd rather be acquaintances than friends with me? Definitely. The song ended and Theo stopped dancing and released her. In fact, I've taken too much of your time. Thank you for a brilliant party. And thank Jenny too. You're leaving? she asked. I hope Ron didn't. He smiled at her. Certainly not. He lifted her hand and brushed his lips over her fingers. It's simply time to go. Good night, Hermione. She watched him turn and disappear through the portrait hall. She frowned. That was a tactical retreat if she'd ever seen one. Very smooth, very Slytherin. Theo didn't return to the party, so Hermione danced with Neville, then Seamus and Dean, trying to drink the Gryffindor's awful spiked punch. Ginny and Zabini had slipped out through the portrait hall, still retaining Slacon's bottle of fire whiskey. Neville left early, muttering about watering some seeds the next morning, before they woke up. Hermione switched to Butterbeer and continued dancing with abandon, keeping her distance from Malfoy. She expected him to leave. He certainly wasn't being social. He just withdrew to a shadowy corner, sipping a siren scotch with a trace of his old sneer. Lavender kept slinking over to Chad, leaning into him and patting his arm before her friends dragged her away again. Parkinson stopped by his corner to exchange a few sharp words, then stalked off, fuming. Everyone else avoided him. The crowd paired off into couples as the night wore on, and Hermione lost track of Malfoy. Seamus and Dean left to the portrait hall to smoke muggle cigarettes and came back with Ron between them, dragging him off to the boys' dorm. Lavender followed them soon after with a seventh-year Gryffindor boy, giggling loudly and trying to draw as much attention to herself as possible. As midnight drew near, Hermione kicked off her shoes and curled herself into a sofa by the fireplace to wait for Ginny, who still hadn't returned. That's a beanie ball watching. The lamp above the sofa flickered out, leaving her in shadow. She must have dozed off because when Hermione opened her eyes, the common room looked dim and empty. The phonograph now played a low, crooning tune, but she wasn't entirely alone. The Malfoy was seated across from her sofa in an armchair, drink in hand, long legs stretched out towards her, his head turned towards the dying fire, just staring at the flames. Hermione said nothing, instead watched his profile, the pointed line of his jaw, a slow flutter of thick, dark lashes. Firelight splashed across the pale skin. You're still here, she said finally, propping herself up on an elbow. Malfoy turned his head to face her, his gaze sweeping over her body, stretched out on the sofa. Obviously. He raised his wand slightly, and the lamp above her sputtered to life, yielding a dim glow. She blinked at him sleepily. Are you here to warn me against Theo? He shook his head. I should want Theo against you. He'll likely end up petrified. Only if he threatens me. I wasn't threatening you. Hermione sat up, yawning. Malfoy's eyes flickered to the wrinkled red skirt riding up her thigh. She tried to smooth it down, then gave up. Her hair was probably right mess, too. I was simply asking for the return of my rightful property. He continued. Once still in hand, he began dropping tiny ice cubes into his glass. Her eyes narrowed. You were demanding your property and walking toward me, Malfoy, threateningly. And so you took off your shirt and petrified me. 
He set down his wand and splashed more siren scotch into the glass. Do I frighten you that much? Certainly not. Malfoy set down the bottle and joined her on the sofa, drink still in hand. Hermione gave a huff of irritation. What? she asked, shifting away. You, Granger, are meddling know-it-all. And this surprises you? she asked, turning to face him. The fire reflecting in his eyes gave them a rather demonic sheen. His mouth quirked upward. No. The portrait hole creaked open, making them both jump. And the seventh-year couple tumbled through, holding hands and giggling. Hermione watched him climb the stairs, parting with a kiss, then turned back to Malfoy. He was lightly swirling his drink, watching the ice melt into the scotch. You brought a letter to the Wizengamot, defending it, my trial. He said softly, not looking at her. Hermione tried not to sigh. Clearly, she had an introspective drunk on her hands tonight. Malfoy had that brooding look she knew well from her month in the tent with Harry and the Horcrux. That letter to the Wizengamot was confidential, she said. How do you know about it? I have my ways. His face was all hard angles. You were quite eloquent, Granger. Especially the bit about how mercy wouldn't corrupt the wizarding world, but help redeem it. She shrugged uncomfortable. Maybe. Malfoy edged closer. You wrote that forgiving me would. How did you put it? Help turn our common suffering into hope for the future. His fingers tightened on his glass. I can't imagine how you could say that. I didn't, Nelson Mandela, Hermione said. Malfoy raised his eyebrows. A South African muggle statesman spoke out against prejudice and racism. He wrote, Our human compassion binds us, the one to the other, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who have learned how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. I included that quote in my letter. Malfoy shook his head in disbelief, his white blonde fringe falling into his eyes. He swiped the hair back impatiently, and his sharp gaze looked anything but drunk. So you, a muggle-born, courted a muggle-leader to help keep a pure-blood death-eater out of prison. Hermione shrugged again. It's positively mental, Malfoy snapped, placing his glass on an end table. How could you do that? Did you not remember the last time we'd met? In my own fucking drawing room where you were given this? He slid his hand up her bare arm, grasping her left elbow and pulling up her forearm where the angry letter spelling mudblood shone red in the firelight. His fingers lightly brushed against the raised ridges. Hermione swallowed. No one but a healer had ever touched her scars before. Look at that. The letters match my skirt, she quipped to cover her discomfort. Granger, he growled, I'd very much appreciate it if you take this conversation seriously. You throw around these righteous quotes with no thought to the consequences. How many dangerous criminals did you set free with your little games? Hermione suddenly felt quite serious. Well, now you'd sound just like Ron. He said the same thing. What are you defending Mare for? Why don't you try to free his father while you're at it? Or maybe Dolohov or Lestrange? She tucked her arm away. As if I am not capable of rational thought. Frankly, I'd say I'm a much better judge of character than either of you. Time and time again I have made unpopular decisions, and time and time again they've been proved right on. And yet every time I follow my own judgment, I get nothing but grief. Hermione pushed herself to her feet and glared down at him, hands on hips. When the hell is somebody going to trust me? Malfoy stared up at her, wide-eyed, silent for once. And anyway, she raved on, who better to defend you than a muggle-born with the words of a persecuted muggle? Your pure-bloods are our future, don't you see it? I was furious when the first-year Slytherins were booed at the sorting. Everybody thinks you lot should be cut out like a diseased limp, cut out of society and buried out of sight. That is all wrong. You all don't need to be cut out. You need to be healed. Hermione came to herself suddenly, her cheeks flaming and her vision blurred. She tried to calm down, a pretty thing it would be if she passed out in front of the men. Only Harry had heard these thoughts before, and while he'd agreed and testified for Malfoy and his mother, he had done so with great reluctance, and more likely out of love for her rather than any true conviction. Nerva was standing now as well, looking down at Hermione like he'd never seen her before. The only sounds in the room were her panting breaths and the snap and crackle of the fire. A loud groaning creak broke the tension, and Hermione looked around Malfoy's shoulder to see Ginny tiptoe through the portrait hole. Ginny froze and gave her a questioning look. Hermione nodded reassuringly, and Ginny climbed the staircase to their dorm, frequently looking back and stumbling slightly. 
Snaffer ignored Ginny's passage and returned to his bottle, dropping ice cubes into a second glass and pouring siren scotch. All right, then, he said, dismissing the entire topic with a wave of his hand. He handed the glass to Hermione and resumed his seat, suddenly all relaxed elegance. Come here, Granger, Malfoy said as if he owned the sofa. We have more to discuss. Hermione rolled her eyes but complied. Apparently Malfoy was running the agenda tonight. And people called her bossy. She took a sip of scotch, enjoying the rich, tingling taste. You talk to Slughorn about me, he began. About the Quidditch team. Yes, she admitted. Did you sneak that out too? Lucky guess, although Slughorn didn't deny it. Astoria posted a note in the Slytherin common room tonight, naming me the team's new seeker due to higher influences. Thrilling. Murphy leaned towards her, putting his hand on the sofa's back. I don't like this pattern, Granger, he said. I don't need you walking behind the scenes, pitying me, fixing things for me. I'm not one of your dim-witted friends, she snickered. Oh, please. I would never pity you, Malfoy. I pity those who have to deal with you, including myself. He grinned at that, and his hand on the sofa found a long, dark curve that had escaped her hair clip. Speaking of dears, I think we should make another. He said, eyes on the curve. He twined it around a pale finger and pulled it lightly. Hermione took a gulp of scotch. Lovely idea, because the last one worked so well. That was a bad deal, he murmured, moving closer. Don't try to blackmail people, Granger. That's not where your genius lies. Hermione tossed her head, pulling her curve free of his hand, and felt another chunk of hair slip out of the clip. Bother, she said, setting her glass down and trying fruitlessly to tame her curls again. What I wouldn't give for a decent hair clip. Malfoy leaned back, sipping his drink and watching her with a half-smile. Finally, she gave up, resting with her hair and faced him again. All right, what's this new deal? I will allow you access to the Codex and Runestone, he said. In return, let me work with you on those experimental potions you're planning. Slack on, Hermione breathed. Mad think. She turned over his proposal in her mind, gears whirring. It was easier to think when he wasn't touching her hair. Very well, she said crisply. If you allow me access to the Codex and the Runestone, you may assist me in my experimental patients. She bent to pick up her shoes and began wiggling her feet into them, feeling Malfoy's eyes on her. Deal, he said. Deal, Hermione stood, which brought Malfoy to his feet once more. She impulsively stuck out her hand, which she briefly shook in a businesslike way. No suggestive looks or brushing of lips. Slytherins did take their ideals seriously. His hand was large and warm, the palms surprisingly rough. She pulled her hand back. All right then, off you go, Malfoy. Party's over. Hermione walked toward the portrait hall, motioning to him to follow her. Torture, Quidditch, blackmail. She needed to end this conversation before Malfoy thought up another appalling discussion topic, like divination. Honestly, she was born to suffer. Granger, Malfoy said as he stepped through the open doorway. Nope, not done yet. Tell me. Why did you try to help me with the Quidditch team? He looked at her through the portrait hole, his face lit by the common room lamps. She eyed him warily, this pristine pure blood, now wearing an open expression she'd never seen before. Several sharp responses came to mind, but Hermione decided to be honest. I like to watch you fly, she said. Malfoy stared speechless for once, and Hermione shut the portrait hole in his face and headed up the dormitory stair. Chapter 11 Hangover Hermione was on a broomstick, flying higher than she ever had before, over the Black Lake. But she wasn't scared. The broom soared, and she wasn't controlling it. She was only a passenger. There was a solid warmth behind her, and she felt safe. Hermione, said a voice, low and urgent. Hermione! Uh -huh. She opened her eyes. She was spread-eagled on her bed, lying on her stomach, still in her skirt and gold halter top. Pavati was shaking her. Hermione! She sat up. What time is it? 7 a.m., Hermione. You have to come downstairs. Now. Why is Madame Hooch angry? And how the common room is a mess. You have to see, Pavati straightened. And bring your wand. Hermione's brain snapped to attention at that. Pavati's face was serious, and she was wearing her jogging shorts and sports bra. Her housemaid must have gone downstairs for her morning jog, the Patios were fitness freaks, and seen something. Hermione slid out of her bed, picked up her wand, and shoved her feet into fuzzy blue slippers. Ginny lay unmoving in her bed, still in her own party clothes. Lavender's bed was empty. Okay, Hermione said, let's go. 
They descended the staircase to the common room, flooded with morning sunlight that dazzled her bloodshot eyes and glinted off half-empty glasses and bottles. There, Pavati said, pointing to the wall to the right of the portrait hall. Hermione nearly fell off the last step, her mouth open. On the wall, in letters two feet high, were the dripping, rust colors words. Die, mudbloods! Hermione felt like she had been hexed, but was too shocked to feel anything. She almost dropped her wand, her hands trembled so badly. Who did this? She breathed. Slytherins, of course, Pavati said, her voice dripping with venom. We don't know that. We don't? Pavati turned and stared at her. We invite Slytherins to our common room for the first time in Hogwarts history, give them a password. Then, the next moment, we get that on our common room wall? Hermione drew closer to the wall, dripping rust-colored letters. Blood, she said softly. These letters are written in blood. Godric help us, Pavati whispered. Whose blood? No way to tell, Hermione said. Or was there? Should we raise it? Pavati raised her wand. No, Hermione said. There could be a megaborn out there. Hurt. She rubbed her forehead and tried to think past the pounding. Pavati, please go get McGonagall. Then Madame Hooch. We need all the heads of houses. Slytherin, too, Hermione nodded. Slytherin, especially. Pavati gave her a sideways glance, then ran out the portrait hall. Glad to have something to do. Looking around her and sure she was alone in the common room, Hermione transfigured an empty butterbee bottle into a potion vial. She approached the wall, nearly touching the last D in mud blood, with her wand. She waved the wand slightly, and a long drip stretching from the bottom of the D to the floor flew off the wall and into her vial, which filled with red blood. Now what? Hermione spotted her beaded back underneath the sofa she had dozed on last night. Where she lay well, Malfoy? No, it wasn't him. It wasn't. Shaking her head to clear it, Hermione summoned the back with her wand and tucked the vial inside. She had just slung the chain strap over her shoulder when McGonagall charged through the portrait hall, wearing a dressing gown and her black hat, wand held high. What's the danger? Are ye? The headmistress broke off when she saw Hermione, who was suddenly aware of her wrinkled clothes, crazy hair, and fluffy blue slippers. Hermione pointed at the wall. McGonagall gasped. <gasps> Is anyone hurt? I don't know, Hermione said. We need all the heads of houses to check on their students. Yes? McGonagall said, stepping closer to the letters. Blood, of course. The portrait hall swung open, revealing Madame Hooch, looking grim, dressed in her usual jersey and leathers. Early morning flight, or let the woman sleep in Quidditch gear. What is all this? Madame Hooch snapped, stepping in, followed by Pavati. The state of this? The head of house trailed off as her eyes fell on the letters. Miss Petil, please stand outside the portrait hall. Let no one but the heads of houses in. Pavati nodded and left. Madame Hooch, McGonagall went on, I need you to account for all your students. She glanced at the bloody letters, especially the Muggleborns. If any students is missing, inform me immediately. Madame Hooch nodded and dashed up the boy's stairs. The portrait hall opened again to admit Slughorn and behind him Flitwick, the Ravenclaw head, and Professor Sprout. Flitwick and Sprout gave gasps of shock and dismay at seeing the letters, but Slughorn just shook his head sadly, his moustache drooping. His eyes met Hermione's, and they were full of pain. McGonagall instructed them to count their students, then report back immediately any missing or injured children. Have prefects keep the students in their dorms and common rooms. Everyone is to stay in their house until further notice. The three heads nodded and left, although Sprout and Flitwick each gave Slughorn a quick, sober look. Miss Petil, please stand guard by the wall. No one but myself is to touch the letters. McGonagall turned to Hermione. Miss Granger, come with me. Hermione clutched her beaded bag grimly as she followed McGonagall out of the portrait hall. Adelina, McGonagall said to the portrait outside. Hermione started. She had never heard the fat lady's name. Tell me, who was the last person to exit the Gryffindor common room last night? The fat lady obviously didn't know what had happened, but she was wide-eyed from watching the activity and shivered at McGonagall's tone. Adolina, the headmistress repeated, who was the last person to leave the common room? Draco Malfoy, the fat lady said. Draco Malfoy, McGonagall repeated. Yes, the portrait said. Ten minutes after midnight. Woke me up, he did. How did he look? McGonagall asked. 
Very nice, the fat lady said. Such pretty hair, and his clothes are never must. His expression, Adolina, the headmistress said. Any sign of his feelings, general thoughts? He seemed happy, the fat lady said. He thanked me very nicely. McGonagall and Hermione both stared in astonishment. You are certain it was Mr. Malfoy? Yes, yes, quite sure. Granted, I haven't seen him often, but occasionally I visit a snake charm or portrait in the dungeons. And Mr. Malfoy was happy, McGonagall said in disbelief. What kind of happy? It took all of Hermione's self-control not to fidget, and she couldn't decide which kind of Malfoy happy she preferred to hear about at that moment. It was a lovely smile, the fat lady sighed. So sweet and open. Did anyone enter the common room after Malfoy left? Hermione asked quickly. No, dear, the portrait said, until the headmistress arrived, of course. Thank you, Adelena. McGonagall re-entered the common room, closely followed by Hermione. Pavati was shooing a couple of early rising first years away from the wall. Miss Granger, the headmistress said quietly, do you know if anyone was with Mr. Malfoy before he left the common room? Hermione took a deep breath. Here goes nothing. I was with him. McGonagall didn't look surprised. Was there anyone else in the common room? No, she said. A few students entered through the portrait hall where we were talking, but they went straight to bed. McGonagall paused a moment, and when she spoke, her voice was, Careful, please, tell me what happened. We were just talking, Hermione said, which was true, except for the time she spent napping. He probably could have written twenty blood messages during that time. He also could have hexed her, or hurt her, but he didn't. What did he do then? Just drink siren scotch and watch me sleep? She shifted uncomfortably. Miss Granger? Hermione started. The headmistress was speaking and she hadn't heard a word. S Sorry? McGonagall's lips thinned. I asked, Miss Granger, what you were speaking about with Mr. Malfoy. Another deep breath. We were talking about Quidditch. McGonagall's eyebrows shot up. Quidditch? He was just no Slytherin seeker, you see, and we talked about ancient runes. Which was also true enough. Anything else? Potions, Hermione said calmly, having mastered her nerves finally. McGonagall nodded. Yes, I've heard about you and Mr. Malfoy's impressive performance in potions. What then? And then I escorted him out of the portrait hall and went to bed. The headmistress looked at her thoughtfully, a thousand questions behind her spectacle-rimmed eyes. But she only asked, Is there anything else I should know, Miss Granger? Hermione fidgeted with the chain of her back. She had to tell McGonagall. The woman probably already knew. There was a confrontation last night between Malfoy and Dennis Creevy. McGonagall's eyes sharpened. Go on. Ron started it, really. Malfoy made a cheeky comment about, well, it was a cheeky comment, and Ron tried to punch him. A fairly common impulse around Mr. Malfoy, I vega. You have no idea. Merry gold, my darling. Both McGonagall and Hermione jumped at a littling voice. Bluebell fluttered a few feet above the carpeted floor, her sweet face wreathed in smiles. She flew over and gave McGonagall a light kiss on both cheeks. Apparently the Dada teacher hadn't been fibbing about her friends of the fairies. The fairy eyed a giant blood-soaked message with bright interest. Is this it? Lovely! Yes, Professor Bluebell, McGonagall said rather grumpily. Bluebell waved her thin wand at the words. This is no simple message. Is it a curse? What kind of curse? Hermione asked. The fairy tilted her hat to one side and her intricate wand work never slowed. Difficult to tell. Cast on the castle itself, responding to blood, manifesting in blood. Hate, certainly, but also love. Love, McGonagall repeated. She cut her eyes at Hermione, who shrugged slightly. You hired her, Marigold. An ancient spell soaked in blood into the very walls. Bluebell said cheerfully, as if she was discussing the curtains. That hardly sounds like love, Professor, Hermione said. Bluebell eyed her mischievously. Ah, oh, and you are an expert in love, yes, Miss Granger? Can you tell who caused this message? McGonagall asked. No, but it was powerful magic, recently cast with powerful blood, Bluebell said. Must we seal the room? McGonagall asked. This is the only entrance to Gryffindor Tower. The fairy shook her head, golden curls bouncing. 
I cannot tell the purpose, Mary Gertie, but the letters themselves are not harmful. I don't like the younger students seeing this, McGonagall said, but I can't destroy the evidence. She waved her wand, and a red velvet curtain appeared, shrouding the wall. Bluebear was looking around the room. Some nice daisies would look well in here, she said. Healing? McGonagall drew her money aside as Bluebell chattered about flowers to a startled Pavati. You were saying, Miss Granger, that there was a confrontation between Mr. Weasley and Mr. Malfoy last night? Yes, Ron threw a punch, Malfoy dodged it, and Dennis aimed a stunning spell straight at Malfoy, Hermione said. She shook her head. It should have worked, but instead Dennis was thrown backwards into a wall. McGonagall drew a sharp breath. Was the boy injured? Hermione shook her head. Is it possible, Mr. Malfoy? He didn't have his wand out, Hermione said quickly. The two women stood silent, thinking. Malfoy could have used wandless magic. His time as a Death Eater had doubtless left him with many advanced skills. Skills Hermione did not want to know about. I don't think it was Malfoy, Hermione said finally. He appeared honestly shocked when Dennis fell. McGonagall's face was expressionless. Thank you, Miss Granger. She raised her voice. Mm, Professor Bluebell, would you be so kind to accompany me? The fairy immediately followed the headmistress through the portrait hall. Hermione shared a long look with Pavati, and the two young women wearily climbed the stairs again. McGonagall would question Alpha now, of course. She hoped the man had the wit not to mention Hermione's nap. He probably knew better. If there was one thing Slytherins were good at, it was self-preservation. The library was rather empty for a Sunday afternoon. Typically, students packed the tables to catch up on homework, even so early in the term. But fear and speculation had swept the castle, and students were too busy spinning blood message theories about double-crossing Slytherins and Malfoy in particular. No students had been reported missing or injured, although a few endured painful talks with their heads of houses for being out of their assigned beds. The fat lady had obviously blabbed that Malfoy was the last person to leave the common room, which closed the case for most. Nearly everyone believed that he had written a message during the last hour of the party. The common room was darker then, and any remaining parties were preoccupied. A few students remembered seeing Hermione talking to Malfoy as well, which prompted more speculation. How drunk was Hermione last night? Had Malfoy hexed her? None of the talk made her look particularly good, and Ron, plagued with a well-deserved hangover, had emerged to lecture Hermione in the common room until she threatened a bad boogie hex. Now she was sitting in a library, wearing jeans and a Weasley sweater, hair in a bushy ponytail, trying to remember if there had been anything suspicious about the wall the night before. The lights had been low, and she'd been... A series of dull thoughts and flesh of white blonde hair caught her attention. Malfoy, of course, hidden behind a shelf, pushing at books from his side so they'd fall to the floor near her table. Subtle. She put down her quill. It was dangerous for him to be out alone. A few students had banded together, she'd heard, vowing to rid the castle of that Malfoy menace. She slipped into the goblin history section and waited for him to follow. Few people read about goblins by choice. You shouldn't be here, she said when he joined her. Oh, I shouldn't be anywhere, he answered. She eyed him carefully. He looked fine, if a bit hollow-eyed, in a black t-shirt and grey trousers. What did you tell McGonagall? she asked. That I didn't attack the weasel or that creepy boy. Creepy? Hermione snapped. And that I spent the end of the party with you, chatting amicably about patience. He smirked. Such dedicated students we are. I didn't mention the part where you lay snoring on the sofa. I didn't snore, Hermione said indignantly. And talking in your sleep, he closed his eyes. Oh, Draco, Draco, I'm leaving now, she said. No, wait, please. A long, smoothly muscled arm shot out to block her movement. The dark mark on his forearm suddenly before her eyes. Hermione stared at the mark wide-eyed, then turned to frown up at him. Tell me, he said, were you able to erase those words? Die mudbloods, Malfoy, that's what the letter said. Her voice was sharp. The fear to say something increases the fear of the thing itself. Very eloquent, he sneered. Very Gryffindor, quoting that muggle again. Dumbledore said it. Malfoy's eyes took on a cold, distant look, and he withdrew his arms, pecking away slightly. I know what happened in the Astronomy Tower, Hermione said in a rush. I know you didn't want to. Dumbledore, Snape, my mother, he said bitterly, all lining up to save my sorry ass, if not my soul. My pretty, pretty soul. Hermione said nothing. I'm not sure they succeeded. 
"'No matter what you wrote in that letter,' he went on, "'I still let those death-eaters in, Granger. Fenrir tainted the curse-breaking Weasley. The old fool died. Hermione held his gaze. "'Yes, you did what you did. I happen to understand your reasons, but that doesn't change the fact. Are any of us so pure? Harry forced Dumbledore to drink poison. Ron abandoned us while we were on the run from Voldemort. I set fire to a teacher, imprisoned a woman for writing lies, and disfigured a classmate. You think you're the only one who can be ruthless? His eyes glittered. How oh, I would love to hear your stories. You didn't hurt or kill those people, but you bear responsibility, she went on. That's your debt to pay. Then help me pay it, he said, surprisingly earnest. It took the Golden Trio, an entire order, and half the school to bring down the dark Voldemort. And now somebody wants to start it all up again. Malfoy raised his arm, one hand on the shelf, again blocking her exit. He leaned into her. Tell me what you're thinking, he said, his voice low. What will McGonagall do? What are you planning? I won't say. Tell me, he repeated softly, his lips very close to hers. No, she said, just as softly. I'll kiss you if you tell me, Granger. A tremor swept up her body, constricting her throat. Reckless, her mind whispered. You'll kiss me if I don't, she managed to whisper. He chuckled softly in his throat, his eyes hooded. Clever girl. Hermione. Thea's voice carried clearly through the library. Hermione, are you here? Malfoy backed away again, lowering his arm and glaring in Thea's direction. Hermione drew in a much-needed gulp of air. I'm not telling you anything, she said louder. He transferred his glare to her. You think I would write that message, and no, I'm not saying that word, and it's final. Hermione, Thea's voice drew closer. Don't play the victim, Malfoy, she snapped. You tormented me and my friends for years. We've been talking civilly for a little more than a week, and you want me to betray McGonagall for you? Malfoy just looked down at her, frowning. Hermione was reminded of the concerned look he'd given his mother in the entrance hall. That message targeted, he began, Hermione. Theo entered the goblin section wearing a green jumper over brown trousers and a button-down shirt. Harry could use a few fashion tips from this wizard, Hermione thought. Maybe get him out of those got awful sweatshirts. Relax, Theo, Malfoy said. Ranger is perfectly safe. Between the two of you, I find her much scarier. Theo looked at him coldly. You'd be surprised what little tricks I know. Theo, I'm fine, Hermione said impatiently. I need to study. She gave Malfoy a last doubtful look and stalked out of the goblin section. A new stack of books had appeared on her table. Theo is most likely. She sat down and fussily sorted her papers, but every nerve ending in her body was tuned to the goblin section at three shelves over. What did she expect? Blood-curdling screams. Shelves bursting into flames. They were probably just having a pissing contest over there. Nothing to concern herself with. Still, she was relieved when Theo re-emerged, disgruntled but unhexed. He fell gracefully into the chair opposite her. You should stay away from him, he grumbled. You should mind your own business, she said. I told you I don't need another run in my life. He smiled. Protectiveness is entirely lost on you, isn't it? How am I supposed to impress you? By treating me like an intelligent person and not a piece of ass. Pretty harsh, Hermione, he said, his smile gone. She sighed. You're right. Malfoy seems to bring out the worst in everyone, including me. I want to be clear. His behavior, those words and awards, the rest of us Slytherins are not exactly cheering. I've been asked by my house to tell you that. Thea's green eyes were sharp, as if he was trying to bore his message into her skull. Blaze is furious. Slughorn has threatened us with expulsion if we do anything, or Malfoy would be in the infirmary right now. We don't know who did it, Theo, Hermione said. We have no proof Malfoy did. He was the last one in the common room, I heard. No, Theo, I was the last one in the common room. I saw him out of the common room. Theo didn't like that, she could tell. He opened his mouth to say something, but glanced at her and thought better of it. I am hoping you can help me study, he said somewhat formally. I have a week's worth of catching up to do. I would be happy to help, Theo, she answered, equally formal. His perfect smile flashed again. The man turned it on and off like a light bulb. It was unnerving. She had to press her lips together to keep from smiling back. Show me your schedule, was all she said. Chapter 12 Dinner with Snakes Hermione found helping Theo an absorbing task. 
he would be joining her patients class and Bluebell's Dada seminar, despite his lack of war experience. It was quite relaxing to sit with him in the library, drawing up summaries and priority grids, and unlike Harry and Ron, Theo let her color code his study schedules. Hermione, Theo said finally. Hermione! Yes? She asked, looking up. Do you need me to annotate the... Sweet salsa, you are relentless, Theo said standing. It's dinner time. I'm not hungry, she said, waving her hand to rearrange her schedule again. He can't do the sentient transfiguration essay before the non-sentient essay. How can I make it... Well, I am, and we are leaving right now. He grasped her hand and pulled her to her feet. But our books, our notes! Nobody would dare to touch Hermione Granger's notes, Theo said decidedly. Let's go. He pulled her all the way to the great hall and retained her hand even as they entered. The environment in the hall was subdued and any noise stopped completely as people saw their clasped hands. Theo, she hissed, people are going to think acquaintances remember. Interhouse unity, he said. She halted. Of course, she said, pulling her hand back. You want me to join your house for dinner? He looked down at her, his green eyes serious. We, as a house, did not write that message, nor do we support it. Show everyone that you believe that, please. This is quite Slytherin of you, she said. Yes, it is. Theo lowered his voice. I'm asking you to do this for us, just one time. But that isn't why I want to be acquainted. Hermione looked up at him, considering. Theo wasn't as tall as Malfoy, so talking to him up close was a bit more comfortable. Talking to him in general was more comfortable. And she liked his plan. She didn't believe the entire house was behind the message, and even if a Slytherin had cast a spell, and she was by no means convinced of that, it was unfair to blame the rest of the house. She looked over at the Slytherin table, and the sight of the little first year silently hunched over the plate settled the matter. Will you follow my study schedules if I sit with your house tonight? She asked Theo. He smiled. Most faithfully. Lead on, then. Their footsteps were loud in the deathly quiet hall, as Theo led her to two empty seats opposite Malfoy. There were always empty seats around Malfoy. All the Slytherin males stood at her arrival and waited for her to sit before resuming their places. Malfoy's face was expressionless, but the fingers on his right hand drummed lightly on the table. Hermione hated her sudden impulse to place her hand over his to stop. Malfoy, she said politely, anything worth doing was worth doing well. Granger, he responded. Pumpkin juice? No, thank you. Apple cider? Theo asked, the glass pitcher at ready. Yes, thank you, she said. Malfoy looked affronted. Damn it, Malfoy, I just like cider better. Theo's smug smile didn't help. Nice to see you, Hermione, Zabini said from further down the table. Good party last night. Thank you all for joining us, Hermione said, forcing a smile. She put her napkin on her lap and snuck another glance at Malfoy, who was absorbed in slicing and eating silvers of chicken in a fussy way completely foreign to her experience with the Gryffindor boys. Pansy Parkinson, who sat beside Sabini, kept glancing behind Hermione. Is Ron going spare? Hermione asked her. Pansy smirked. He's glaring at the back of your hand so hard, I'm surprised it hasn't burst into flames. Is he always so angry? A Southern boy asked. It's been a tough year. Hermione said gently, he lost a brother. My brother is in Azkaban, piped up a first-year girl with dark braids. I'm sorry, Hermione said. The little girl grinned. I didn't like him anyway. Theo choked on his cider. The rest of the table looked uncomfortable, except Malfoy, who was now cutting his carrot with surgical precision. Hermione, Zabini asked, what career might you pursue after Hogwarts? She paused to admire the grammar in that question, then shrugged. I don't know yet. I just want to do well on my nudes. Might you join the ministry? Perhaps. Hermione's stomach clenched, however, at the idea. The ministry had not impressed her during the war against Voldemort. She considered alternatives as she sliced up her own chicken and nibbled on a roll. I might become an aura, she said absently. But it's a hard life. Silence reigned, and she cursed her wayward tongue. Aras had begged relatives of half the people at this table. Hermione glanced at Theo, and he smiled warmly. Well, that's what Zabini gets for asking. I'm Hermione Granger. Of course I'm going to consider the Aura's office. You would make an excellent Aura, Granger, Malfoy said. The entire table glared at Malfoy for speaking, even the first years, but he just sipped his juice with a tiny smile. 
It's probably Run, Hermione thought. Run's losing it over at the Gryffindor table, and Malfoy's loving it. Malfoy followed up his comment with an intent look at Hermione that made her face heat. He really was a monster. Then he began peeling a green apple with a silver knife, slicing and eating it, never taking his eyes from hers. Really, how could eating an apple be so suggestive? He felt Theo take her hand again and almost groaned aloud. Yes, Malfoy was annoying, but there were other ways to deal with it. Hermione pulled her hand back, not bothering to hide the gesture, and Theo stiffened beside her. Malfoy smirked, biting into his last apple slice with a wink. Please let us dinner be over. Hurry, Blaze! It was Ginny, glorious Ginny, stopping by in support of Hermione and distracting the entire table. All the male Slytherins stood again, many openly staring, and Zabini offered her his seat on the bench, but she just shook her head. Mm, just saying hello. Ginny drifted away again, still smiling, and Zabini slowly resumed his seat. He rubbed a finger on his chin, which was the equivalent of dropping his jaw and clutching his hair for any other man. What happened last night? I need to talk to Ginny. Malfoy was ignoring Hermione now, eating chocolate ice cream with the tiniest of spoonfuls. Hermione inexplicably found that more arresting than the bit with the apple and turned her hat to avoid staring. Well, time to study, Theo, she said brightly. But dessert, he began. No time, she bolted to her feet, which prompted every male Slytherin to stand again. And thank you, everyone. It was a lovely dinner she said and strode off to a chorus of thank yous and good nights, vowing never to put herself through that again. Ron called up to her at the doors. Hermione, can I talk to you, please? He ignored Theo. She bit her lip. Ron actually sounded sane. He was still a friend and deserved an explanation. She turned to Theo, who looked slightly irritated, either by Ron or the loss of ice cream. Or both. I'll meet you at the library, okay, Theo? I'll wait, the Southern said, giving Ron a hard look. Fine, she led Ron out of the great hall and over to the house hourglass cabinet. The Hufflepuffs were still ahead in house points, but there was a suspiciously large pile of emeralds in the bottom of the Slytherin glass. Ron gave her a tentative smile, tugging at the sleeves of his jumper. He was obviously trying to execute good advice again. Hermione, I'm really sorry about last night, he said to his feet, and for, uh, yelling at you this morning... Oh, I didn't mean what I said at, at, at the three broomsticks. He looked up and met her eyes pleadingly. Oh, no, I need to trust your judgment. I, uh, need to respect, uh, your agency. Hermione fought the urge to giggle as he continued before finally nodding and patting his arm in acceptance of his apology. Ron stopped talking about supporting personal empowerment and looked relieved. Good, he said. He took a deep breath. About what happened just now in the Great Hall? I don't understand what you're doing. Can you tell me what's going on? Ron's tone was careful, like he was approaching an offended hippogriff. It was just dinner, Ron, Hermione said. Why are you sitting with them? Or are you dating not now? He looked around and lowered his voice. Is this being reckless? No, Ron, this is being fair. I don't know who put dye mudblots on the wall. She said watching him wince, just like he used to when she said Voldemort. She sighed. But even if a Slytherin did it, we shouldn't punish them all. I believe in interhouse unity, like McGonagall says. Ron rubbed his hands over his face and dropped the rehearsed tone. Oh, look, Hermione, I know you can care less, but I don't get anything you're doing this year. Fine, you don't want to be with me anymore. He looked a little woe be gone. You want to, I don't know, find yourself or something? But do you have to do it with a bunch of snakes? Hermione considered this. I suppose it's because they don't know me either. They don't have a lot of preconceived notions about what Hermione Granger does and doesn't do. I'm crazy strange to them, so they'll accept anything. But Hermione... Ron put a hand on her shoulder. That message. There is someone out there trying to hurt you. You and other Muggleborns. And that someone could be a Slytherin. It probably is. He frowned and let his hands fall. I just want you to be safe. I won't be safe, not even in Gryffindor Tower, she said. Even if I stay with you every waking moment. But Malfoy... I know Malfoy's a tremendous git, she said. But he's in four of my classes and he's my patience partner. And you should know that we'll be working on some experimental patients together. I honestly don't think he wrote die. Merlin Hermione, do you have to say it again? In fear of a thing... Yeah, yeah, I know. Ron turned a resentful eye towards Theo, who leaned against the firewall, looking like a catalogue model. 
What's the story with that one? I'm happy to catch up with schoolwork. He likes my color-coded study guides. Well, I bet he does, John said sourly. You'll help him study, but not. He's very conscientious. Lovely handwriting, too. If you could just look at my essay on Patronus charms. I'm busy tonight. She glared at Ron slightly, then reconsidered. Fine. If you apologize to Theo for your behavior at the party, I'll give you ten minutes of breakfast tomorrow. Ron nodded reluctantly, and the two of them walked over to Theo. No, I'm sorry, I was rude, Ron said in a rush. I forgive you, Roy, Theo said. Ron growled low in his throat and stumped off without a word. Progress, Hermione thought. Maybe those Slytherins are onto something with the deal-making. Is he now a year? Theo asked her loudly. Ron paused, but kept walking up the marble staircase. Hermione looked back at Theo. She wouldn't smile. She wouldn't. All right, she said. Let's go set up your patient study schedule. You'll need to review Aramantus and the Draught of Peace and Fiducia. If you memorize the methodology for each, you just might. Theo groaned, but he followed. It was nearly ten o'clock that night before Hermione dragged herself through the portrait hall and up to her dormitory. Jenny was sitting up in bed, reading a piece of parchment by the light of her one. Mm, pretty late there, Jenny said, looking up. Library, I was helping Theo not with his homework. Hermione yawned and dropped her back on the floor. Eight Theos enjoyed an extended curfew as well as the freedom to leave the castle on weekends. Nevinus bed was closed and dark. Is she all right? Hermione asked. Jenny shrugged. She's upset. Everybody's upset. We had one little party and now we have evil blood letters on our wall. Hermione nodded and left the room to get ready for bed. When she returned, Ginny was still looking at her parchment and Hermione joined her. Crookshanks jumped up on Ginny's bed and both women petted him. I had an oddly progressive conversation with Ron after dinner, Hermione said. Was that your work? I thought he was going to start denouncing the patriarchy. Ginny nodded. He still cares about you. So much. I know, Hermione sighed. When I'm through with these roles we play, the fun-loving Weasley and the nagging bookworm. For years I followed him around crying, Run! whenever he said something cheeky. Now he's following me around yelling, Hermione, and he doesn't like it. Jenny pulled up her legs and rested her chin on her knees. Her brown eyes, darker than Hermione's, almost black against her pale face and halo of gleaming red hair. You may have something there, she said. I know Ron's really trying, but I don't think we can go back. Jenny sighed. Oh, I get it about the roles. It's rather like me and Harry. Maybe he loves me, but not as an equal. He feels responsible. Her eyes were sad. He refused to sleep with me, Hermione, over the summer. Didn't feel it was right. Said I didn't know my own mind. Give him time, Hermione said. He's felt responsible for the wizarding world for seven years. He hardly knows anything else. I asked him today about the blood messages and he wrote me this note telling me to stay in my room between glasses and never be alone. Jenny crumbled a parchment in her fist. That doesn't even make sense. I'm not a target. Did Harry send a note telling ye to hide? Hermione stroked Jenny's hair. He still thinks of the Chamber of Secrets. I was eleven, Jenny snapped. You and Harry and Ron fought a troll and defeated a Cerberus at eleven. I'm not eleven anymore. I'm a prefect and a war veteran, and I will not stay in my room. Hermione hacked her. I know, I know. If Harry insists on seeing me as a little girl, there are others who don't. Zabini, be careful there, Hermione said. Ginny snorted. You're the one to talk, and I like Blaze. He doesn't treat me like I'm eleven and stupid. He makes me feel sexy, desirable, almost dangerous. He obviously never been with a Gryffindor before. She stared into space, a soft smile on her lips. I like the roles we play. Hermione swallowed hard. Those Slytherins. Ginny's eyes focused again on Hermione. So, you and Malfoy spill. What were you two discussing so passionately last night? Potions. Ancient runes. Another snort. No man looks that serious about ancient runes. You'd be surprised, Hermione said. Ginny shook her head. Draco Malfoy, and you tell me to be careful? She fixed Hermione with an unblinking stare. Everything I told Lavender about him still stands. He's obviously interested, but Merlin... I know, Hermione said, toying with the golden rope tassel on Ginny's bed hanging. Crookshanks pounced on the ends. Malfoy won't do for much, just some furtive... I know, 
And now you're walking into the great hall, hand in hand with Theodore Nod. We are acquaintances. Merlin, Ginny said again. She crawled under the covers with a sigh. Hermione stood and Crookshanks jumped off the bed. Poor Ron, it's really over, Ginny said sleepily. Don't pity him, Hermione said, getting into her own bed. One can do better for himself if he'll only admit it. A mumble from Ginny was her only response. Hermione lay on her back, muscles aching from hours at a library table. She closed her eyes and tried to slow her breathing, but sleep wouldn't come. The letters, Die Mudblood, drifted behind her eyelids, a taunting echo of the red letters on her arm. Bluebell had said the letters manifested from a spell on the castle, but no muggerborns were killed or injured. Why cast a spell on the castle, then, when slapping some dear blood on the walls would do just as well? Did the spellcaster really hate Muggleborns, or was it a ploy to discredit the Slytherins? Enough. She couldn't solve anything tonight. She'd just give herself nightmares. Hermione closed her eyes, remembering Theo dancing with her at the party, sent sliding up her back. She tried to hold on to the image, but another Slytherin drifted into her thoughts, leaning close in a library full of promises. I'll kiss you if you tell me, Hermione. She couldn't believe he'd said that. She couldn't believe what she'd said back. Worst of all, she'd wanted to tell him. Tell him everything. Every thought, every feeling, every fantasy. All of it. Just lay it all at the feet of a former Death Eater. Would he be shocked? She recalled his expression when she took off her shirt in that old charms classroom. What would have happened if the sword of the earth hadn't worn off, if her wand had remained useless? He moved towards her, sunned on her shirt. I'm unconvinced, he says coldly, sliding open the last two buttons. That snitch could be anywhere. Her hand ran over her breasts, imagining his warm fingers, then went lower. He pulls aside her skirt. Is it there? Fingers inside her knickers. I must be thorough. The mighty swallowed a groan and tried not to pant too loudly. His voice in her ear, the rough skin of his hand on her. Open up to me, Hermione. Tell me everything. Open. She finished in a flurry of images, finally falling asleep to a low, deep voice. I'll kiss you if you tell me, Hermione. I'll kiss you. Hermione slept deeply, dreamlessly, and turned up at breakfast the next morning brimming with ambition. Nothing was impossible if you stayed organized. The mudblood messages, Ron, Malfoy, Theo, Newt's, the alleged errors in her spare ancient rune essay, all manageable. She'd been acting like a ninny. All it took was a good night's sleep to see the error of her ways. Finishing her oatmeal, she ignored the conversations around her and opened her loop notebook. She had written extensive notes that morning on life's proper priorities. Number one, of course, was researching the source of the mudblood message. Number two was nudes. She could not allow Theo to distract her. He certainly had enough to go on with his studies. People have to learn independence, Otherwise, they ran after you for every little thing. One thing about Malfoy, the man was self-reliant. Granted, he didn't have much choice, what with everybody hating him and all, but Hermione hadn't heard him whine about that. In fact, he'd been cross with her for pitying him, which she didn't. As for Ron, she didn't consider him a major problem as long as he kept listening to Ginny. Sooner or later, he'd meet a woman happy to nag him all the time and settle down. Hopefully sooner. Miney made a note to keep an eye out for pretty seventh or eighth year students with overbearing tendencies. Theo was an interesting case. She'd be glad to pursue their acquaintance as long as he kept his propensity for run like behavior under control. He would bear narrow watching for signs of slippage. One, repeating her name. Two, grabbing her hand. Three, acting unnecessarily aggressive around Malfoy. Hermione continued to scribble. Malfoy. A tricky case. The Malfoy section of her loop was written in runes to be on the safe side. To be even safer, she added a random dot to every tenth marking. One couldn't be too careful. There was a fascination there, she wrote, but that didn't mean she needed to give in to it. The last thing she needed this year was a secret torrid affair with the Slytherin poster boy for evil. She looked at the words, secret torrid affair, Scribbled in the margins by his name and sat at them. Mad idea. 
The man was a walking nightmare, born to try her, and he could find another cranky muggerborn to pursue if he wanted to turn over a new leaf so badly. Her Mafia strategy was simple. <laughs> All the best strategies are. Avoid being alone with him and cultivate a calm, tolerant attitude. The only wrench in her plan was ancient runes. She had been promised access to the Codex Runicus and Runestone in exchange for patient's help. She turned the page in her notebook and continued writing. Question. Was the knowledge gained from the Codex and Runestone worth the risk? She drew some lines for a pros and cons chart. Pros? Such high-level knowledge couldn't be gotten anywhere else. Certainly not from Hogwarts' criminal travesty of a textbook. She was considering a career in magical archaeology, and missing a chance to understand those ancient languages was unacceptable. After graduation, Merfa would take both manuscript and stone home again, and all that knowledge would be lost once more. She could use those artifacts to improve the ancient runes textbook and benefit all of wizarding society, despite her selfish ways. One must take risks sometimes in service of a higher cause. Cons. Doing anything on Malfoy's term was a recipe for disaster. At best, she'd be distracted and unsettled by his presence. At worst, she'd find herself carrying on with the most irritating men in school and one of the most notorious in the wizarding world. Pouring herself another goblet of apple cider, Hermione looked at her chart with satisfaction. It was an excellent summation of her dilemma, very cogent and well organized. It was also an utter failure, since she still had no idea what to do, but sometimes orderly thinking was its own reward. Hermione, Ginny asked, why are you giggling at your notebook? I thought you were finished having little conversations with your school notes, Never said. I haven't seen you do that since fourth year. Hermione looked around at the table. Everyone was staring except Ron, who was madly scratching at his charms essay. I don't know what you're talking about. She said and returned to her notebook. Some people didn't know how to have fun. Ron pushed his essay at Hermione, and she shook her head as she scanned a slightly crumpled scroll. His discussion of corporal versus non-corporal patronuses was woefully inadequate, and he completely failed to mention that a caster's patronus shape could change after great shock or emotional upheaval. She didn't mind, however. Revising one's essay meant she couldn't leave for ancient runes until the last possible moment, thus successfully avoiding her life's trickiest priority. Virtue often brought its own reward. Advanced runes continued to be saltifying, expanding on general principles and not even approaching the Elder Foo box, the oldest magical runic alphabet. Malfoy began carving indecent comets in runes on his desk, which at least gave Hermione something to look at. She sent him a scroll with suggested edits, but Malfoy always was an ungrateful person. Potions was not nearly so placid. Slughorn asked Hermione and Malfoy to assist their classmates with Fiducia, but nobody would let Malfoy near them. So he was exiled to the head of the class, where he held Slughorn's pocket watch and called out seconds in a bored tone. Hermione and Slughorn, on the other hand, were swamped, dashing between tables to keep students on track. After an hour, only two teams remained in the running. Slughorn coached a pair of Slytherins, while Hermione stood by Neville and Pavati, whispering instructions while Malfoy counted off seconds. As it became apparent that the two pairs might actually pull the potion off, Malfoy's voice turned smooth and efficient, and Hermione began to feel that same strange connection between them as she listened for the next mark. It unsettled her, and when the successful teams put their spoons down and the class applauded, she couldn't help glancing at Malfoy. He looked back at her with unusual seriousness, brows slightly drawn into a V. Both potions were deemed passable, although considerably less strong than Hermione and Malfoy's. Neville drank a vial of his potion and let Malfoy tap his nose. Slughorn beamed, giving extra house points to all parties involved, including Hermione and Malfoy. Theo smiled at Hermione as well from his table in the back of the dungeon. He'd been matched with a pair of giggly Slytherin girls who had immediately shed their ropes. It's so hard! Then they did nothing for two hours but hang on a sleeve and drop ingredients on the floor so they had to bend over and pick them up. Theo watched his partner's antics through half-lidded eyes, making no effort to discourage such behavior, and the trial's patient attempt was predictably miserable. Imani sniffed and ignored them. Some people didn't deserve help. Imani hadn't forgotten about her blood magic research and skipped lunch for some quality time with the library's restricted section. 
She read up on tainted blood, but she a lot of ignorant nonsense about giants, dwarves, and muggleborns, then moved on to cursed blood, full of lurid descriptions of werewolf and vampire blood. Her reading did support a theory that the blood of a powerful magic worker was particularly effective in blood spells or curses. A witch or wizard's blood could also have a profound effect on the spell. There was a blood curse in the 1400s, cast by a man-hating hag, that had the unintended side effect of shrinking every male's. A small movement drew her eyes to her open bag on the table. A rune-marked scroll hopped up and down, waving its little ribbon arms for her attention. How did he do that? She looked around, expecting to see Malfoy lurking behind the shelves again, but the library was deserted. A tap of her wand opened the scroll. Granger, if you'd like to keep to the terms of our deal, meet me in the former charms classroom today at three o'clock. D. L. M. Chapter End Notes This is another odd chapter. Again, Draco is everywhere, but says almost nothing. This chapter also does a lot of heavy lifting, setting up all kinds of future action. Keep an eye on that little Slytherin girl. Some paragraphs could have been entire scenes, but as Hermione would say, one must move forward. Appropriately, this chapter begins and ends with Hermione in the library. I imagine Theo saw their study session as a little get-to-know-you time, but then was flattened by a steamroller Hermione. A little caution flag from Bluebell. The story contains a love triangle. Look forward to jealousy, drama and misunderstandings. We spend a fair amount of time with this love triangle, so if love triangles aren't your thing, you have a long road ahead. But if fighting evil can be fun, so can a love triangle. Really? The next chapter, however, is all about Hermione and Draco. Chapter 13 Charm Hermione frowned at the open scroll in her hands. Continued secret meetings in abandoned classrooms would completely undermine her Malfoy management strategy. Fragments of a pro-cons chart floated around in her mind. In the end, she decided to go. Perhaps she could mitigate the risks of extended interaction. She found him lying on the teacher's desk, his rope laid over a chair. Late afternoon sunshine poured through the room's long, narrow, gothic windows. He had his wand out, likely defacing the high ceiling above with degenerate wounds. Hermione purposely did not look to see. You're late, he said, sitting up. A fringe of white blonde hair fell over one eye, and he tossed his head back impatiently. I just saw the note, she answered. Why not after dinner? Quidditch practice. Hermione nodded, flushing slightly. It must be on you. She placed her back on the table and tried to look stern. Empty your pockets, Malfoy. He raised an eyebrow. Surely you didn't just order me to empty my pockets. And let me search your back. That is an invasion of my privacy. Says the man who dumped out my back on that very desk. Malfoy scowled. You were withholding my property, Granger. You ambushed me with a hidden magical substance, she returned. They glared at each other until Hermione spoke again. I've chosen my first experimental potion, she said. Blood magic. He blinked. Blood magic, he repeated. Her meaning was clear. She let him help her with the dye mudbloods case. She didn't think he read the message. Malfoy slowly slid off the desk. Why stop at my pockets then? he asked, smiling. Perhaps you should search my person as well. Seems only fair. Stepping closer, he deftly unspooled his green and silver tie, pulling it off, and Hermione found herself staring. No! Hermione cleared her throat. Uh, no! She repeated in her best McGonagall tone. That won't be necessary. Malfoy's hand tightened around the tie, then he tossed it onto the table beside them and emptied his pocket. There wasn't much to see. A wand, a few galleons, a heavy ring. She peered down at the last item. It was a small work of art, silver and onyx, embossed with silver dragons and a large M in the center. The motto on the crest made her skin crawl. Sanctimonia Vincent Semper. Purity will always conquer. Why don't you wear it? She asked, looking up at him. Draco was now the head of the family, since Lucius' life sentence in Azkaban had stripped the elder Malfoy of all titles, rights and fortune. Would you? he asked, his smile gone. He looked away. Would you bear that name if you didn't have to? No, Hermione said. She stepped to the right so she could see his eyes again. Will you ever wear it? His face was completely shuttered now, his eyes just silvery glass. 
One day, he said coolly, one day that name will mean something again. He pocketed the ring, wand and coins, then set his back on the table before her. Hermione stared at her soft leather bag, probably cost more than the entire contents of her trunk, thinking about his words. How would Malfoy go about redeeming his family name? Could it even be done? Well, Granger. Hermione still hesitated, her hand over the back's over clasp. What did she expect to find? Evil talismans? Wizard pawn? No, she had to do this. She couldn't risk another girl around with that horrid sort of the earth. She gave the bag a quick but thorough search that yielded only schoolbooks, parchment, the close-wrapped codex, empty potion vials, quills, ink, and to her amusement, a small silver hand mirror. Will I be subjected to this every time we meet? Malfoy asked coldly. No, she sighed. She had to trust him a little, or give the whole idea up. Malfoy repacked his bag with a flick of his wand, leaving only the wrapped codex. He sat down before it, and Hermione took a chair beside him. She gasped as he unwound the cloth. The book was just as intricate and beautiful as she remembered. This should be in. Don't start, Granger, he said. It's a book, not a house elf. You're not going to free it. Want to carry it around, stuffed in your bag? It's my manuscript, and I can use it to paper my bedroom if I want. Shall we get on with it? He opened the book, revealing an illuminate page filled with glowing dancing runes. It was almost hard to read the text, what with the figures waving their cross edges like little arms, competing for her attention. The first part of the book is a rundown of ancient magical lore and a primer on different runic languages, said Malfoy, sounding very much the pedantic professor. The second part is a history of great magical deeds. What is this? Amani asked, tracing a strip of runes along the bottom of the page with her finger, careful not to touch the vellum. Musical notations, Malfoy said. Amani stared at him. What really? Can we... As an answer, Malfoy tapped a strip of runes with his wand, and instantly an odd, halting tune began to play, slow and sad. It tugged at her heart. I think it's a dirge, he murmured. This codex is dedicated to Wolof the Elder in the year he died. Hermione was enraptured. She couldn't believe she'd almost denied herself this. So the man was a pain. <laughs> Who cared? I must study this father, she said. We should copy it. If you won't loan out the manuscript, you can at least offer Hogwarts a transcription. No, Malfoy said. The Ministry has plundered our house enough. They would only encourage another raid. I won't put Mother through that. Hermione sighed and nodded. She'd agreed to do this on his terms, after all. Fine. How much have you translated? Just the first few pages and the prana, Malfoy said. He waved his wand and pages turned, revealing a sheet with singer runes paired with delicate pictures like a children's dictionary. Hermione leaned forward, marvelling at the swaying leaves and the sketch of a tree. This book was a wonder. You were right, she said absently. Our textbook is all wrong. Get it out of my bag, will you? She shed her black robe and rolled up her shirt sleeves. Hermione didn't look up when he slid the textbook into her hand, just opened it and clicked her mugger pen. Look at that, she muttered, scribbling in a textbook. This dotted variant separates voices K from the corresponding voiced consonant G, but the book doesn't even... Hermione didn't know how long she sat there, puzzling out the discrepancies between the codex and her textbook. She occasionally consulted Malfoy, who lingered nearby for a time, then returned to lying on the desk. But most of her work was brood copying and comparing, slow going at first, but then she began to see patterns. If the shaft of the T doesn't go over the cross stroke, then... Granger! Contractions in the nasal line signal A following Granger, but that doesn't correspond with Granger. Hermione looked up at Malfoy. He was standing beside her, and his hand was over the manuscript, blocking her view of the runes. Annoyed, she pushed his hand, but he wouldn't move it. Granger, it's almost dinner time. No, it isn't, she said, still pushing on his hand. Slytherins were certainly intense about their meals. He wrapped the hand around hers. Granger, you've been muttering over this book for nearly two hours. She blinked up at him again and stood reluctantly. Sunlight no longer streamed through the windows, and one or two lamps had lit themselves in the failing light. Mafa released her hand and gathered up the manuscript, tucking it into his bag with a few flicks of his wand, then laid his wand on the table. That was brilliant, Hermione said as she packed her own bag by hand and zipped it shut. Our ancient ruins textbook is practically criminal. She walked over to the blackboard and picked up a piece of chalk. Look at these variants, the sound changes. 
No, I won't look. She heard Malfoy say behind her. No more runes today. Mother Shape, after letter corn. Hermione trailed off. He was close behind her now, the scent of his cologne mingling with the smell of chalk. One straight line, another curve to meet it. So? He said in his ear. His voice was deeper, huskier. Here we are. Hermione's fingers tightened on her chalk and hearted in the act of drawing the rune. Tell me, Malfoy went on, have you been thinking of me? Her cheeks heated and she could feel a warmth spreading to her neck as posed by her braided hair. That was all the answer Malfoy needed, of course. A large, warm hand slipped up her bare, outstretched forearm and pulled the chalk from her suddenly nerveless fingers. She heard a faint clatter as he tossed the chalk to the floor. You do think of me, admit it. His breath hitched in her ear. You want me. She swallowed. Is that what you tell all the girls? Only the ones who want me. Malfoy's voice was gently mocking. Hermione pulled her arm away and turned to face him, sharp words at the ready. Big mistake. Malfoy had unbuttoned the top buttons of his shirt after shedding his tie, revealing the long, pale column of his throat. His gaze was hypnotic. Unblinking, like a snake's before striking. Hermione froze. Malfoy lay his hands lightly on her throat, rough palms against her pulse. You can't help yourself, Hermione. There's no shame in it. She was breathing him in, enchanted by his voice, his scent, his body so close, but the word shame dropped into her mind like a pebble into a pond. Of course there's no shame. A person can't help how she feels, only how she acts on it. The thoughts sent ripples through the pseudo-magical spell he was casting, and she drew back further against the blackboard. Her mind, slightly dulled by two hours of runes, struggled to catch up with her body. She felt all the weight of Malfoy's personality bearing down on hers. I know what you want. He whispered, his lips inches from hers. No, she heard herself say, her voice a bit breathy. You know what you want, Malfoy. You hope I want the same. Malfoy looked smug. I know you want the same. His lips brushed the side of her jaw, his hand settled at the curves of her waist. He kissed the pulse at her throat, a light pressure of tongue and teeth, while his other hand left her throat to trail over her hip and drift lower, teasing. Money's head fell back against the board, her eyelids suddenly heavy. It's just us here, he murmured in her ear. Nobody else has to know. The money realized one of her legs was curving slightly round his. She pulled it back and stiffened her posture. No, Malfoy, she said, breaking free and stepping away from the blackboard. You don't know how I feel. Oh, but I do, he said, smiling. The money shook her head like a dog shakes of water. Then she refocused on Malfoy, whose smile had slipped a bit. Well, this has been fun, she said brightly. She pulled out her wand and summoned her back and rope to her left arm. Dinner time! Malfoy put his hand on her wand arm. You don't want to go, he said. What is wrong with you, Malfoy? She asked, fully alert now. Get your hand off me! This hand? He asked, running light fingers along her arm towards her wand. Enough! Hermione stepped back and raised her wand. I don't know what Slytherin taught you used to, Malfoy, but I don't like being told what I feel, what I think, and what I need. Malfoy's eyes widened. His own wand was still on the table, out of reach. Hermione was glaring now. Was well, this your plan? she asked. To lure me here with your pretty manuscript and then bully me into kissing you? Her temper flared. Is that the only way you can get laid these days? His face darkened. Watch that mouth of yours, Granger. Apparently you watch it enough for both of us, she snapped. Her wand was at his throat now. Is this your famous Slytherin sex god technique? Needs work. Malfoy raised his hand, palms out. All right, now put the wand down. Turn around and face the wall, she said. Granger, I'm... Turn the fuck around, Malfoy, or I swear I'll petrify you again, and it won't go easy this time. He pulled a long, suffering face and turned to face the wall. If you would only... Hermione didn't wait to hear the rest. She slammed out of the classroom door and into the shattered hallway, tripping over rubble, not pausing until she reached the third floor stairs. Soon scattered before her as she stumbled up to Gryffindor Tower, one still clenched in her fist. Happy hippogriffs! 
She snarled at the fat lady. Jenny was curled up on her bed reading when Hermione burst into their room, throwing her back down. What happened to you? Jenny asked. Malfoy happened, Hermione said, tossing her wand on her desk. Malfoy, really? Jenny eyed her shrewdly. Did he try something? Hermione collapsed on the room's small sofa, heart still pounding from nerves, and her sprint up to Gryffindor Tower. It wasn't what he did, Jenny, she said slowly, trying to find the words. It was the way he did it. Like he knew all my thoughts and feelings, and nothing I said mattered. Crookshanks hopped into her lap, and she petted him. I've been an idiot, she sighed. Stop that, Ginny said, scrambling off the bed and sitting next to her. I was so mad I almost hexed him again. Ginny's eyebrows shot up. Again? I petrified him last week, Hermione confessed. He was, uh, walking toward me. So you petrified him? Just a little, Hermione said. And just now we were, um, studying, and he started crowding me, saying he knew what I wanted, what I felt. Was he using like a lamency on you, do you think? No, I don't think so. Does this great big mouth you go run amok? Was he? Jenny cleared her throat. And was he wrong? Hermione sighed. No, not entirely. I thought I actually knew him. Isn't that ridiculous? A week and a day back at school, and I think I know Draco Malfoy. Her hand clenched on Crookshank's fur, and the cat yowled in protest. Oh, sorry, Crooky. But you didn't hax him this time, Jenny wanted to be clear on that. No, I wish I'd slept him, though, Hermione grumbled. Another crack to the face from me would do the men nothing but good, Jenny grinned. It was a little ridiculous, really, Hermione crossed her eyes. He was all like, you know you want me. She crooned, mimicking Malfoy's voice. Honestly? Ginny laughed out, right. A tapping at the window caught their attention, and Hermione looked to see a large eagle owl fluttering outside. She moved towards her desk, picking up her wand to vanish the pain, then pulled a scroll off its leg. The owl hooted in a superior way and flew off. Who's it from? Ginny asked. Malfoy, Hermione said, restoring the glass with a wave of her wand. The parchment was bound and marked with a familiar green ribbon and rune. You recognize his notes? What have you two been doing? Jenny demanded. Mine didn't answer, just tossed the unopened scroll into the air and pointed her wand at it. Incendio! The scroll burned up and vanished in smoke. Jenny nodded. What now? Nothing, Hermione said tiredly, putting a book out of her bag. I have to study. What about dinner? Hermione shook her head although she was a bit hungry already, having skipped lunch. I'll visit the kitchen and get your plate for you, Ginny said. I'll say you're not feeling well. After Ginny left, Hermione took a long shower to calm her nerves and crawled into her bed with her homework, trying to lose herself in her transfiguration essay. She worked steadily through her assignments until Ginny returned. Here you are, Ginny said, pulling paper boxes out of her book bag. A nice shepherd's pie, still warm, and an apple turnover, and this. She placed a bottle into Hermione's hand. And the last leftover butterbeer from the party. Heal a Ginny's order. You're a good friend, Hermione said, digging in. Ginny sat on the bed beside her. Malfoy cornered me in the entrance hall after dinner. Hermione looked up in surprise, mouth full of shepherd's pie. She swallowed and took a gob of butterbeer. Was he angry? No, Ginny looked thoughtful. He seemed concerned, upset. Hermione sniffed skeptically. I told him you burned his note without reading it, Ginny went on. He really wanted to see you, followed me all the way here. I thought he was going to try to break into the tower. Hermione sighed. The man had truly gone around the bend. Ron, he came by while I was arguing with the git. Don't worry, Ron didn't hear anything, Ginny reassured her. Murphy's presence alone was enough to wind him up. What did Ron do? Ginny rolled her eyes. He started growling, telling Malfoy to get the hell out, accusing him of writing that bloody message. Malfoy stayed pretty calm until Ron told him to stay away from you. That Malfoy wasn't worthy to be in the same space as you. Then Malfoy slammed him against the wall. Hermione gasped. And the fat lady started screaming and then Peeves showed up and started insulting them both. Ginny continued. Ron started making these wild swings at Malfoy and I could tell that Malfoy was pulling his own punches. Probably knew he'd be expelled, Hermione said, fighting would violate his probation. Yeah, anyway... I told Malfoy to get the hell out, and he gave me this look. And then what? Hermione asked feebly, imagining some sort of fanfire spell at Malfoy packing his trunk for Azkaban. Ginny shrugged. 
And he said, tell her I'm sorry. And he left. He said, what? I know. Jenny shook her head. I hate to say it, but he sounded sincere. Hermione groaned. Ron is going to be revolting tomorrow, my fucking hero. She finished her pie and apple turnover and drank a bottle of butterbeer. What are you going to do? Jenny asked. I'm going to bed, Hermione said tiredly, vanishing the boxes and cutlery. She gave Ginny another hug. Thank you, she whispered. It'll be okay, Ginny said. He's just a stupid ferret after all. Lying in her bed, Hermione felt overwhelmingly homesick. She wished her mother would appear with hot chocolate and a hug. She wished she knew what had set Malfoy off like that. He'd been fine and then he seemed to lose control. She wished she'd been able to study more of the Codex before the Slytherin went sex-crazed. She wished there was another Hogwarts student good enough to help her with her experimental potion. Most of all, she wished she could feel that burning anger again, rather than the sick feeling that she'd lost some kind of friend. Stupid! Finally, she drifted off to sleep, dreaming of eagle owls laden with apple turnovers and ancient runic manuscripts burning in a giant bonfire. Chapter End Notes Brace yourself, it gets worse. Chapter 14 Fallout Hermione slipped down to breakfast early the next morning, hoping to eat quickly and return to Gryffindor Tower until ancient ruins. But she was still discovered outside the great hall doors by a handsome Slytherin. Thankfully, not Malfoy. Hermione, Theo said, striding towards her. You weren't at dinner last night. Ginny said you were ill. Just tired, she said. Nothing to worry about. He gave her an impish grin. We'll have to find better reasons than studying to stay up late. Perhaps. She couldn't help smiling back. In the meantime, I've caught up in transfigurations and herbology, and Slughorn is helping me brew two potions after dinner tonight. Hermione was pleased. Then there's only our Defense Against the Dark Arts seminar. That's today, and <laughs> trust me, it has not been demanding. Just remember... Love is the only defense. Theo chuckled. I'm looking forward to that class. That makes one of us. Hermione was beginning to think Bluebell was another Professor Trelawney. I want to thank you properly, Theo said, shifting his shoulder back almost weighty as Hermione's own. Would you care to go to Hogsmeade with me sometime? Hermione hesitated. Her last date in Hogsmeade hadn't gone well, and an outing with Theo would only cause more talk. Then she saw Malfoy's tall form emerge from the dungeons and pause beside the house hourglass cabinet. I'd love to go to Hogsmeade with you, Hermione said loudly. She leaned into Theo and kissed him on the cheek. See you in patience, she whispered with a wide smile. Before Theo could respond, she flounced into the great hall and sat at the Gryffindor table, her back to the Slytherins flushed with her own recklessness. That's how much I want you, Malfoy. Ginny showed up soon afterwards, sitting opposite her. Both Malfoy and Theo are staring, and Malfoy looks particularly dangerous, she said, keeping her voice low. And Blaze, Hermione asked. Ginny rolled her eyes. Yes, he's looking over here too. There must be something in the water. I met Blaze in the astronomy tower last night, and he had this subtle vibe, like being kissed by him was this great honor. I finally had enough and walked out. Subtle, Hermione said, gloomily stirring her porridge. I'd kill for subtle. Well, I've had it with Slytherins. Jenny poured herself a goblet of pumpkin juice. I can't wait until Saturday's match. We'll flatten them. We sure will, Ron said, sliding into the bench beside Hermione. Hey, Hermione, that fairy tried to sneak into Gryffindor Tower last night, but I sent him packing. Jenny snorted, drawing a glare from Ron. He clenched his fists and turned around to look at the Slytherin table. Keep your voice to yourself, you gets. He muttered, turning back. Hey, save it for the field, Ron, Ginny said. Ron grinned. They have no chance on Saturday, with those new chasers of ours. He and Ginny launched into a detailed Quidditch discussion, squabbling about plays against Slytherins. Bored, Hermione finished her porridge and pulled out her loop notebook. Its open pages wrinkled and creased. She smoothed them with her wand, then fished out her pen. There had been no chance that morning to write five things to look forward to. Today's list would be easy. 1. Not looking at Malfoy. 2. Not speaking to Malfoy. 3. Not thinking of Malfoy. Hermione froze, fingers clenched on the notebook. Quibbled in the margins of her draft. Organization is its own reward, essay was a single note. Written in an elegant, loopy hand that was horrifyingly familiar. 
Like a good organizational plan, a secret torrid affair can be its own reward. Her breath caught. He knew he'd read her notebook, even the parts about him. Especially the parts about him. It would take more than a few random dots in the runes to fool that man. That was why he'd been so confident in Charm's classroom. He'd read about her feelings. He knew. The mind's face burned with shame, then anger, and she bolted upright, turning towards the Slytherin table. Theo looked over at her with concern, but Malfoy was already gone. Hermione, Ginny asked. I forgot my homework, she said, shoving her loop notebook back into her bag. She would throw the wretched thing into the fire the first chance she got. She swung her leg over the bench and stormed out of the great hall to run to cry. Hermione never forgets her homework. He panned up the stairs to ancient ruins, and there he was, leaning against the wall, arms crossed. His shoulders were slumped, his head down, his shoulders were slumped, his head down, but Hermione barely registered this unusual posture. She halted in the middle of the hallway and threw her back aside. You! she snarled. He straightened. Granger, look, I'm so... You! The singer syllable dripped with vitriol. You read my notebook! You read my thoughts! Malfoy stepped into the middle of the hallway, facing her. Now, Granger, it was open, I just... He trailed off as Hermione began to circle him, and he eyed her warily. So clever, aren't you, Draco Malfoy? Her voice was icy. So smooth with the turn of phrase. She completed her circuit and just looked at Malfoy, unblinking, and she could see his Adam's apple bob as he swallowed. Yes, she said softly. Everything in that notebook is true. Is that what you want to hear? She advanced, and now he was the one stepping back. Do you want to know all my fantasies, Malfoy? Is that what you want? She inched closer. Go ahead. Pull them out of my mind. I'm a rubbish at Clemens. Would you like to watch all the imagined stolen kisses? The imagined games of search for the snitch? Malfoy tugged. Granger. But why stop here? She went on, relentless. She didn't know what her own face looked like just then, but Malfoy's was bloodless. Go on, Malfoy. Take what you want. Look at all my fantasies. About you, about Theo. Run, Harry. She smirked. Professor Snape in sixth year. Malfoy looked away, his hair falling over his eyes. Please, Granger. No? Hermione had him backed against the wall now, his hands at his side, palms flat against the stone. That's not what you wanted. No, you just wanted to read a few warm thoughts about yourself. And then use them on me. She laughed harshly. It is truly a brave new world, one where Draco Malfoy tries to seduce Hermione Granger. A secret affair with a mudblood? It must be true, mustn't it? I have it in writing. Malfoy cleared his throat. Granger, don't, he said, trying to sound stern. You are taking this all wrong. You have to... I don't have to do anything, she said. Her rage faded, leaving her empty. Malfoy's face blurred. Granger, please listen. Malfoy was pleading now. I never meant to. He broke off as McGonagall appeared. He was clacking and head bobbing, with the rest of the class trailing behind her. She gave Malfoy and Hermione a sharp look before opening the classroom door and shooing the other students inside like baby ducks. The interruption helped Malfoy regain some poise, and when Hermione looked back at him, he was frowning down at her. Obviously, I went about this the wrong way, he began. Stop, don't even try. She snarled, pulling out her wand. You don't care about me, Draco Malfoy. You don't care about my feelings. You only care about your own dick. So why don't you go and just fuck yourself? Her voice had risen during this speech, until she was shouting the last words. A spark flared from the wand, she was now pointing at Malfoy, and an invisible force knocked her backward into the wall. She fell on her rear, gasping, wand clattering to the stone floor. How dare you? she cried. I didn't. Malfoy's face was shocked. He stepped forward, hand out to help her up, but she grabbed her wand instead and scrambled to her feet. Don't touch me! she shouted. Miss Granger, Mr. Malfoy! McGonagall snapped. The headmistress stood in the doorway, arms crossed, her face a thundercloud. If you are quite finished... Quite finished, headmistress, Hermione said. 
She swung away from Malfoy, grabbed her back, and entered the classroom, head held high. A harsh curse resounded from the hallway, and the class heard McGonagall cry out, Mr. Malfoy! When McGonagall re-entered, Malfoy was not with her. He didn't appear in potions either, and Neville counted seconds while Hermione and Slughorn coached more pairs towards successful fiducias. Hermione felt like a block of ice inside. She could hardly listen in transfigurations and skipped lunch again to have a good cry in a warded bathroom. Then she washed her face, found Ginny to heal her swollen eyes, and they headed to a defense against the dark arts seminar. Theo was outside the classroom when Hermione arrived and touched her elbow to draw away from Ginny. I hear you tell Draco to fuck himself outside ancient runes, he said. Yes, Hermione said, glad the rumor mill had actually gotten it right this time. I'm sorry to have missed it. I'll do it again if you like. Again, that impish grin. I'll hold you to that. Time for class, everybody! Blue Bell carolled from inside. Mafa was inside, lounging in his yellow beanbag as usual, closely watched by his nervous classmates. When Hermione entered with Theo, the stairs shifted to her. She willed herself to stay calm and took her seat between Ron and Malfoy. Bluebell had conjured a beanbag for Theo next to Luna so that he was opposite Hermione. He looked at her, eyes twinkling, as Bluebell reviewed her Love can defeat any evil thesis. Then Ron read aloud Hermione's scroll about Malfoy's lovable qualities. Malfoy's scroll on Ron, delivered in frigid tones, listed his absurd yet serviceable small owl, his excellent care for his substandard quidditch broom, and a veiled suggestive compliment for Ginny. Ron's face heated, but he said nothing, and Bluebell looked satisfied. And now, Mr. Nutt, the fairy said, turning to Theo, why don't you list three things you love about a classmate? Which classmate, Professor? He asked calmly, the picture of dignity, even on a fat pink beanbag. Anyone you like, dear boy? Theo spoke in a clipped voice. I love how Hermione Granger's curls elude any attempts to capture them, no matter how large the ribbon or hair clip. I love how she gives every person she speaks with, whether friend or foe, her entire attention, staring them down until they can hardly look at her. I love how her formidable brain constantly wars with her feelings making her every statement unpredictable. He looked at Bluebell. Will that do? If Hermione thought her scene with Malfoy that morning was embarrassing, this was a thousand times worse. Theo thought of that. What had she gotten herself into? What was it with these Slytherins? Ron to her right was hissing like a boiling tea kettle, while Malfoy on her other side was rigid and silent. Bluebell clapped her hands. Well, isn't that just lovely? Splendid to have older students who can express their feelings so. And it's a perfect introduction to our next lesson. Unpredictability. Most humans are very predictable, even witches and wizards, Bluebell continued. Every day they eat the same thing, they take the same routes to work or school, even repeat the same conversations. So it only stands to reason that they would fight in predictable ways as well. The whole class sat stunned by yet another trenchant display of logic by the flighty fairy. Even Hermione was impressed. With the most cursory of study, a witch or wizard can predict what his or her foe would do in nearly any situation. The fairy rose about a foot in the air and spun slowly, letting her words sink in. When you are defending yourself against the practitioner of the dark arts and you are plotting your next move, your question should not be, what spell is the most powerful, but... What spell is the least predictable? She spun again. Can anyone give me an example of this concept in action? Ron, of all people, raised his hand. In first year, we were fighting a troll and Harry Potter stuck a wand up the troll's nose. Hermione was instantly taken back to that day. She was so certain she could handle that troll and only ended up pressed against the bathroom wall, waiting for her death when Harry and Ron burst in. The day they defeated a troll, the day they became friends. She reached out and took Ron's hand and squeezed it, tears in her eyes, feeling the icy block in her chest thaw somewhat. He patted her hand, smiling, and she put her head on his shoulder. Some things she could trust anyway. Very good! Bluebell clapped her small hands beaming. In many cases, a simple, less powerful action or spell is quite effective, if it's unpredictable, whereas a powerful yet expected move may fail to find its mark, yes? 
Can anyone else give me an example of unpredictable response? Imani could think of six examples off the top of her head, but she kept her hand down for once. She was more interested in hearing others' accounts. Malfoy sat stiffly beside her, his hand clenched. She ignored him. My father had a story from the Battle of Hogwarts, Ginny began and swallowed. He told me how kings like Shackable faced a Death Eater apparating through a window. Instead of aiming a curse at him, Kingsley cast a momentum-reversing spell, sent a Death Eater flying backwards to his death. The entire class looked at Malfoy then, clearly imagining him flying backward through Bluebell's window to his death. Except for Hermione, who stared at a point above Theo's head. Ernie Macmillan recalled using Flippendo during a classroom duel once, but someone else described how Pavati used a bodybind curse on Dolohov. Lavender trembled in her beanbag and said nothing. Wonderful, wonderful examples. Let's try an exercise, Bluebell said. Everyone pair up and stand opposite each other, once out. Each pair will be given an advanced offensive spell, which can be defended by any minor defensive spell. Hermione ran through her mental catalogue of minor spells, which were extensive. Ron looked at her and she nodded. Partners. The other students paired off quickly, leaving Malfoy with Theo, to Hermione's amusement. The two Slytherins looked eager to face off. Ron tucked at her hand to gain her attention. Go easy on me, boy, he whispered. Your simplest spell could drop a horse. Bluebell flitted between them. Miss Granger, you are to cast Petrificus to Talus. Ron groaned. Excellent, Hermione said loudly. I found Petrificus to Talus very effective. She turned to Ron and lifted her once lightly. Petrif? Tickles exploded around her ribcage, causing her to drop her wand with a clatter. Run! She gasped, giggling uncontrollably. Run, stop! Ron looked down at her, grinning. Gotcha! He said, ending the spell. She leaned against him, still giggling. Good one! She said. Chaos had broken out among the other partners. Neville had beaten off a Levy Carpus with an augmenty water spell so powerful that it soaked Luna completely. Lavender aimed a surprisingly well-cast confundo at Ginny, who spun in circles, tripped over Ernie, who was on the grassy floor recovering from a stinging jinx, and fell into a giant daisy. Theo, meanwhile, had cast a stunning spell at Malfoy, who managed to get off a leg locker curse at the same time. Theo's spell went wide, smashing a globe on top of a tall cabinet. Malfoy now stood over Theo, one aimed at his throat, while Theo lay on his back, legs snapped together. The blunt Slytherin looked every inch the deadly death eater and everyone was staring mr malfoy bluebell said come now malfoy flicked his wand at theo whose legs shot straight up then out then up again mr malfoy the fairy repeated malfoy's lip curled but he released his partner now reverse positions bluebell instructed hermione had been the first to turn away she now faced twirling her wand like a baton Look out, Weasley, she said with an evil smile. Take it easy, Moy, Ron said nervously. Expelliarmus, Bluebell told them as she flitted by. Out of the corner of her eye, Hermione saw Malfoy cast a carpet retractum charm, a fiery rope spinning out of his wand, with Theo transformed into a harmless snake. Theo muttered a few words and the snake immediately slithered out a half-open window. Hermione couldn't help but stare. Theo was a parcel mouth. Money, Ron asked. Are you ready? She turned back to him and grinned. Always. Ron swallowed and held up his wand. Ex Guardium Leviosa, Hermione said crisply, barely moving her wand, and Ron shot straight up, hovering face down just a few inches from the ceiling. Well, that's not fair, Ron shouted down at her. To a wand. We landed in first year, she called back. Yeah, with a feather. I don't know my own strength. Leviosa. Let me down. Ron yelled. She brought him down slowly to the floor. Little swore, he said fondly. She smiled. It was good to be friends again. Chapter End Notes A book containing a character's secret thoughts is like a loaded gun in this type of story. If it's introduced in the first act, it's bound to go off. Objects, especially personal objects, are big in the story, revealing so much about character. Draco and Hermione in particular will continue to squabble over objects, everything from the house hourglass to six bushels of clover blossoms. And Malfoy's luck, he'd left breakfast by the time Hermione read her loop. 
or she would have been screaming at him in the great hall. Chapter 15 Squeaky Mouse Voices Malfoy didn't approach Hermione after Dada class or after dinner, but she knew it couldn't last. He was just waiting for his opportunity and found it that very night. A pack of first years had broken into the potions cupboard that afternoon and lifted Slughorn's entire store of moss flossum, also known as squeaky flowers. If you heavily sniff a squeaky flower, your voice gets high and squeaky like a mouse's. It was like kids sucking on helium balloons in the muggle world. These particular students ran off with about 20 squeaky flowers and spent a hilarious hour squealing at the top of their lungs out by Hagrid's hut. The high voices maddened Fang, who broke out of the hut and leaped on a Thestral. The Thestral was hitched to a carriage, preparing to bring back a student who'd left on a family emergency. When Fang fell on the Thestral, the winged animal took to the air, throwing off Fang and breaking the carriage's shaft. The carriage smashed against the hut and the Thestral disappeared for two days. The students involved, all Hufflepuffs who could never resist funny voices, were then set to write 100 sentences as detention. Slughorn was supposed to oversee them, but he was busy helping Theo brew his makeup potion and asked his favorite student to step in, which was why Hermione was sitting on a teacher's desk Tuesday night, knitting a long brown scarf while eight children hunched over their parchments, scribbling the words she'd placed on the board. I will not sniff squeaky flowers to speak in mouse voices and upset dogs who fall on thestrals and damage valuable property and inconvenience busy eighth-year students. The students had groaned over the length of her sentence, but Hermione found it perfectly appropriate. She was knitting away, unable to leave for another half hour, and so, of course, Malfoy strolled into the classroom. Slughorn probably told him about the detention. Hermione was truly beginning to dislike the Slytherin head. Granger, Malfoy said amiably, as if they'd never had words. He sent an amused glance both at Hermione's knitting and the sentence on the board. Keep writing, Imogen, Hermione said sharply to the red-headed girl who looked up open-mouthed at Malfoy's entrance. Malfoy moved to lean against the teacher's desk, standing entirely too close to Hermione's way of thinking. The look in his eyes made her uncomfortable aware of her thin white jumper and form-fitting jeans, her hair piled messily on her head. Malfoy was usual black, his rolled-up shirt sleeves clearly revealing the dark mark on his forearm. You really do knit, he said, eyeing the long needles. I thought it was just another tale. I have nothing to say to you, Hermione said. Rather dull colour, he went on, tugging at the end of the brown scarf. I hope it's not for me. Hermione glared as her knitting needles clicked. Granger, he said low, I need to talk to you. I'm busy. You're knitting and watching dingbats. Two pastimes infinitely more interesting than talking to you. Don't worry, Granger, he said with a smile. I won't try to seduce you here. Malfoy! Hermione cast a muffliato spell to avoid being overheard. The red-headed girl looked disappointed. Give me one reason why I shouldn't hex you across the room. You'd be modelling poor behaviour. Adults should work out their differences amicably. Like you did with Theo today she asked acidly. Or run last night. All right, you and I should work out our differences amicably, without getting physical. Another smile. Uh, unless you want to. Hermione shook her head. You didn't hear a word I said this morning. I certainly did. Malfoy's face was suddenly all hard angles, his mouth a thin line. I heard a version of myself I didn't much care for. A man who would read a woman's journal, used information inside to manipulate her for sex, then force her to keep it a secret because he's ashamed of her. Really, Granger? You read? He sighed loudly. Yes, I read a bit of your precious book. Who would have thought you were such a schemer? It was shocking, really. You sitting at the table working on the codex, looking so prim and proper well. Is there an apology coming? Hermione asked. Because I've yet to hear one. But perhaps a mudblood doesn't deserve. Don't you dare put that word into my mouth. The fact that you're muggleborn. A mudblood. Stop saying that word. Malfoy snarled. Why not? She yelled, leaping up to face him. You taught it to me. The scraping of chairs caught their attention, and Hermione and Malfoy turned to see the first years lined up wide eyed against the far wall, as far away as they could get. Hermione glared at Malfoy. Now look what you did. You scared them. You scare them, he muttered. 
She lifted the muffliato spell. It's all right, she said reassuringly. Finish your sentences. Mr. Maffa and I are just having a disagreement. The first years looked at each other and slowly returned to their desks. Hermione perched herself on the teacher's desk again and picked up her knitting. Maybe he'd get the hint. No such luck. Malfoy continued to loom over her. Look at me, Granger, please. The last word drew Hermione's eyes from her scarf. He had moved closer, one hand on the desk, the dark mark clear against his pale skin. I'm sorry, he said, too low for the Hufflepuffs in the front row to hear, although they tried. I'm sorry I read your book. I'm sorry I pushed you. I'm sorry I hurt you. Marnie turned her head away, and the Hufflepuffs under her sudden gaze began scribbling madly. Granger, Malfoy said. She reluctantly looked back up at him. His face wore that open expression she'd last seen at the Gryffindor portrait hall. Granger, he repeated. I'm far from reformed, but I'm not the monster you painted me outside ancient ruins either. Hermione said nothing, and now it was Malfoy's turn to look away. He sighed and joined her, sitting on the desk, looking out at the rows of Hufflepuffs. The red-headed girl, Imogen, looked up from her parchment and gave him a tiny smile. His own lips quirked slightly. Were we ever that small? he mused. You were right, little shit, Hermione said, winding yarn around her finger. I was, he agreed. And you, bursting into our train compartment. Has anybody seen a toad? Nerfoy asked in a high, fluting voice. He rolled his eyes. As if any of us would be caught dead with a toad. I should have turned you all into toads and given one to Neville, Hermione said. He looked amused and lowered his voice again. Look, Granger, I know you don't trust me any more. If you ever really did, he said, but the Muggleborns here are in danger. You are in danger. You need to work on that potion, and I'm the only one who can help you. Hermione continued to knit, thinking, and Malfoy was silent as well. Finally, she put her needles down and cast another Mufliato spell. Then she turned slightly to face Malfoy. You have a point, she said, but we're at an impasse. You're right, I don't trust you. Unless you can prove you didn't write the Die Mudblood's message, you can't help me. Malfoy frowned. That makes no sense. Just because I acted like an idiot doesn't make me a criminal. If that were the case, the weasel would be in Azkaban. Stop calling him that. Ah, so quick to defend him, Malfoy sneered. Yes, I am. Ron and I are friends. We've been friends for seven years. We've lasted through good times and bad, and we always will. Maybe you've never heard of that kind of friendship, but it's real. Hermione turned back to her knitting and tried not to feel guilty. Maybe she shouldn't have thrown his friendless state in this face, but honestly, he was always on her last nerve. Malfoy stood off the desk and turned back to her. Perhaps I did ruin everything, Granger. It's probably better that way. His fist clenched. But you have to let me help you. Then help me trust you, she challenged. You created a problem, then fix it. She pointed a knitting needle at him. Remember, Fiducia, all trust has to be earned. Earn it, Draco Malfoy. For once in your fucking life, earn something. He met her eyes, glare for glare, brown against grey, then nodded. Fine, he snapped and stalked out of the room. The door slammed hard enough to make the desk shake. Hermione turned back to the students, who had once again abandoned their sentences and were staring open-mouthed. She waved her wand to lift the Mufliato spell. Well, she snapped, get back to work. Are you going to forgive him? Whatever he did, asked Imogen. You should forgive him, said a snub-nosed blonde in the back. He's very handsome, said a third. Girls are so stupid, said a boy with dark hair and an ink smudge on his nose. He's a total wanker. Of course he is, Imogen said, but he likes her. But she hates him. That's because she has taste. She doesn't hate him. Enough, Hermione yelled. Go back to your halls. It's almost curfew. Professor Slughorn will oversee your extended detention tomorrow, since we are too distracted to finish your sentences today. The students obediently gathered their things and exited the room chattering. I don't know why he likes her. Anyway, she's so crabby. He just wants her body. You pick, Percival. Hermione let her head drop into her hands. Sweet Merlin, she was no smarter than that pack of squeaky idiots. She had just issued a challenge to a Malfoy, and only Godric knew what would happen next. Chapter End Notes Hello, little Hufflepuffs, and welcome to our show. I bet you all were wondering if you'd ever see anything from the summary besides the blood messages and Dramani. Up next, 
a griffin of fracas at lunch. You rather let us all down over at the Slytherin table, Theo told her. We were hoping you'd tell Weasley to fuck himself. I lost ten galleons. Chapter 16 The Way of the Wing Queen Hermione's sleep that night was plagued with unpleasant dreams, less powerful than the nightmares she'd suffered right after war, but disturbing nonetheless. She kept dreaming of danger, herself running from more danger, images of her parents in danger, her friends in danger. Then a particularly vivid scene of Malfoy in danger, no specific danger, just a feeling, and calling her name. This last dream finally woke her and she found herself sweating and gasping in the dark. She was in a vile mood at breakfast, and Malfoy's absence in the great hall strangely didn't make her feel any better. She was poking at her food, letting Ron and Ginny's Quidditch talk wash over her, when suddenly the voices around her stopped. Hermione looked up to see McGonagall standing beside her. Miss Granger, if you will accompany me, please, she said and turned away without waiting for an answer. Hermione exchanged a baffled look with Ginny and stood up shouldering her back and trotting after the headmistress. McGonagall moved quickly for her age. Hermione was panting once they reached the top of the stairs on the third floor. She stopped and stared. A thin black mist blocked the side corridor leading to ancient ruins. A figure emerged pale against the mist and her eyes narrowed. Malfoy. Thank you for coming, headmistress. It's this way, he said. What is it? Hermione asked. Did you conjure this mist? Don't be afraid. Malfoy said. I'm not, she snapped. McGonagall stepped through the mist without hesitation and Hermione followed. The headmistress had stopped on the other side and Hermione stepped around her to see better. Then she also stopped and stared at the opposite wall, the wide stretch of stone at the end of the corridor now covered in blood-red letters. Die, mudbloods. Not again, she breathed. Explain, Mr. Malfoy, McGonagall's voice was called. Oh, I can't. Malfoy moved past them, stepping closer to the letters, then turned. His face was composed, but one hand clutched the strap of his leather bag tightly. It was here when I arrived at the classroom. Indeed, Mr. Malfoy, he frowned. As soon as I saw the letters, I blocked the passageway and sent a student to find you. McGonagall didn't answer. Merrily handed Hermione a piece of parchment. Headmistress, please come to the ancient room's classroom immediately. Bring Granger. Draco and Malfoy. Hermione bit her lip. Malfoy's actions, if believed, demonstrated surprisingly good judgment. McGonagall stepped forward to inspect the letters more closely, and Malfoy edged closer to Hermione. She gave him a warning look, but he just rolled his eyes, pulling his hand out of his rope pocket. He held a small potions vial, half full with red liquid. Blood from the message, Hermione stared at him. Damn, another good move. Malfoy stepped closer, pressing the vial into her hand, his fingers lightly brushing her palm before moving away again. She clutched the vial tightly. Miss Granger? McGonagall turned back to face them, and Hermione hastily tucked the vial away. Would you be so kind to ask Professor Bluebell to join me here? There will, of course, be no ancient runes class this morning. You may consider this a free period. Yes, headmistress, Hermione said. Mr. Malfoy, you will remain with me, please. McGonagall sat, looking back at the letters again. Hermione turned and walked through the mist without a backward glance. It would be daft of him to write that message, then immediately inform the headmistress and Hogwarts post to go mudblood. The ferret will be fine without me. Malfoy reappeared at lunch, and Hermione tamped down her relief. The castle was buzzing with news of the second message, and Dennis Creevy was especially venomous about Malfoy's guilt. There is absolutely no proof that Malfoy wrote those messages, Hermione said calmly as she sorted her chips. The hate in Dennis' eyes almost made her quail. The Death Eaters wants to carry on Voldemort's work, he asked. He wants to kill all of us Muggerbones. Enough, Dennis, Ginny said sharply. Malfoy isn't trying to kill anybody. No, there's a switch, Ron said. Dennis barked a laugh, but Ginny, Hermione, and Neville all frowned at Ron. What? Ron asked. Don't tell me you've forgotten the sixth year. You know when he tried to kill Dumbledore? He nearly killed me, too. He didn't, though, Hermione said. He hasn't killed anyone. That we know of, Ron said darkly. Dennis nodded. 
You saw what went on on Malfoy Manor, Hermione. Merlin, you were. You're prejudiced, Ronald, Hermione cut in. She was not going to talk about Malfoy Manor. You don't like Malfoy, so you're spot on there, Ron said, slamming down his goblet. He's more than just a get, he's dangerous, and you talk to him like he's some kind of wounded bird. It makes me sick watching your Ginny smile at older Slytherins. Exactly, Hermione cried. You're prejudiced. You refuse to see that anyone has changed. Well, we've all changed. Malfoy, Theo, Ginny, never all of us. She stood and grabbed her back. Everyone but you. When the hell are you going to grow up? She slammed her way out of the great hall and into the entrance hall. The sound of footsteps echoed behind her, and she halted, rubbing the ridges on her left arm, wondering what else the day had in store for her. Sort off, Malfoy, I'm a no- I'm not Draco, I'm happy to say, said Theo's voice. Hermione turned around. I'm happy too. You rather let us all down over there at the Slytherin table. We were all hoping you'd tell Weasley to fuck himself. I lost ten galleons. She eyed Theo carefully. Do you think Malfoy wrote those messages? It would violate his probation, wouldn't it? He'd never be that stupid. Exactly, Hermione said. I... The great hall doors burst open and students streamed into the entrance hall. Let's go, Theo said, taking her hand. You have herbology in the greenhouses next, right? She nodded. Theo had care of magical creatures, so she let him lead her up the short staircase to exit the castle. A tingling instinct made Hermione turn back, and there was Malfoy entering the entrance hall, walking in an empty ring as students flowed warily around him. He halted, and he could clearly see her and Theo, she knew, standing above the crowd, their hands clasped, and she could see Malfoy's upturned face his clear eyes holding hers, giving nothing away, the afternoon sun on his hair. Hermione swallowed and turned away, trying to ignore the twisting feeling in her chest. She held Theo's hand more tightly, fingers curled around her smooth, broad palm, refusing to remember another rougher palm on her throat and the words, I know you think of me. Herbology had become one of Hermione's favorite classes for two very good reasons. One. Professor Sprout was adamant about hand-raising during his citations, and, too, she sat nowhere near Draco Malfoy. But this educational idyll was shattered that afternoon with Professor Sprout's announcement of an advanced seminar in herbology. McGonagall and the Ministry had given Sprout permission this year to allow select students to cultivate a rare but volatile plant. What is a plant, Professor? Blaze asked, but Sprout very properly ignored him, and nodded towards Hermione's raised hand. Thank you, Professor, Hermione said, savoring a small moment of justice in an anything but just world. What is the plant? I cannot reveal the plant's name right now, Sprout said. But we'll be growing three specimens in the small greenhouse on the west side. Everyone looked to the right-hand glass wall to see a small structure outside, its windows painted over in a rainbow of colors. Only six students are qualified to study this plant, she went on, unrolling a piece of parchment. I received the last parent wave about this morning, so we can move forward. She looked up from the parchment. Any of your six can, of course, decline the new assignment and remain with the rest of the class. This assignment is for extra credit, and you'll be expected to write essays on the plant studied in our regular classes as well. Hermione's paws jumped. Parent waver. This plan must be really dangerous. She was so busy reviewing all the dangerous plants she knew, from nightshades to devil snares, that she nearly missed Sprout reading aloud the name. Ranger. Hermione expected no less. Greengrass. Also expected. In addition to her beauty and quidditch skills, Astoria Greengrass was known for her talent in herbology. Her family, Hermione knew, had planted the famous green grass gardens, the most lavish botanical preserves in the wizarding world. Hermione had never seen the gardens. They could be viewed by invitation only, and such invitations were never extended to muggerborns or half-bloods. Longbottom, she said. No surprise there. He'd been helping Sprout prepare for the lessons. Malfoy? A ripple ran through the class, and there were scattered hisses. Of course. He'd been so quiet in this class, bearing Luna's chatter with remarkable fortitude, that Hermione had dared to hope that he wouldn't qualify for this special group. No such luck. 
The Slytherin hadn't so much as looked at her in classes all day. Proud rounded out the group with two seventh-year Slytherin boys, then addressed the rest of the class. Please review the chapter on the venomous tentacular until I return. She led the chosen six out of the main greenhouses and into the smaller structure. There was little to see, really. No plants, just a large cupboard and three long wooden tables with stools. A weak sun shone through the greenhouse's only clear window above. Take your seat, please, Sprout said briskly. I've divided you into pairs, alphabetically by last name. Grange and Greengrass, Longbottom and Malfoy, Stern and Wheelwright. Hermione glanced at Neville with concern, but her friend just shrugged and joined Malfoy at the table. Hermione found herself directly facing Malfoy, but at least she didn't have to work with him. She was so thankful to avoid Malfoy, in fact, it didn't even hit her that she was paired with Astoria until the young woman took her seat, eyeing Hermione with regal disdain. Malfoy has a very specific type, Jenny's voice echoed in her thoughts. Slutty, gorgeous, rich, pure blood, bitch. Hermione couldn't help but wonder how far things had gone between Malfoy and the tall beauty opposite her. Astoria's hair, a rich golden colour, drew back from an arrow straight centre part to shining braids that wound around her head. Diamonds glittered in her ears and peeped above the collar of her uniform shirt. Hermione didn't know Astoria very well. She was just Daphne Greengrass's little sister, and Daphne was vain, idle, not worth noticing. This Greengrass, however, could not be ignored. Ginny considered Astoria a formidable opponent in Quidditch, and Hermione had seen her performance in Herbology, the only class they shared. I wonder what she was like last year, Hermione thought. And then you follow the Caras, Astoria, Crucio, innocent students. Do you miss those days, a school free of mudbloods, with plenty of frightened children to terrorize? Such questions filled her mind as she held Astoria's tilted blue eyes, now slightly wary. Your money and blood mean nothing to me, Hermione told the other woman silently. Go ahead, start something. I'm waiting. Didn't know how long the staring contest would have lasted, but one of the glass panes behind Professor Sprout snapped loudly and the entire class jumped. Hermione tore her gaze from Astorias to see a large, multi-branched crack in the pink-painted glass. Dear me, Sprout said, flustered. She repaired her glass with a flick of her wand. Hermione bit her lips, silently cursing her lack of control, her eyes meeting Malfoy's briefly. His brow was creased slightly as he watched her and Astoria. A parchment and quill appeared on the table before Hermione, and she was grateful to have something else to look at. Hands of all students under eighteen have signed a waiver, but the three eighteen-year-olds here must sign their own waivers, releasing the Ministry of Magic from any liability, Sprout said. Hermione scanned the document quickly. Typical boilerplate, promising not to sue the Ministry if she was injured or disfigured in any way. She also would sign away all rights for her family to sue on her behalf if she suffered a fatal incident. What kind of plant was this? She shrugged inwardly and picked up the quill. She and her friends had cheated death every year they attended this school. She highly doubted a plant would finish her off now. The three signed documents flew into Professor Sprout's hand, and there was a short silence while everyone waited for something to happen. All the waivers include a confidentiality clause, Sprout said. The parchment has been magically treated, so if any student shares information about this plant with others or smuggles class material out of this greenhouse, there will be uncomfortable consequences. Neville turned slightly to grin at Hermione, who smiled back, thinking of Marietta Escombe and Dumbledore's army. Malfoy looked at the two of them with narrowed eyes. We will be studying a semi-sentient plant, Sprout went on. Can anyone tell me what that is? Hermione and Neville raised their hands in the same instant, so she didn't mind that Sprout selected her friend. Semi-sentient plants can perceive or feel things, Neville said breathlessly. Some, like the parrot pot, can even communicate. Yes, ten points to Gryffindor, Sprout said smiling. While the parrot pot is fairly harmless, often only repeating the words spoken to it, the plant we will be studying is rather more aggressive. She waved her wand, and a single parchment appeared on each table. It was a drawing of a flowering plant in a pot. Its branches curled like vines, curving over the pot and reaching outwards. 
The blossom's petals were broad and also curled, with sharp thorns clearly visible. Brown waved her wand again, and two thin books appeared on each table. The money picked hers up. It was titled, The Way of the Winkweed. She looked up in surprise. She'd never heard of that plant. The faintest of lines appeared on Astoria's brow. Winkweed is an extremely rare plant, Sprout began in a lecturing tone, and there was a small rustle as the students rushed to take notes. Its proper name is Wota Winchen, and it is also known as the Hoodwing Plant, Astoria said. And now please, Miss Greengrass, Sprout said, but yes, you are correct. It is also known as the Hoodwing Plant. Is there anything else you would like to tell us, Miss Greengrass? It is very dangerous, Astoria said frostily, and illegal to cultivate. Yes, Sprout said. While the plant remains extremely rare, it is beginning to spread beyond the dark, cool, isolated environments in favors. Therefore, the ministry is allowing a select number of herbologists and students to study it. Fortunately, winkweed is a fragile plant and difficult to pollinate, but it is aggressive, if not vicious, if threatened. Your assignment today is to read the first chapter of The Way of the Winkweed and label the drawing before you. The class will have no homework. All reading and studying will be accomplished in class. You may proceed. Proud turned and left the room, and every student immediately opened his or her book. Hermione was disappointed that they wouldn't get a glimpse of the plan today, but perhaps that was best. She immediately dove into the text. Winkweed was discovered in 1567 by a fur trapper in the Caucasus Mountains and... Hermione looked up suddenly. Greengrass, what are you doing? she hissed. Her partner had picked up her quill and was about to mark the drawing. The assignment, Granger, Astoria gave her a mocking smile. Professor assigns, students complete. Surely you are familiar with the concept? Vaguely, thank you, Hermione smiled back. Not the instructions are to read the chapter, then mark the drawing. Note the conjunctive adverb then in that sentence. Surely you are familiar with that concept? Astoria waved a dismissive hand. Unnecessary. This is obviously the stem, for example. Nothing is obvious about this plant, Hermione said. I never heard of a winkweed and you obviously know next to nothing. Making assumptions sound like a quick way to end up in St. Mungo's. And I thought Gryffindors had courage. And I thought Slytherins had an ounce of self-preservation. The two women glared at each other until Astoria set down her quill and picked up her book. Hermione read through the first chapter, pleased to be reading more quickly than Astoria. The other woman had been right about the stem, of course, but that wasn't the point. Hermione had hoped to read the second chapter while waiting for her partner, but the rest of the book was empty, no doubt enchanted to reveal its chapters one at a time. Astoria closed her book and looked down her nose at Granger. Even sitting, Hermione was a few inches shorter. I assume we may mark the drawing now, unless the brightest witch of our age has an objection. Her voice dripped with acid. None at all, Hermione said brightly. You may label the stem if you like. It seems like a fairly conventional plant in terms of structure. Yes, that was readily apparent to the discerning eye, Astoria said, marking other parts of the drawing with quick efficiency. The two women worked in silence, caught in subtle competition to provide the most labors. Perhaps the seminar won't be so bad, Hermione thought, as long as they didn't talk. Never and Malfoy had also discovered the virtues of silent partnership. They had finished their drawing without exchanging more than a few words. Sprout re-entered the greenhouse. Mr. Malfoy, she said, the headmistress would like to see you in her office. Malfoy looked surprised, but immediately packed up his things and left. Hermione frowned after him, wondering. I know what you're doing, Astoria said. Hermione turned back to the way of the winkweed. It's called reading, you should try it. I heard you defending him at lunch. Be assured he will never be so desperate. Astoria sat with the curl of her perfectly painted mouth. His family may be in disgrace, Granger, but they will never sink so low. Hermione sniffed. If you're speaking of the Malfoys, I don't think it's possible for them to sink any lower. You think you can redeem him? Still an ancient wizarding title. You! 
The man he stared at the other woman in amazement. Astoria thought she wanted to be a Malfoy, live in a Malfoy manor where she was tortured, with Lucius Malfoy for a father-in-law. She couldn't help shaking her head and grinning a little. Good Godric, I thought you Slytherins were supposed to know people. You honestly think I'd aspire to anything so cursed and empty? Sentence myself to such a cold and miserable life? Astoria smirked. I've seen him look at you. Wouldn't it really be so cold? Hermione spent every spare minute in the library over the next week trying to develop a potion that could identify a blood sample. It was a first vital step to finding the person who wrote the message since McGonagall's interviews with students and staff had revealed nothing and only appeared to strengthen the case against Malfoy. The Wizarding World's attitude towards blood was shockingly medieval, Hermione concluded, almost worshipful. Few witches and wizards cared to look beyond its fearsome power and see blood as a substance. A substance that could be identified. It took days just to pinpoint the differences between magical blood, muggle blood and animal blood. She'd never have succeeded except Snape's private library had been transferred to the restricted section after his death. And that man knew a few things about blood and potions. Then she worked up a methodology to match blood, a concept common in muggle detective shows, but shockingly neglected in the wizarding world. Now the recipe for the blood potion was developed, at least in theory, and Hermione was anxious to begin. But she didn't know how she could without Malfoy, and they still weren't speaking. This potion was more complex than Fiducia, and she wasn't sure she could brew it successfully even with Malfoy's help. The Slytherin had returned to his former reserve, looking a bit like he had in sixth year, his eyes ringed with shadows. He spoke to Hermione in patience only when necessary, and waved away Ron's baiting comments. Hermione began to fret. What if he ignored her ultimatum? What if he didn't feel the need to regain her trust after all? Had she misjudged him entirely? How could she ever trust a Malfoy whose very name meant bad faith? Malfoy was her only option, though. Nobody else was adept enough. Hermione seriously considered burying Snape's portrait from McGonagall's office and propping it on a shelf in the potions lab. She was that desperate. Hermione was sitting in her beanbag in Dada, trying to think of a way to blackmail Slughorn into helping her when Bluebell's wind chime signaled the end of class. A huge relief. The session had focused on the language of flowers as part of the Dada professor's Love is the Answer thesis. Hermione continued to resent Bluebell's teaching style. Without a textbook or syllabus, there was no way to prepare, which meant she'd spent the entire class watching Neville wipe the floor with her in recitations as Bluebell transformed a quill into various flowers and everyone noted their meanings. Dia was surprisingly good at the lesson as well, and Malfoy's absence meant a peaceful, if academically barren, afternoon. Hermione thought about sending Bluebell a basket of dark purple anemones to represent her fading hope that this class would ever help her with her nudes. Have an apple blossom day, Bluebell called as they left. Hermione grunted in annoyance. I am a swan floating over the pond. I am at peace. Hermione? What the fuck? she shouted. Then she focused. She was standing by the potions dungeon with no idea how she got there. And Theo was looking at her quizzically. Hermione, are you all right? He touched her right wrist, and she could feel his smooth, cold fingers on hers. What are you doing here? My special potions project, she said, yanking her hand back nervously. Which was somewhat true. She needed to cross-reference the ingredients needed for a blood potion with the dungeon stores. Really? Can I help? His eager expression gave Hermione a pang of guilt. They hadn't yet set a date to go to Hogsmeade. She'd been so distracted. Thank you, Theo, but I don't think you're ready for this kind of potion, she said. Merlin Hermione, you know how to build up a man, she grinned. Oh, Theo, she said, fluttering her eyelashes. Could you help me with my little potion? I'm trying to make it pink and bubbly, but it's still just a bit too orange. And, oh dear, I've dropped my guardy roots. Let me just pick them up. Theo raised an eyebrow. Let me get this straight. I had to watch Draco practically licking his plate at dinner last week, but you object to a little harmless... Hermione, another voice interrupted. She looked away from Theo, exacerbated to see Ernie McMillan standing before them. The head boy was taller now, but still all earnestness and big ears. Hello, Ernie, 
she said. The half above had been trying to get her to join the seventh and eighth year social committee, but she'd sworn off student government this year. I told you I can't help you plan the Halloween feast. It's not that. Although we could really use you, Annie said. We are trying to brainstorm ways to incorporate into house unity into the proceedings and so far. What are you after then, Macmillan? Theo cut in testily. I've just come from the hatmistress's office, Annie said. They are waiting for you, Hermione. Who? All of us from the Ministry of Magic, Ernie said. They're arresting Draco Malfoy. Chapter 17 Truth and Consequences Hermione and Theo stared at the head boy. Arresting Draco Malfoy, Hermione repeated. Arresting him? For what? Theo wanted to know. Ernie shrugged. For such a busybody eager to organize things, he had a distinct lack of curiosity about anything that mattered. They didn't say, but it's high time they did something about the Death Eater. Hermione ignored this, leaving Theo without a word and running up to McGonagall's second floor office. Ernie trailed behind, panting. Her mind whirled. Oros at Hogwarts, arresting Malfoy. How was that possible? Where was the proof? Malfoy may be considered an adult in the wizarding world, but his status as a Hogwarts student preempted that. Oros could not simply dance in and arrest a student without. A powdered porcupine, and he gasped at a gargoyle. The head boy stayed below, and Hermione climbed the spiraling stairs more slowly, attempting to make calming breath. The large circular office looked much the same as it had after the Battle of Hogwarts, with the pensive and the sorting hat, with the addition of new portraits of Dumbledore and Snape. Two wizards in oil robes stood before McGonagall's massive claw-footed desk, their backs to Hermione. Am I to understand? Hermione asked, her voice like ice. That an arrest is taking place here? The auras turned, and one of them was Harry, looking older and yet exactly the same, his black hair still tousled and round glasses balanced precariously on his nose. He rushed forward to pull her into a hug. Harry! she squeaked. Hermione dropped her back and hugged him back hard, eyes filling with tears. She'd missed him so much. Look at you, so handsome! She stepped back, running her hands over his dark aura robes with the Ministry of Magic crest. Her eyes found his face again, and he gave her a significant look. Hermione, he said, tilting his hat toward the other aura, and McGonagall. Oh, of course, official business. She blushed and turned to look at Malfoy, who stood between the two striped armchairs. What's with the scowl? Merlin Malfoy looks like he writes blood-soaked messages on walls every day and twice on Tuesdays. So Hermione looked at McGonagall instead. Headmistress, Malfoy is a student here, and you simply can't allow him to be taken from Hogwarts without proof. Nobody is taking anyone, Miss Granger, McGonagall said. Had Order Shackerbolt, Kingsley Shackerbolt smiled at Hermione, and Assistant Order Potter are here to administer Veritas serum to Mr. Malfoy. Hermione's jaw dropped. What? You can't force... It was Mr. Malfoy's idea, the headmistress said. Mr. Malfoy contacted me this morning, volunteering to be questioned under Veritas serum, on the condition that you, Miss Granger, are present for the entire interview. What do you say, Granger? Malfoy asked gracefully, dropping into one of the armchairs. His scowl had disappeared, and he now appeared utterly relaxed. Hermione didn't answer, just stared down at him, horrified. The Ministry's aura office had been most displeased with Malfoy's sentence, considering it entirely too lenient. Kingsley himself had been quoted in The Prophet, saying that all former Death Eaters should be given a Dementus kiss. Ministry baristas continued to appeal to Wizengamot's verdict and sentence, and Malfoy had surrendered himself to Auras for interrogation on the Veritas serum. What is the procedure? Hermione asked Kingsley, finding her voice. Kingsley produced a small butter from his robe. Quite simple, Hermione, he said, smiling. Mr. Malfoy will drink this Veritas serum and answer a few questions. Hermione frowned. He certainly will not. You two can't feed him a fat dose of Veritas serum and then grill him with any full questions that pops into your heads. This interview concerns the two dye mudblood messages, correct? Kingsley and Harry cringed slightly and she huffed. Correct, she repeated. Yes, it does, Hermione, Kingsley said severely. We are taking this case quite seriously and we expect Mr. Malfoy's full cooperation. Mr. Malfoy did agree to this, Miss Granger, McGonagall said. Hermione waved that away. He's an idiot ferret. What do you expect? 
Kingsley and Harry glance at Malfoy to see his reaction, but Malfoy's smile only widened. A nice opportunity for the Aura's office, isn't it? Hermione went on, eyes narrowed at Kingsley. Maybe a chance to get a few Death Eater tidbits as well, hmm? Well, I won't have it. Kingsley and Harry goggled at her, but McGonagall was unaffected. What do you suggest then, Miss Granger? she asked. A half bottle only, and any questions will be written out beforehand and approved by me. Kingsley and Harry began protesting, but McGonagall cut them both off with a look. Mr. Malfoy? she asked. Malfoy looked smug. Don't ask me. Apparently I have no say in any of this. This is ridiculous, headmistress, Kingsley said with a scowl. We are Aurus, we have a responsibility to protect the public, and it is our duty to question Mr. Malfoy thoroughly either here, he glared at Malfoy, or at the Ministry. You aren't taking him anywhere, Hermione stormed. He is a student. Yes, he is, Miss Granger, McGonagall said, and as headmistress of Hogwarts, I am perfectly capable of protecting Mr. Malfoy's rights. Well, you've done rubbish of a job so far, Hermione said. Hermione, Harry cried. Kingsley's face was stern. Mr. Malfoy, we appreciate your agreement to be questioned under Veritas Serum, and I'm sure you wouldn't want to go back on your word. Malfoy looked up at them all. Eyebrows raised slightly. He's the one under suspicion, and he's calmer than any of us, Hermione thought. I have no intention of going back on my word. Malfoy's voice was cool. I agreed to be questioned under Veritas Serum, provided that Granger was present. If her demands are not met, she will likely stomp out of here in Gryffindor fit of righteous anger, and then there can be no interview. Silence followed this statement. McGonagall passed her lips thoughtfully, while the Iris looked simply furious. Hermione gave Malfoy a rare smile of approval. She always appreciated a nice turn of logic. Very well, Kingsley sat through gritted teeth. I will write out the questions. And half a bottle of potion only? Hermione reminded him. Ye may use my desk order, Shacklebot, McGonagall said, rising from her seat. The headmistress moved behind Malfoy's arms chair, standing over him almost protectively now. Harry stepped closer to Hermione. My, what are you doing? Protecting a fellow student, Harry, she said. But it's Malfoy, he hissed, sounding just like Ron. So, she hissed back, his mother saved your life, remember? The Ministry can't simply drug people in and pump them for information. Oh, I'd bet anything, Malfoy knows something, Harry said. I mean, Hermione, look at him. They both glanced over at Malfoy, whose smile had admittedly turned a trifle villainous. The Ministry could probably convict him on horse-stealing on looks alone. Kingsley sat down the parchment and stood. Oh, I trust this will be sufficient. Hermione replaced him behind the desk, sitting in McGonagall's chair without thinking, and picked up Kingsley's quill. You're mad, she said, striking out question. This one needs to go, and this, and this, and certainly this question isn't relevant. She handed a list back to Kingsley. The head aura was outraged. Questions about Death Eaters are vital to this investigation. Malfoy has already testified to the Wizengamot in the Ministry about the Death Eaters and his actions during the war, Hermione said, not backing down. New evidence has come to light. And then obtain Mr. Malfoy's permission for another interview and ask about that, Hermione said. She folded her hands on the desk before her and looked beadily at Kingsley. This interview is about the two dyed mudblood messages. Hermione, Harry begged. No, you have to keep saying that. Fear of saying a thing only increases fear of the thing itself, Hermione said. Harry and Malfoy both rolled their eyes. I won't limit this office to these questions, Kingsley said decidedly. Take it or leave it, Shacklebolt, Malfoy sneered. Kingsley clenched his fists and Hermione watched him silently count to ten. Very well, Mr. Malfoy, he said and handed Malfoy the clear bottle. Malfoy brought it to his mouth and took a quick gulp, leaving half the potion. The room was suddenly tense. Malfoy's smile was gone and his eyes took on a faintly haunted look. McGonagall put her hand on the back of Malfoy's chair while Hermione used every drop of self-control to remain still behind the desk. This is a terrible idea. Kingsley's voice was suddenly soft. What is your name, sir? Draco Lucius Malfoy. His voice was equally soft. Were you present at Gryffindor Tower the night before the blood letters were discovered on the common room wall? Yes, Malfoy said evenly. 
What were you doing in the common room that night, Mr. Malfoy? I was there to see Granger, Malfoy said, his voice still soft. Why? Harry asked. Harry, Hermione snapped, that question is not on the list. But it was too late. Malfoy was compelled to answer the question. She was being an interfering busybody on my behalf, and I wanted to find out why. His mouth snapped shut. Not bad, Hermione thought. What? Harry began, but stopped at Hermione's ferocious look. Did you write the words in blood on the wall, Mr. Malfoy? Kingsley asked, frowning at his parchment. Malfoy looked at him calmly. No. Did you assist the person who wrote the words in any way? No. Do you know who wrote the words, Mr. Malfoy? No. When did you leave the Gryffindor common room that night? Granger's courted me out about ten minutes after midnight, Malfoy said. Hermione saw you out, Harry asked. Ye two were alone in the common room. Yes and yes, Malfoy said, teeth clenched. Harry! Hermione cried. Harry ignored her and stepped closer to Malfoy. What were you doing in the common room with her? Were you drunk? Hermione stood. Harry, stop it! I was drinking siren scotch. I was waiting for Granger to wake up from her nap on the sofa. Murphy's voice was clipped, and it was obvious his words were completely driven by the patient. I was not drunk. I was, however, slightly intoxicated, so I couldn't help admiring her legs. You were drinking and oogling Hermione while she slept. Harry looked ready to do a murder. Murphy smirked. Apparently so. Hermione's face burned. Quit cutting the fool, Harry. She snapped, moving between her friend and Malfoy. You can't feed the man truth serum and ask him personal questions and then explain because you don't like the answer. Or a shekelbolt, McGonagall said. I believe you have a few more official questions. Kingsley, who had been watching the exchange between Harry and Malfoy with wide eyes, cleared his throat and looked at his parchment again. Mr. Malfoy, you were the first to see the second bloody message Wednesday morning, correct? Oh, I can't answer that, Malfoy said. Kingsley looked at McGonagall. We need to administer more verita serum. Ye most certainly will not, the headmistress answered. Half a bottle only, you agreed. I have not finished my questions, the head aura said. It is unfortunate that your assistant wasted time with questions not on the list, but that is no reason to break your word, McGonagall said. Kingsley and Harry both looked ready to explode now, so Hermione reluctantly stepped in again. The girl here was to clear Malfoy's name, not send the auras away with more reasons to be suspicious. The Veritas serum is still in effect, she told them impatiently. Hermione looked down at Malfoy, speaking directly to him for the first time. Tell them. You, Granger, need to have more fun. I'm extremely fun. Tell them. Malfoy sighed dramatically. I cannot tell you, Shacklebold, if I was the first to see the message. It's likely that I was, but anybody living or dead who entered the passageway before me could have seen it first. Kingsley crossed his eyes and opened them again, trying to keep a rein on his temper. Very well. When you saw the messages Wednesday morning, Mr. Malfoy, what did you do? I blocked the passageway with a dark mist so other students could not see it, Malfoy intoned. Then I wrote a note to the headmistress and found a student to take it to her in the Great Hall. The note is on my desk, or a shackerbolt, McGonagall said. Things I picked up the folded parchment she indicated, then passed it to Harry. What did you do after that? Kingsley asked. Oh, I stood in front of the mist to ensure no students entered. McGonagall and Granger arrived soon after. Did you write that message? Kingsley asked. No, I did not. Do you know who wrote that message? No. Do you know why the message appeared in that particular space? Harry put in. No. Hermione blinked. That question wasn't on the list, but it was interesting. Why had the message appeared outside the ancient runes classroom? Her mind began turning over ideas, but then Harry spoke again. Well, did you and Hermione have an argument in that location? Harry asked. Murphy scowled. Yes. Hermione was shocked. How did Harry know about that? Run, maybe. What did you argue about? Harry asked. Don't answer that! Hermione cried, suddenly horrified, but it was too late. Murphy's face was red from strain, but he had to answer the question. I behaved badly toward her, Malfoy gritted out. I invaded her privacy. I read a journal in her back. I tried to take advantage. Harry's face was red as well. What did? It? Don't you dare, Hermione shouted. If you want to hear about the argument, you can ask me. I tried to apologize, but she wouldn't listen. Malfoy looked relieved to be finished with the answer. He gave Harry a thin smile. She told me to fuck myself.
Kings and Harry both looked at Hermione with approval. Ora Shekerbold, Assistant Ora Potter. This interview is at an end, McGonagall said. She walked over to the fireplace and gestured toward the urn of flu powder. Kingsley looked at Malfoy speculatively. Harry took Hermione's hand and pulled her aside. What the hell is going on with you and Malfoy? he hissed. Ron wrote that message you two had a big fight before ancient runes said you hated each other. Now you're defending him to the Ministry. He is not a criminal, Harry, Hermione said uncomfortably. Harry frowned over at a Slytherin. He sadly took advantage, did he? It's fine, Harry. I handled it. I can't believe you were alone with him at that party. Where was Ron? Ron! Hermione barked out a laugh. Ron left me at the Three Broomsticks that night when I refused to start dating him again. Then he got stinking drunk at the Gryffindor party and stormed out of the common room. Did he tell you that? Potter! cried Kingsley, who had been conducting his own whispered argument with McGonagall by the fireplace. We are leaving. Harry slung his arm around Hermione's neck and pulled her closer. Oh, I hope you know what you're doing, he shook his head. Merlin! Harry! Hermione bit her lip. Come see Jenny soon. He nodded, his face suddenly expressionless, and walked over to the fireplace. Hermione followed him with a glance at Malfoy. The Slytherin had apparently recovered from any small embarrassment, now lunged in his chair with an insolent smile. Take care now, Malfoy called to Kingsley. Kingsley rounded on him, a handful of purple flu powder dribbling from his clenched fist. Malfoy, he barked suddenly, are you currently in contact with any Death Eaters? Shacklebolt, how dare you? McGonagall shouted. Malfoy jumped to his feet, his own fists clenched, the look on his face frightened Hermione, and her breath caught. Even Harry looked aghast. No, Malfoy ground out, I am not in contact with any of them. Any active Death Eaters consider me a blood trader and would happily murder me if given the chance. Hogwarts is the best place for me right now. I certainly wouldn't trust anyone in your pitiful Aura's office, except perhaps Pothead here. Malfoy looked as if he wanted to cut out his tongue for those words, but Hermione couldn't help the smile spreading across her face. She looked triumphantly at Harry, who nodded reluctantly. Kingsley's face was full of frustrated rage. Ministry of Magic, Aura's office, he snarled, throwing his remaining powder into the fireplace and disappearing. Thank you, headmistress, Harry said to McGonagall. I'm sorry for this scene in your office. Don't apologize to me, Mr. Potter, she said tartly. Apologize to Miss Granger and Mr. Malfoy. I'm sorry, Hermione, Harry hesitated. Malfoy? I forgive you, Potter, Malfoy said magnanimously. Sometimes incompetence can't be helped. Do you always have to be an enormous git? Harry snapped. Apparently, I hardly know I'm doing it any more, Malfoy said. His eyes cut over to Hermione. Oh, I think Granger likes it, though. Oh, God, Harry, please leave, Hermione begged. With pleasure, Harry said, scooping up powder and throwing it into the flames. Ministry of Magic, Aura's office. Harry vanished and Hermione rounded on Malfoy. You! You! She couldn't find words bad enough to describe him. I must say, Mr. Malfoy, that you are often your own worst enemy, McGonagall observed. Undoubtedly, Malfoy said. You will remain at this office until the Veritaserum is quite out of your system. You may rest assured that I will ask you no questions. She continued, sitting behind her desk. Thank you, headmistress, Malfoy said. Have a seat, Granger. No, I'm leaving, Hermione snapped, picking up her bag near the door. Malfoy stood. Oh, are you sure? he asked her. There's nothing you feel the least bit curious about. You've certainly earned at least one question. She tossed her head. No, I won't take advantage of you like that. Of all the mad, idiotic, dangerous stunts. Come on, Granger he said, stepping toward her. Ask me about my family. Ask me about the codex. Ask me how I slept that night. You may never have this opportunity again. Stop wheeling, I said no. He halted a few feet from her, eyes glittering. Come on, take advantage of me. Wasn't this little interview enlightening? Hermione sniffed. No, Malfoy, she said. You didn't say one thing in this office that I didn't already know. Malfoy blinked, startled, and she spun on her heel and left the room. Chapter 18 Gryffindor vs. Slytherin You call this a potions lab? It was Saturday morning, and Malfoy stood in the doorway of the tiny, narrow room, unimpressed. Light filtered weakly through the lab's single grimy window, 
Rusted chains hung from the ceiling, and half-melted red candles appeared to drip blood on every surface. A scarred mahogany cabinet dominated the far wall, its door hanging drunkenly from broken hinges. A table shoved against the right-hand wall, holding three cobweb-shrouded cauldrons, while a high rickety shelf lined the opposite side. The money, on the other hand, was beaming. It's perfect, she said, as Malfoy shut the door behind them. It's just a door away from Stuckon, yet separate from the main potions dungeon, so he has deniability if we blow ourselves up. Charming, Malfoy said. We should get your squeaky mouse club to sort this out. No need for that, Hermione said, poking around the dusty jaws on the shelves. A few cleaning spells. She stopped to look up at him. You do know cleaning spells, don't you? Malfoy shrugged. Of course you don't, she said, giving him a rather reptilian stare. You've always had oppressed house elves without proper pay or benefits. Don't start spooing on me. Society for the promotion of elfish welfare. Nobody is abusing house elves at Malfoy Manor, Malfoy said. My father's treatment of Dobby was one of his convictions, if you recall. Even if my mother and I wanted to harm an elf, it would be incredibly stupid. They are well treated. But they are not free. Malfoy rolled his eyes. A department of medical creature officials offered them freedom right after the war, tried to give them the Ministry of Magic sweatshirts, and the elves cried for a week. But if it was presented in the right way, drop it, Granger. Fine, she huffed. Get your wand out, then. I'm not cleaning this room alone. Hermione gave her own wand a small flick. Scorchify, she said, and the dust vanished from half the table. Scorchify? Murphy said in a bored tone and the table's other half was wiped clean as well. Hermione moved closer to the table's largest cauldron, brushing Malfoy's arm, and there was the sound of smashing glass. She looked over her shoulder. Malfoy had bumped into the shelves, and the back of a Slytherin Quidditch jersey was now covered in green slime and shards of glass. Malfoy, you spilled all the pickled toad! Hermione raised her wand, chanting, Tergeo! And the charm siphoned the toad guts off his back. Don't forget the little tap, it's very important. She turned back to the cauldron, holding up her lit wand to see crawling mass of spiders inside. Ig! she said, flinching away. She brushed Malfoy again, and he crashed into the broken cabinet this time, sending both doors to the floor with a clatter. Malfoy, what's wrong with you? she demanded. Oh, I'm fine, he snapped, siphoning the dust off his jersey and hair. He gave the cabinet an appraising look, then cleared it of dust as well. Lowering his wand, he ran his hand over the cabinet's interior and across the top, then raised his wand again and began a series of complicated waves. Standing behind Malfoy, Hermione craned her neck to see the cabinet practically repairing itself. Malfoy's intricate handwork continued as he muttered spells under his breath. In no time at all, the Slytherin had expertly reattached the cabinet doors and installed a new transfigured wooden panel and claw foot. The cabinet now looked brand new, probably better than you, its mahogany finish glowing softly. Maffa lowered his wand and stood still, his back tense. Hermione said nothing, just turned back to the cauldrons, ignoring the sudden ache in her chest. She had to score the cauldrons down the metal, stripping away layers of grime and failed potions. By the time she'd finished, Maffa had finished cleaning and repairing the window above the cabinet, now propped half open to let in the warm outside breeze. Malfoy, do you need any? Hermione began stepping closer, and he jerked sideways, slamming into the cabinet again. She bit her lip to avoid a smile. Relax, Malfoy, she said, touching his sleeve. It's all right. Oh, perfectly relaxed, he snapped, but he did stop trying to destroy the furniture. With two ones at work, the rest of the room was spotless clean in no time, with the shelves dusted and sorted and all three cauldrons spider-free. But now a mind of cleaning made the laboratory any bigger, and its two occupants were forced to stand close together at the table. A draught from the window brought that warm sunshine scent with the faintest trace of cologne. It's time to look at the ingredients, she said, a bit more quietly than she'd intended. Please hand me my back and don't open it. Murpha looked offended. I thought you'd trusted me again. I trust you not to write murderous threats in blood, Malfoy. It's not a high bar. You always knew I didn't write those messages, he said, giving her the bag. You were testing me. That was quite Slytherin, quite dangerous. 
Well, I didn't expect you to run off to take Veritas serum, Imani said, spreading out her parchment. Desperate times, he murmured. Desperate? You? She strove to keep her tone even. This was a very smart room. Terribly desperate, he said into her hair. Malfoy? Malfoy stepped back slightly, crossing his arms and leaning against the cabinet. He looked down his nose at her. You're wasting time with Theo, Granger. You think he'll be any easier to manage? A smarling, scrubbed-up, more palatable version of what you really want? Never presume again to know what I want, Malfoy, Hermione said, her voice purposely cold this time. I am far from over what happened in a charms classroom, and I am not your plaything either. Oh, of course not. You're something better, Malfoy smirked. I now have my own little war hero. Merlin, if you could have seen yourself bursting into McGonagall's office like an angry lioness, defending me tooth and claw. Oh, the look on Pothead's face. Don't call him that, and I thought you didn't like me fixing things for you. I don't like you fixing things behind my back, he responded, uncrossing his arms and pointing a long finger at her. But feel free to continue leaping into situations, yelling and defending my honor. It's very arousing. Someday they'll come to drag you off to Azkaban for littering, and I won't do a thing about it, she promised. But until that happy event arrives, do me a favor and look this recipe and ingredients list. We'll need to gather a few things in the forbidden forest. Bloodroot? Acromental of venom? He moved to her side and scanned the parchment, frowning. What exactly are we brewing here, Granger? I call it blood obsidity, or blood identity potion. If we do it right, it will help us identify the animal or person who provided the blood in the message. Malfoy sat down the parchment and looked down at her again. He was uncomfortably close. What? she asked. Where did you get this recipe? he asked sternly. It wavers on the edge of dark magic. Nowhere. I created it. Have you tested it? She shifted nervously. Uh, no. That's why it's called experimental. He eyed her again without speaking, his face unusually serious. What? Sometimes you frighten me, Granger, Malfoy said. Podhead may have been the chosen one, but he had a savior too, and I'm looking at her. Hermione stared up at him, her throat suddenly tied. That's nonsense. Don't be so sure. He looked down at the ingredients list and returned to his usual light tone. I assume that brutish gamekeeper of yours will help us find the slot. His name is Professor Hagrid, and yes, he will. She glowered at him. And you will treat Hagrid with respect, or I'll do this alone. Malfoy waved a hand. Yes, yes. Care to tell me why we need six bushels of clover blossoms? Hermione coughed. It's um, for um the odor. Murphy raised an eyebrow. We have to put something in there or the potion will smell like rotting meat. We might need more than six bushels, actually. And I'm putting you on clover picking Gucci, Malfoy, for insulting Hagrid. She expected him to protest, but he merrily nodded, which meant he was up to something. She opened her mouth to ask, but decided she didn't want to know. This takes two or three weeks to brew, Malfoy asked. Yes. He sat the list down. All right, I have to go to the Quidditch pitch. You'll be at today's match? Of course, she said airily. I'll be there for Ginny. She picked a jar of lizard hearts from the shelf and shook it. They didn't look very fresh. Mm-mm, so you say, Malfoy brushed past her and opened the door. He turned to look at her, his hair backlit by the light from the main dungeon. So you say, he repeated with a thin smile. But you'll be watching me. And contrary to my usual preferences, do try to control yourself today, Granger. Don't go running out on the pitch if I get injured throwing hexes and what not. Would not look good defending a Slytherin, no matter how fascinating. He noticed Hermione's hand tighten on the jar and managed to slip out before she had a chance to throw it. I am a pond, she told herself. I am a fucking unruffled pond. It was a perfect day for Quidditch, unreasonably warm with a gentle wind. Hermione and Neville had prime seats on the north side of the pitch, which had been rebuilt after the Battle of Hogwarts. The whole school had packed the stands for the first match of the season. Hermione congratulated herself for turning down McGonagall's offer to be head girl or even prefect, or she'd be patrolling right now and confiscating Weasley's Wizarding Wheeze product. Instead, she was relaxing with Neville, who also had a hazy grasp of Quidditch and didn't mind if she said wacky faint. Among a crowd of Gryffindors who were wildly cheering even though nothing had happened yet, Ginny was huddled with her team on the south end of the pitch. 
Most of the Slytherin players were in the air, practicing looping plays, leaving only Malfoy and Astoria on their side of the pitch in close discussion. Here, Hermione, Neville said in an undertone. He pulled two butterbeers from under his thin cloak. Neville, you shouldn't, she scolded, but she took the bottle anyway. Yes, she was very glad not to be head girl. Sipping her butterbeer, Hermione tried to enjoy the sun on her face and not fret about the blood potion ingredients she could be gathering. Merv and Astoria were still talking, facing each other about two feet apart. Glossy brooms in hand, Astoria obviously giving last-minute instructions. They made, Hermione had to admit, a striking couple. Both pale, tall and slender, with sleek, shining hair of gold and platinum. Astoria's hair was worked into a long, intricate braid down her back, woven with green ribbons. Merva was bent slightly toward her, listening attentively and occasionally nodding. A prince and his princess in green and silver. He could win her again, Hermione was certain. He could easily restore his family name among the purebloods. He was still handsome and rich after all. The rest of the wizarding world might not matter to him. Give it a few years and it would be like Voldemort had never risen, like the death and destruction and terror never happened, at least in his gilded world, so long as Lucius stayed in Azkaban. Whispers would always follow Draco and his pure-blood lady, but never truly touch their lives. What's wrong, Hermione? Neville asked. You look a little sick. In suffice, she said quickly, nodding at Ron, who, she just noticed, had pulled out of a deep dive and was looping past him with a wave. Arm had swooping and spinning. Malfoy kicked off away from Astoria and immediately launched into a corkscrew-like trajectory straight up into the air, then took the same swirling path down again. Show sure enough, Hermione muttered, then groaned as she saw Ron attempt the same move. He was a strong flyer, but nowhere near so graceful. Malfoy snickered, then made a cheeky pass by the Gryffindor stands, bowing at the booze. Did Malfoy just wink at you? Neville asked. Certainly not. Well, he wasn't winking at me. I don't know, Hermione teased. You two seem awfully chummy in herbology. Not as chummy as you and Malfoy and potions. Is it true you're brewing something with him in the practice lab? Hermione looked at her friend, surprised. Word did get around quickly. Yes, actually, we're working on some experimental potions. He's been decent as yet so far, for Malfoy anyway, Neville said. Hasn't insulted me once. Creepy. It won't last, she said. Never nodded in agreement and took another swig of butterbeer. Madame Hooch released a snitch and immediately the players swirled into action. Malfoy was in rare form, his flying drawing cheers from the Slytherins and even some impressed growls from the Gryffindors. Not the worst way to win over his own house, Hermione thought. A lot would be forgiven if he helped them win the Quidditch Cup. She took her head. Slytherins won the Quidditch Cup? Terrible notion. She pulled her eyes away from Malfoy's graceful circles and watched Ron make another clumsy but effective save. Slytherin's beaters were a real pair of ducks, almost comically large on their skinny brooms. They seemed to enjoy slamming into people more than hitting badgers with their bats. They followed the Lundy twins like scowling shadows, nearly knocking the Lundy sister off her broom. Ron was catching every quibble. Quacky? Quabby? While the Lundy brother scored twice as a sister distracted the Slytherin beaters. Keeper Astoria was screaming at her beaters now, a distraction that allowed another score on her, and the Gryffindors cheered wildly. The snitch was nowhere to be found. Ginny tried a few fake dives, but Malfoy refused to bite, simply continuing his sweeping circles. Then his body stiffened and his circles became tighter. Hermione's eyes narrowed. He's singing something, she said to Neville. Malfoy? He whispered, following her gaze. Malfoy was playing it cool, she could tell. Slang became less casual, and every curve brought him just a bit lower. She squinted, trying to calculate the trajectory. I think the snitch is by the far hoop, she said. Malfoy broke off to his right, cape flapping, and several things happened at once. Ginny went into a deep dive after him, and Hermione could hear Astoria shrieking orders. The two Slytherin beaters, on opposite sides of the field at the moment, flew at high speed straight for Malfoy and Ginny. We're going to ambush Ginny, Neville cried. Hermione shook her head. If she didn't know better, she'd think they were aiming for... Malfoy! She shouted, her voice lost in the screams of Gryffindors around her. Neville gave her a strange look. The crowd gasped as the snitch shot up, sparking in the sun, passing nearly under Malfoy's nose. 
He snatched it up and held it close to his chest. A second later, the two Slytherin beaters smashed into him, one from each side. Hermione was on her feet clutching Neville's hand. Malfoy! she shouted again. Crashed between two huge beaters, bearing in at full speed, bats in hand, Malfoy screamed once, and then his body tipped to the side, one arm hanging uselessly, the other still clutched at his chest. One leg flew out at an odd angle, and he lost his broom and began plummeting. Jenny dove after him, her wand out. Malfoy! Hermione screeched, Draco! Her bottle of butterbeer smashed at her feet, and she groped for her own wand to stop his fall. Malfoy landed with a thud on the pitch. Cursing his owners, Hermione pointed her wand and stared at the Slytherin beaters, who hovered nearby, looking smug. Suddenly, they both gasped and clutched their throat. Two strong hands grabbed her arms and forced her wand down. Hermione, stop it! Neville yelled in her ear. The beaters released, flew down to the pitch, and fell to their knees coughing. Astoria and Madame Hooch had reached Malfoy, who now lay on the grass unmoving. Ginny had reached the pitch and was backing out of the way, looking worried. Get off me! Hermione shouted, fighting against Neville's hold and struggling to leave her row. You can't, Hermione! Neville's voice was harsh in her ear. What's wrong with you? You can't go down there! Her friend grunted as Hermione jerked an elbow into his rib. She pushed out of her row, stepping into the aisle, but Neville's hand caught her arm before she could go any farther. All the stands were in an uproar, with both Slytherins and Gryffindors on their feet and flooding the aisles to get a better look. Merlin, Hermione, have you lost your mind? Neville cried. Stop fighting! Ow! Her elbow had kinetic again, this time with his jaw. Look, Madame Pomfrey's with him! Ow! Shit! Malfoy was still prone on the grass, utterly still, with Astoria kneeling beside him. The Slytherin beaters continued to cuff, although they could breathe now, while the rest of the players, both Gryffindor and Slytherin, stood silently around the pitch. Pomfrey conjured a stretcher and levitated Malfoy onto it. The stretcher floated off the pitch with Pomfrey and Astoria following. Malfoy was unconscious, and Hermione could see a long, pale arm hanging off the stretcher, the snitch slipping out of a nerveless hand and buzzing away. Hermione, stop struggling! Neville hissed in her ear. He had both arms around her now, and she couldn't use her wand. You can't go down there. She suddenly froze, remembering. No try to control yourself, Granger. Don't go running out on the pitch if I get injured, throwing hexes and what not. Merlin, she gasped. He knew. Who? Neville asked. Malfoy, she said, watching the injured blonde disappear into the castle. Malfoy knew he was going to be attacked. The mood in the Gryffindor common room was somber that night. Since Malfoy had caught the snitch and managed to retain it all the way to the ground, it was a Slytherin win, despite his injury. Hermione had talked to Theo briefly in the Great Hall after dinner. Oh, I guess it's great we won and all, Theo said. Big party in the dungeons tonight, but I'd rather take you to Hogsmeade. Theo was no great Quidditch fan. Any word on Malfoy? Hermione asked, trying to sound casual. Our story has in the infirmary. Draco has shattered bones in his arms and right knee. Theo reported, always in the know. He'll need a night with Skelligro, but he'll live, no thanks to those two beaters. McGonagall is still screaming at them in her office. They claim somebody choked them afterwards, but nobody knows who. Hermione flushed at the memory of her hexes. What had gotten into her? Oh, I could slip away from the Slytherin party, Theo said, edging closer. Perhaps a late dessert at that new Hogsmeade restaurant? Hermione shook her head. I'm sorry, Theo. I should stay with Ginny. This was her first big game as Quidditch captain, and to lose it at, like, Blaze will console her, I'm sure. Theo sat with a glint in his eyes. Not likely. She won't want to see any Slytherins. Ginny was tough and shrewd, but she was still a hot-tempered Weasley. Theo sighed. Quidditch. You'd think the wizarding world turned on every match. Hermione agreed fully. Back in the Gryffindor common room, Ginny was pounding fire whiskey with the team, and Ron was already half drunk. You want to tell me what happened today? Never asked in a low voice, joining her on the sofa by the fire. She sighed. There's nothing to tell, Nev. Great, Never said. Then you won't mind if I tell Ginny how you nearly charged a Quidditch pitch after Murphy was hurt, and how he warned you about a possible attack beforehand. Really, it's nothing. I need him for my experimental patients. Neville nodded. Experimental potions? Okay. He was silent for a moment, then went on. Let me tell you what I've been seeing, Hermione. 
You and Malfoy brew this crazy trust potion together in class and keep meeting up before ancient ruins. Then you two fall out and he shows up at the Gryffindor Tower, shouting to see you and fighting with Ron. Then you make up somehow and start working on experimental potions together, and he's talking to you about a text from other students. He held her eyes in his surprisingly stern blue ones. And today you practically break my ribs trying to get to him when he was hurt this afternoon. What in Merlin is going on here? You two are... No, she said quickly, we're not. Neville looked relieved. Oh, I thought you were dating not, which is crazy enough. Theo and I aren't dating either. Yet, she said. I did say I'd go to Hogsmeade with him, though. He looked around and lowered his voice. And what about hexing those beaters? That was vicious, Hermione. They couldn't breathe. I don't know what you're... Never flushed. I know what I saw, Hermione. How far would you have taken it if I hadn't stopped you? Did you see what they... I saw, he said grimly. I saw them and I saw you. You've been pulling your wand out a lot this year, and I'm not talking about defense against the dark arts. Oh, if you only knew, Neff, Hermione thought. McGonagall's out for blood, wanting to know who hexed those beaters, Never went on. It doesn't look very good for interhouse unity. Interhouse unity? Hermione snorted. What about house unity? Malfoy was attacked by his own damn beaters. Never rolled his eyes. Maybe Malfoy's been slightly less revolting this year, but I'm not going to get excited about snakes eating their own. I'm just here to take my nudes, and I thought that's why you were here too. Hermione remembered her life optimization organization plan. You're right, Neville. I have been a little distracted. She leaned back on the sofa and looked at him thoughtfully. We should organize a new study club. Never grunt. Oh, no. He put his head in a sense. I talk too much. We'll call it, we'll call it, pupil organization to review new. P-O-R-N? Porn? Never sputtered, raising his hands. He's got porn? Ginny asked alertly from her table of shots. Hermione? Never said. She wants to start a study group for nudes. With porn? Ron asked. Sort me up. Pupil organization to review nudes. Never said, grinning. This is really needed, Hermione said stubbornly. We eighth years came back to sit for our nudes after all. And we should invite all the houses to join. The whole room groaned. Not again. Hey, it's not a terrible idea, Ginny said. For your eighth years, anyways. No story guides, Ron pronounced, and the room cheered. Hermione was appalled. You can't prepare for newts without study guides. Or oh, I can, and I will, Ron said. I'm not joining porn if there are study guides. It's the pupils' organization to review newts, Hermione cried. Whatever. Can we stop talking about studying now? Ron asked. Would you rather talk about Quidditch? Hermione answered nastily. Down, girl. Never whispered. Hermione flushed. All the talk of nudes and Quidditch killed what small bust the common room had, and people began drifting upstairs to their dorms. Hermione had other plans, however, and after a quick visit upstairs to stuff the marauder's map in her jeans pocket, she returned to the common room to catch Ginny and Neville talking earnestly on the sofa. This can't be good. I can't believe you, Hermione, Ginny has. You hex them? They deserved it, Hermione said, sitting in the armchair opposite. Ginny frowned. You need to be careful with this Malfoy thing. What thing? Neville asked. Hermione, you told me you two weren't. We're not, she said, glaring at them both. Maybe you're not, but there's definitely a thing, Ginny said. He winked at her before the game today, Neville said. There's a lot of tension there, Ginny said. There's a lot of tension between you and Blaze, too, Hermione said, never groaned. I just want to stay out of it all, he said. Everyone's gone sparse these days. Ron, Dennis, the two of you, McGonagall. I won't let anyone else take the fall for those hexes, Hermione said. I'll tell McGonagall myself. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, Ginny said. You could be expelled. Are you kidding me? Never asked. Expel Hermione Granger. She might have to if the parents make a stink, Hermione said. Well, I've had it, Ginny said, yawning. I'm exhausted. I was up at six this morning, drawing up Quidditch plays, and we still lost a damn game. We talk about the hexing and the pawn tomorrow. She stood up, swaying slightly. Pupil organization to review newt, Hermione said. Ginny just grinned and yawned again. Good night, she said, heading upstairs. Neville stood as well. Um, oh, Nicker too, he said. You getting some sleep? 
I will, I promise, Emily said. I'm just going to sit by the fire for a bit. Her friend looked down at her, his face concerned. Be careful, Hermione. Malfoy is still trouble, you know. I know, she said, staring into the fire. Merlin, do I ever know? Chapter Notes Some readers have noted how badly Kingsley Shackerbolt behaved in the last chapter, and I agree. He's under great pressure from the Ministry, but that's no excuse. Kingsley gets a little character arc in this story, so we'll see what happens. Chapter 19 Recovery Hermione halted outside Infirmary's main door and unfolded Harry's Marauder's map. I solemnly swear I am up to no good, she whispered, tapping the parchment with her wand. Malfoy's was the only dot in the infirmary, Madame Pomfrey's dot was in her office just off the main ward. Hermione crept in cautiously, wishing she could light her wand, but infirmary was now protected by wards preventing non-medical spells. Hermione proved of the security measures as inconvenient as they were now. She slipped from room to room, feeling her way in the near darkness until she reached the main ward. The only light was a thin yellow line shining under Pomfrey's closed office door and the moonlight pouring onto the ward's single patient from the wide east window. She crept to Malfoy's bed, her trainers making no sound on the stone floor. Malfoy lay stretched out, looking impossibly long on the narrow bed. He was asleep, but the thin blankets were twisted around his middle and one pyjama-clad leg and bare foot stuck out. The other leg was wrapped in bandages, as were both his arms. His face looked peaceful, though free of pain, his hair rougher. A fallen angel crashed to earth. Hermione shook her head and sat down in the chair by the bed, banishing the ridiculous thought. There was nothing angelic about Draco Malfoy, quite the opposite. A silver vessel he was, shining on the outside, empty inside. That will be the man, she told herself, thinking of Astoria. Pure blood redemption. That will be his life. She didn't know how long she sat there, lost in gloomy imaginings, when she heard a low, hoarse voice. Granger. Hermione leaned over to speak into his ear. Quiet, she said softly. Pomfrey's in her office. Malfoy tilted his head slightly to look up at her, eyes shining. From the pain potion, most likely. Come to nurse me, Granger. Hermione said nothing, just moved to pour water from a pitcher into a tin cup. She held the cup up to him, but he shook his head. Granger, he whispered. She bent forward again to hear him better, a long curly lock of hair dropping to his shoulders. He smiled tightly. I can't move my arms, Naz. Hermione nodded and stood, swiping a pillow from a nearby bed. She placed a hand under his neck, gently raising him and placing the pillow beneath. Then she slid her hand out of that warm skin and silky hair and picked up the cup again, putting it against his lips. His eyes held hers intently as he drank, but she was pleased to see that her hand remained steady. How bad is it? she asked, bending towards his ear once more, her hair tumbling forward. Malfoy tried to shrug his shoulders. Could have been worse. No head injuries. The skellig row is just about finished. Thank Merlin. He went slightly. Good, she whispered. She straightened absently, smoothing Malfoy's hair back from his forehead as she eyed his bandages more closely. The right arm wrapping looked a little loose. She turned his head, lips brushing the side of her wrist, and Hermione couldn't suppress a small shiver. She glanced back at Pomfrey's office and pulled her hand away. Tell me about the threats, she said, looking down at him. He sighed. There is nothing to say. You were warning me this morning. You knew you would be attacked. Yes. And you didn't listen at all, did you? He asked, his voice rising. Astoria told me about those choking hexes. That was you. I know it. Shh! Hermione hissed. She bent over him again and her hair fell onto his shoulder, creating a wall around their face. She pulled the curls behind her ear impatiently, but it just fell forward again. Malfoy's eyes closed. Don't go to sleep, Malfoy. Oh, I'm anything but asleep. He growled, but he kept his voice low. Nobody knows who hacks those beaters, she said. He snickered softly. Really? And how many students can cast two simultaneous choking hexes from forty to fifty feet away? Merlin Granger, you get yourself expelled if you keep on like this. Hermione puffed a laugh into his ear. You're lecturing me on prudence. You'll get yourself killed if you keep on like this. You've been getting death threats, haven't you? He shrugged again. Nothing new. A few weeks into school and you're in the infirmary, Malfoy. That's new. At this rate, you won't make it to your nudes, even if you have porn to help you. His eyes widened. 
Even if I have what? She blushed. Never mind, listen. Malfoy, you have to tell McGonagall about the death threats. If you don't, I will. You are not to interfere. Shh! Hermione straightened and looked over at Pomfrey's office. She thought she saw a shadow under the door. She had silently for a moment and once again sat in the chair, edging it closer to the bed and leaning over to speak in his ear again. Your ranger, don't tell McGonagall. You can't get involved, he whispered before she could say anything. If anyone finds out, you, Hexto's beaters, you'll be next. I'm already a target, she said. Die mudlots, remember? Damn it, Granger, you need to back off, he hissed in her ear. Since when have I ever backed off? She hissed back, ready to say more, but she was leaning too close now. Malfoy turned his hat to answer, and her lips inadvertently swept along the side of his face, following the sharp, smooth curve of his cheekbone and over the rough, nearly invisible stubble on his jaw. Her eyes closed after her own volition, and she couldn't resist running her lips over his jaw a second time. Merlin, the way he smelled. Don't stop, Malfoy said, his voice hoarse again. She didn't, she couldn't. Just trailed her mouth under that pointed jaw, across the roughness to a smooth spot below his ear. Her fingers were in his hair again, tilting his head back, exposing that long, pale throat, and she could taste his skin with her tongue, feel his rapid pulse under her lips. Pomfrey's office door rattled and Hermione sat up, startled. A shadow clearly moved under the door this time. Now you back off? Malfoy sighed. I have to go, she whispered, keeping a wary distance from his ear this time. What this isn't over. You are in danger. This is a Slytherin issue and we Slytherins will handle it. He was back furiously. Astoria has already. Hermione stood up so suddenly that her chair fell over with a clatter. Of course, of course, Astoria had multiple interests in this. Pomfrey's office door opened, flooding the ward with yellow light. Mr. Malfoy, the matron called. Granger, he hissed. Hermione. Hermione turned and slid into the shadows, following the far wall to exit the ward. Pomfrey stood at the doorway to her office, blocking much of the light, but Hermione could still see Malfoy struggling to move, his eyes glittering like a cat's in the dark. There is nothing for you to worry about, he called out, his tone significant. Hermione disagreed. There was every reason to worry, but perhaps she had no right. She slipped through the infirmary like a shadow, stopping only to place a few wards on the infirmary door. If she could slip inside, so could someone else. Then it was a long walk back to Gryffindor Tower, silently scolding herself over her behavior. Nova didn't need any help. Some Slytherins did take care of their own. Marnie spent Sunday morning in the Gryffindor common room, grimly working through her assignment with an equally quiet Neville and Ginny. By tactic agreement, no one spoke about Quidditch or Malfoy or choking hexes. Hermione's mind kept wandering from arithmancy, however, continuing to dwell on her stupidity the night before. What had possessed her to visit Malfoy? She'd accomplished nothing, and worse, practically attacked the man. Ron's voice echoed in her mind. He's more than a get, he's dangerous, and you talk about him like he's some kind of wounded bird. Ah, oh, yes, the Florence Nightingale effect, that explained it. Malfoy looked so winsome and vulnerable, at least when he wasn't talking. All ruffled hair and big eyes. It was a passing weakness, a misplaced saviour complex, a law for justice. Imani nodded in satisfaction and tapped her arithmancy figures with her wand, watching them shift. That afternoon, she went hiking with Hagrid in the Forbidden Forest, enjoying the still fine weather and gathering herbs for the blood potion. Hagrid was an excellent company, finding dark hollows full of bloodroot, talking about his new shipment of moon lynxes, and didn't mention Quidditch either. The rest of the school was still obsessed with Sunday's match, however, eager to hash over Malfoy's injury and the hex beaters at breakfast Monday morning. A story had kicked the two beaters off the team, seems said, and they had detention until Christmas. Malfoy was openly welcomed at a Slytherin table, moving a little stiffly, but otherwise the picture of health, while the two beaters wore bandages around their necks and moaned pitifully. Malfoy was obviously irritated by this sight, which amused Hermione, who hadn't forgotten the blonde's malingering over his hippogriff wound in third year. But her smile wavered at the sight of Astoria sitting by Malfoy, her hand stroking his arm, and Pansy Parkinson on his other side pouring pumpkin trees. Hermione, you need to stop glaring at Malfoy, Neville whispered. McGonagall is watching. 
Well, make up your mind, Neville, she snapped, keeping her voice loyal. Am I supposed to hate him or not? She stuffed a book into her bag. I guess all I can do is leap. She swung her leg over the bench and stomped out of the great hall. To cap off her mature behaviour, she went and hid in the bathroom and her just before ancient rooms. Malfoy kept eyeing her throughout class, but didn't try to speak to her, and when they stood opposite each other in patience, he went about mincing his squid suckers as if he'd never had a death threat in his life. Ron kept throwing resentful glances at Malfoy across the table, but said nothing, and Hermione and Lavender exchanged relieved looks. Slaghorn had them mixing up another draught of peace, with an eye to creating a few healing potions, and that suited everyone's mood. Most Granger, Mr. Malfoy, could you stay a bit after class? Slughorn asked as he visited their table. Ron narrowed his eyes suspiciously, but again said nothing. Maybe the heavy steam bellowing from their cauldrons was having an effect. Hermione could literally feel her head bend right from her skull as her hair expanded in all directions. After the class ended, Hermione and Malfoy sat on each side of their empty table in silence as they waited for the professor. Malfoy began drawing invisible patterns on the tabletop with a single elegant finger. Hermione's eyes couldn't help tracking the movement, and Malfoy must have noticed because he lifted his hand, waggling his fingers at her in a little wave. Hermione flushed and looked away. How are you feeling? she asked politely. Quite well, thank you, he said, amused. We still need more ingredients for our blood patient, she said, pulling a scroll out of her bag and knocking out two others. Malfoy picked up the nearest rolled-up scroll, looking at outside markings. Porn? he asked raising an eyebrow there. Why, Granger, I didn't know you like that sort of. It's a club, she said, snatching it away from him. A porn club? A study club. You study porn? Malfoy was smiling now. How interesting. Need another member? She scooped up all the scrolls and stuffed them into her bag. You're disgusting. I'm not the one starting porn clubs. Miss Granger, Miss Malfoy? Slughorn boomed. Money jumped in her seat, trying not to blush. I wanted to ask you both about Friday night. I'm resuming my little gatherings this year, and... The professor netted on, and Hermione was suddenly too indignant to feel embarrassed. Sakran had made her stay after potions, stuck her alone with Malfoy while her hair staged an anti hairband revolt. Ugh, why did she even care? Plus, made her late to arithmancy, just so he could talk about his Godric damned slug club. Well, Miss Granger... Slughorn and Malfoy were looking at her. We simply couldn't hold it without you. I know you're quite busy. Yes, very busy. Malfoy put in. She's starting a new study group. Do tell, Slughorn said to her, all eagerness. It's an eighth year into house group, Hermione said, trying not to blush again. The first meeting is Wednesday after dinner, Ed. Well, we don't have a place yet. I would like to offer the patient's dungeon, Slughorn said. Just say, shrivel fix and the door will open. A dungeon, Alpha said brightly. Perfect. No more Friday, Miss Granger, Slughorn said. I know it's a birthday, so if you have other plans, I'll be happy to choose another night. Hermione blinked. She'd forgotten why she was sitting here stuck on a Malfoy in the first place. Friday's your birthday, Granger, Malfoy asked. She nodded, trying not to glare at Slughorn. She shouldn't be surprised that the professor knew. He probably had doses of all of his favourites. So Friday night would be acceptable, Slughorn pressed. Hermione tried to come up with an excuse, but her mind was blank, so she just nodded. Splendid. It would be a nice little affair. The professor looked up at the wall. Heavens, you both will be late to your next class. He waved a wand, and two small scrolls appeared on the table. Here are notes for your professor. Uh, Mr. Malfoy, if I could have an additional word. Hermione picked up a note, hoping Slughorn hadn't written, and kept her behind to discuss his slug club. Professor Vector would not be amused. She slung her back over her shoulder and left the patient's dungeon in a half daze, not even coming back to herself until she was halfway on the stairs to arithmetic. What had just happened? Despite its acronym, few eighth years appeared interested in the pupil organization for reviewing nudes. While the Ravenclaws and Hufflepuff knew porn's true purpose, the Slytherins were allowed to make what Ginny called unwarranted assumptions that neither she nor Hermione felt inclined to correct. The you came the closest to the truth as they sat together in a large window sill Tuesday after defense against the dark arts. Oh, I hear you're starting a porn club, he said with a smile. It's called P-O-R-N, she admitted. His green eyes narrowed, and for a moment he looked so much like Harry. What's the catch? She grinned at him. Come and see. 
Tomorrow after dinner in the patient's dungeon. I will, he promised, reaching out a hand to take hers. Sam was broad and soft, and he wore a silver signet ring embossed with an N. He laced his fingers through hers, looking down at the connected hands, then up at her face. And his eyes didn't look like Harry's anymore. I'd like to take you to Hogsmeade Friday night, he said quietly. She shook her head. I'm sorry, Slughorn's having a supper party. The Slug Club is back, eh? Theo's mouth twisted slightly. He obviously hadn't received an invitation. Hermione wished she could give him hers. I'd rather not go, but... And on Saturday, Theo asked, Ron and I are meeting Harry in Hogsmeade. He looked at their intertwined hands and impulsively said, But not until four o'clock. Now, that sounds promising. I could meet you at... Thames and Scrolls, she asked. The bookshop? Why aren't I surprised? His voice was amused. Meet at one. Hermione nodded and Theo gave her hand a light squeeze before releasing it. I have to go to Transfiguration, he said. McGonagall is giving me a makeup test. Non sentient to sentient, she asked. Yes, Theo said. He slid out of the window sill, bending to give her a light kiss on the cheek, then shouldered his back and walked off. She stood there, watching him turn the corner, wondering how he always knew the perfect moment to leave. Hermione arrived early on Wednesday evening for the pupils' organization for reviewing Newt's first meeting, looking over her six foot scroll, breaking down the exams into forty seven sections. Most of her classes were well enough, but she didn't trust any teacher except McGonagall to prepare properly for the most significant exam of her academic career. Her future was at stake here. She wasn't running around in a pleated skirt and striped tie at age 18, almost 19, out of nostalgia. Eighth year students began to trickle into the room with an expectant pack of Slytherin men arriving at the last minute. The young Blaze took seats in front while Marvel leaned against a stone pillar with the look of a man prepared to be entertained. They took the news that Hermione's porn study group was an actual academic club fairly well, except for Greg Goyle, who looked devastated. Oh, what materials! He said loudly, and the entire room nearly cried with laughter. I'm so sorry to disappoint, Hermione said, unable to hide her grin. Then she launched into a little speech. Think of studying as a quest. As you begin your nude studies, you are going into the unknown. She was pleased that nearly everyone stayed till the end although looking a little glum. Oh, I'll be speaking to Ginevra about this, Blaise told Hermione afterwards. I believe she is starting her own group for the seventh years, Hermione said, the Society for Magical Understanding of Tests. Hermione and Malfoy met in the patient's lab early Thursday morning to brew a tiny test sample of the patient. But without a clover, the smell drove them out of the small room even before they'd added a troll's blood. We'll try again Saturday morning, Malfoy said, gagging delicately as they leaned against the wall outside the potion's dungeons. We need six bushels of clover blossoms, Hermione pointed out. I'm on it. Uh, how are you, Granger? Now if I turn to look her in the eye. Oh, I said I'm on it. Not six bushels, he sighed. A little trust, Granger. Other people can be resourceful too. I can help you today before dinner. No, I have plants and they don't involve mucking around hillsides picking flowers, Malfoy said firmly. Back off. Hermione huffed. Fine. He edged closer, his expression changing. Oh, unless you'd rather not back off. Malfa glanced around the corridor. We should keep our voices down, he whispered. No, we should talk loudly, Hermione boomed out. My knee's a little sore, nurse. He murmured, his breath warm on her ear. Could you? Hermione pushed herself away from the wall, slinging her back over her shoulder. Talk to me when you have the clover, she said, then walked quickly towards the stairs before she did something stupid again. Obviously, a career as a healer was out of the question. Their patient's rancid smell ended up seeping into the main patient's dungeon, and Slughorn set the advanced class to bring the love potion Amortensia to counteract it. Unfortunately, the smell of rotting meat combined with people's favorite scent just made matters worse. Slughorn started out asking people what they smelled, but the combinations were so revolting. Honeysuckle and dead pigs? He gave it up and dismissed them an hour early. Hermione was enormously relieved. The last thing she wanted to do was tell the entire class about the mingled scent of two separate brands of expensive cologne wafting from her cauldron, as well as Oh the Butcher's Shop. Both Ron and Malfoy kept glancing at her and glaring at each other, and she didn't want to hear what they smelled either. At least Malfoy was in defense against the dark arts that afternoon, which made education more pleasant for everyone. Bluebell had them discussing complementary dark and light magic, 
a cursing versus a healing spell, for example, and there were no snide remarks or near duels. Theo tried his best to annoy Ron, but his smiles and significant looks at Hermione didn't set off the visceral reaction that Malfoy could elicit with the slightest of glances. Hermione and Ron were partners again for the practical portion of the class, and it was nice to use her wand in a non-aggressive way. She discovered the reason for Malfoy's absence while leaving the North Tower. He was walking along the battlements with his mother, who was visiting again. In her deep blue velvet cloak with embroidered silver stars, Narcissa made Astoria look like a kid in pigtails. Malfoy looked very lord of the manor himself, his posture at his haughtiest. Hermione hunched and tried to slip by unnoticed, creeping along the opposite wall, but to no avail. Miss Granger, Narcissa Malfoy said, her soft voice full of command. Lady Malfoy, Hermione said, straightening. Welcome back to Hogwarts. She glanced at the blonde man beside his mother. Malfoy? Narcissa bowed her head a fraction. My son says you have been quite cordial to him upon his return to school. I am grateful. Not for the first time, Hermione wished she could raise one eyebrow, the only appropriate response to a description of her and Malfoy's checkered relations this year as cordial. She just smiled again. We are trying to make a fresh start, Lady Malfoy. Not everyone has your generosity of heart, Narcissa said. Her blue eyes were penetrating. Hermione clutched the wand in her pocket to keep from rubbing the scars on her arms hidden under her robes. My entire family must beg your forgiveness for past events. Of course, Hermione said, her teeth gritted slightly. One must look forward. Mother, Malfoy said quietly. Perhaps we should go inside. Nonsense. Narcissa answered without taking her eyes off Hermione. Madame Pomfrey said you must walk every day, Draco, and walk you shall. A shocking injury, wasn't it, Miss Granger? Yes. Hermione turned to Malfoy, trying to match his cool bearing. I hope your recovery has gone well. It has. The nursing was excellent. His voice held a hint of suggestion, but Hermione managed not to blush. I am a frozen pond in Norway in sub-zero temperatures. Draco tells me you are his partner in potions. Narcissa continued. Yes, Hermione said again. An awkward silence fell and she felt compelled to add, he's done some remarkable work. But you continue at the top of your class as usual, Miss Granger. The term has just begun, Hermione says. He has time to catch up. She kind of liked us talking about Malfoy as if he wasn't there. He looked a little irritated now. Yes, it is very important you do well in your newts, Draco. Narcissa lectured her son. I agree, Malfoy said. I attended a new study group yesterday. How very interesting, Narcissa said. Not quite as interesting as I had hoped, Malfoy said. Will you be joining us in the Great Hall for dinner, Lady Malfoy? Hermione asked to change the subject. Malfoy smiled mockingly. Sadly, no. I came only to reassure myself as to my son's condition and bring a few items from home. Hermione recalled the huge bundle of treats and gifts Malfoy had received by owls over the years. Jelly slugs, perhaps? Narcissa laughed outright. Oh, I had forgotten. You love those so. She smiled fondly. No, today I deliver something infinitely more precious. Her smile widened as she looked at her son, and Malfoy's face suddenly lost all expression. I hope to hear some happy news soon. Mother, why don't we continue our walk? Malfoy asked quickly. I'm sure Granger needs to get to the library. Will you join us? Narcissa asked Hermione politely. Hermione did her best not to look appalled by the very idea. No, thank you, Lady Malfoy. Your son is correct. I'm headed to the library. She gave Narcissa another smile. It was a pleasure talking to you. The pleasure is all ours, isn't it, Draco? Narcissa asked. Oh, yes, pleasure. Malfoy said with a suggestive glint in his eyes. Have a good day, Hermione said in her best fake bright voice and walked away as quickly as she could without looking rude. Entering the tower, Hermione leaned against the wall for a minute to recover. She hoped her patient's partner managed to avoid another injury in the future. One Malfoy in the castle was enough. Chapter 20 Hermione's Birthday Chapter Notes from the Author now for Hermione's birthday, where this story's obsession with personal object truly runs rampant. And it includes the first slug club gathering. Hogwarts' unreasonably fine weather broke on Friday. Hermione could tell even before she saw the sullen clouds outside her bedroom window. Her bathroom mirror revealed a hat of hair twice as large as usual, much like it was in Patience, 
a casualty of the sudden humidity. Her usual meditation and journal time was pissed away, combing speakeasy hair tonic through her curls and trying to confine them in loose braids. Happy birthday! Ginny crowed, leaping out of bed. Time for presents! She pulled a stack of brightly wrapped gifts out of her wardrobe and put them on Hermione's bed. Lavender came back from the bathroom already dressed for the day. Happy birthday, Hermione, she said without enthusiasm. Staying for presents? Ginny asked her. Lavender picked up her bag. Just looks like a bunch of books to me, she sneered and left the room. Bitch, Ginny muttered, sitting on Hermione's bed. Come on, I happen to know they're not all books. Hermione smiled as she joined Ginny. Lavender wasn't entirely wrong. Most of the red gibbs had a suspiciously heavy rectangular shape. Mom first, Ginny said, handing her a small soft package. Hermione unwrapped it, stared down at it for a moment, then glared at Ginny. Really? she asked. Held it up, Ginny said, eyes dancing. I will not. There's nobody else here. Hermione glanced around, anyway, and held up a screen silk brasserie. Matching knickers too, Ginny said smugly. You're dating a Slytherin now. I'm not dating a Slytherin. Jenny followed her legs under her. Are you going to hogs me with the tomorrow? Yes, before I meet Ron and Harry. Hermione sat, tucking a dangling strap away from Crookshanks. It's not a green lingerie situation. You never know, Jenny said wickedly. Now open Ron's. It's probably a book, Hermione sighed. Ron always gave her books. Lazia's birthday book was about the Chutley Cannon's Quidditch team, and he borrowed it from her right away and never returned it. I know for a fact it's not, Ginny said, handing her a small box. Did he pick this gift or did you? Hermione asked, unwrapping it. Ginny shook her head. It wasn't even there. Hermione eyed the small velvet box suspiciously, wondering what she would find. Earrings? A diamond pendant? Goddard forbid a ring? She took a deep breath and opened it. Well, Ginny asked, it's jewellery, right? It's a golden pin, Hermione admitted. At least it's not a book, right? Hermione turned the open box around so Ginny could see. It's a pin, shaped like a book, she said flatly. Oh, Ginny flushed slightly inside. Well, progress. Ginny, Ron's just rubbish with gifts. Last year he gave me a handkerchief. Ginny. Hermione snapped the box shut. There is nothing to say. That is how he sees me. It's not all he... Hermione rolled her eyes. You know it's true. It's not meant to be. Why else would you be giving me Slytherin underwear? Jenny looked at her hands, a curtain of red hair falling around her face. Hermione pushed a lock behind her friend's left ear and smiled. It's okay, Jen. It's a good gift from a friend, and that's what Ron and I are. Now, let's open my parents' gift. She held up a little box and card that her parents had slipped into her trunk before she left for school. This box had a beautiful heart-shaped sapphire, a birthstone on a silver chain. The card was signed, In memory of the happiest day of our lives, love, mum and dad. Hermione sniffled and had the box to her chest. They forgave her. She had erased their memories and packed them off to the other side of the world, all without their consent, but her parents still loved her and they forgave her. She let Ginny fasten the chain around her neck and tucked a sapphire inside her uniform shirt. The tiny weight on her chest lightened her heart. Now it's time for Harry's. Ooh, Ginny said as Hermione opened her third gift. Inside was a heavy silver otter about the size of her fist, curled up and sleeping. It's a paperweight, Hermione breathed. I saw a hedgehog one in Diagon Alley. Wow, Ginny said. Hermione hopped off the bed and picked it up, placing it on a stack of parchment on her desk. The silver otter stretched and yawned and curled up again. It was such a perfect gift, bookish yet personal. Harry must have ordered it by Owl to match her Patronus. What's that? Ginny asked from the bed. On your desk. Hermione suddenly noticed another present on the desk, tucked near the windowsill. She picked up the flat, heavy silver wrap package and brought it to her bed. Leo? Ginny asked, touching its shining green ribbon. I don't know. Hermione would have liked to think it was Theo, but she had a darker suspicion. Are you going to open it? Yes, best get it over with. Hermione untied the ribbon with suddenly clumsy fingers and pulled away the silvery paper to reveal a white, black velvet box. She looked at Ginny. 
who stared back wide-eyed. Hermione cracked open the box and the two women stared at its contents. Merlin! Ginny breathed. Nestled in grey silk was a jeweled hair clip, exquisitively delicate, with a single diamond in the centre, surrounded by diamond-studded silver wires shaped like rose petals. Accompanying the clip were two matching diamond-studded hairpins. How did this box get here? Hermione asked, looking around. Ginny? Ginny shook her head. I collected the rest of the gifts, but I never saw this one. Hermione rummaged through the paper. No tag or card. Ginny bit her lip. Theo? she asked again. Maybe. Or maybe not. Theo had been very cautious so far, and this was bold. Theo didn't know where her room was either. Someone else did, though. Ginny was fingering the green ribbon. You don't think... Her breath caught. Malfoy? Hermione shrugged. It could be, Ginny said, looking at the hair clip appraisingly. Extravagant? Inappropriate, Hermione said. Impractical. I mean, has he seen your hair? Hermione picked up a hairpin and inspected it closely. Such a delicate accessory would be perfect for a Slytherin's girl's smooth, fine, never must hair. Defiantly, she tucked a pin into the right side of her head, where it vanished instantly into her curls. Jenny laughed. He'd need a dozen of those to hold up one side, she sobered suddenly. How would he get the books in here? Hermione shrugged and placed a diamond set carefully in her trunk. Mav had proven himself resourceful enough. Jenny eyed her sharply, then dropped the subject. Come on, let's go, let's open all your books. Ron was in the common room when Hermione and Jenny came down and immediately noticed his gold book pin on Hermione's jumper. All right, then. He asked, coming up to her. Yes, she smiled. Thank you. She stood up on tiptoe and kissed Ron on the cheek. Oh, Ron said. What? Hermione asked. Did I step on your foot? No, I touched your head and ow! Ron sucked on his finger. Ginny snickered. You live, Ron. Come on, we'll be late for breakfast. Hermione dithered throughout the meal, debating whether to acknowledge Malfoy's gift. In the end, she decided not to. If the man wanted a proper thank you, he could include a card or tag like a normal person. Malfoy kept his distance in ancient runes and was well behaved in patience, which Hermione considered an even better birthday gift. Until, unfortunately, Malfoy noticed the book pin. What's that on your jumper, Granger? He asked, wide eyed. A torn up bit of fire whiskey label. Had a little morning tipple on your birthday. Lavender giggled as Ron turned red. It's a pin, Malfoy. Hermione said calmly, stirring her potion. Sargon had them brewing perfume to dispel any lingering blood potion odors, so now she had a headache and her hair was coming out of its braid from the steam and she was in no mood for his games. A pin. Malfoy leaned forward, his own slightly damp hair falling into his eyes. She had a sudden urge to smooth it back. And then slap his face. It was very disturbing. What kind of pin? He continued. It looks like a tiny box of biscuits. Lavender giggled again. Hermione ignored him, but Ron fell right into the trap. It's a book you get, he snapped. A book? A book pin? Malfoy's face lit up. A birthday present from the weasel, Granger. How romantic, a truly personal gift. Hermione rolled her eyes to the heavens and silently bewailed to the unjust gods. Really? Was this to be her fate? To be trapped at a patient's table while Draco Malfoy crowed over the superiority of his secret birthday gift compared to Ron's? What had she ever done to deserve this? Tamping down her sound and hysteria, Hermione cast Malfoy a hooded look. I think it's a lovely pin. A very thoughtful gift, she said with a smile. She took Ron's hand, which lay on a table between them, and held it. I'm proud to wear it. She purred, looking into Ron's eyes. Ron looked smug. Malfoy decanted their perfumed patient into a bottle and pounded in the cork with his fist. Hermione wondered if she'd slightly overstated her love for the book pin. Wouldn't she have to wear it every day now? Looking at Malfoy's scowl, she thought it might be worth it. Do you caught up with her outside the patient's classroom? Oh, here it's your birthday, he said with a smile. Yes, I'm nineteen today, she said. Happy birthday, then. I wish I'd known sooner. I would have gotten you something. It's fine, Hermione said with great sincerity. Well, we can celebrate tomorrow, Theo said, brushing a curl off her face. He frowned, looking down at his hand, but just then a cloud of perfume 
billowed out of the potion dungeon's door, prompting students to scatter. Hermione hurried up the stairs. Hopefully, Theo wouldn't give her a book tomorrow. Or book charm, or a scarf with little books embroidered on it. Which of these should I wear? Ginny asked, holding up two dresses. Just pick one, Hermione said shortly. Snuck on stupid dinner starts in fifteen minutes. What about your hair? Ginny asked. She threw aside the green dress from the Gryffindor party and unzipped a black lace one. What about it? Hermione asked, stripping off her uniform. Ginny pointed at the bathroom's full-length mirror and Hermione groaned. Her hair was a frizzy mess from the day's humidity. It's weird, Ginny said. Your whole hat went crazy except for the part with the diamond happened. It's still in there somewhere, right? What? Hermione stepped up to the full-length mirror on the wardrobe to look more closely. Ginny was right. The hair on one side of her head was still smoothed back in a thick wave and pinned while the rest had completely freaked out. I'm starting to think the expense aren't so impractical after all, Ginny said thoughtfully. Well, I'm not wearing them, Hermione said, yanking out the diamond pin. The right side of her head immediately puffed out. Ah! Ginny laughed so hard she could hardly put her dress on. Do it again! No! Hermione snapped, pulling on her own blue velvet dress chosen to match her parents' sapphire pendant. It's not funny, she said, glaring at Ginny's smooth golden red head. I need better girlfriends. I am an excellent girlfriend, Ginny said, sipping her up. Your dress looks beautiful, and your parents' necklace. Hermione picked up a sweater. Should I wear Ron's pin? Godric, no. Go get the diamond hair set. No. Hermione had her own reasons not to wear that clip and pins. It'll be fine. It will not be fine, and we don't have hours to tame those cars. Ginny bullied Hermione over to her trunk and made her take out the flat box. Give me that and sit down. There's something weird about these pins. Hermione said, eyes narrowed as Jenny tucked at her curls with a brush. Hey, don't be a baby. Where's my wand? What are you doing? Hermione asked, trying to turn towards the mirror. Stop moving. There. Jenny stepped back. Are you finished already? Hermione was surprised. She stood and walked over to the mirror. An amazing sight greeted her. The deep blue velvet dress, sleeveless with a low, square neckline perfectly complemented the sapphire pendant on its short silver chain. Her hair, amazingly, was smoothly pulled back on the sides and twisted securely in the back, with pins and the hair clips subtly peeping out between the cards. Hermione groaned. This totally sends the wrong message, she said, looking at herself. You should have heard Malfoy impatience this morning. What did he say? He said Ron's pin looked like a torn of fire whiskey label, Ginny snickered. It's not funny, and you're a terrible person. Hermione looked back at her image and sighed. I am too. Nonsense, let's go, Ginny said, propelling her towards the door. We're late. The patient's dungeon had been transformed. The tables and cauldrons had vanished, and shimmering tapestry covered the stone walls. Flowers bloomed from vases, plumbed to mask any lingering patient odors, and candles flickered from ornate standing candelabras, adding to the romantic scene. A long rectangular dining table dominated one end of the cavernous space, sparkling with crystal and china, while couples danced to floating instruments on the other side. Blaze appeared instantly at Hermione's and Jenny's entrance, looking impossibly handsome in dark green robe. He paid them a few graceful compliments and spirited Jenny away right under Sarkon's nose, leaving Hermione with their host. Sarkon's ermine-lined robe of green brocade clashed horribly with his shiny red nose. He'd obviously been drinking heavily from his giant goblet. The professor's compliments were considerably less graceful than Blazer's, and he spoke at length about beauty and brilliance, while introducing her to the ministry's head of departmental communication and its deputy head of sports. Quidditch and the media were not Hermione's favorite topics of conversation, and she slipped away as soon as Slugger turned to greet Gryffindor's Cormac MacLagan. She edged toward the back wall, curious about the scene on the tapestries, and literally bumped into Malfoy, who had apparently chosen lurking behind candelabras as a social strategy for the evening. Hermione rocked back on her heels, staring up at him. Like Blaze, Malfoy was perfectly suited to such a setting, his hair and steel-grey robes shining in the candlelight, which also played off his cheekbones and the line of his jaw. He was evidently in a brooding mood, his eyes distant, much like when she watched him from the sofa the night of the Gryffindor party. He was also silent, no snarky, 
Where's the weasel? A caustic comment about her clumsiness. He just looked down at her for a moment, then extended his hand. She didn't hesitate, just took it, almost in a daze, and let him lead her to the dancing area. His other hand slid her on her waist, and he drew her into a wall. The lilting music and heavy smell of cut flowers washed over her. The last time she'd waltzed among flowers and candlelight had been Bill and Fleur's wedding. The music especially brought her back to that night, the free-floating terror swirling around the dancers, finally taking shape in the form of Kingsley's lynx patronus, landing in their midst. Scringer's dead. They're coming. Malfoy slowed his step. You're trembling. He whispered in her ear. Hermione looked up at him. The last time I heard this was, she swallowed. It was the night the ministry fell. She didn't know why she told him that. She expected him to look away, ignore her words, perhaps even leave. But Malfoy looked down at her steadily with that odd open expression. The yeah, air, she went on. It smelled of roses that night, too. His arms tightened around her. Whatever Malfoy's own memories were of the dark summer, or his thoughts of a ministry still eager to send him to Azkaban, those grey's eyes held nothing but reassurance. It's all right, he whispered, pulling her closer. We're all right now. All right. His words sounded like a mantra, something he had often repeated to himself. The scent of his cologne and a warm sunshine smell surrounded her. She wanted to lay her cheek on his robes, close her eyes and breathe it in. It was unreal. Malfoy's were supposed to cause distress, not alleviate it. They continued to waltz, gently, neither wanting to break the spell. Malfoy danced effortless, like he was born to it, which Hermione supposed he was. He led her so subtly she hardly noticed it, yet she hadn't stumbled once, which had to be a record. She began to feel that strange connection they'd shared while brewing the fiducia potion, with their breath and heartbeat synchronized as well as their steps. The chatter and laughter around them seemed to fade away. You look beautiful tonight, Malfoy whispered above her right ear. His breath stirred her curls. So do you, Amani thought, but she said nothing. Having a good birthday? He asked, carefully polite. His eyes lingered on her sapphire pendant, and perhaps lower, until Hermione could feel the heat spread down her neck. Yes, she answered, sounding a little breathy. Then something occurred to her, and she backed away slightly. How did you do it? He smiled. How do you think I did it? He flew to the window, she answered. Vanished the pain. Ten points to Gryffindor, he smirked. You could say thank you, you know. She smirked right back. Draco Malfoy teaching me manners? Apparently I need to. Hermione rolled her eyes. Oh, yes, you're eminently qualified, because taunting people about their gifts is the epitome of good manners. Malfoy gave her a look that reminded her of his father. Good manners don't apply to the weasel. Good manners apply to everyone. Then I'm still waiting for my thank you. Thank you for your very thoughtful birthday gift, she said in a sing-song voice. A muscle tightened in Malfoy's jaw at the word thoughtful, but he let it go. He released her hand and ran a light finger over one of the hairpins before taking the hand back again. His grip was light and warm, and she could feel his palm rough against her knuckles. Just puff, he said smugly. Hermione shook her head. It's too much, really. Nonsense. Nothing's too good for Gryffindor's princess. He grinned, knowing she hated that title. Hermione looked away, huffing to see Neville entering the dungeons wearing dress robes of dark red. Behind him was Astoria, shining in pale blue satin and long white gloves. My mother enjoyed speaking with you yesterday. Malfoy was shifting back to small talk. She gives you her best. Hermione frowned. Then you tell her about my letter to the Wizengamot? I assure you, I did not. Well, then, I'm surprised by her. Let's not discuss my mother, he said, his jaw tight. You're the one who brought her up. I was being polite, he hissed. Well, you need more practice, she hissed back. Miss Granger, Mr. Malfoy, come join us. Slughorn was calling from the head of the table. The other dancers were leaving the floor and moving towards the table. Hermione stepped away from Malfoy, flushing slightly. She moved towards an empty chair near the foot of the table, but Malfoy reached it first and pulled it out for her. It was all she could do not to gape at him. People were staring now, but Hermione managed to sit down without tripping or knocking over a glass, an accomplishment she felt deserved congratulations. 
Then Afroy took a seat beside her like it was the natural way of the world, and Slakon toasted to the illustrious company. And my undying gratitude to Miss Hermione Granger, who so generously joins us on the day of her birth. Happy birthday, my dear, the professor cried. The whole table toasted Hermione, which she found ridiculously embarrassing. Blaze widened his grin as he raised his glass, and Ginny crossed her eyes. And then, thankfully, it was time for the first course, and the conversation became general. Her relief was short-lived, though, when she realized that she was seated between Malfoy and Cormac in a cross from Her Majesty Astoria. Hermione, Cormac rumbled, breathing brandy all over her neck, you look absolutely stunning. His hand appeared at the back of her chair, his fingers brushing against her skin. She leaned forward. Thank you, Cormac. Are you playing Quidditch this year? Cormac frowned. No. He'd never gotten over losing his bid for keeper to run in fourth year, although he didn't know Hermione had had a hand in it. And then he'd lost out to run again this year, loudly claiming that Ginny favoured her brother. I prefer to concentrate on my needs. That's very good to hear, Hermione said approvingly. I'm glad you joined my study group. He grinned. I would never turn down porn. People, organization to rev your newts, she corrected. She heard Malfoy snicker on her other side and turned to him. And not a word from you either. You'll all thank me when the exams arrive this spring. We are thanking you now, Malfoy said. I can't think of a better name. Hermione took a sip of wine. Cormac's hand left her chair to brush against the back of her neck. I haven't wished you happy birthday yet, Hermione, he said. Perhaps we could celebrate later tonight. Malfoy stiffened beside Hermione, who again leaned forward to avoid Cormac's touch. She found herself staring at Astoria's perfect face above a long rope of pearls that twined loosely around a woman's throat and bosom like a snake. Draco, Astoria said, drawing out the two syllables. I enjoyed my tea with your mother yesterday. I hope she had a nice visit. She did, thank you, Malfoy said. Narcissa was quite pleased to see you fully recovered from your injury, but I agree with her that you mustn't overexert yourself. Malfoy took a sip of wine. There's little danger of that, Astoria. Narcissa is a very wise woman, Astoria continued. She had some excellent thoughts about your post-Hogwarts career. Since when does the new Lord Malfoy need a career? asked Justin Finch Fletchley, who sat beside Astoria. He looked quite refined in black and gold robes, his curly dark blonde hair smoothed back from a high forehead, but the cold glitter in his eyes looked strange on a Hufflepuff. Looks like all's forgiven after all, Justin continued. He can just sit in his manor and count his money as if nothing ever happened. Justin, Hermione said. What, you're going to defend him, Hermione? Justin asked, eyebrows raised. After what happened to you at his home? Malfoy set down his wine goblet with enough force to rattle the china. Without looking at him, Hermione reached under the lace tablecloth to touch his left wrist lightly with her finger. He felt Malfoy relax slightly. This isn't a time or place, Justin, she said coolly, releasing Malfoy's wrist. It's disrespectful to Professor Slockon. All right, then, the Hufflepuff said, his pretty mouth pursed in distaste. But some of us will never forget. I hear Hogwarts will be hosting a Halloween festival on the grounds. Astoria said brightly to the man on her left. Sounds lovely. Do you need any help organizing, Ernie? Ernie looked glum as he crunched a breadstick. Yes, all the help I can get. The prefect have been useless. I love organizing social events, Astoria said, smiling brilliantly at Malfoy. Hermione wanted to roll her eyes, but she was actually grateful to Astoria for turning the conversation. Justin laid off Malfoy for the rest of the dinner, but it was still interminable, and Cormac wouldn't give up. So, Hermione, he murmured, what will it take, hmm? His hand ran up her spine to the back of her neck and into her curls this time. Ah! Cormac gasped, snatching back his hand. He pressed his napkin against a jagged tear on his palm. Oh dear, Hermione said. How did that happen? Hold still now. She healed Cormac's wound with her wand while Malfoy snickered. Cormac kept his hands to himself after that, but she was still relieved when the dinner ended and she could escape to a corner with Neville. Cormac's headed this way. Don't leave me with him, she instructed. And keep me away from Justin and Ernie too. And Slughorn. Oh, and those two ministry luminaries Slughorn brought. Are there any men here that you like? Neville asked. She shrugged. You? Blaze, maybe. She didn't mention Malfoy. Oh, and keep me away from Astoria too. 
Looks like she and Malfoy might be on again, Neville said, tilting his head towards the fireplace where the two stood close in conversation. Astoria's icy blue dress shimmered against Malfoy's grey robes. Rumour has it. His mother came to Hogwarts yesterday to look her over. Ginny stepped up with Blaze, her cheeks red from either wine or the wizard by her side. Hermione, Blaze says it's time for a real party in the Southern Common Room. Neville, we need you too. Thank you, Blaze, Hermione said, but I have to be at the patient's lab tomorrow morning. And I have to set up Quidditch pitch for practice, at Ginny said. Live little, both of you. You'd be very welcome, Longbottom, Blaze said, and Hermione always. Come on, Hermione, Ginny wheedled. Excellent liquor, no Cormac or Justin there. That is a plus, Hermione admitted. Hermione hates all men tonight except for you and me, Sabini, Never said. Even Malfoy, Ginny teased. Hermione gave her a warning frown. It looks like Astoria will keep him busy, Blaze said, glancing over at the couple by the fireplace. Astoria's gloved hand was on Malfoy's arm now. Blaze's dark eyes returned to hold Hermione's. Please come. There was no resisting that pull. Honestly, she couldn't fault Ginny for being intrigued. So Hermione found herself drinking with the Slytherins in their spooky, green-draped common room in the dungeon. She sat beside Neville on the sofa, pounding any drink given to her and trying not to watch the entrance. Neither Malfoy nor Astoria made an appearance, and Theo had apparently gone off to Hogsmeade on his own. Neville practically had to carry Hermione back to Gryffindor Tower and stood with her at the stairs to the girl's dorm, looking concerned. Oh, fine, Nev, she said, patting his shoulder. Thank you. Hermione, he said, keeping his voice low. What's going on with you? You look miserable. What do I have to be miserable about? She asked. We want our life. You and Bron and Harry and Ginny are alive. I have a charming Slytherin whose family didn't have Voldemort as a house guest taking me to lunch tomorrow. She said heavily on the staircase. I'm a war heroine, remember? I'm going to get all outstandings on my notes and go on to change the wizarding world. I'm the last person to be miserable. But Hermione, you're crying, Never said, handing her handkerchiefs. T- tears of joy. Never sighed and wrapped an arm around her as she sobbed how happy she was until Ginny came back. This is not good, Ginny said, pulling Hermione to her feet. Hermione, come on, yes, yes, you're very happy. How long can she go on like this? Never asked. As long as she has to, Ginny answered grimly. I don't know how this is going to turn out. You do keep worrying, but I'm happy, Hermione said as Ginny dragged her upstairs. Never. Never looked up at her. Thank you. I love you, Neville, even though you gave me a book for my birthday. It's a very interesting book, Never said, but magic of rainforest plants. Yes, the riveting, Ginny said, so pushing her upward. Come on, Hermione. Thank Godric your birthday only comes once a year. Chapter 21 Hogsmeade Hermione turned up late at the patient's lab on Saturday morning, hungover, sleep-deprived, and ready to hack somebody. Every time she closed her eyes the night before, she'd seen Malfoy and Astoria together, imagined him sidling up to her with hooded eyes and a long pale hand on the witch's slender hip. She thought of Astoria laughing lightly with Narcissa Malfoy over tea and remembered those tilted blue eyes shining at Malfoy by the fireplace at Stockholm's party. She could only see the back of his hat then, but he hadn't exactly been trying to escape. Godric only knew what he had been saying to her likely in that low, murmuring tone with that hypnotic stare. Money had tossed in bed, imagining them in some corner of the dungeons, heatedly kissing, fingers sliding through perfect hair. In the end, she fell into a restless sleep and dreamed of Malfoy whispering, I'll kiss you if you tell me about your gardens, Astoria. So she was bitterly disappointed to see six bushels of clover blossoms neatly stacked on the table in the patient's dungeon the next morning. That meant she couldn't yell at Malfoy for failing to procure a vital ingredient, turn him into a toad, and then stomp off to take a nap. Even worse, she found Malfoy virtuously stirring up a rainwater base in a small copper cauldron and looking surprisingly well-rested for a man who presumably spent the night in passionate pure-blood shagging nirvana. Granger, he said amiably, you look like hell. She glared at him through bloodshot eyes, and said nothing, just consulted the recipe and began the flubber worms. Those should be chopped, not mashed, 
Malfoy said as he measured a teaspoonful of diced crocodile heart with delicate precision. Hermione waved her wand, vanishing the butchered worms, and started again. Malfoy began to whistle as he minced his mother word. Apparently, the men just needed to get laid all along, she thought. No need for games with the mudblood anymore. Ranger, Malfoy said. Well, I'm personally thrilled about it. Let Astoria haul his ass out of whatever hot soup he lends her next. Granger, Malfoy said. Sure won't be me. Don't know why I'm fretting about a damp... Granger! What? She snapped, slamming down her knife. A glob of flabberworm got spotted onto Malfoy's quidditch jersey. Merlin, Granger! Malfoy said, wrinkling his nose. Hermione raised her wand to Torgeo the guts away, but he held up a hand. Don't, I'd rather you didn't point a wand at me in your current mood. She nodded her arm, registering his green and silver jersey for the first time. You're going to Quidditch practice, she said. Malfoy nodded. Madame Pomfrey cleared me to play. Splendid. Hermione began scraping her finished flubberworms into the cauldron. I'm sure you'll present her with any number of interesting crushes and fractures and internal damage. If you survive the season, Granger, she felt Malfoy's hand on her arm. I'll be fine, he said quietly. I've taken precautions. Oh, uh, really? And what precautions could you possibly take? She glared up at him. You'll be high above the pitch during games and practice. You could be hexed, your broom could be sabotaged, a bludger could be enchanted, another player could be imperious, you could be imperious, the snitch could be cursed. All right, enough, I get it. Malfoy stared at her wide-eyed. Merlin? Then he smiled. Maybe you should come keep an eye on me. Hermione pulled her arm away. I need to get the clover. She stomped out of the room and returned with an overflowing bushel basket, dropping it with a thud on the table. I'm surprised you picked all this yourself, she said, then gave Malfoy a flinty stare. Or maybe not. Malfoy looked smug. The squeaky mouse club. The first years from detention, he nodded. They were a little excited about learning the Augmenti spell and charms, kept squirting water from their wands and potions. Hermione rolled her eyes. That isn't even original. What can you expect from Hufflepuffs? Zakon had me oversee their latest detention, so I set them sentences. Malfoy waved his wand at a lab small chalkboard and the following words appeared. I will not squirt water from my wand and put out other students' cauldrons' fires until the professor's back is turned. While the professor's back is turned, Hermione growled. Malfoy shrugged and began preparing the blossoms. That's what Sluggy said, so I took them all outside and had them pick clovers. Sluggy heartily proved the last thing he wants is another blood potion stinking up his dungeons. There isn't enough Amortentia in the world. Hermione flushed at the mention of Amortentia, then flushed again when she realized she was staring at Malfoy as he stripped the clover stems from the blossoms. Who knew she had such a hand fetish? She didn't recall ever staring at Ron's hands, but there she was, watching Malfoy handle clover blossoms. And Theo liked to twirl his quill in his fingers while studying. Malfoy was eyeing her with interest now, which made Hermione's face heat a third time, and she began snatching up fistfuls of clovers and dropping them into the solution. They worked in silence, with hundreds of little white flowers disappearing into the small cauldron. A fresh, sweet smell filled the room, Hermione stirred the now-distilled sticky potion with a flat stick. All right, that's the last of the clover, she said, pouring the cauldron's contents into a bottle. Go ahead, and caught death at Quidditch practice. I'll finish this potion myself. You certainly will not, at least not today, Murphy said sternly. The merlet mixture still needs to simmer. Go get some sleep, you look completely done in. Gryffindors really don't know how to party. Maybe I didn't have the exciting evening you did, but I know how to have fun. Hermione's voice dripped with acid. I had a great evening. The only thing wrong with it was that I had to talk to you. Ranger, you sound certifiable. You can't say you didn't. Fine, I'll leave, she snapped, shoving the stoppered bottle into her bag. Since Quidditch is more important than this blood spell anyway. She used her wand to clear the table, grabbed her back and left the left. Being completely unreasonable was Ollie satisfying. Maybe that was why Ron liked it so much. Granger! Malfoy yelled. Hermione stomped out of the potions dungeon, slamming the door. Hermione was feeling much better when she arrived at the Tomes and Squirrels bookshop in Hogsmeade that afternoon. 
A tour in up and a pepper up potion had done wonders for her mood. She'd taken some care with her appearances, putting on a blue v-neck jumper, black jeans and boots. She even applied lipstick and cast a glamour spell to reduce the circle under her eyes. Fastening her new sapphire pendant around her neck, she tied her hair back with a silver ribbon. She refused to wear Malfoy's diamonds. I didn't ask to get to spend a fortune on hair accessories. Theo was already there, greeting her with a smile. He was unfailingly patient in the shop, even when Hermione saw noted rune expert Dunbert Donaldson promoting his latest volume as unraveling the elder fairbanks and insisted on waiting in line for a signed copy. Then Theo whisked her to an outer cafe for lunch, correctly predicting that it would not rain on them, and gave her a wrapped gift that was all the wrong shape for a book. Hermione looked at the gift and their tiny table, thinking it was rather hypocritical of her to rail against getting a book for her birthday when she couldn't wait to sneak off to the loo and read a bit of her new foo box tome. She just hoped it wasn't jewellery. She put off the paper to reveal a long wooden box. Looks so old, she said, running her hand over the grain. Open it, Theo urged. She unlatched the lid and lifted it, revealing a small scroll. Hermione glanced at Theo, then took it out, unrolling the delicate parchment carefully. 12th October, 1986. Dearest Drusilla, she read in growing amazement. I deemed the task to be impossible, and rue the day I ever agreed to write. Hogwarts, a history! Hermione squealed the last three words, prompting other patrons to stare. Theo, this is the letter from historian Bathilda Baxter to her niece when she despaired of the task and vowed to throw the manuscript into the fire. And she almost did, but Drusilla travelled to see her and convinced her to toil on. Or, she looked at Theo horrified, there wouldn't be Hogwarts a history. And a bleak world that would be indeed, Theo said with a smile. How did you find it? she asked, hugging him excitedly. It's nothing, Theo said, voice muffled by her hair. Where was it? A little shop in Nocturn Alley. Nocturn Alley, she repeated disapprovingly. A lot of treasure in that place. I suppose so, Hermione said thoughtfully. Maybe she should check Nocturn Alley out sometime. She'd been there before. She tucked the letter back into its box, sternly quashing her wartime memories of Bathilda's animated corpse in Godric's Hollow. Theo had no way of knowing about that. She dropped the box into her expandable beaded bag, hearing an echo clatter. Merlin, she said, peeking inside. I never took those candlesticks out. I've heard about that bag, Theo said with interest. Hermione beamed at him. It was truly a thoughtful gift, perfectly calibrated to her. It almost made her suspicious how good Theo was about everything. Nonsense, she was being ridiculous. The routine fuck-ups by the other men in her life had simply lowered her stance to the point where decent behavior appeared remarkable. She'd have to verify the authenticity of the letter, of course, but it was a thought that counted. How did you know about me and Hogwarts history? she asked. He shook his head. I never reveal a source. Jenny, perhaps, or Neville, so Slytherin. I have to leave in an hour, she said, glancing up at the large clock tower across the street. I'm sorry we don't have more time. That's fine, Theo said. The server arrived and sat down their sandwiches and two glasses of butterbeer. Two new beginnings, Hermione said, raising her glass. Theo smile crinkled the edges of his green eyes. Two new beginnings. They clinked glasses. My theme for this year. You seem to have made a good start, she said. Oh, I'm here with you, right? He set down his glass. And my father is now not so dearly departed. I can set my own future now, put the past behind me. His hands found hers under the table. Money nodded. He certainly would have an easier time than Malfoy. Theo was a non-entity during the war, and his easy charm would go a long way. He wondered why Astoria wasn't chasing him instead. I'm surprised you aren't betrothed to someone, she said, pulling the tomatoes out of her sandwich with a fork. I thought many pubert families made arrangements. He shrugged. My father didn't care much about that, or about me for that matter. Considered me a poor excuse for now. And your mother? she asked. She died before I came to Hogwarts, he said. Oh, I never could find out how. His answer hung in the air between them. Not sure this is the best subject for today, Theo said with a tight smile. You're right, she said, squeezing his hand. Theo's smile softened. A funny thing happened to me in care of magical creatures yesterday. Hagrid brought out this absolutely terrifying chimera, and nobody would approach it except Luna Lovegood. 
She kept giving it daisies and the chimera liked them. Man is soft and took giggles. They finished their lunch, Theo ordered a few more butterbeers, and by the end of the hour they were helplessly laughing, trying to top each other's stories. I can't believe it, Theo said. You called Trelawney, fraud to her face, and stomped out. Divination is a load of rubbish, she said heartily, then she grinned. And you, Theodore, so quiet during first year in Transfiguration, turning people's needles back into toothpicks without anybody knowing. Ron failed that lesson. I did it to yours too, but you didn't even notice. You just switched it back without thinking. That was you. I thought I'd done it myself accidentally. Theo huffed a laugh. Like the great Hermione Granger could make a mistake. She sighed. You have no idea. Hermione looked at the clock again and stood up. I'm sorry, I have to go. Theo stood as well. Don't be sorry, it was a great afternoon. She looked up at him, brow furrowed. Are we friends now, or still acquaintances? Theo chuckled and kissed her on the cheek. It was a lingering kiss. She could feel the roughness of a midday stubble and a warm, sweet breath on her ear. Friendly acquaintances, he said. Hermione was late getting to the three broomsticks, her stomach rebelling slightly from blazes drinks the night before, a big sandwich for lunch and a couple of butterbeers already that day. She needed to slow down, or she'd never make it through the evening. Hermione! Harry shouted her name, causing half the pub to stare. She didn't care, just run between the tables and into his arms. Oh, Harry! She whimpered, almost tearful. He grabbed a handful of his grey Ministry of Magic sweatshirt. Hey, he said, wrapping his arms around her. What's wrong? It's been a long week, she said, her face still buried in his chest. Hey, Moy, Ron said, clearly expecting a hug as well. She pulled away from Harry and gave Ron a quick squeeze. I'm just so glad the three of us are together, she said as they settled around the corner table. Are oh, you really okay? Harry asked, starting a butterbeer towards her. You look upset. It's Malfoy, Ron sped. He won't leave her alone. Has he been bothering you? Harry asked sternly. I did not like the way he was looking at. Looking at what? Ron asked. The way he looked at his trial, Harry lied smoothly. I don't trust him. Yes, tell her, Ron said. Every time I turn around, he's watching Hermione and whispering to her. Is he now? Harry said, green eyes cold behind his glasses. Oh, for Merlin's sake, Hermione said. You're blowing this all out of proportion. He is a troublemaker and both of you let him get under your skin. I'm just a little stressed out about Newt. Ron bounced excitedly in his seat. Did Hermione tell you about porn? He asked Harry. Harry blinked. What? No, I kind of found it on my own. You put organization to revue Newt, Hermione snapped. Harry's laughter had the entire population of the three broomsticks staring again. Ron's face was rat with mirth, and even Hermione couldn't help giggling. All tension faded away, and Ron and Hermione launched into every ridiculous thing that had happened the previous week. Ron gave a spirited description of the Quidditch camp when Malfoy was injured, including the choking beaters. Harry was intrigued and gave Hermione a quick glance, but said nothing. Both men snickered at Hermione's description of the slug party. Sounds awful, Harry said. Now I'm really glad I didn't return to Hogwarts. It's not me, honestly, that you had to do that on your birthday, Ron said. Why did you go afterwards? I was looking for you. Oh, a bunch of us were hanging out, Hermione said. Was Lizarens? Ron asked. Was Malfoy there? No, Ronald, he wasn't there, she said irritated. It was probably with Astoria Greengrass. I don't remember her, Harry said, frowning. You're behind us. A real looker, but a price bitch, Ron said. So she's perfect for Malfoy, Hermione said in what she thought was a light, friendly tone, but both Harry and Ron stared. What? Nothing, Harry said. Tell me more about your birthday. My parents gave me this pendant and this sweet card. They've really forgiven me, Harry. She felt like sniffling again. Harry patted her hand. Beyond? Ron prompted. And a lovely golden pin from Ron, Hermione said in a sing-sang voice. Well, that sounds nice, Harry said, sipping his butterbeer. It tripped like a book, Ron said proudly. Harry sighed. I'm going to just bang my hat on the table now. It's all right, Harry, really, Hermione said. What? Ron asked. Harry and Hermione started laughing. What? He asked louder, but it was no good. His friends were out of control now. They all think he'll ever work it out, Harry gasped. What? Hermione likes books, right? Ron asked. Harry's hat fell on the table. Oh, I can't take it, he groaned. 
Harry, what did I say? Ron asked. Hermione! She stroked Harry's head beside her butter beer. Thank you, too, for the paperweight, Harry, she said. I just love it. Harry raised his head and grinned at Ron, who was still frowning. Pull yourself together, Harry, and tell us about the Aurus office, Hermione commanded. It's important stuff for Ron to know. And maybe you, too, if you want to join us, Harry said. He described the training, and it did sound demanding but exciting. Ron seemed surprisingly distant, only half listening, but Hermione was intrigued by the Aura's creative approaches. An anti-apparition capture charm. Fascinating, Hermione said. You should talk to Bluebell, our new daughter teacher. Ron burst into laughter. What, that little fairy? he asked. A fairy? Harry asked. I've decided that her approaches has some merit after all. Although it wants discipline and proper nude preparation, Hermione said. She talks a lot about unpredictable spell work and creative strategies. A love, Ron said. She talks a lot about love. Harry looked apart. Well, the auras can skip that part, Ron, Hermione snapped. Can you see it? A bunch of auras reading lists of what they love about each other. Asked Ron, laughing again. Hermione couldn't help but join in. And then Harry, although he looked a little nervous about fighting dark wizards with love, and the three were off again, laughing until they were finally kicked out of the three broomsticks and ended up at the hogshead. Harry picked up three grimy glasses and a bottle of fire whiskey from the bar. Hermione, Harry said quickly while Ron was in the loo, we have to talk about those blot messages. Kingsley's got some theories. Hermione sniffed. I'm sure he has. And I want to hear about that experimental potion you bring. Will it really identify the blot yeast? I hope so. She said, an unexpected issue came up, but I've got it now. Give me ten days, no, two weeks, and we can show you something. Who's we? Hermione groaned inwardly at her own stupidity. She hadn't planned on telling him. I have an assistant. Who? Hey, never. Harry eyed her closely, and his freak aura senses kicked in. Oh, no, 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 no. There's nobody else good enough, she has. Slughorn won't help the coward. Drake and Malfoy cannot be trusted, Harry hissed back, his lightning scar a dark jack line on his flushed forehead. He looked a little like he had in sixth year, manically trying to convince Hermione that Malfoy was a death eater. He had, of course, been absolutely right, she remembered uncomfortably. Just because Malfoy didn't write that message, Harry began, then looked up and stopped. Hermione followed his gaze to see Ron heading their way stopping to goggle at a hag in the corner with tiny birds circling her head. Harry turned back to her. All right, my, two weeks. I want to see this fabulous potion. Ron was nearly at the table. I'll allow you, he whispered. Hermione nodded and sipped her drink. Ron dropped into his seat and picked up his glass of fire whiskey. So hurry, he said. When are you seeing Jenny? Their friend looked away. Did she say something? No, it seems buds really go for the Slytherins these days. Ron caught his eyes at Hermione. Run, Hermione said. Just seems a bit strange, that's all, how cozy you and Ginny are with the lot. Ron went on. Jenny fooling around with Sabini and you spending all this time with not a Malfoy. Jenny's fooling around with Sabini, Harry asked. Hermione nodded reluctantly. Now you have been spending time together. Harry looked down at the drink in his hand. Oh, I told her we should see other people, but I didn't think that meant... His lip curled in a very unhairy like way. Blaze Zabini. His voice held a world of contempt. What aren't you telling us? Hermione asked. Harry rubbed his hand through his black hair, sticking it up even more. I've... I've met someone too. Ron's face turned red. You're cheating on my sister? He asked loudly. Ron, Hermione snapped. Harry said they could see other people, and Jenny told me the same thing. It's not cheating. You're right, it's not, Ron growled. Cheating is when you think you're in a relationship with someone, and she suddenly starts stringing you along and chasing other men. I told you straight out, I just wanted to be friends, and I'm not chasing other men, Hermione cried. The fucked up part, Ron continued, is I'll probably string them along too, poor bastards. I will feel sorry for Malfoy. Ron, that is uncalled for, Harry said. Hermione says there's nothing going on between Hal and Malfoy, and I believe her. Hermione shifted slightly in her seat, thinking of lips against skin and infirmary. Well, what about not, then? Ron was asking her. Fear the not. Ignatius not son. Harry stared at her wide-eyed, then shook his head. Hermione doesn't have to tell us anything. No, it's all right, she took a deep breath. 
Right now, Theo and I are friends, but yes, we might start dating. She glared at Ron. At least Theo doesn't lose his mind every time I do or say something he doesn't like. He's not a big fan of Malfoy either, but he's somewhat mature about it. Why? I get upset because I care, Ron said. Those cool blood snakes don't care about anybody. We've been over this, Ronald, Hermione said. Your idea of caring is acting like a Godric damn control freak. Whoa, you keep doing stupid shit like... Don't you dare call me stupid. When's the last time you did anything, right? She yelled, slamming her hand on the table. Dust billowed from the wound surface in a choking cloud and covered their already dirty glasses of fire whiskey. Run, Harry said. Hermione can make her own decisions. So you're on her side now, Ron said. I'm on both of your sides, and... No, you're not, Ron said. You don't think I see the looks between you, the conversation stopping whenever I approach? His blue eyes were unusually shrewd as he looked between them. It happened again just now when I came back to the table. Hermione was appalled. Ron, there is nothing going on between Harry and me. Absolutely nothing, Harry said firmly. I don't see her that way at all. All that time in the tent. Harry shook his head. Nothing happened there. We've never kissed. Ew, Hermione said. One quirked a small smile at that. Well, then what's going on? Why don't you tell me more? Maybe we would if we could trust you not to go spare, Harry said. I can bet it, really, Ron said, leaning forward. I promise. What were you talking about when I came back? Harry and Hermione glanced at each other. Hermione sighed. We were talking about my experimental patient with Malfoy, and I just didn't feel like hearing twenty more verses of the same old song. Malfoy? You were still... Ron began. Hermione and Harry glared at him across the table. Okay, okay, Ron said. He blinked a few times and cleared his throat. So, uh, how's that going? He asked in a painfully polite tone. Harry started laughing. Hermione scowled as she cleared the dust off the table and glasses with a quick scorchify. Surprisingly well, she said. We're working on a blood potion that might help us find out who wrote that message on the wall. Uh, Malfoy really wants to do that, Ron raised his hand. I'm just asking. It's a fat question, Harry said, pouring out more fire whiskey. Ron, Malfoy was questioned by Oros and the Veritas Serum. He didn't write that message and he doesn't know who did, Hermione said. That's right. I was there, Merlin, help me, Harry said. So what McGonagall said was true, Ron asked. Have you ever known her to lie? Hermione snapped. Anyway... After Malfoy proved himself on the Veritas serum questioning, there was no reason not to accept his help. I need him, Ron. I've seen that patient, Slab, Ron said, knocking back another fire whiskey. It's quite small. How small? Harry asked. Harry? Hermione rolled her eyes. Don't you start? I don't think Malfoy wants to help Muggleborns at all, Ron went on. I think he's got a sick fixation with Hermione and he sees this as his way in. I completely agree, Harry said. His eyes looked like cold jade. Hermione could almost feel the magic crackling around him. Don't look at me that way, Hermione. I was with you two in McGonagall's office, and he was everything that Ron describes. What did he do in McGonagall's office? Ron asked Harry. Hello, I'm right here, Hermione said. Should I just leave now so you can discuss me in peace? Doesn't anybody want to know what I think? I already know what you think. You've made it quite clear. Ron said, You think Malfoy's changed or reformed or something, that he was Voldemort's innocent victim and deserves a second chance? He's no innocent, Ron, but yes, he does deserve a second chance, Hermione said. It was definitely time to change the subject. So, she asked Harry, who's the woman you're two-timing Jenny with? Oh, Merlin, stop. Harry groaned, dropping his head into his hands. Yes, what's that all about? Asked Ron. Always easily distracted. Who is she? Harry flushed. Another aura trainee. Graduated from Bobaton. Her name is Chloe de Grey. Does she bought Vila? Ron asked with a grin. No, Harry said shortly. But she is incredibly talented and she doesn't care that I'm famous. She's pure blood and her family practically disowned her when she announced she wanted to come to Britain and be an aura. Suddenly the chairs began to levitate from the floor. Harry barely managed to keep his eyeglasses on his nose, and Hermione grabbed a beaded bag as the chairs carried them away from the table. What's happening? Ron cried out. Bar's closing, Harry said, grinning. This place means business. Makes sense, given the clientele, Hermione added. Half the remaining patrons were passed out in their seats. 
The levitating chairs carried them outside, unceremoniously dumping them outside the door and floating back inside. Money and Ron fell to the wooden sidewalk while Harry managed to stay on his feet. Money scrambled up quickly, but most of the other expelled patrons just lay on the ground. Oh, I think it's time to call it a night, Harry grinned, helping Ron stand. Ron groaned, All the whiskey had obviously rushed to his head. Can you get him back to Hogwarts, Hermione? Of course, she said, giving Harry a hug. Be careful, Hermione, Harry whispered. Watch yourself with Malfoy. I know you're not telling me everything. He slapped Ron on the shoulder, nearly knocking his tipsy friend into the dirt, and this apparated with a pop. Boy, Harry, Ron shouted into thin air. Oh, boy, let's just apparate to the castle. Ron, you can't apparate into Hogwarts. How many times? She turned to see him grinning at her. Very funny, she huffed. Oh, I was waiting for you to call Hogwarts a history, he said. Wish we could apparate, Hermione sniffed. You'd probably splinch yourself. Or... Excellent at apparition. Oh yes, so amazing, you left an eyebrow behind during the test. Hoff, an eyebrow? Ron said indignantly. Now Hermione was grinning. Hey, he cried, very funny. It is, she said, drawing her arm through his. And the walk to the castle would be good for you. I don't want what's good for me. Ron grumbled, leaning against her. Hermione sighed. Nobody does, she said. Chapter 22 Surprises the walk back to the castle was good for Ron, and he was mostly sober as he and Hermione climbed the stairs to Gryffindor Tower. Can we sit a bit by a fire, Hermione? he asked as they entered the portrait hall. She bit her lip, looking up at him. I don't want to fight, she said. No fighting, I promise. They settled on the sofa by the fire, and it was after midnight, and the common room was dim and empty. Ron lay there cloaks on the armchair and sat facing her his arms along the back of the sofa, much like Malfoy did the night of the Gryffindor party. Money glanced at the curtain still covering the bloody letters. It had been weeks since the messages appeared, and they were no closer to figuring out who did it. Why? Oh, I still don't get it, Ron said almost pleadingly. Why all the Slytherins this year? Money felt like pretending she didn't know what he meant, but she was suddenly so tired of games. I'm not entirely sure myself, she said. It was rather odd. If she wanted to date outside Gryffindor, why not Ravenclaws or even Hufflepuffs? Well, maybe not Hufflepuffs. Only Macmillan? Justin Finch Fletchley? Ew. You think Malfoy has turned over a new leaf? Ron went on, thankfully ignorant of her mind's latest puzzling detour. You think he's handsome and funny? He sneered the last word. I've seen you try to hide your smiles. You like the whole bad boy Slytherin asshole thing. Hermione frowned. Maybe I like that Malfoy and Theo treat me like a woman and not a book with legs. I do see you as a woman. Ron's blue eyes gleamed at her. You can't have forgotten. That's just sex, Hermione said bitterly. The rest of time I'm just a walking library to you. Well, that's not true, Ron said, his hand reaching out to stroke her hair. It made her uncomfortable, not the way Malfoy's hand did, when she couldn't help but stare at a long pair of fingers tugging at her curl but tense and crawly. Ron's purposeful touch had a not-quite-right feeling she couldn't shake. Ron, she said gently, you gave me a book pen for my birthday. His hand stopped. You said you liked it. Look, she said, tugging her hair away, much like she had with Malfoy. Was she doomed to play out as a little scene with Theo next? What would she do if he sat on the sofa and played with her curls? Life was truly baffling. Hermione, you said you like the pen, Ron said, bringing her back to the conversation. You like books? I do, but that's not all I like. I like personal gifts too, Hermione said. I don't want to criticize your gift, Ron, and it's perfect if we're just friends. As friends, I'm always happy to receive a gift from you and have you in my life. But it's not exactly romantic. What about Harry's present? He gave you a paperweight. Yes, it's shaped like an otter she said, when looked blank. An otter, Ron, my Patronus. Ron stared at her, all colour fading from his face. Personal, he said. He looked so woebegone that Hermione couldn't help but hug him. Oh, Ron, you are my best friend with Harry. I love you. I just don't think we're good as a couple. Ron held her face in his hand. Boy, I still want you, he whispered, looking at her lips. 
She pulled back. It's not meant to be. Ren lowered his hands. What is meant to be with Slytherins, eh? Although you'll be waiting a while to get a personal gift from Draco Malfoy, like he wastes his precious galleons on a gift for you. He stopped. Marnie tried to keep her face neutral, but his eyes narrowed anyway. Malfoy gave you a birthday present. He did. What was it? A sotty underwear? Run! Hermione snapped her face red. Well, you want personal? Ron sneered. I'll have you know, Ronald, the only sotty underwear I received for my birthday was from your sister. Ron's expression was priceless. Malfoy's present was nothing disrespectful, she went on. And if you think I'm telling you, you're balmy. Boy, it was personal, Ron said, now looking ill. Well, it wasn't a book, she snapped. That killed the conversation for a time, and only the popping and crackling of the fire could be heard. Ron, you wanted to tell me something, she finally said. He looked hesitant. First, let me get this straight, Ron said. You and Harry aren't telling me things because you say I get excited when I don't like it. Hermione nodded, wondering where he was going with this. Well, if I'm going to stop doing that, you have to promise to stop doing it too. When have I ever... Hermione's voice rose, then trailed off. Are you saying you're not telling us something? Two things, actually. Ron looked uncomfortable. What? Now it was Hermione's turn to lean forward, eyes narrowed. Ron was flushing. When I couldn't find any of you last night, I went off with R Romilda Vane. Romilda Vane? The brainless groupie? What were you? Hermione snapped her mouth shut. She was doing it. She closed her eyes and took a breath. Romilda Vane, she said in a completely different tone. How interesting. Ron snickered. Yes, uh, interesting. He looked uncomfortable again. Hermione, the night of the Gryffindor party, I kind of got involved with Romilda. Hermione tilted her head. Involved? We shagged, he admitted. She stared at him. Do you like her? She asked, trying to sound calm. Oh, I don't know, but I like how she makes me feel, Ron said. Like I'm powerful, important. But she's just using you, she doesn't care. Ah! Hermione shook her head wildly. I'm sorry, she said. This is hard. You're telling me, Ron sighed. You say I don't make you feel like a woman. Well, maybe you don't make me feel like a man, just a sidekick. Hermione took his hand. You're not just a sidekick. Harry, I love you. Ron just looked down at their hands, not answering. Ron, if you like being with Romilda, then you should be. What I think doesn't matter. Ron looked up. You're so beautiful, and I still won't, but... He sighed again. You said there were two things, Hermione said, hoping to change the subject. This next one is worse, he groaned. She looked at him skeptically. Oh, I didn't want to come back to Hogwarts in the first place, but since the Aura's office wouldn't take me, you said I didn't have a choice. That's right, you don't. You have to get your... Ah, uh, I'm doing it again. She slapped her hands over her mouth. Yes, you are. Ron's amused, slightly superior gun looked strange on his freckled face. But I do have a choice. Oh, I don't have to get my nudes. I can work with George in the joke shop. Hermione said nothing, just kept her hands over her mouth. Harry's been writing me about aura training. I could never hack it, Ron said seriously. I'm sick of trying to do things I suck at and getting my ass handed back to me by you or Harry or both. I want to do something I'm good at. I want to make people smile and make children laugh. George is there all alone and I want to be with him. I miss my family. I belong there. I don't belong here anymore. Hermione slowly lowered her hands. You want to drop out of Hogwarts, she said as neutrally as she could. Yes, Ron said. I don't like who I am here, an angry fuckle sneaking around with Romilda fighting with the Slytherins. What about Quidditch? Hermione asked. He shrugged. Meg Legner is just as good as I am. Jenny just shows me because I'm a brother. That's not true. Hermione, you're brilliant, but you don't know shit about Quidditch. There was another short silence, then Hermione plucked up her courage. I just have to say this, she said. Are you sure? Because if you tire off the joke shop, you can't come back. This is your only opportunity to sit for your nudes, and if you don't do it, it will limit what you can do in the future. Ron shrugged. Any job that requires stellar nudes is not a job I do well at. Hermione didn't entirely agree, but she clenched her teeth and said nothing. She'd been no more tolerant of Ron's choices than he had been of hers. He had returned to Hogwarts for her, and just before they arrived, she'd cut him loose. No wonder he took up with that idiot Vane. 
Hermione still hadn't forgiven that woman for trying to dose Harry with a love potion in fourth year. She thought about reminding Ron of that, even considered suggesting that she dosed Ron this time, but held her tongue. What will I do here without you? She asked, taking his hand again. Apparently run around with every Slytherin prat in school, he said gloomily, but without he. When will you go? A week from Friday, Ron said. I'm going to tell McGonagall tomorrow. Does Ginny know? He shook his head. George does, of course. I'll tell Jin tomorrow, tell my parents after I leave. I don't fancy filling house from Mum every day. I'll come see you every weekend, she promised. Maybe. He looked at her longingly for a moment and shook his head. We really need some time apart, Hermione. He swallowed. I never shat, Lavender. You were first, you know. She had known. It had been so awkward and she had assumed that was because Ron was just awkward. Looking back, Hermione realized she'd expected sex with him to be awkward. She'd been surprised it had been as enjoyable as it was. She shook her head. She really did always think she knew it all, and it turned out she knew nothing. Ron hadn't just been a self-indulgent ass over the summer, he had also been a teenage boy getting late for the first time. I'm glad you were my first run, he said. I'm glad you're doing what makes you happy. She took a deep breath. I will support you fully, and I won't let anybody criticize your choices. He kissed her for that, but it was a light, quick kiss on her mouth, full of understanding. In a way, she felt she was meeting Ron as an adult for the first time. She just hadn't seen it. Upstairs in bed, Hermione tossed and turned, trying to process the eventful day. Malfoy, Theo, Harry, Ron, such very different people. She considered updating her life optimization organization plan to process her thoughts. She had an idea for a flowchart, but she fell asleep instead, lulled by dreams of magical charts with color-coded columns. Hermione spent Sunday in the library, while nearly the entire school went to the Ravenclaw Hufflepuff match. Between porn and Slughorn's party, experimental potions and Hogsmeade, she'd had little time for her assignments and was only two months ahead of her reading. It took the entire day, skipping lunch and sneaking snacks from her back to complete her schoolwork to her satisfaction. Thea joined her after lunch, also missing the Quidditch match, and except for a sly smile and stroke of his fingers on her cheek, stayed fairly focused on himself. Late in the afternoon, after the game, Hufflepuff won in a total upset, Students began filling the library, everyone catching up on work neglected over the weekend. Neville joined Hermione and Theo, then Ginny arrived, and little was heard but the scratching of quills and rustling of parchment. Hermione's first thought Monday morning was that today Ron would tell McGonagall he was leaving Hogwarts. On while getting ready and packing her bag, she had to restrain herself from running into Ron's room, screaming that he was making a huge mistake. This is his life, he's a grown man. She repeated silently. You didn't like him questioning your choices. Ginny had taken the news the night before with surprising aplomb. She'd known Ron wasn't happy at Hogwarts and she'd been worried about George. Ron himself was reserved at breakfast, sitting beside Hermione with his back to the wall. Hermione put her head on his shoulder and he put an arm around her, looking around the hall as if he was seeing it for the last time. He didn't even glare at a Slytherin table. Hermione didn't look over there either. She didn't care what Malfoy was doing and whether Astoria was sitting beside him or not. She didn't. Potion's class was strained and stilted. Ron was absent and Hermione was sure he was in McGonagall's office, which made her distracted. Lavender joined her in Malfoy's potion and spent most of it praising Malfoy's chopping and stirring. Malfoy kept trying to catch Hermione's eye, but she was almost too preoccupied to notice. Ron turned up at lunch, looking greatly relieved, and the next few days were unusually placid. Malfoy continued to watch Hermione in class and snipe at Ron at every opportunity, but Ron ignored everyone but Hermione, spending his class hours scribbling down ideas for new joke products. Aware that Ron's days remaining at Hogwarts were few, Hermione spent all her spare time with him. He wasn't studying much these days, so they had regular teas with Hagrid, played cards and wizard chess, and visited their old haunts. They even took some butterbeers into the Forbidden Forest and jumped into a leaf pile like first years until Ron rubbed moss in Hermione's hair and she dropped a spider on his chest in retaliation. He was hurrying along the second-floor corridor on Thursday after dinner, well wrapped in a scarf and hat in preparation for watching one play Kidditch, when a heavy black mist appeared before her. Hermione tried to walk through, but the dark cloud felt as solid as a wall. She turned to see another mist about five feet off, effectively blocking her into the small space. Hermione huffed across her arms, utterly unsurprised to see a ghost-like figure emerge from the darkness. 
Cute, Malfoy, she said. What are you after? A moment of your time, he answered, unsmiling. He had shed his rope, jumper and tie, and his hair and white shirt shone starkly against the blackness beyond. I'm late for the Gryffindor's practice, she said. He arched an eyebrow. Since when do you watch Quidditch practices? Since now, let me out. No, he said, looking down his nose at her. Oh, I've been trying to speak to you all week. Tell me. Tell you what? What I did this time? His voice was cold. You were right shrew in the potions lab on Saturday, and now you're avoiding me and living in the weasel's pocket. So what fell short, Ranger? The gift? The dance? Are you miffed because I didn't dig up those wretched weeds myself? Of course not, Hermione said. You're being ridiculous. His eyes glittered. It's true, then. You've gone back to your weasel. His voice was so confident that if she didn't know better, she'd believe it herself. Malfoy moved closer. What makes you think he'll ever be enough? Hermione felt a tug at her neck and looked down to see his hand pull away her red and gold scarf to pull on their feet. Malfoy's other hand drew off her hat, releasing her wild hair. She swallowed. No, I'm not back with Ron. Then tell me, tell me now, he demanded. What did I do? Hermione squeezed her eyes shut like a child, unable to look at him. Going from Malfoy, this was practically begging. You didn't do anything wrong, she choked out. You have every right to. Then why, Hermione? She could feel his warm hands on her throat, tilting up her face. Why are you running from me? He whispered. I'm not. She began, but then his lips were on hers, swallowing her lie. He licked her lower lip and she responded immediately, welcoming him in, and the feel of his warm tongue against hers almost made her sob. Malfoy deepened the kiss, his hands still on her face, and she pressed against him, her own hands running up that long, sinuous body. She went that way, shouted a high voice. Cupcake! There's nothing there, Bertie. That black fork, it ate her, cupcake! Hermione and Malfoy broke apart, startled as more voices filtered in from the black mist. Bertie lost his pygmy puff. Again? Cupcake! Malfoy glared in the direction of the voices. Oh, for fuck's sake, he muttered. L look, Hermione stammered, pointing to his feet. Her heart was still pounding, and she felt lightheaded. He looked down, and his horrified reaction to the pink pygmy puff on his glossy shoes sent Hermione into a smothered giggle. Dark wizard Draco Malfoy and his spooky, puff-trapping myth. Oh well, her nerves were already shot. What harm could a little hysteria do? The puff squeaked excitedly and disappeared inside Malfoy's trousers cuff. Ugh! he cried. I heard her cupcake, cupcake! Bertie screeched. Malfoy was shaking his leg, trying to dislodge the puff from inside his trousers, and Hermione collapsed against the wall, holding her sides. Cupcake rolled out of his trouser leg and began bouncing in a confined space, still squeaking. Some help you are! Malfoy snapped at Hermione. He pulled out his wand and waved it, then the puff bounced again, sailing into the mist and disappearing. Cupcake! shouted Bertie. Both black mists dissipated, and Malfoy and Hermione found themselves facing a group of familiar Hufflepuff boys. Mr. Malfoy! It's Mr. Malfoy! And Miss Granger! They saved Cupcake! Thank you! Oh, no, said Hermione, who had finally gotten her giggles under control. Malfoy was still too outraged to speak. This was entirely Mr. Malfoy's doing. Thank you, Mr. Malfoy, Bertie cried, running up to the Slytherin, his puff in his hands. Cupcake says thank you, too. Cupcake bounced onto Malfoy's shoulder, causing the blonde to recoil. Look, Cupcake, look, Cupcake likes him. Ah, come here, Cupcake, Bertie called. The boy jumped up and down, arms outstretched in an attempt to retrieve his pygmy puff. Puff squeaked, but wouldn't leave Malfoy. Get it off, Malfoy said, shaking his shoulders. He looked over at Hermione. Where are you going? Hermione was wrapping her scarf around her neck again. I told you, Quidditch practice, she said, jamming her hat on her head. No, just wait a minute, Malfoy shot forward and led her away from the Hufflepuffs. Hermione, he said in a low voice, his eyes on hers. Hermione's breath caught. He suddenly looked so vulnerable and young, nearly as young as the boy fidgeting behind him. Don't be angry, he whispered. Don't shut me out. I'm not angry, Hermione said. I like my gift. I like the dance. I even like the studying clover. 
I like to kiss, too. Well, then help me. I do like to bed by Slytherin ass, I'll sing. Then forget Quidditch practice. Come with me. Malfoy swallowed and looked down. I won't tell anyone. No, Draco, we can't do this. She had considered everything very carefully over the past few days. She'd even created a Granger Malfoy flowchart in her loop, and no matter how many times she drew it, the boxes and arrows always diverged. He was a Malfoy, and she was a Muggerborn. No matter what happened between them, one day Draco would reach into his pocket and slip on that onyx and silver ring with its sinister motto and take his rightful place. She wanted no part of that world, and she wouldn't be his youthful indiscretion, or even worse, his dirty little secret. I'm sorry, she whispered. She brushed his hand with her own and walked away, leaving a stunned young wizard with a pink pygmy puff on his shoulder. Chapter 23 A Complex Verbal Threat Malfoy kept his distance from Hermione the next day, his posture stiff and his face unreadable, and Hermione did the same. It was the only proper course, and she had the flowchart to prove it. Ginny threw another party Friday night in the Gryffindor common room, inviting eighth year Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs, but not Slytherins, not even Blake. Hermione spent most of the evening on the sofa with Ron, drinking as little as possible and trying not to think back to the rich taste of cyan scotch and a long, pale finger gently tugging a curl. Do I frighten you that much? On Saturday, she and Ron met Harry in Hogsmeade, and the trio spent the day and night getting thrown out of various cafes and pubs. They ended up at the Hogshead again, where Hermione began covertly turning Harry's eyebrows different colours and pretending to see nothing when Ron drunkenly pointed it out. The two men finally caught on and started chasing her around the pub, tripping over the empty bottles she rolled in their way until Harry finally bound Hermione to a chair with an incarcerous spell and began whispering in her ear all the ways he was going to fail her newt. Her screams finally got them expelled from the hogshead for frightening the clientele. Hermione was so distracted she'd forgotten that the second Monday in October was the introduction to the fabulous winkweed plant in double herbology after weeks of observation and essay writing. Her pulse sped up when she entered the small greenhouse and saw a tarp-covered object in the centre of each table. Professor Sprout was bobbing on her ears, her face flushed with excitement. All right, class, she said. You are now ready to meet the star of the show. First, a quick review. Can anyone tell me about the specimens we're about to study? Hermione and Astoria never raised their hands in the same instant. Miss Greengrass? These sprouts have yet to bloom, Astoria said with icy precision. The stamen is fully developed. However, producing poisonous pollen that can be released in clouds if the plant feels threatened. The seeds, however, are immature, and while they can be shot out at high velocities, they have not yet developed in magical attacks. Excellent. Don't mind this Slytherin, Rod said. It is very important that once the wingweeds are uncovered, that no one startles or upsets them. They are likely sleeping now, and you all want to keep them that way. No noise muffling spells allowed. This is an observational lesson only. You will make a drawing of your particular plant, noting any distinctive features, and label them as you did at the start of this lesson. We will save more dangerous activities, like watering the plants or setting them in direct sunlight, for the next week. The student nodded in agreement, eyeing their covered plants nervously. Now, Sprout said, who can tell us the steps to take if a plant is awakened? And keep in mind, if one plant is awakened, it will likely wake up the other, so quick action is vital. Again, Hermione, Astoria, and Neville raised their hands at once, and Sprout nodded at Hermione. The first step is to loom threateningly over the plant, as close as possible, Hermione said. The winkweed might think you are a larger plant and curl up, especially since it is still a seedling. If the plant doesn't retreat, the next step is point your wand at it while delivering a complex verbal threat. Why a complex verbal threat? Sprout asked. The winkweed considers itself a powerful being. A complex threat positions you as a superior being capable of imaginative destruction. Yes, Dan points to Gryffindor. Mr. Malfoy, what other qualities necessary for the threat to work? It has to be heartfelt, Malfoy said, sounding bored. The student has to appear ready and willing to carry out whatever he or she says, no matter how dangerous. Yes, was all Sprout said. Never rewarded students who waited to be called on, 
an attitude that Hermione considered commendable. And here we come to the heart of the plan's name. Obviously, we do not want any of you to damage your plans. They are far too rare and valuable, but a plan does not know that. So your challenge is to fool it into believing you're serious, to hoodwink it. Hermione thought back to the fur-trapping wizard who first discovered the plant. He had fortunately been an avid poker player with a flaming temper and an intemperate tongue. All right, class, uncover your plants, Brad said. Astoria, predictably, shifted her stool farther away, leaving Hermione to pull off the top. Damn, coward Slytherins, Hermione thought, noting that Neville was left to uncover his as well. The wingweed plant didn't look dangerous, especially as a seedling. It was about a foot tall with small green buffs that would open to become blossoms. Its thorns were tiny, but still looked sharp. Its main stem and leaves were curled and sleep, and Hermione let out a breath she didn't realize she was holding. Astoria spread out her parchment and began sketching, and Hermione did the same. Soon the only sound in the greenhouse was the scratching of quills on the parchment. Astoria apparently included a flair for drawing in her long lists of talents, and her meticulous sketch was a work of art with lovely cross-hatchings on the leaf. Hermione's was merrily serviceable. After thirty minutes of silence, the seventh-year Slytherin boys began speaking in low voices, and Astoria decided it was time to chat as well. Oh, but Trussell is still there, you know, she murmured. Why, Astoria, I didn't know you cared, Hermione said, retracting her drawing's jack line of the stem. Would you like a large wedding? It was signed years ago, the Slytherin continued, keeping her voice low. Signed, sealed, and consummated. Astoria smirked. Consummated repeatedly. I don't need to hear about your Akai customs, Hermione said at regular volume. This isn't 1470. She was alluding to a wizarding tradition begun that year where betrothals were consummated before both sets of families to ruin their prospective brides for anyone else. She'd spent an eye-opening hour on Sunday researching pureblood betrothals. Pureblood academic interests, of course. Astoria's hand clenched on her quill, but her voice remained cool and low-pitched. Draco's name might be slightly tarnished, but not for long. He is clearly plotting the Malfoy's return to power. Perhaps, Hermione said, putting down her quill and finally looking at her partner. But repairing that family's reputation could take decades. Are you willing to wait that long? You've given this some thought, Granger. Astoria purred. Hermione shrugged. It's rather obvious. Death Eaters and their families have little choice but to atone as best as they can, contribute to the greater good, and hope time does the rest. A hard road, Astoria said. Some prefer a less rigorous path. Then they will fail, Hermione asserted. There are no shortcuts here unless one wants to be dogged by fear and suspicion for the rest of his or her life. She held Astoria's eyes. And that goes for the family's precious heirs as well. Are you sure you want to be Lady Malfoy, Greengrass? Are you sure you want that for your children? Her voice had risen near the end, and her final words rang out in the silence. The plant before her quivered, and Hermione snapped her mouth shut. She couldn't help but look over Astoria's shoulder at Malfoy, and his horrified expression made her stomach twist. She looked down at her trembling hands, already regretting her words. How could she say such a thing? Them, that Astoria. The plan drooped again, to both women's relief, and Hermione dared to hope that she'd at least shut Astoria up for good. She glanced over at Malfoy and Neville's table again, and was alarmed to see Neville's sleeve tip over his inkpot. He righted it immediately, but the table was slightly tilted, and a thin rivulet of ink ran quickly toward a trailing winkweed vine. Never! she hissed. Never looked up at her, startled while Malfoy, lost in his own obviously unpleasant thoughts, hadn't noticed. A drop of ink touched the vine. Never, Malfoy! Hermione said louder. Sliding off her stool and stepping closer to their table, the little plant shot straight up, rattling its leaf menacingly. Both men understood the situation instantly and leaped to their feet, ones out. The plant's vines whipped out, reaching for Neville, and Malfoy shoved his partner aside, knocking over his stool. The noise enraged the plant, and it turned on Malfoy. Get Sprout, Hermione told the Southern boy, and drew her own wand. Astoria said smoothly to the other side of their table, 
further from the threatening plant. Hermione stepped closer to Malfoy. Ranger, Malfoy warned, moving between her and the plant and raising his wand. Sloming height wasn't enough. The plant was fully awake now. Fire, Hermione said. Malfoy nodded and addressed the plant. I will burn you to ash in an instant. Incendienda! For an instant, Hermione thought he had done it. Destroyed his wingweed on the first day. His face was a mask of fury, and his voice, by pitched low to avoid waking the other plants, was bursting with power. But then she realized he had pronounced the last syllable of the charm incorrectly, and Malfoy would never make such a mistake. The wingweed obviously believed him, however. The plant curled back into its pod, unharmed, and when Sprout burst in, all three plants were sleeping, and Hermione was helping Neville to his feet. Sprout waved her wand covering the plants and casting a spell, shielding them from any noise. What happened here? she demanded. Oh, I knocked over my ink pot. Neville said miserably. Some of the ink reached the plant's leaf. It probably thought you were trying to water it, Sprout said. Hoodwinks hate to be watered. You were able to quiet it, however. Malfoy did, Neville said. He knocked me down and confronted it, threatening to burn it up. Very good, Mr. Malfoy. Trying to bite the Slytherin, Sprout said. She wrapped her wand and levitated the three plants into a cabinet and closed it. I think we've done enough practical applications today. Each of you will write an essay on today's incident and the lessons learned. Leave your scrolls on the tables. She turned and left the greenhouse again. Uh, thanks, Malfoy. Hermione heard Neville say as she returned to her stool. Next time I'll let you deliver the threat, Longbottom. Malfoy drawled. Oh, I could use a good laugh. All was quiet in the small greenhouse once more, and Hermione was outlining her wingweed essay and trying not to look at Malfoy when she noticed that Astoria wasn't writing. She looked up to see the blonde woman eyeing her. What now? Hermione asked. Astoria's hat was tilted slightly. Rather heroic, you girl Draco, really, to protect his partner? Yes, he's a peach, Hermione said. So passionate under that cool exterior. Astoria murmured. From her low tone, she could be describing the characteristic of quality parchment. So demanding. You don't say, Hermione's hand never faltered as she wrote. Draco was insatiable in sixth year, Astoria gave her a thin smile. And now he is a man. Hermione ignored her, drawing up a timeline of the events after the ink touched Neville and Malfoy's wingweed. Some might consider his taste somewhat debauched. Asari went on, her voice still low, sitting closer, her tongue flicking out between white teeth. Such imagination! Such appetites! Can a pretty little bookworm ever satisfy them? Hermione carefully placed her quill beside her parchment and looked straight at Astoria. The blood pounded in her head, but her voice was cool. Yes, Greengrass, I am a proper person and a scholar and I will not apologize for it. So sad, Astoria said again, now writing. Hermione leaned closer, and she also kept her voice low this time. I'll tell you what's sad. Remember Dolores Umbridge? You're just like her, you know? That same sweet, venomous tongue. She looked into Astoria's eyes. You live in fear, don't you, little green grass? That horrible fear that someone will look past that lovely shell and see the empty, disgusting toad of a person inside. Two spots of colour appeared on Astoria's cheek, and she began breathing sharply through her nose. So I'm pretty right now, aren't you, little girl? Hermione continued relentlessly, her voice still low. It was going to fucking end this, right here, right now. But you won't always be pretty. Better find yourself a title quickly, Greengrass, before the bulging toad eyes and wide toad smile come out in your face and you're just a tall, skinny umbrage with a little diamond bow in your... As her wand was out, her face contorted with fury. Crush! Hermione's right hand touched her wand inside her skirt pocket and she murmured softly, simultaneously disarming Astoria, summoning the Slytherin's wand into her own hand and slamming Astoria against the greenhouse wall. Two glass panes cracked but held, and Astoria slid to the floor, dazed and choking, just a little bit. Malfoy stepped forward, but Hermione flung out an open hand, halting him without looking. He stalked over to the Slytherin woman. 
He blinked up at her from the stone floor. Hermione bent down slightly to make eye contact. Never pull a wand on me again, green grass, she said loudly. You will lose every time. She tossed Astoria's wand on the floor, then summoned her back and left the classroom, pushing past the startled Professor Sprout. Once outside the greenhouse, she ran blindly, pounding down a thin path and finding herself outside Hagrid's hut. Twelve magical creatures had apparently entered, and she saw only the stone hut and adjoining garden with its giant pumpkins. She paused, catching her breath, then trudged onward. A quiet hour with Hagrid and some hot tea would do her a world of good. With luck, she could stay out of the castle until dinner time. The hut was dark, however, the door shut and no sign of Hagrid or Fang. Her mind began circling the small stone building to make sure. Footsteps crunched the leaves behind her, too quick and light to be Hagrid's, and Hermione turned to see Malfoy round the corner of the hut. Hermione! He advanced toward her, grasping her upper arm and looking into her face. Are you all right? I'm not the one you should be asking, Hermione said. Oh, I don't care if she's half dead. What happened back there? She looked up at him, and he stared back, hands still on her arm, his eyes the same color as the clouds looming over the castle behind him. Hermione had always believed that nearly any difficult situation could be overcome given a moment of rational thought. But Malfoy's sudden nearness and Astoria's recent words were too powerful. Her mind couldn't focus. Consummated it repeatedly. His appetites are debauched, insatiable. No prim little bookworm can ever. Her anger blazed up again, no longer cold, now crackling and furious. How dare she? And Hermione shook off Malfoy's hand and grabbed his tie, pulling him to her and crashing her lips against his so hard their teeth cracked together. Neither backed away, though, and this time Malfoy's hand slid around her waist under her robe, pulling her body to his. She released a tie and plunged her hands into his thick, silky hair she remembered from the infirmary. It was a second-floor corridor again, but this time there was no softness, only raw need and the words, I can, I can, I can, pounded in her head. His magic surrounded her. She could feel its pulsing in time with her heart. Hermione! He moaned against her mouth, his arms like iron, holding her so tightly to him that she could hardly breathe and frankly didn't care. His lips were rough, desperate, like he had to fit a world's worth of kisses into a few short minutes. His body pushed her against a stone heart. She could feel his arousal, his other hand sliding down her hip, demanding. Demanding? Passionate? Ah, sorry, it's a voice. Our betrothal is still valid. And her coolly superior face bloomed in Hermione's mind, and she jerked away, panting. Malfoy stepped back, his arms dropping to his side. No, no, she stuttered, nearly falling over Pumpkin Vine. I'm, I meant what I said. This changes nothing. Malfoy growled in frustration. He looked beautifully rumpled, cheeks flushed, hair tousled, tie skewed. Hermione swallowed. Do I have Astoria to thank for this, then? He asked, striving for his usual drawl. Whatever she said, it must have been a treat. You don't need to know, Hermione snapped. Just leave. She wouldn't do this. She just wouldn't. All right, then, he said coldly, eyes narrowed. You've made yourself very clear. Go lead Theo on a merry chase while you sort out what you really want. He brushed past without looking at her and disappeared around the corner again. Hermione stayed behind in Hagrid's garden, her shoes sinking into the soft earth, tears running down her cheeks until she could no longer hear the crunching and shuffling of leaves under his feet as he walked away. Annoying, but occasionally useful. Hermione stood along the corridor to the patient's dungeon on Wednesday night, dressed in jeans and a red jumper, her hair bristling with aggravation. She had spent hours preparing for that night's pawn session on charms. The dust up with Astoria, and the second encounter with Malfoy had rattled Hermione, driving her back to her studies and pawn with an intensity that startled her friends. She still carved out time for Ron, however, aware that only a few days remained with him. Ron was developing a line of mischievous quills that wrote improper phrases into students' notes or randomly broke out into song, and Hermione was helping him perfect the charms. One must be supportive, after all. Hermione had also been anxiously awaiting McGonagall's response to her attack on Astoria. She fully expected Astoria to report her and was prepared to accept any consequences. 
She even drew up a list of appropriate punishments, such as marking papers for professors or writing essays on violence as a social problem. But it was all for naught. Instead of informing a teacher, Astoria went around telling people that Hermione had lost control of her wand, which absolutely nobody believed. So now the story sweeping the castle was that Astoria and Hermione had been dueling for Theo's affections. Which made even less sense than the truth, in Hermione's opinion, and the truth was ridiculous enough. Theo found this rumor quite amusing and began referring to himself as the spoils of war. It was all terribly embarrassing. Obviously, there was a middle ground between bookishly prim and batshit crazy that other witches seemed to navigate with ease, but Hermione had never been good at finding a happy medium. So she'd been counting on her Wednesday porn sessions to present a calm academic persona to balance out her recent, uh, spirited behavior. But then that son of a banshee, Ernie Macmillan, called an emergency prefect meeting Wednesday night to discuss his accursed Halloween festival, stealing away half of Hermione's group and forcing her to cancel porn. Worse, Starkon had learned of the cancellation and asked Hermione to oversee a special detention in the potions dungeon so he could go schmooze at some ministry event. Hermione was livid. She'd spent over an hour creating 57 little origami shapes each one representing a different charms, and all for nothing. And now she had to waste time disciplining rule-breakers. Honestly, why couldn't people just behave themselves? If those were the squeaky mice down there in the patient's dungeon, fresh from their latest prank, they were going to regret the day they received their Hogwarts letters. Therefore, it had been entirely too easy on them. They'd find a less accommodating. Let's see how they like writing six-foot essays on... Dungeon door was ajar, which meant the students were already inside, probably trashing the place and plundering Slughorn's stores again. Marnie charged forward and slammed open the heavy door with enough force to rattle nearby tables and stools. She halted in the middle of the room, mouth open, for instead of a pack of schemy little badgers, the dungeon held only two students. Both tall and hulking, with comically small hats on their muscled shoulders. There were the former Slytherin beaters who had injured Malfoy, still serving their twice-weekly detentions until Christmas. The two huge boys leapt to their feet at Hermione's entrance, eyeing her warily. Nobody knew who had choked them on the pitch, except Neville, Ginny and Malfoy, but Hermione's name had been whispered. She stepped forward and the boys cringed slightly, backing away. Hermione rolled her eyes. Obviously, she wasn't going to hex them now. With an effort, she recalled their names. Mr. Bloom, Mr. Pratt, sit down, please. The two instantly obeyed. Hermione set her back on Slughorn's desk and eyed them thoughtfully. Despite Malfoy's protest that night in the infirmary, Hermione had gone to McGonagall the following week anyway, demanding to hear the school's response to Malfoy's injury and a death threat. The headmistress's answer had been less than reassuring. Bloom and Pratt had simply sought payback for years of Malfoy's bullying in Slytherin House, and the death threats had been a crude effort to scare Malfoy off the team. Hermione had sniffed skeptically and hounded McGonagall with questions until the headmistress tossed her out of her office, along with a veiled warning about using her wand responsibly. Now the beaters were shifting nervously on their stools under her stare, and the blonde one, Bloom, raised his hand. She nodded. <laughs> Miss Granger, he said. Uh, would you like us to start scrubbing now? Scrubbing? Scrubbing what? she asked. We've been scrubbing the giant cauldrons, Bloom said. He swallowed. W without magic. Hermione looked toward the back of the dungeons, where three monstrous cauldrons squatted. Ancient and hulking, the iron cauldrons were covered in infinite layers of grime and scorched potions, constantly emitting vile fumes. Nobody ever used them. Not even a stronger scorchify could clean them, and the most back-breaking scrubbing would make little difference. She bit her lips, considering. While the thought of these two spending the evening in a hopeless toil warmed her heart, there were other, more productive options. Marnie stepped up to their table, and the two boys shrank back, 
looking down at her uneasily. Perhaps, she said coolly, you too would prefer to do something else. Blooms and Pratt's eyes widened hopefully. Really, Miss, Miss Granger? Bloom asked. That'd be fucking... He cleared his throat. Uh, that would be great. Pratt nodded eagerly. Money squinted up at them. You could write sentences. Fuck yeah, Pratt said. Bloom gave him a furious look and Pratt flushed. Sorry, Miss Granger. Amani pulled out her wand. The beaters flinched and a sentence appeared on the board. I will not lose control of my broom and slam into annoying but occasionally useful seekers at high speed. Bloom raised his hand. Uh, Miss Granger? He flinched again as she looked at him. We didn't lose control of our brooms. That's right, Pratt said. Oh, we didn't. Hermione blinked slowly at them, a trick she'd picked up from Astoria of all people. Quite effective, really. Well, it's very important that the sentence be accurate, wouldn't you agree? Pratt and Bloom both nodded, happy to help. She waved her wand again. I will not slam into annoying but occasionally useful seekers at high speed for no good reason. We had a good reason, Pratt protested. Rupert! Bloom hissed. Did someone make you do it? Hermione asked. Pratt shook his head, his face grim. No, but that Ponzi get bullied us for years, Miss Granger. Every day he'd call me a Pratt. Isn't that your name? Hermione asked. Pratt glowered. It's the way he said it. Bum and Pratt, he called us. Bloom nodded in agreement. Hermione's mouth fell open. Well, then help her. She almost believed him. That sounded just like Malfoy. She waved her wand again. I will not purposely sum into annoying but occasional useful seekers at high speed in response to years of bullying without proper warning. We did warn him, Red cried. Rupert, Bloom hissed. Do I listen to him, Miss Granger? It's very simple, Mr. Bloom, Hermione said sternly. You can either write me accurate sentences or... Her eyes drifted back to the three giant filthy cauldrons. The boys shuddered. Bloom sighed. We may have sent the gifts some letters. We hoped he'd just quit. Hermione waved her wand again. I will not purposely slam into annoying but occasionally useful seekers at high speed in response to years of bullying after sending pitiful letters that would scare nobody. Oi! Pratt cried. We can't write that, Miss Granger, said Bloom, stung. Apparently the former beater took Pride in his death threat. We wrote Malfoy that if he tried to play in the Slytherin Gryffindor match, they'd be scraping his ass off the pitch. Charming, Hermione said faintly. Pratt beamed. Tell her the other one. I don't think it's appropriate, Rube. Bloom whispered loudly. I think we have beyond that, Hermione said. We, we wrote that if he tried to play, we'd use his bonnets for blotches. Lovely, Hermione said. He waved her wand one more time. I will not purposely summon to annoying but occasionally useful seekers at high speed in response to years of bullying after sending several stylish and imaginative death threats. Bloom and Pratt both nodded, pleased. Very well, Hermione left her table and sat behind Sakon's desk. Write a sentence twenty times, neatly and with proper punctuation, and I will excuse you from the cauldrons this time. Go on now. She pulled out her study schedule and began plotting ways to add an extra pawn session to her calendar. The former beaters obeyed and the dungeon was quiet except for Pratt's muttered swearing whenever he splattered ink blots on his parchment, which was often. Hermione twirled a curl with a finger thinking. It looked like Malfoy's injuries were the result of rampant stupidity from all parties involved. Honestly, Quidditch should be banned at Hogwarts. Hermione was trying to think of legal precedence for such a ban when a squabble, delivered in what the boys fondly thought were whispers, caught her attention. I, Alf. Piss off, Rupert. She's fit. Shut up, you fucking moron. And you think she's fit? Yeah, but she's dead scary too, so shut up. I hear she likes Slytherins. You have a fucking death wish. We're not scared of not. I'm talking about her, you fucktwit. Do you think she likes younger? All right, boys. Hermione said loudly as she stood. That's enough for tonight. Bring me your sentences. She was not sitting here listening to this. 
Pratt and Bloom looked surprised but handed over their parchments, thanking her again and practically running out the door. Hermione was tucking their sentences into her bag. Bloom had managed five full lines and Pratt had written two when she heard a thud that sounded suspiciously like Bloom stemming Pratt into the corridor wall. Hermione could only approve. Ron left Hogwarts Friday evening. His plan was to slip out of the castle after curfew and meet McGonagall at the entrance. From there, he'd take a fast-trail carriage to Hogsmeade and flew to Joke Shop in Diagon Alley, sharing the flat above the shop with George. McGonagall had objected to this cloak-and-dagger way of departing, fearing that it would seem like a disgraced exit and hurt Ron's reputation. But Ron hadn't told his family yet and feared any public exit would be reported in The Daily Prophet, which obviously still had spies in the castle. Hermione privately agreed with McGonagall, but told the headmistress in her office that Ron should be allowed to handle this in his own way. Ron had looked at her in gratitude and squeezed her hand, and McGonagall had reluctantly approved. You have performed invaluable services to this castle, and I won't allow anything to overshadow that, Mr. Weasley, she said. Hermione helped him pack, which meant sitting on his bed and trying not to sniffle as Ron gleefully turned his school uniforms and robes into marshmallows, squashing them flat under his shoe and then incendiaring them. He kept his prefect badge, however, and other mementos, even a Potter Stings badge. Then they sat together and looked at pictures. One from first year, when they were so little, made Hermione sob outright, as did the picture of Ron and her dancing at Bill's and Fleur's wedding before the Death Eaters arrived. Suddenly, she couldn't stop crying, and Ron held her like he did at Dumbledore's funeral. I don't want you to go, she sobbed. I feel like I just got you back. Oh, I have to, Moy, he said. Money buried her face in the Quidditch jersey he'd given her. She just felt so alone with Ron leaving. She had Jenny, of course, and Neville, and Theo was a quite regular presence, and Malfoy. Well, she tried not to think of Malfoy. She hadn't told anyone, not even Ginny, the details of her confrontation with Astoria or recent encounters with Malfoy. Hermione knew she'd been cold and hurtful to him. She had implied to Astoria that marrying him would be a degradation. She should apologize, but wouldn't that only make everything worse? Harry was due to visit Hogwarts the next day, and Hermione had asked Malfoy during potions to meet them at the lab at noon. Malfoy just nodded shortly and turned away. Hermione didn't know how she'd handled potions with only him and Lavender. Lavender had suddenly turned smug and sneering this week, reminding Hermione of sixth year when Lavender was dating Ron. Ron was sitting cross-legged on the floor, sorting through books. Nearly all of them would be donated to the small Gryffindor library in the common room. Ron, she said suddenly, have you noticed anything odd about Lavender lately? He blinked up at her. Yeah, she's been acting a little strange. I wonder what she's doing. I wonder who she's doing, Ron said darkly. What do you mean? He shrugged and tossed another book into the common room pile. Let's laugh. It's all about blokes to her. She's shagging somebody and it's got her feeling on top. He gave a roguish look at the innuendo and Hermione couldn't help smiling. Did he really have to leave now? Hey, look! Ron held up a lumpy blue hat. One of our first knitted hats for Spoo. Social promotion for elfish welfare, she said, still smiling. Oh, I'm keeping this, Ron declared, putting it on top of his jumpers. In the end, the trunk was only half full when they finished, and Ron dragged it out of the room. He was wearing jeans and a Weasley sweater, and already looked more relaxed. This was the right choice. He had already said goodbye to Ginny, so Hermione walked him to the entrance, using the marauder's map to avoid anyone and make on a girl at them outside. Now it was clear and bright, and the Thestral was practically invisible. Ron shook McGonagall's hand. Best of luck in all your endeavors, Mr. Weasley, and don't let me see any of your products in my school, she said. Ron gave a very Fred and George smile. He turned to hug Hermione. Oh, see you Sunday, he said, kissing her lightly on the mouth. Be careful. That message on the walls. It's a real threat. And all you've got is that Malfoy. And Harry, she said. He's coming tomorrow to look at our patient. Oh, I'll leave some good stuff from the shop. He whispered in her ear. It'll cheer you up. Run, she protested. He winked at her and climbed into the carriage and flew away. Money burst into tears again. 
They treated each other abominably for much of the term, and now he was gone. Now, now, Miss Granger, McGonagher said. That young man knows how you feel. You must forge your own path. I wish I could have loved him. Hermione whispered, too low for the headmistress to hear, also she thought. We can't fight our hearts, the headmistress said, and Hermione stared to hear her talk this way. McGonagall's had created a tall, pointed silhouette against the flicking lights of the castle. Not even you, Miss Granger. Hermione was up early Saturday morning, after a restless night of sleep. Most Gryffindors thought one was just gone for the weekend, all except Hermione, Ginny and Neville. Hermione spent a solid hour with her loop notebook, listing thirty-eight ways she would stay in touch with Ron. She transfigured a picture frame for the photo of herself, Harry and Ron in first year, and put it on her desk beside her otter paperweight and Theo's wood box containing the backshot letter. Then she put on her own wheezy sweater and Ron's book pen and walked down to the potions lab. That was tied back with a broad red ribbon. She hadn't worn Malfoy's diamonds since Sarkon's party. Her eyes were still puffy from tears, but she didn't feel any need for glamorous. At least a potion looked good. The merlet mixture had simmered down to a dull brown powder. She was carefully scooping the powder into a large bottle when Malfoy appeared in the open doorway, wearing his Quidditch jersey again. He didn't look so well himself, she noticed. Maybe being engaged to a rabid sex fiend was catching up with him, she thought weppishly. His eyes were heavy with dark circles and his face was alarmingly pale. He looked a bit like he had in sixth year. What happened? He asked, reminding her of Monday's encounter by Hagrid's hut and sending a shiver down her back. Nothing, she said. He couldn't betray Ron's confidence. Why? He said indifferently and moved to the other side of the narrow table. His eyes looked dull, almost empty. Harry's coming today to see our patients, she said, stuffing the bottle. Why? Harry wants to help us, she said. Don't worry, Kingsley doesn't know. If we get a lead from this potion, we might need Harry to chase it down. We need him. Malfoy, I can't do this alone. I need you both. She looked at him pleadingly. Something moved behind Malfoy's eyes and he nodded. The room suddenly felt too small again. Hermione cleared her throat. Quidditch practice today? She asked just for something to say. Yes, he said, putting on gloves to handle the nightshade. And please, I don't need to hear all the ways I could die horribly. Hermione shrugged. It's likely you'll survive, since Pratt and Bloom apparently acted alone. Malfoy put down the nightshade leaves. How do you know that? I have it in writing. She pulled Bloom's scroll out of her bag. They had a detention with me on Wednesday. Malfoy stripped off a glove to take the stroll. I will not purposely slamming to annoying but occasionally useful... He read the rest of the sentence and looked up, scowling. You made them write this? We worked on it together, she said, shaking a vial of Thestral blood. I told them the sentence had to be accurate. This is anything but accurate, Malfoy huffed. It's accurate enough, Hermione said. That was terrible, what happened to them. Uh, yes, it was. My knee still to them? Malfoy's voice hit a surprisingly high register on the last word. Bullying them like that. No wonder they threatened your bollocks. They told. And bullying only perpetuates a cycle of violence, as you have now discovered. She finished. Oh, I'm not talking about this, Malfoy said, shoving the scroll back at her. Save your lectures for the weasel. Hermione turned her back on him, clenching her hand, while Malfoy finished chopping the nightshade and added the leaves. She took a few deep breaths, then opened a vial of thestral blood. I'll let the blood while you stir, Hermione said. At least that both her voice and her hands were steady. Malfoy nodded, careful to finish the proper one and a half counterclockwise stir after each tablespoon. As with the fiducia, the potion's intricate steps soothed both their nerves. They took turns repeating the spell after each spoonful of blood, but it was tiring work, and they were both relieved when the potions emitted the proper yellow steam. Hermione could catch a faint whiff of that rotting meat smell. Quick, this a clover juice. Hermione said, and Malfoy emptied the bottle into the cauldron and stirred. The smell vanished, and they smiled triumphantly at each other, everything else forgotten for an instant, then looked away. Well, that was amazing, said a deep voice. Harry was standing in the doorway, leaning, actually, like he'd been there a while. 
the way you two work together. It's spooky. Harry! Hermione slid over to him for a quick hug. Have you seen him? She whispered in his ear. He shook his head. Tomorrow? Murphy cleared his throat and Hermione and Harry broke apart. Tell me about the potion, Harry said. He wore jeans and a black hooded sweatshirt with the white letters reading, Go ahead, run for it. It's about ten days from completion, if what we did today works out, Hermione said, as Malfoy divided a cup of the potion into two tiny cauldrons and set them simmering. We have a few more ingredients to add. Each of these, she held up two small bottles, contains a bit of those bloody letters on the walls. We can add them now. Harry and Malfoy watched as she shook some dried scraping into each cauldron. The potion inside both bubbled and turned identically grey. Is that good? Harry asked. Very good, Malfoy said. The blood from the walls combined with the Thestral blood absorbs any other animal blood, leaving just magical blood behind, Hermione said. And that's why the liquid went from black to grey. That means magical blood was used to write the letters. This also shows that both messages were created using the same blood. When the potion is finished, we'll spoon a little into a vial, Malfoy said. Then we can add somebody's blood. The new blood doesn't match the magical blood and the potion, nothing will happen. Not if they do match. It will turn purple, Hermione said. So, if we have a suspect, we can test their blood against this potion to see if it matches the bloody messages? Perfect, Hermione! Harry cried. He tried to pace, but the room was too small, so he contented himself with shifting his feet. This has amazing implications for the war department. So many threatening messages are written in blood. And while muggle scientists have fast and equally valid ways to identify blood, the Ministry would never accept them, Hermione said. What we're brewing here is the magical equivalent. Are we finished here? Malfoy asked. Yes, of course, Hermione said. She cast a protective spell on the cauldrons, and she and Malfoy began their now well-practiced regimen of cleaning spells. When they finished, Malfoy pocketed his wands. Granger, Potter, he said and left. Harry stared after them. He was almost human. Hermione sighed. Yes, he quite often is. You work that way together all the time, like you can read each other's mind. Hermione shrugged and led the way out of the dungeon. We've been patience partners for a while now. We have a rhythm. I'll say. Oh, I can't believe I'm asking this, but you two are really not. No, Hermione said shortly. Actually, I have a date with Theo tonight. Good, Harry said. Hermione raised her eyebrows. Oh, I don't have anything against not. Horrible family in Slytherin, of course. But you can handle yourself. Hermione rolled her eyes. What a relief it is you think so, Harry. I was ready to cancel if you objected. He ignored it. You and Ron are coming to lunch tomorrow, right? He asked. She nodded again. Harry glanced at his watch. A birthday present from Hermione had inlaid various charms on an ordinary muggle Rolex. Oh, I have to meet Ginny by the lake. Skeeter's been sniffing around the Aura's office, and I don't want her to hear about Chloe from the Daily Prophet. All right, Hermione said. That's an incredible potion you created, he said, shaking his head. I still can't believe it. It might not help much, she warned. We can't exactly draw blood from the entire student body to test, but we know already that messages weren't created with simple deer blood, and that's something. They had climbed the stairs from the dungeons and stood in the entrance of the castle. Harry was beginning to attract looks from passing students. What do you think those messages might be curses? He asked her, keeping his voice low. She shrugged. Maybe. Our data fairy doesn't think so, however. Either way, whatever blood was used was from a powerful wizard or witch. Harry frowned. I've been reading into blood magic, she went on. It stands to reason. The more powerful the blood, the more powerful the magic. I'd like to think there aren't any powerful dark wizards or witches at Hogwarts, but I'm sure that's not true, Harry said grimly. You could be in real danger, like all the Muggleborns. Be careful. Hermione smiled. I'm always careful, she said and turned back toward Gryffindor Tower. Chapter 25 Dinner with Theo Chapter Notes This chapter is a big turning point, since many of the actions taken have major repercussions much like the Gryffindor party and that scene in McGonagall's office. This chapter was already planned when I first began the story and has changed very little since. Hermione had hoped Ginny would be around to help her dress for dinner with Theo, 
but Ginny never returned to their room after meeting Harry by the lake. Lavender was a poor substitute, lying on her bed in knickers and a chemise and sneering at Hermione's every move. You really should be studying, Lavender, Hermione said as she pulled dresses out of her wardrobe. She was sick of the staring, and at the rate you're going, you'll earn no nudes at all. I have better things to do with my time, Lavender said, languidly stretching. Why not our frigid swats? Hermione's fingers tightened on the hanger, but she said nothing. Just held up the blue velvet dress she'd worn to Sarkon's dinner. Theo hadn't seen her in it yet. Lavender watched as Hermione shed her fluffy pink robe. See something you like? Hermione asked, raising her eyebrows. Don't you have some poor bloke to follow around? There must be someone at Hogwarts who likes the desperate clingy type. You'd be surprised, Lavender said wickedly, running a finger from stomach to throat. Hermione refused to ask. It was probably Cormac or some other rubbish heap of a person. She dressed quickly and fastened her parents' sapphire pond on. She even put on makeup, a little more than usual. She was stalling. She didn't fancy resting with her hand in front of Lavender. In the end, she had no choice. It was either do her now or be late to dinner. And her hair, of course, sensed this on some level. She long suspected her mane was semi-sentient, and was at its most perverse, frizzing with abandon despite how much sleek easy potion she heaped on. Hermione struggled to twist or braid the curls, even with the help of her wand, and the more she worked, the bigger her hair grew. Lavender's night remark certainly didn't help, and the wretched girl was now sitting straight on her bed, eyes sparkling, giggling uncontrollably. Flushed and desperate, Hermione did the one thing she'd vowed she wouldn't do. She went to her trunk and pulled out a flat velvet box from Malfoy. Lavender stopped laughing and her eyebrows climbed into her dark blonde hair at the sight of the clip in hairpins. That's a gift? Lavender asked. Yes, Hermione said. She dragged a diamond clip through her frizzy curls like it was a comb and blinked in amazement as the clip left soft waves in its wake. She twisted up thick waves and fastened them easily with the clip, then inserted the hairpins. Malfoy's cliffs and pins stood out clearly this time against her smooth dark locks, but that couldn't be helped. Lavender watched sullenly as Hermione teased out a few curls with her wand. Have a good evening, Lavender, she said with a thin smile. You do, I assume, have plans with your mystery men. I'll have to creep around in a corner somewhere. Lavender's dark expression vanished. Yeah, not the only one who came back a Slytherin, she purred. Hermione tried not to react as she tugged candlesticks and three books out of her small beaded bag. Was Lavender sneaking around with a seventh year then? Because there weren't any Slytherin men in eighth year except Blaise, Theo, Goyle, and... Malfoy! Hunched over her bag, a candlestick in hand, Money looked sharply at Lavender, who was flushing now with triumph, her eyes sparkling. Yes, you know who I'm talking about, her roommate said. She licked her lips. So hot, likes it raw. Isn't he betrothed? Hermione asked, trying to keep her voice light. Lavender looked even more smug. To the ice queen, so what? She shrugged. I know what he wants. I don't think he'd like you spreading this around, Hermione said, straightening. She looked fixedly at the woman on the bed. But that's what you do best, isn't it, Laugh? Spread it around. I spread it for him, that's for sure, Lavender said. You haven't left until you've had that blonde hat between your... All the window glass panes behind Hermione suddenly shattered, letting in a harsh freezing wind from the mountains. Lavender yelped and scrambled behind the bed. Hermione could see herself in a full-length mirror, her face flushed, eyes cold, glass shots on her hair and skin, raising the candlestick like a wand. The cars around her face whipped in the wind, but the rest of her hair didn't budge. She dropped the candlestick and picked up her wand, repairing the glass in an instant, all the shots and bits reassembling themselves. The howling of wind stopped and the room was silent. Nevin! Lavender popped up from behind the bed. You're mental! You, you could have killed us! Her voice quivered with fear. Hermione summoned her beaded bag and red cloak and walked calmly toward the door. She turned to look at Lavender, who was still shaking. I wish you joy of him, she said coldly. Lavender's eyes filled with tears and she looked down at her bed covers. Hermione swept out the door without another word.
She didn't remember walking down the stairs and through the common room. She didn't remember walking through the portrait hall. It seemed like she was just suddenly in the corridor beside the fat lady's portrait and before a smiling Theo. Apparently, psychotic behavior agreed with her because he seemed struck by her appearance, his eyes widening. You, Hermione Granger, a rare beauty, he said. I'm a lucky man tonight. Hermione blinked at him, trying to focus, but the blood still pounded in her veins and she could feel her magic crawling up her fingertips. She managed a weak smile, however, and clutched her cloak and bag. Theo frowned. Oh, you are right. You look upset. Fight with my roommate, she said. It's nothing. It doesn't look like nothing. He took her hand and led her away from the portrait. Still all right for dinner? She nodded. Oh, I just need to cool down. Well, that's easy in this drafty castle. Theo took her along the corridor, eyeing the tapestries until he saw one that fluttered. Here we are. He pulled aside the tapestries, revealing a small balcony hemmed in by stone. The money entered and looked up to see a white square of grey clouds. All this time I didn't know it was here, she breathed, distracted slightly. The cool outside air felt good on her cheeks and neck. She turned to smile at Theo, standing broad and solid with a tapestry dropping behind him. He looked quite dashing. And Slytherin, in a black suit with a green shirt and tie, a rich black cloak slung over one arm. You always know what to do, she told him. How is that? Well, I almost never know what to do, Theo said. I just know how to appear that I do. Yes, you're very good at it, she teased. For example, he continued in a low, rumbling tone. I know what I want to do right now, but I'm not sure it's what I should do, because you seem upset, and I'm still not entirely sure you see me that way. He took a step towards her, his hand grazing her bare arm. Can you advise me, O oh brightest witch of her age? I love to give advice, she said. Her blood still thrummed slightly, with Lavender's words ringing in her ears, and Theo's green eyes looking nothing like Harry's. Thank Merlin. And what would your advice be? He asked, bending closer. Kiss me, she whispered. Their lips met, and it was sweet and arousing. Theo deepened to kiss his arms around her, his hand stroking the velvet of her dress, and then the bare skin of her upper back. As Cologne, a dark, musky scent surrounded her. She was flush against his body now, and her back and their cloaks fell to the stone floor of the balcony, forgotten. He had expected Theo to stop there, but he was Slytherin after all, always more ready to ask forgiveness than permission, so she shouldn't have been surprised to find herself gently pressed against the stone wall. One large hand moved to her thigh and stood upwards, while the other tucked down a dress strap as Theo's lips traced lightly to the soft curve between neck and shoulder. She needed to stop this, but every time she thought of pulling away, Lavender's sneering, I know what he wants, echoed in her head, and Hermione found her hands inside Theo's suit coat, running under her silk shirt. When her fingers met a warm, softly hairy skin, her mind cleared. She didn't want a quick shag in an alcove. She could ruin this if she wasn't careful. Theo's fingers were nearly up to her. She stepped away, panting. Theo let his hands drop, and they stared at each other, both a little stunned. Well, Theo said with a slightly trembling smile, I'm going to pay your roommate to fight with you before every date from now on. They both laughed, perhaps a little more than the weak joke deserved, trying to manage the sudden awkwardness. I'm not... I... I don't usually... Hermione stuttered. Oh, I'm not complaining, Theo said, tucking his shirt in and straightening his coat and tie. He cleared his throat. But perhaps we should go to dinner now. Yes, she said, still catching her breath slightly. She pulled up her straps and tucked down her dress. She put a hand to her curls, but Theo hadn't touched her hair. So hopefully she didn't look like a total disheveled slag. She transfigured a bit of stone wall into a mirror, to find her makeup still intact as well, requiring only a fresh swipe of lipstick. Theo now looked as impeccable as before, and Hermione couldn't help eyeing him as he handed over her bag and cloak. He was obviously quite adept at such discreet encounters. Theo took the odd beginning to their date all in stride, 
keeping up a steady patter of light conversation on the walk to Hogsmeade. The money concentrated on not acting like a mental case. By the time they reached the Spangled Veil, vale, she was a bit more relaxed. The Spangled Veil vale was a new addition to Hogsmeade, a high-end restaurant replacing a woodcutter's shed destroyed during the war. Much of Hogsmeade had been rebuilt, often to serve a more well-heeled clientele, and Hermione had heard some complaints from the locals about the new rich blood. She made a mental note to ask Madame Rosmerta and a few others about that. It wouldn't do for locals to be priced out of their own village. But tonight, she enjoyed the opulent surroundings, brocade-covered walls, waterfall chandeliers, lovely views of Scottish mountains. A ripple ran through the tables as Dinah's turned to see Hermione Granger enter on the arm of a man who obviously wasn't Ron Weasley. Theo was a striking figure in his own right, although not generally known, and Hermione noted which his speculative glances as they passed. The atmosphere was almost oppressively posh, and the thought of encountering Malfoy here with Astoria made Hermione stumble slightly. But no, Malfoy couldn't be taking his pure-blood princess out to dinner tonight if he was shagging his brainless strumpet in some empty classroom. She stumbled again. Good show there, Hermione. Theo looked at her quizzically, but she made it to their table all right. Good thing she'd never claimed to be graceful. She was happy to sit back and think about unruffled ponds in Norway as Theo selected a bottle of wine and bent it back and forth with the waiter. Once settled with their orders and their wine, Hermione asked Theo what brought him back to Hogwarts. He eyed her with his glass of Domaine Rappel à la vie. Oh, I was quite conflicted, he finally said. Oh, I didn't plan to return. What well, changed your mind? Theo shrugged. Oh, I was in Germany with my grandmother. She has this beautiful Bavarian castle. You'd like it. And I suddenly realized that I would always be an outsider in that country. Britain was my home, and any meaningful future was here. And to make a future here, I need to do well on my nudes. He winked at her. So I poured key directly to Diagon Alley. Didn't even stop at not a state. I bought everything new. Trunk, clothes, books, and paid a loco to take me to Hogwarts in a wagon. That was the day of the Gryffindor party, Hermione said. He nodded. Oh, I just left my things in the entrance hall and went to McGonagall's office. She didn't seem surprised to see me. Probably has her own way of knowing things. She sent me to the Slytherin dungeons to bunk with Blaze and Grey. Good thing those two had an extra bat, or they would have put me with Draco. Why is that? Draco has his own dom. No one would room with him. Hmm, Hermione said, sipping her wine. Yes, Malfoy doesn't need to sneak around in empty classrooms after all. Something wrong? Theo asked. He touched her hand on the table. I know, she said. Of course nobody wants to live with Malfoy. Yes, he'll have a hard time changing minds, Theo said rather indifferently. People won't forget. Hermione nodded, looking down at his fingers lightly holding hers on the white tablecloth. A silver signet ring and emerald cufflink glinted in the light of the candles. Her hand and arm were bare, the word mudblood, written clearly in red on her inner forearm. Nobody should forget what happened, Hermione, Theo said softly, turning her hand slightly to see the scars better. Hermione gently pulled her hand away and placed it in her lap. This is a lovely restaurant, she said. Thank you for bringing me here. Theo gave her a boyish grin. My pleasure. You found it. Sang a dragon lady for my honor. Hermione couldn't have smiling back. Whatever Astoria said to you, I'm sure she deserved what she got. He went on. She sniffed. I didn't hex her because of what she said. She tried to crucio me. She what? Hermione took a ragged breath. She hadn't told anyone that. Please don't tell people. She bit her lip. Don't tell Malfoy. Damn it! His voice rose and other diners were glancing their way. This is all wrong. We Slytherins need to re-enter the entire wizarding world, not just pure society, and Astoria attacks a war heroine? Theo shook his head in disgust. Then a thought occurred to him, and his eyes widened. Crucio? That's an unforgivable. She could be arrested for even. Hush now, Hermione said. I'm fine, I can handle green grass. She gave him a hard look. I'm telling you this in confidence. Why can't Draco know? He just can't. Can we please not talk about him? Hermione shifted uncomfortably. Most certainly. He leaned back in his chair, still frowning a little. What a strange evening this was turning out to be. What future dates include such wild mood swings? Tell me about your grandmother, 
Hermione said, buttering a small chunk of bread. Lady Gretchen. Theo brightened and launched into a vivid description. His maternal grandmother was more than a hundred years old, a great society beauty in her day, and ruled her castle like a queen. She'd sent five specially trained better wizards to fetch Theo when his father openly joined the Death Eaters, determined that her grandson wouldn't take the mark. The wizards had literally kidnapped Theo in the dead of night, right out of not a state, and dragged him kicking to Germany. Oh, I mean, I was grateful Joan to get me wrong, Theo sighed, but it would have been nice to have a choice. She did the right thing, Hermione said. I sent my parents to Australia. They didn't have a choice either. She touched a sapphire at her throat. That's a lovely necklace. I was admiring it earlier. Theo leaned forward, his eyes taking on a heated look from under heavy dark lashes. That's a gift from my parents. Of course, your birthstone. Mine is Ruby. He said back again as the waiter presented their steak. Ruby, that's not very Slytherin, she teased. So you know birthstones as well as flowers, then? She asked, thinking back to the Dada lesson. Only Neville had beaten Theo at reciting that day. I know all the birthstones and meanings of flowers and gifts and proper ribbons for messages. He grimaced. My governess. He eyed her hair as she turned away to retrieve a dropped napkin. That's a lovely hair set. Another birthday gift? Yes, she said simply. Damn that lavender. A rather significant gift, Theo said, his face taking on a cool, appraising look. No trace of a smile. No, it's really not, she said, cutting her steak with unnecessary vigor. She was never wearing the diamond set again. She didn't care how good it made her hair look. They spoke of light topics again after that, giggling over Bluebell's antics and Dana. Dessert was served while Theo was away from the table, which was fine with Hermione. She appreciated the breathing spell, a chance to nibble her cheesecake without having to school her expressions. Alas, it couldn't last. Hermione, called a voice, a deeper version of Ron's. She looked up to see Bill and Fleur hand in hand. Fleur glowed in blue silk, drawing every eye in the room. Hermione rose immediately to hug them both. It looks so beautiful, my dear, Fleur cried. Such a lovely dress and your air, she gasped. Those diamonds! Her blue eyes widened. They are goblin make. Well, what? Hermione stuttered, reaching up to touch the pin nervously. What had possessed her to wear Malfoy's present tonight? She should have wrapped a scarf around her head. Definitely historic, reset in the last century, Bill added, regarding her hair with a professional eye. A treasure hunter for Gringotts runs brother new jewellery. Hermione, Fleur breathed. Who are you with? Bill asked suddenly, the werewolf scars harsh on his face. Uh, hello, I'm Theodore Knott, said a voice from behind Hermione. Bill and Fleur looked startled by the last name, but they rallied instantly. Good to meet you, Bill said, smiling, shaking Theo's hand. Bill Weasley, and this is my wife, Fleur. Hermione could only be grateful that they introduced themselves, since she was suddenly incapable of speech. The mind whirled. Malfoy had given her historic, goblin-made jewellery. No wonder Theo was suspicious. And now, looking at Bill and Fleur's smiling faces, she almost groaned. They obviously believed the diamonds were from Theo, and she couldn't very well correct them. Anything was better than the truth. Would you like to join us? Theo asked, urbane as always. Oh no, thank you. You're nearly fini, I see, Fleur said. We have just arrived. Good to meet you, though, Fleur said. He kissed Hermione's cheek in an oddly careful way, and Fleur kissed both her cheeks before leaving with a final brilliant smile. Bill, he is the eldest Weasley boy, yes? Theo asked as they sat down. Yes, he and Fleur were married last year. Hermione was taken suddenly back to the wedding again, but now her words with Malfoy was overlaid over the memory. Blinking, she realized that Theo was holding her left hand again. You're back, he said quietly. I'm sorry. Hermione bit her lip, feeling guilty. Don't be sorry. Ever. Theo said, his jaw tight. I heard what happened when the ministry fell. The rest of us should be sorry. Getting to know you makes me think. He trailed off. Think what? Hermione asked, ever curious. Maybe I should have stayed and fought my father. Would you have stayed? She asked. Honestly. His eyes were a bit sad. No, I wouldn't have. I'm a Slytherin. Self-preservation. People change, 
Hermione said. If there's one thing I've learned so far this school term, it's that people change. He gave her a weak smile. Oh, I'm very glad I came back to Hogwarts. He squeezed Hermione's hand and leaned over the table and gave her a light kiss on her lips. I meant what I said at lunch last week. Theo continued, pouring them more wine. He sat back in his chair, glass in hand. About setting my own future. Thanks to my father and uncles, the not name is synonymous with Death Eater. But that will change. Up ipso ferro. He said, and his signet ring glowered for an instant. Up ipso ferro, Hermione repeated. From the same iron, Theo said. A bit of luck there. When trying to redeem one's name, it helps when the family motto makes no sense at all. Theo winked at her, and Hermione couldn't help but smile back. It certainly beat. Purity will always conquer. They were a little quiet, walking back hand in hand, and Hermione felt like sighing. No matter how much they tried to make this a fun date, darker things kept creeping in. Oh, I'd like to try it again, Theo said finally. Another dinner. This was lovely, she said. Just a little intense. Theo turned to face her, standing in a dark path with nobody around and a huge moon above. Oh, I refuse to give up, he said. There are two incredibly frivolous people inside us just crying to get out. She laughed and he put a cool hand to her cheek, bending to kiss her again. He responded, their kisses full of wine and softness. He pulled her closer and his lips brushed her eyelids, then her ear. Hermione, he whispered, as moving higher into her hair, his hand at her waist, drawing closer. Mm, Hermione, come with me. Ah! He hissed and pulled away. Theo! Hermione's eyes popped open. Theo's other hand was pressed against his forehead. He removed his fingers, revealing a thin streak of blood, black in the bright moonlight. Hermione drew her wand and healed it went instantly. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. Although she now had a strong suspicion. She had definitely felt a hairpin move that time. Malfoy. Theo frowned and wiped his forehead with a handkerchief. Nothing to apologize for, he said, tucking the square of cloth into his pocket. He moved closer again. Such a dangerous girl, he purred. I'll just be more careful. Hermione stepped back. We don't need to rush anything, she said. I was a little heated earlier. Theo nodded and took her hand with a smile. Of course. They walked on and Hermione concentrated on managing her breathing. Every roommate has a price, you know. Theo said conversationally as they neared the castle. I intend to find out hers. Chapter 26 Notori What the hell did he do to Lavender? Jenny asked Sunday morning, stuffing a toothbrush into her toiletries bag. What do you mean? Hermione pulled on a black jumper, her bushy hat popping out the top. I mean, I got back to the room last night to find out it left not ten minutes before. Lavender was freaking out. Screaming that he tried to kill her. Nonsense. Hermione tied up her hair with a gold ribbon. She looked and felt much better today. Time with Theo appeared to be therapeutic. Ginny put her hands on her hips, Molly Weasley style. Hermione, Jean, Granger, did you or did you not shut her our window? That was an accident. What did you say then? Ginny persisted. It took forever to get Lavender out from under the bed. Hermione stuffed a cloak into her beaded bag. Coming for breakfast? Hermione! Jenny pulled her over to sit down on Hermione's bed. Crookshanks immediately jumped up to get as much orange hair as possible on Hermione's black sweater. What's going on? Lavender said that you went absolutely spare and that you can't sleep here anymore. Then she packed up all her stuff and left. What, really? Hermione looked around. The giant stuffed bear was gone from Lavender's bed along with her trunk and all those weird googly-eyed dolls from her desk and the pictures in pink heart-shaped frames. Levin is gone. She's roaming with Pavati in a couple of seventh years. Hermione grinned. I should have done this years ago. That, that is what I'm talking about, Ginny said, pointing at her. You're not acting like yourself this year. She stared at Hermione fixedly. Let me guess, Malfoy, right? Funny how he's always part of your little episodes. Hermione looked away, her hand stroking Crookshank's fur. Maybe. Well? Hermione sighed and gave it to her straight. Melfa checked Lavender. Ginny's jaw dropped. I don't believe it. Believe it? 
There I was, innocently getting ready to meet Theo and Levina presents the latest episode of the Slytherin Sex God Chronicles starring Draco Malfoy and his wonder dick. The drums were starting to beat inside her head again. She really needed to calm down about this. Oh, Merlin, Jenny breathed wide-eyed. Are you sure? Apparently I haven't lived until I have that blonde head between my legs, Hermione said bitterly. Merlin, Jenny said again. I'm so sorry. Why are you sorry? Well, you... You... You like Malfoy. I know you do. You gods, no wonder you shut at the window. Hermione sighed. Maybe, but he's betrothed to Astoria Greengrass and now apparently with a little lavender on the side and I want no part of that mess. How do you know he's betrothed to Astoria? Jenny asked shrewdly. Astoria told me. Before or after, you choked her and slammed her into a wall. Hermione played with the beads on her back, reluctant to bring up the attempted crucio. She was being annoying. Annoying? Merlin, Ginny huffed. Just because Astoria says they're betrothed doesn't mean it's true. She's been saying that for years. Malfoy's still a git, but he's been almost human this year. Neville says he hasn't insulted him once. That, along with the injury and snitch catching, well, well, Malfoy's making a hat while with students despite the blood messages. People actually talk to him now. Astoria thinks she's got a string on him and she's yanking it. She can't be pulling the leash very hard if he's shagging Lavender, Hermione pointed out. Ginny was frowning. Oh, he just can't see it. Malfoy and Lavender, she sighed. Oh, I should have been here for you. Hermione pulled the redhead into a hug. No, no, none of this was your fault. How did you talk with Harry going yesterday? Ginny's face was downcast. He met someone else, but you already know that. Yes. We took a walk around the lake and it was fucking awful. It was all mature and noble and understanding. When I mentioned Blaze, Jenny choked. It, it was obvious I checked him. I mean, my face was so hot. I couldn't even look at her, and when I finally did, his mouth was doing that thing. Hermione nodded. She knew that look. When Harry folded his lips into a grime lime from an injury or hard feelings and was trying to hide it. Then he starts acting like my father. Her roommate eerily mimicked Harry's serious aura voice. People are not always what they seem, Ginny. Ginny sighed. It's just... I loved Harry for so long. I don't know how I feel now, but it doesn't matter, really. She looked at Hermione. You're meeting him today, aren't you? Hermione nodded. I'm leaving for Diagon Alley after breakfast. Now I just have Blaze, Ginny sighed. And I have no clue how I feel about him. I feel like it could crash and burn just like you and Malfoy. There wasn't enough of us to crash and burn, Hermione said earnestly. It's just not going to happen. I'm with Theo now. I like being with him. Even if Malfoy isn't engaged to Astoria and isn't checking Lavender, it doesn't matter. The whole thing was ridiculous. He's a Malfoy. I'm a Muggleborn. There is no future there. We can never be real. We are patient partners, and that's it. The Daily Prophet Sunday edition arrived at breakfast, with owls dropping thick wards of parchment on people's heads and plates. Hermione was still cleaning pumpkin juice off a smeared paper when Ginny nudged her. Hermione? She said, shoving another folded copy at her. Magical virus infects Azkaban. Hermione read. Look, Ginny, there is a sickness running through the prison. It seems that many inmates are weak and vulnerable after years with dementors. Not there, Ginny rolled her eyes. The real news. She unfolded to top half. Look! Hermione bent her head over the parchment again. There, on the front page, under the headline, War heroine in love trust with Death Eater's son, was a picture of Hermione and Theo at the Spangled Vell the night before. She sat in shock watching the two of them kiss lightly over the table again and again. Great skater, she murmured. She read on. During a lovely meal at Hogsmeade Hottest New Restaurant, the Spangled Veil, this reporter was shocked to see Warher and Hermione Granger enter with none other than Theodore Knott, son of infamous Death Eater Ignatius Knott, who was executed by the Wizengamot in August for murder, assault and conspiracy. See Scandal, page 17. Money rifled through the pages. Granger, 19, 
right-hand woman to Harry Potter, the boy who lived, and a major combatant in the Battle of Hogwarts, has returned to her alma mater to finish her education. Undoubtedly, that is where she took up with not eighty, who spent the war overseas and only returned once the fighting was over. Granger is well known for her generosity of spirit, and it looks like the handsome Slytherin's charms may have overcome the judgment of the brightest witch of her age. Only a month ago, we expected wedding bells between Granger and fellow war hero Ronald Weasley, and now she is seen canoodling with a rival house. However, one admits if Granger must take up with a Slytherin, young Nut is probably the best choice, despite his background. Nut is in full possession of the family fortune and has contributed to various worthy causes, including muggles displaced, killed or injured by the war. And unlike Granger's previous suitor, he can obviously offer the famous Muggleborn the best of everything, from lens to diamonds. Perhaps Nod's relationship with Granger is a sign that the charismatic pureblood has turned over a new leaf and rejected his family's past prejudices. Hermione looked up from the page to see the entire Gryffindor table staring. Murmurs from the other tables had risen to a dull roar. Thank Marlin Pront isn't here for this, she thought. It's not too bad, Hermione said, shrugging. Nice picture. Hermione? Never began. It's okay, really. Could be much worse. The and I are dating. We're not hiding it. We just didn't think it would get out so quickly. She looked around. Really, everyone, it's fine. The entire table looked relieved and began to talk again. A bit jumpy, aren't they? Hermione asked Neville and Ginny. Ginny snorted. <laughs> They're probably afraid you're going to blast a window out of the Great Hall. Levin has been blabbing. She cast an evil look at their former roommate, who sat further down the table with Pavati. I don't remember seeing Skeeter at the restaurant. Hermione skimmed over the article again. Something about the tone seemed off. In any case, I don't see anything damaging here. I'll have a quick word with Theo, and then I'm off to Diagonelli. Hermione gave the Gryffindor table a reassuring smile that they all seemed to appreciate and left her bent, seeing the thin strap of a beaded bag across her chest. She looked over at the Slytherin table and nearly flinched at Malfoy's galere. The open prophet was in his hand. Merlin, what was wrong with him? If anyone should be glaring, it should be her. She wasn't shagging his roommate, as if anybody wanted to be his roommate. And the men weren't bragging to him about her sexual appetites. She just went on a date. Now Theo was walking away, a sad smile on his face. She began back at him, and he relaxed immediately, taking her hand. Everyone was certainly very tense this year. Hello, son of a Death Eater, she said. Hello, Muggleborn gold digger, he answered. Add it to the library. Not now, she said. I'm meeting Harry and Ron at Diagon Alley. They passed through the double doors and left the castle through the entrance hall. Oh, I'm sorry about the prophet. Theo said as they stood outside. That was quite quick. Hermione pulled out her cloak and Theo arranged it around her shoulders. It's all right, I'll have head west, she said. Theo deftly fastened the cloak under her chin, a small gesture that made her blush. If I kiss you here, will it cause a media frenzy? he asked. She looked around. Students were streaming out the castle doors. I think the people have seen enough, Hermione said with a smile. She squeezed his hand and headed up the chilly path to Hogsmeade. The newspaper story made shopping in Diagon Alley an ordeal for Hermione. He was constantly followed by hisses of Death Eater Whore, plus two howlers from irate Ron fans. After a few hours of that, she stomped over to the leaky cauldron. It was near the Daily Prophet offices, and she just bought herself a nice glass jar. Fire whiskey neat, Hermione ordered, taking a seat at the bar. She pulled out her wand and began poking holes in the jar's lid. Be early for a shot, isn't it, Granger? A female voice asked. Hermione turned around, hoping she had misidentified the voice, but no, it was most certainly Pansy Parkinson standing there, looking decidedly out of place in her yellow sheathed dress. A white yellow band smoothed back her black hair, and she had a little white purse and lace glove. In fact, nine, you were here, Parkinson, Hermione said. I would have ordered two. Pansy sniffed. I don't care for whiskey. Two shots for me. I suppose you're celebrating in your own common way, Pansy said. Looking to be the next lady not, are you? Hermione sighed and stuffed a jar back into her beaded bag. 
Why does everyone think I'm chasing a title? I actually like Theo, you know. He's a better prospect than Draco, anyway. Hermione grunted and knocked back her shot. She was not discussing Malfoy with another one of his bins. She never wanted to discuss Malfoy again. She never wanted to see or think or hear about Malfoy again. Maybe he would drop out of Hogwarts. Maybe she should drop out of Hogwarts. She caught the bartender's eyes and pointed at her empty shot glass, then turned to glad Pansy. Why are you still here? I like Theo too, actually, Pansy said. Let me guess, Hermione said, knocking back her second shot. You have a prior agreement with Theo, which you've consummated in the most disgusting ways possible, and you plan to stalk me and criticize my drinking habits until I leave him alone. Pansy blinked. Is that why you hex a story, huh? Because of her past with Draco? No! Get that into your sugar spun hat, Parkinson. I did not hex Astoria because of what she said about Malfoy. She had Pansy's dark eyes with her own. It was self defense, and they call me violent. Fuck! She slammed her shot glass on the table. I believe you. Splendid. When I said I liked the I meant as a friend, Granger, I don't want him used. Neither do I. I have no plans to be Lady Not. Fuck that. The fire whiskey was really going to her head. I believe you, Pansy said again. Hermione scrunched up at her. I must be particularly persuasive when I'm drinking. Are we done here? Is Longbottom seeing anyone? Hermione blinked. Pansy took the stool beside her, crossing her ankles and placing her purse and gloves over her knees. Her back was straight, and she looked completely ridiculous. Another one, the bartender said. Hermione looked at Pansy, who nodded. Two more shots and some bread and cheese, please, Hermione said. I have a lunch. I'd rather not turn up sloshed. Too late, Pansy said. No, Hermione went on. I don't know if Neville is seeing someone, but he's one of my very best friends. A good man, and anybody who hurts him is going to think Astoria got off easy. Hell, they think Bellatrix got off easy. Feel me? Loud and clear, Pansy said. Two shots arrived, along with the bread and cheese, and the two women drank. Hermione immediately started in on the bread. I've been watching Draco this year, Pansy went on, Hermione groaned. I'm beginning to think our house has been a little hard on him. You'll tell him that, Hermione said. I don't care. He's been behaving quite strangely, Pansy said. He was always strange, see, don't care, a buff. I heard you tried to murder Lavender Brown, Pansy smirked. My, don't you have a temper this year? Hermione shrugged. So, I've been a little testy. If you say so. We've all seen Brown following Draco around for weeks, even right up to the Southern Dungeons. You Gryffindors have no pride. Maybe you should consider herself your successor, Parkinson, said Hermione, remembering how Pansy hung on Malfoy for years. Meow. Brown, Astoria. As I said, I've been watching. It's disturbing what happens to people who get between you and Draco. He's been a little testy, too. Pansy's eyes narrowed. It makes me worried about Theo. Theo can handle himself, Hermione said. I understand where you're coming from, but you don't have to worry. There is nothing going on between me and Malfoy. All right, then, Pansy set a gallon down at the bar. Drinks on me. Hermione shook her head and pushed a coin back towards her. You can pick up the next tap, Granger. Hermione smiled reluctantly. All right. Pansy left her stool quite graceful for someone who just had a shot of whiskey and minced out the door in her heeled shoes. Hermione put her foot on the bar. What a goddamn damn mess. She must have dozed off a little, face down on the bar, because she felt a bit better when Harry found her. He teased her about the smell of fire whiskey and a heavy line on her forehead, then bore her off to the three broomsticks, where Ron and George were on their second, maybe third, Potterbeers. Ron looked more relaxed than she'd seen him in years. His act was friendly, and he made only few pointed remarks about her and Theo's front page news. The turnaround was stunning, and Hermione spent most of lunch staring at his new Ron. Ron and George needed to get to the borough afterwards, invited the rest to come along, but Hermione said she had to study and Harry had training. Hermione spent the afternoon working in the Gryffindor common room, and after dinner she studied in the library with Ginny and Neville, as well as Theo, who was still manfully trying to follow her colour-coded study guides. It was a quiet evening. Jenny looked a little pale and heavy-eyed, and Theo kept glancing at Hermione worriedly when he thought she wasn't looking. 
Hermione was glad to return to the dorm, where she and Ginny split a butter beer and went to bed early. Ginny didn't mention Blaze, and Hermione didn't mention Malfoy. Hermione lay on her back for a long time, staring at the canopy above, thinking of everything and nothing, and she was pretty sure Ginny was doing the same. Her mind, especially, kept drifting back to Malfoy's diamonds, still stowed at the very bottom of Hermione's trunk, protected by strong wards. A few times over the past weeks, the jewels had drawn her out of bed, and she'd held the pieces up to the candlelight, admiring their faceted fire, touching the cool, smooth diamond in the centre of the clip. Dark, dangerous jewellery. Historic jewellery? Possibly family jewellery? Hermione tossed restlessly in her bed, unable to accept the possibility that she lived in a world where Draco Malfoy gave her a muggle-born such a treasure. Just because it was her birthday. There simply had to be another explanation. Dark doubts drifted in. Perhaps the diamonds were cut. An intricate plan of revenge. She set up. Oh, in Merlin, now she was being truly ridiculous. Malfoy was no saint, but he wasn't a diabolical dark wizard trying to live up to his dark mark again with another careless delivery of deadly jewellery. Then why? Hermione flopped back onto the bed. She could start a new loop section on the topic, but she lacked sufficient data to draw any reasonable conclusions. Asking Malfoy directly was out of the question. He probably just put her off. So where were answers she needed? What were the right books? The right sources? She was still pondering research options when she fell asleep. Chapter 27 Dodging and Weaving Breakfast Monday morning began with a dramatic announcement. McGonagall rose from her throne-like chair in the Great Hall and her assembled students immediately quieted. Hermione looked across the table at Ginny, who nodded. I have an important announcement regarding one of our most valued students, the headmistress said. Ronald Weasley has elected to leave Hogwarts and accept a partnership with his brother George at Weasley's Wizard Weasers. I have absolutely no doubt that both Mr. Weasleys will continue to find great success with their business. Murmurs rippled through the mass of students, and a good number of them looked at Hermione and Ginny, who both smiled and nodded. I cannot emphasize enough the debt this school owes to Mr. Weasley personally. He has been a brave and loyal addition to Hogwarts and worthy of our respect. He regrets that he was unable to say goodbye to you all personally, but felt his family needs him after the events earlier this year. She lifted her goblet. I would like us all assembled to toast Mr. Ronald Weasley. The money stood up immediately and the entire Gryffindor table followed as well as the Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs. Ginny gave Blaze a significant look, and he rose with Theo bringing the Slytherin table along. Even Malfoy stood with a glance at Hermione. She felt a bit teary after they sat down again, but the memory of Ron so cheerful and relaxed at Diagon Alley the day before was a comfort. She took out her quill to update the day's study schedule, and it suddenly quivered in her hand. Oh no! Feelings, nothing more than feelings, the quill sang. Ginny whipped her hat around in her seat. Is that trying to forget my feelings of love? The rest of the table looked at Hermione nervously, but she just smiled down at the crooning quill. Oh, yes, definitely the right choice. For the first time in her life, Hermione seriously considered scarving off a class. Anything was better than sitting at a patient's table with Malfoy and Lavender. But then she thought how disappointed her parents would be if they knew she'd comprised her education just because her roommate shacked a former Death Eater that Hermione had blackmailed, hexed and kissed. She could just hear her mother. Now, honey... Those bits about shattered windows and blood-soaked jewellery sound like excuses to me. One mustn't fear success. So she marched into the patient's head held high to find Malfoy setting up their cauldron without an ounce of shame. Disgusting. She gave her patient's partner the cold look he deserved and took her seat. Levin arrived and looked nervously at Malfoy 
who regarded her with usual bored indifference. Hermione glared at them both as she ground an irrumpent horn to dust. Sickening! Absolutely sickening! The angry Hermione became, the smug Levinus expression grew, and by the end of the class she was cooing at Malfoy as usual. Malfoy gave Hermione an occasional sharp look, but if he had any thoughts, he wisely kept them to himself. The entire week after Ron's departure was marked by a steady, pouring rain that seemed to oppress the entire castle. Malfoy especially was a dark, brooding presence which irritated Hermione to no end. What in Godric's name did he have to brood about? He was living the pure-blood dream over there in Slytherin, with his pure-blood betrothed and his pure-blood mistress. All he needed was a cane and one of those aristocratic hounds. She turned to her schoolwork for distraction, and Theo proved diverting as well. Slytherin was quite good at luring her into alcoves for a bit of snogging, but Hermione never let things progress very far until Friday afternoon after classes. I'm beginning to think you don't really like me, Hermione. Theo murmured in her ear. He had found him a storage room off the dungeon corridor. The large space was packed with ten strings of lights and folded wooden tables for outside events. Oh, I like you fine, she said, drawing his hand out from under her uniform skirt. She was seated on a picnic table with Theo standing between her legs, his hands now on her hips. The piles of boxes and assorted outdoor junk reminded her of Arthur Weasley's muggle shack, and she hadn't forgotten how having sex there had turned out. Oh, I don't believe you. Theo's voice took on that rumbling tone. Convince me. I wrote up a chart on all your positive attributes in my loop, ranked in order of importance, she said brightly. I could read it to you if you like. Theo withdrew his hands and looked down at her sternly. Like Hermione, he had shed his rope, tie and jumper, and with his artfully messy black hair and five o'clock shadow, he looked nothing like a student. Top buttons of his shirt were undone, revealing a quantity of dark chest hair. Hermione swallowed, but didn't look away. Oh, I'm guessing the words considerate, kind, and agreeable figure prominently in your chart, Theo said. Hermione nodded. And organized. Your study guides are coming along nicely. Ah, the words every man longs to hear. I wonder. Theo murmured, twining a hand into her curls and pulling her head back gently. If you'd like me better, if I was a bit less agreeable. Hermione's breath quickened, and she flushed, realizing she'd given herself away. She and Theo locked eyes, and his hand in her hair tightened. His kisses were rougher now, his other hand tearing at her shirt. He was pressing her backwards, and things might have advanced further if Ernie Macmillan hadn't flung the door open with a bang. Hermione! Ernie said hoarsely, his ears turning red. Theo spared Ernie the slightest of glances, not moving his hands an inch. Whatever you're here for can obviously wait, Macmillan, he said coolly. Is it Malfoy? Hermione popped up, nearly clocking Theo in the head. Is Kingsley here again? Theo gave a low groan. What? No, Ernie said. I'm here to take inventory for the Halloween festival. I told the prefects to do it, but... Have you organized a festival steering committee? Hermione pulled away from Theo and turned toward Ernie, wagging her finger. You won't get anywhere unless you hold people accountable. Ernie, are you listening to me? Ernie's whole face was brick red now, as well as his ears. Hermione looked down. Her shirt was completely unbuttoned. Blushing, she pulled it close, clamping her knees together as well to avoid a view straight up her... It's all right, Macmillan, Theo said, chuckling. I wasn't listening either. He gave Ernie superior looks. Perhaps you should take care of your own tent before you start counting these. Theo! Hermione scolded. Ernie fled, utterly mortified, and Theo pulled her close, enveloping her in that musky cologne. I'm impressed, Hermione said. Oh, I haven't even begun, he murmured into her throat. You don't care that Ernie got an eye for? I thought your Slytherins were jealous types. She almost shivered, thinking of Malfoy's likely reaction in such a situation. Theo raised his head and snickered. Jealous of a Hufflepuff? Hardly. Next, you'll expect me to if you're threatened by just a fat fuckhead. He tugged at her bra strap. Did you put a sticking charm on this? She had, as well as on other items of clothing in strategic places, which Theo considered unsporty. The man enjoyed the resulting squabble, but Ernie's entrance had rather killed the mood. Ernie had seen her bra. Ew. But maybe she should have tried harder, because when she left the storage room, followed by a slightly disgruntled Theo, 
she bumped right into Astoria Greengrass. Hermione was not pleased. She'd already had her recommended daily allowance of Astoria and Herbology, where the atmosphere at their table had been cold enough to frost over their wing. Literally. Bloody accidental magic. Theodore, Astoria said, drawing out the syllables as she had with Draco at the Slug Club dinner. She was wearing her keeper's jersey and holding a broom, obviously on her way back from afternoon Quidditch practice. But despite the wind and rain outside, Astoria looked painfully tidy, with only a slight dampness curling the ends of her long golden braid. She ostentatiously brushed at her sleeve where Hermione had touched her. Oh, Astoria, Theo said curtly. Astoria looked him up and down, then cut her eyes between Hermione's rumpled state and the still ajar storage room door. Hermione flushed. Theo's hair and clothing, of course, were above reproach. You seem tense, Theodore, Astoria said with a smile. Dissatisfied. A bright gaze touched on Hermione again. So sad. Astoria, Theo repeated, an edge of warning in his tone. Hermione's fingers twitched for a wand. The blonde's cat-in-the-cream look only intensified. Perhaps it's for the best, Theodore, she went on. You wouldn't want to spoil your appetite. She smirked at Hermione. Astoria, I ask you to. Malfoy strode into the corridor, also wearing a Quidditch jersey and holding a broom. He halted at seeing them, then turned a deadly, unblinking gaze on Theo, who smiled back pleasantly. Look what I found, Draco, Astoria said. Outside a storage room, no less. We were accounting inventory for the Halloween festival, Hermione blurted. Tables and folding chairs and candles and... Shut up, Hermione screamed. Shut up. And tents, Theo put in. So many tents. And cauldrons for apple bopping, Hermione blabbered. You can't have too many cauldrons. Shut up about the cauldrons. You sound like Percy. Draco and I are headed to the common room for a little mulled wine before dinner. Please join us, Astoria said to Theo as if Hermione hadn't spoken. Thank you, Astoria, Theo said smoothly. But I don't think Hermione and I are quite finished. He turned to Hermione with a smile. We still haven't counted the boxes of disembodied hands. Malfoy's hand tightened on his broom and Hermione bit her lip, wondering what to do. Despite Astoria's needling, Hermione wasn't slipping back into that storage room with Theo. And she certainly wasn't going down to the Slytherin common room. Manipulative snakes. Finally, she summoned the one phrase that had never failed her. I have to go to the library, Hermione announced. Astoria cast a look of burning contempt. Malfoy raised an eyebrow. The library? Theo repeated. Now? I have an astronomy essay, Hermione said. Some scrolls can only be read when Venus and Mercury are above the horizon. He pulled a study schedule out of her skirt pocket. She always carried a tiny roll, never knowing when inspiration would strike, expanded it, and gave it a quick scan. Yes, she said decisively. Finishing that essay tonight gives me more time for pawn. Hermione pocketed the scroll and looked calmly at the Slytherins. Sarah was staring in confusion, mouth slightly open. And Malfoy appeared to be suppressing a smile. So, thank you for the invitation, Greengrass, but we must decline. Hermione said in her swattiest tone and flounced off without a backward look. Theo had no choice but to follow her. Well played, Hermione, he murmured as they climbed the staircase to the first floor. Clever of you to dream that up. Now, there's this interesting tapestry of Everett the Evil back in the... Oh, no, I was serious, Hermione said, refusing to be lured into another alcove. I never lie about a library, and they really are astronomy scrolls that can only be read under certain skies. She stopped at a library corridor. I understand if you'd prefer to sip mulled wine with Astoria. She said, and she meant it. Better him than me, anyway. Theo groaned and scrubbed at his hair, making it look like Harry's. And watch Astoria hold court with the Slytherin prince. He widened his eyes. Draco! Hermione grinned. Lead on, then. Theo said, waving a hand. Obviously, I'm still too considerate, kind, and agreeable. The skies cleared temporarily Saturday night, revealing a crisp, clear sky lit by the full moon. Unable to bear another minute in the castle, Hermione asked Theo to meet her by the Quidditch pitch as soon as he could escape some pretentious Slytherin cocktail party.
tucked in her bag, were three more astronomy scrolls that could be read under mid-October skies, and she couldn't wait to look at them. She wondered if Firenze the center might help her track constellations, or whether he'd just say, Mars is bright tonight, or spout divination rubbish. Hermione almost didn't need a light. The moon was so bright that she illuminated her wand anyway with a red glow. She picked a bench high in the Hufflepuff stands and just sat there for a moment, enjoying the quiet and solitude, her red and gold-knitted hat low on her forehead and her scarf wrapped tightly around her throat. Then she flattened a Cygnus squirrel and laid it on her knees under the starlight. Tiny, inky stars appeared almost immediately, moving across the parchment and reminding her of the little waving runes in Malfoy's codex. Singus, the swan, rotated slowly on the scroll, and yes, there was its neighbor, the constellation Draco, huge, with a bright yellow eye, bullying his way into her chart. Sigurd. Movement spotted out of the corner of her eye made her look up, and she saw a familiar silhouette on a broom against the fat moon. Speak of the devil! The picture was such a cliché. All he needed was a pointy hat. Hermione watched the flyer's movement with a faint smile. It was a pity all their interactions couldn't be silent at least five hundred feet apart. Her smile faded entirely as the figure made a sweeping curve and barreled straight towards her. She barely kept from screaming as the black shape swooped down and pulled up just a few feet away. Granger, Murphy asked. He hovered before her. Moonlight shining on his eyes and hair, drawing shadows along the sharp lines of his nose and jaw. With his hair ruffled by the wind, he looked much like he had in the infirmary. Only you would be out here doing schoolwork in the dark, he sneered. Hermione made no answer, and they just looked at each other for a few heartbeats, unsure what to say. The only sound was the wind rattling in the quidditch stands and snapping the flags. So uh, the weasel left? Murphy said out of nowhere. That's why I spent so much time with him. Yes, you didn't tell me that. It wasn't my secret to tell, and certainly not to you. I don't owe you anything. His eyes glittered. You're angry at me. Again. Well, I sputtered. Why the fuck now? He demanded. Money looked down, not wanting to meet his eyes. He touched her, and... Why was that so terrible? Or she knew Malfoy and Astoria were breaking furniture every night. Why was it so sickening to imagining him with... You don't even like her, she said, hence tightening on her scrolls. Like who? You think she's nothing beneath your notice. You barely tolerate her, and yet you still... Granger? Malfoy's voice was strained. Granger, I would greatly appreciate it if you would make a little sense here. Hermione jumped to her feet, scrolls tumbling off her lap. Fine, she hissed. You want to do this now? We'll do it now. You fucked her. You fucked Lavender Brown, and apparently you fucked her so well that she... I... What? Malfoy nearly fell off his broom. Brown, have you run mad? Don't even try to deny it, Hermione snapped. Lavender told me last Saturday, and let me tell you, I've had it up to here with your witch's bragging. And you believed it? Malfoy's eyes narrowed. Of course you did. I'm capable of anything, aren't I, Granger? Apparently there are no depths that I won't sink to. Malfoy leaped from his broom to the nearest bench in a single fluid motion, shadows rippling across his face. He stepped down into Hermione's row and she stiffened, resisting the urge to step back. Look, who knows so much, he said in a soft, cold voice. Tell me how many other slacks I have bent over, willingly or not. His hands were on her shoulders, clutching the cloth of her wool coat. I saw a lot of things during the war. She couldn't look away from those deadly eyes. I'm a bad man, remember? Hermione breathed in sharply. D don't be stupid, I don't think... You don't think you know, don't you, Granger? He pulled her closer. Tell me what I've done. He whispered, his breath hot in her ear. Wands and knives weren't the only weapons at Malfoy Manor. Hermione's heart pounded. She couldn't move, and the moment held. Then Malfoy released her and stepped back, lip curling. You insufferable little know-it-all, he said. He drew his wand and pointed it at his broom, still hovering nearby. The movement spurred Hermione into action, and she pulled out her own wand, shooting a collar shoe hex to stick Malfoy's feet to the stand. He struggled to move, his face a mask of fury. Granger! Expelliarmus! Hermione yelled, capturing his wand. Bluebell was really onto something with the unpredictable spellwork. Hermione backed away, just out of his reach. You Slytherins! she sniffed. 
so much drama. She tucked her once into her pocket. Give me my want, Granger. Now I said through gritted teeth. Not until you calm down, she said. Of course you're not some sicko wizard doing... You know. Hermione flipped her hands menacingly. That stuff. Malfoy glared. Why not? You thought that I would. Oh, come on now. Hermione snapped. Let's say Cormac rolled up to you Saturday night and said, Hey, Malfoy, Hermione's a hot check and let me tell you about the oral sex. I suppose you would have been all... Now, MacLegan, I find it hard to believe Granger would do that, so why don't we have a nice, calm chat about your motives? Really? Malfoy seemed struck by this, but said only, Oral sex. Yes, I'm told I haven't lived until I've had that blonde head between my legs. Hermione flushed. She couldn't seem to stop quoting that awful line. Malfoy looked pained. With her? I can't even imagine. He went, No, I just did. Hermione grinned at him, her spirits restored. Apparently it was so hard. Swear to solace, like Ranger, if you don't free my... Hermione. Theo was climbing the stands at a rapid pace, holding his wand like a torch, black cloak whipping behind him. Hermione quickly freed Malfoy's feet and handed him his wand. Oh, look, Granger has a new weasel. The ingrate sneered when Theo reached them. Theo just smirked. Hardly. You look a trifle as tough, that Draco. He slipped an arm around Hermione's waist. Malfoy stepped down a few branches and summoned his broom. Please, he drawled. Wait until I leave before you start pawing her. Like you were pawing her just now. Don't think I didn't see. Thea's icy tone sent shivers down Hermione's back. You Malfoys, always grabbing whatever you want. Theo, it wasn't what it looked like, Hermione said. It was... She trailed off, unable to produce an explanation that didn't sound completely mental. Theo left her side and stepped lightly down to join Malfoy, who easily kept his balance on the other end of the wobbling bench, his broom in hand. Slytherins were so well coordinated. Theo's cloak billowed in a sudden gust of wind, and a crackling dark power clung to both wizards. You ruin everything you touch, Draco, Theo went on. His green eyes glowed like a cat's. Stay away from her. Or what? Go back to your grandmother, little Theodore. Malfoy sneered. Don't try to play with the big boys and girls. Theo, please, let me explain. Hermione scrambled onto a slightly higher bench with a completely lack of grace. You see, I was getting ready for dinner with you, and Lavender said Malfoy shagged her. You think she'll be satisfied with your little games? Malfoy continued as if Hermione hadn't spoken. He stepped closer to Theo on the bench. She's a Gryffindor. She'll demand everything, heart, mind, body. Can you give it to her? Theo's smile shone white in the moonlight. I'll give it to her, all right. I know I shouldn't have believed her, Hermione was rambling on, only half listening. There had to be a way to explain this. Maybe she could create a timeline. My living has said I hadn't lived. Well, never mind about that, and I... Malfoy, what are you doing? Stop! Malfoy had slammed the handle of his Quidditch broom into Theo's jaw and a side jab to the ribs knocked the black-haired wizard off the bench. Malfoy glanced back at Hermione, broom in hand. Granger, don't! If that's to start some! Theo's voice boomed, and a bolt of red light shot upward, lightning up the stands. The dueling spell, designed to knock back an opponent, missed Malfoy by inches. Stop! Hermione shouted again and drew her own one. What's wrong with... Expelliarmus! Malfoy snapped, catching her wand and tucking it into his coat. He smoothly retreated, still holding his broom, and vanished into the shadows of a yellow-painted wall. Undaunted, Hermione charged after him, tripping on a step and falling to one knee. Malfoy emerged from the shadows, looking down at her, and Theo suddenly popped up again and threw a stinging hex at the blonde wizard. Malfoy grunted with pain and raised his wand. Taranta Ligra! The white spark from his wand lit up Malfoy's face like a flash of lightning. And for an instant, Hermione was back in the Department of Mysteries, dodging curses from Death Eaters in the dim light. She remembered Ignatius Knott's hulking form, his huge hand on Harry's arm, and a smooth rush of magic from her wand. Knott's mask torn off and his green eyes, so like Theo's, widening when she stunned him, the wizard falling in the toppling shelves of prophecies. Hermione froze, still kneading, lost in the memory, even as Malfoy's dancing curse directly hit Theo. 
The pain from the stinging hacks must have weakened Malfoy's casting. However, for Theo began a light tap dance rather than the spell's usually fast, frantic tarantula. Theo could still use his wand, and the flagpole ripped itself off the stands and flew spinning towards Malfoy. The blonde wizard yelled, Incendio! burning up the flag in a mid-air fireball, then he cast Petrificus to Talus. Theo fell between two benches with a clatter, and the stands were suddenly dark and quiet once more. Hermione jumped to her feet and ran to Malfoy, shoving him back in the shadows against the wall. She could hear him panting, trying to catch his breath, and his broom clattering to the wooden floor of the stands. Have you lost your mind? Hermione hissed at him. Give me my wand! She began rifling through his pockets, and when it yielded nothing, pulled open his coat, refusing to be distracted by the sudden burst of cologne and the feel of hard muscle under her finger. She was inches from punching him as she had in third year. Ow! Malfoy cried, wincing as Hermione pulled his wand out of his hand. I can't want! She caught her wand with a snap and stepped back. Malfoy strode after her, scowling ferociously. Swollen left arm strained its coat sleeve. Give me my... You don't deserve to have a wand, not after the demonstration I just saw, Hermione snapped. You and Theo can have your wands back tomorrow. How could you attack him like that? Didn't you hear what he... I don't care what he said. Whatever it was, he just said it to get a rise out of you. It's after curfew. How am I supposed to get back to the dungeons without my... I don't care. Akio astronomy scrolls. Hermione scrolls shot into her hand and she summoned her back and stuffed them into it. At least, you my... Forget it. Oh, I can't believe you're blaming me for this, Malfoy said silently, slumping back against the flagpole. Believe it, she said. You're the one who inspired and launched a whole evil creep wizard routine. Congratulations. Now Theo thinks you were... Hermione stopped speaking as a babble of voices reached her ears. Dark figures had gathered at the bottom of the stands, teachers most likely, finally investigating the lights and noise. Honestly, she'd expected a quicker response time. I had to learn nothing from the war. The staff obviously needed additional training. You can't leave me here without a wand, Malfoy protested. Watch me. Hermione stomped down the stands to pinch Theo's wand as well and lift the Petrificus to Talus Hex. Theo took the news that she was leaving him wandless and unhealed no better than Malfoy. Now, sweetheart, you can't be serious, Theo said reasonably as he sat up on a bench the fact slightly mounted by his swollen jaw and still twitching legs. Malfoy stood nearby, still glaring and clutching his arm, which was now twice its usual size. I'm quite serious, Hermione said as she backed away. I hope you both get detentions until spring. She cast a disillusionment charm around herself, rendering her almost invisible, and crept away from the two now squabbling wizards. I'm going to fucking waste you, Theo, when I get my wand back. I don't need a one to break every bone in. Children. Absolute children. Hermione thought as she slipped past Hagrid and two other professors and stalked back to the castle. Maybe she should have listened to Ron. He always said nothing good came out of hanging out with Slytherins. To be continued. Chapter End Notes by the author Okay, so obviously I didn't fool anybody with the whole lavender thing. You all are too smart for me. I hope you like the duel. Next up, Hermione teaches Draco about owls. Chapter 28 The Mask Slips Chapter Notes by the Author Here's a short light chapter before we enter deeper waters. The rain returns Sunday morning with a vengeance pounding on Hermione's bedroom window as she packed a few items into her pink beaded bag and added two square packages marked with runes. Beneath her heavy black cloak, she wore jeans and a red jumper, and her hair was tied up into as tight a bun as she could manage, although it would all fall apart by noon in such weather. She'd had a restless night, plagued with dreams of the war again, the terror and confusion at the Department of Mysteries, the pain of Dolohov's curse. She'd woken up sweating, and when she finally fell asleep again, confused dreams of Theo followed, and then the one with Malfoy and danger. The last dream Hermione had dismissed as guilt. Stinging hexes were painful, and she didn't think Malfoy would ask anyone to heal him. She literally found herself standing by the bedroom door, wearing slippers and a pink robe, clutching her wand and the marauder's map. You're being stupid, she told herself, turning around and getting back into bed. 
He's fine. He's resourceful. You need to stay away from him. Now it was morning, and Hermione stopped by the Aulery first thing to send two stubborn gits there one. Not that they deserved them, any more than they deserved the books she'd included to advance their knowledge. She had chosen Happy Hoots, Advanced Owl Feeding and Care, for Malfoy, his eagle owl looked a little peaky and she'd written out a recommended diet, and Sands of the Hourglass, Advanced Time Management Techniques for Theo. Both packages were tied with large red and gold ribbons and covered in smiley faces. She almost regretted not being in the great hall for the delivery. Packages sent, she hurried down the west tower stairs and had almost reached the statue of the one-eyed humpback, which when Theo's return owl found her. Hermione unrolled a small parchment sealed with green wax bearing the imprint of the knot ring. Dear Hermione, please meet me at the entrance hall. I'm sorry. Yours, Theo. Hermione groaned. How could she ignore such a note with an apology in everything? At least one wizard knew how to be properly contrite. Theo was standing alone by the Slytherin hourglass, which looked suspiciously full again. He wore dark trousers and a high-necked green sweater, and his jaw, she noted, was still a bit swollen and bruised. He greeted her a bit cautiously, even thanked her for the book. Then he eyed her cloak. You are leaving the castle today, he said. I have an errand, she answered a bit coolly. Please, just one minute before you go, Theo said. There's a tapestry of Eva de Eva. If you even think I'm going to... Hermione... He raised his eyes to the hall's high gothic ceilings for patience and apparently found it. He looked back at her intently. I just want to talk to you. And given the look on your face, I'd rather be behind a muffliato charm while I do so. She agreed and they walked in silence to the ground floor corridor leading to Ferenc's divination classroom. They pulled aside a faded grey tapestry depicting a dark wizard felt by a nasty spell that had turned his limbs into tentacles. Mine paused to inspect the weaving. The artistry was remarkable, really. Some of the tentacle suckers were stuck to Everett's face, and a slight puckering in the weave seemed to show how his skin was poor. Hermione? Theo asked, the faintest hint of impatience in his tone. She gave him a dark look and flounced into the alcove. Honestly, he was the injured party here. Where are you going? Theo asked after casting them a fliato. No, I just got here. I mean your errand, of course. Hogsmeade, I could come. Oh, no, I, I can't. He said, glowering. Oh, I'm confined to the castle. Hermione gasped. You mean you were... Yes, we were caught. What did you expect, leaving us out there without our wands? Theo looked quite pleased. Draco and I can't step outside of the castle for two weeks. Not even to walk to grounds unless we're escorted to classes by a prefect. First offence is grounds for expulsion. Expulsion? Hermione was shocked. My expulsion would violate Murphy's probation. His sentencing was very... Oh, yes, Draco's probationary status was my first thought as well, Theo said dryly. Half the castle thinks we blew up the Quidditch stands and some dark wizards better with corpses hanging from... Well, that is ridiculous, Hermione said. Ian Murphy would never be stupid enough to fight... Oh, wait. Theo's displeasure deepened. All the talk isn't doing the Slytherin's reputation any good. Draco and I managed to keep your name out of it, but it wasn't easy to convince McGonagall that we caused all that light and noise without wants. Especially the fireball, Hermione said. Fire spells are quite tricky to control without wands due to the lack of precise... Yes, yes, I know, Theo said. He seemed a bit tense, Hermione thought, but that's what happened when one broke rules. He took a deep breath and continued. We managed to convince McGonagall that we were practicing wireless magic and some of the spells got out of hand. You're welcome, by the way. Hermione sniffed and straightened her beaded back, its thin strap slung across her chest. I take no responsibility for that duel, which, by the way, you have yet to apologize for. I'm not apologizing for the duel. Draco attacked me. What, with an oh-so-deadly broomstick? And you responded with Everta Starchim? And that's a second-year dueling spell. I thought Bluebell taught you better. Theo looked stern. Let me get this straight. First, you scold me for dueling Draco, and now you're upset because I didn't perform up to your standards. Anything worth doing is worth doing well, Hermione said primly. Theo groaned and ran his hands through his hair. 
You're impossible. I'm not hearing any apology. He pressed his lips together, then sighed. I'm sorry for what I said about you. You should be, Hermione said. I very much regret it. You should. I was trying to provoke Draco, and it's obviously succeeded. All too well, he went on. I didn't expect such a response, but what I said was crude and disrespectful, and... Theo's eyes narrowed in a disturbingly hairy-like way. You don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Of course I do. I'm a pot, Hermione said unconvincingly. Theo groaned again. You weren't even listening to us back on those stands, were you? You were yammering on about brown and... He let his head fall back against the archive stone wall and rubbed his hands over his eyes. He looked a bit tired, Hermione noticed. It had been a long night for everyone. This whole conversation was a terrible idea, Theo said. It was, rather, she said. Obviously, he'd wasted both their time. But I'm here now, so you might as well tell me what you said. Theo looked shocked. Oh, I can't tell you out of context. It would sound awful. And it sounded better on the Quidditch stands. Teasing Theo was speedily restoring Hermione's good humor. I suppose I could ask Malfoy, she said. Dating you seemed like such a good idea, Theo said. You seemed so nice. He looked at her speculatively. You obviously won't rest until you know, so here it goes. Draco asked if I could give you what you want, and I said... He put on a suggestive tone. Oh, I can give it to her. Then he stood stiffly, as if awaiting a blow. Hermione blinked up at him. That's terrible. I know. I'm very offended. I know, and I'm... Theo's jaw dropped. Damn it, you're not offended at all. What did Malfoy say I wanted? That's it, this conversation is over. Theo snapped, his patience finally at an end. I don't know what I expected. Talking with you never goes the way it's supposed to go. Don't you want to know what happened with me and Malfoy on the stands? Theo shook his head. No, I don't even care anymore. But I made up a timeline and everything. Hermione was disappointed. He eyed her for a moment, lips finally quivering into a smile. His cool, broad hand touched her cheek. Maybe another time, he said. Will you accept my apology, even if you aren't offended? Yes, she said, smiling back. And thank you for protecting me, even though I took your wand. And refused to heal me, Theo said. My feet were tapping all night. Shifted closer, thick lashes slipping lower over green eyes. I needed you, Hermione. I was thinking of you. He was terribly close, and Hermione felt awkward, unsure of how to respond. When the strap on her beaded purse snapped, dropping its suddenly heavy weight on Theo's foot. Ah! Theo hissed. He gave Hermione a sharp look as he wiggled his toes inside his shoe. Cuts, bruises, necks were giving me burns. You talk a lot of nonsense, Hermione said, drawing her wand to both heal his foot and repair her back. And I need to go. She pulled aside a tapestry and looked back at him. I don't want to hear about any duels while I'm gone, Theo, and if you do enter into a duel, try to do better than if Virtus start him. To be continued. Chapter 29. Spellbound. Chapter Notes by the Author. This chapter was conceived and outlined before I even began writing the story, and it has changed very little since its first draft. Here goes. Hermione hesitated outside a dark shop in Nocturnelli. Only a faint yellow light in a corner of the grimy front window hinted that the building was occupied. After leaving Theo at Hogwarts, she had taken a marauder's passageway to Hogsmeade, then apparated to Diagonelli, where she dawdled over breakfast for an hour before slipping into this dark, dodgy street. She was wearing her black cloak, hood up to shield her from unfriendly eyes in a relentless rain. There were no canopies or awnings in nocturne alley shops, and hunched, often misshaped figures huddled at the edges of spreading puddles. Honestly, the Ministry should do something, set up a rain shelter, or at least offer soup or ponchos. Despite the downpour, the alley remained endlessly fascinating. She'd had to exercise strict self-control not to poke around in the bundles and barrels heaped carelessly on the dirty cobblestones. She did not stop into Mr. Marpepper's apothecary, discovering that this branch had potion supplies that the Diagon Alley shop didn't carry. She burned to ask the wise and proprietor about Thestral blood or dragon eyes, but left without a word. Yes, Nocturn Alley was definitely worth a return trip. Taking a deep breath, she pushed open the store's age-darkened wood and brass door and entered. 
Bogan and Burke's was just the same as she remembered. A shadowy, whispery place crammed to the rafters with dark artifacts. Fascinating. She could hear the tick of a giant grandfather clock. Its hands both stopped at thirteen. A green-scaled hand crawled along a shelf like a spider. She froze at the sight of a vanishing cabinet, twin to the cabinet Malfoy fixed in sixth year. She had visited this shop once before during that year, trying to find out what the blonde boy was up to, and had failed miserably. The money wanted the antique shop's crowded aisles, wondering what would have happened if she had succeeded. Could she have stopped Malfoy, stopped all the terror and destruction he caused? He dismissed such thoughts as useless and eyed a malevolent-looking letter opener, its handle fashioned into a twisting snake and its blade stained with blood. No weapon than a letter opener, she thought, even if it was on a shelf labelled Office Supplies. He was more tempted by the ink pot beside it, purported to hold never-ending ink. She looked into the pot and saw a tiny green face scowling at her. An evil genie in an ink pot, perhaps? May I help you, my lady? asked an oily voice. She turned to see Mr. Borgen himself, creepy as ever, although much smaller and frailer than he'd been two years before. It couldn't have been easy for him during the war, with Death Eaters dancing in every two minutes demanding deadly artifacts, although Hermione had no sympathy. The man was lucky he was still alive and not in Azkaban. The Aura's office should do something about this place. Hermione gave the shop another check to make sure they were alone and touched her wand inside her cloak. The shop's doors, front and back, immediately locked in response to her nonverbal spell. She warded them against entry and eavesdropping, then approached the counter. My lady, I must protest. Voice trailed off when he saw her face, but he was too cagey to speak her name. It's an honor to have you visit my humble shop. Hermione wanted to grin, but kept her face blank. The last thing this man wanted was an assistant or a Harry Potter's best friend hanging around. Borgen's bogging eyes took in every detail of her appearance. The black cloak still swathed around her, her face framed by the hood. I need information, Borgen, Hermione said, trying to turn Bellatrix Lestrange on a bad hair day. And really, they had all been bad hair days. I expect full confidentiality. Of course, nothing but discretion for the affairs of a most honored. Hermione pulled a flat box out of her beaded bag and laid it on the counter. It's an appraisal, actually. I've come into possession of some jewelry, and I would like to know more about it. He laid her hand on the black velvet box and willed it not to tremble. Visiting Borgen's shop was a calculated risk, Hermione knew, but she couldn't keep these diamonds any longer without knowing more about them. They could be Malfoy family jewelry. As unbelievable as it seemed, and Borgen had been buying magical corrupt items from Lucius for decades. If Hermione couldn't get answers here, she'd go to Bill Weasley. Borgen rubbed his hands greedily, his eyes lingering on the box's ornate silver clasp, which Hermione now noticed was shaped like a sinuous dragon. She slowly opened it. The rose hair clip and pins shimmered from their grey silk. Borgen gasped. A faint sound through discoloured teeth. May I? he asked, pulling out an ornate white wand. She nodded, and he waved it over the diamonds, murmuring spells under his breath. Hermione watched and waited. An ailed family heirloom, clearly, Borgen said, breaking the silence. Very rare, from the sixteenth century, I believe. A lot of diamonds are from a previous piece, a crown, perhaps. The setting has been modernized slightly about a century ago, to make it look more... delicate. The man did a faint touch of legolamency on the shopkeeper, not enough for him to notice. He seemed to be telling the truth. There is powerful magic here, in all three pieces, Warren continued. Dark magic? Amani asked. Oh, I don't believe so. Weaved his wand and muttered again. No, no curses, at least not now. There was a small curse, but it has been expertly removed. What kind of curse? Hermione asked. He blinked at her. A curse aimed to prevent a touch of a... Muggle. 
Oh, Hermione nodded to show she wasn't offended. Go on, please. There are multiple spells on these spaces, mostly smoothing and expansion spells. Noble witches throughout history would cast such spells on their hair ornaments to help them create their intricate stars. That seemed harmless enough. Jewelry like this was it a traditionally popular gift, such as... Hermione trailed off, unsure how to ask what she wanted to know. But Borgen grasped her intent immediately. Her jewelry is a very personal gift. Far more personal than other types of jewelry. Such jewelry is often passed from mother to daughter. Borgen's roomy eyes looked straight into her. This jewelry is not. The shop seemed utterly silent to Hermione's ears now. She could no longer hear the ticking of the clock or the soft sobbing of some cursed plant in the corner. She didn't know what Borgen was going to say next, but she was sure she wasn't going to like it. Tell me, she said softly. Borgen nodded and continued. This particular heirloom has been exclusively given as an interest gift. An interest gift? The miner repeated. The term sounded vaguely familiar. She raised her eyebrows, silently asking him to go on. Courtship rituals among the oldest magical families are quite complex, Borgen explained. The first step to betrothal is the interest gift, a small token of regard. Hermione's jaw dropped. Courtship? Betrothal? Did he know? He must have known something if he went through the trouble of taking the anti-muggle curse off. What was he about, giving her family joy with such associations? She almost shivered. Bargain cleared his throat. Oh, I mean no disrespect, my lady. But I hope you do not intend to sell these pieces. What? No! She croaked. She couldn't imagine doing such a thing. I thought not. Pity. Bargain gave the jewels a covetous look. The binding, of course, would prevent that. Binding? The money gasped. What fresh hell was this? Accepting this jewellery and wearing it forges a bond between the giver, the recipient, and the diamonds himself. The shopkeeper went on, eyeing her closely. Only the woman who receives the diamonds may wear them, and only the man who gave them to her may touch them. Hermione nodded, thinking of Ron and Cormac, not to mention poor Theo. She touched her wand again, but sensed no deception from Borgen, only greed and fascination. And if another man touches them, she began. A small cut, nothing dangerous. Usually. The first time, anyway. The shopkeeper sat with an evil smile. Hermione almost groaned. Of all the reckless, careless. Quite romantic. Bargain added, admiring the diamond. Well, yes, she's supposed in a creepy, possessive, pure-blood kind of way. And so died Hermione's last hope that the diamonds were an impulse by at some swank shop. She was holding enchanted Malphite treasure passed down through generations. And to think she'd been walking around wearing the things like plastic hair claws. My lady. Bargain dropped his oily tone and replaced it with one of portent. This is a significant gift from a noble house. You obviously were not aware of the implications, and I would never dare to speculate on the mind of the noble when he now doubt humbly presented it to you. He didn't present it to me, he left it on my desk, Hermione said, goggling slightly at the idea of Draco Malfoy humbly doing anything. No, no, to her anything. Borgen looked thoughtful but said nothing. Does that make a difference? she said hopefully. Like the jewellery was technically, uh, abandoned, and I just happened to pick it up. What if I covered the box and gift wrap and threw it at his head and knocked him out, and when he came to... Hermione trailed off at the shocked look on Borgen's face. What? she asked the man. This man maintained a godric damned magical trove of evil, yet enough to look alarmed by her? Well, she went on, hands on hips, any further insight? I don't have all day. Of course, of course, my lady. Bargain bumped nervously and smoothed his greasy hair. You have identified to give her, yes? Did, did you thank him? Yes and yes, Hermione said reluctantly, thinking back to her dance with Malfoy on her birthday. 
She couldn't believe she was standing around discussing her personal life with the shopkeeper of Borgen and Burke's. This whole school term had been nothing but weird. And you have worn the jewels, he went on as she nodded. After he thanked him, he touched the pieces and escaped unscathed. She nodded again, grimacing. Borgen's eyes gleamed. Then a bond has been forged. Merlin, have I committed to anything here? Hermione asked nervously. I have no plans in marrying this man. He shook his head. Again, simply an interest gift, not a betrothal. You may even return the jewels if you wish to the family. But no other woman may wear these particular jewels until your death. Hermione could have wept. She wanted to kill Malfoy, then resurrect him with the Philosopher's Stone, then kill him again. Of all the irresponsible. Bargan watched her owlishly, waiting for her next move. There was a hint of eagerness about him, which made no sense. He couldn't buy the diamonds. Wait a minute. Do you know what family this Alan belongs to? She asked softly, touching her wand inside her cloak. Borgen licked his lips. Sadly, no, my lady. He's lying this time. He knows it's Malfoy jewellery. Thank you, Hermione said. She closed the box and slid it back into a beaded bag, which disappeared under her cloak. I know I can rely on your discretion. Implicitly, my lady, Borgen said. Very well, then. I appreciate your... Hermione whipped out her wand and pointed it between his eyes. Obliviate! Morgan's eyes unfocused, then focused again, and he swayed and clutched the counter. Hermione quickly turned and headed towards the door. My lady? The shopkeeper called hesitantly after her. May I help you? Not today, she rasped, trying to disguise her voice. She pushed open the door, waving her wand to dispel the wards, and practically ran out of the shop. Hermione had planned to head straight back to Hogwarts, but instead found herself dazedly wandering diagonally, clutching the hood of her cloak and sloshing through puddles. She was still trembling. What on earth should she do now? She wanted to throw the jewels into the gutter, then catch the first portkey to North Africa and join the French Magical Legion under an assumed name and never return. Wonder what the requirements would be. Miss Granger. Hermione turned around and stared silently cursing her evil luck for standing before her, tall and elegant, under a silver-chased black umbrella, was none other than Narcissa Malfoy. Chapter 30 Tea with Narcissa Lady Malfoy, Hermione said weakly, expecting the older witch to nod and walk on. But Narcissa just looked at her, blue eyes weighing and measuring. The elegant witch wore a soft grey cloak and matching gloves, and an enormous diamond pin fastened the cloak at her left shoulder. Her eyes were ringed and black, and her mouth a perfect red bow. Hermione's face, on the other hand, had been washed clean by the rain, which had also sent her hair exploding in all directions. Her bare hands were blue with cold, and her jeans were wet to the knees. "'Miss Granger, you look in need of some hot tea,' Narcissa said. Her words were kind, but the tone was cold. Hermione stuttered a polite objection, but found herself taken by the elbow and whisked into a nearby tea shop in seconds. The shop's hostess collected their cloaks and their sister's umbrella at the door. The tea shop wasn't frilly and romantic like Madame Puddyfoot's in Hogsmeade, or bright and bustling like a muggle shop. This place was sumptuous, all sparkling crystal and gold gilt, with all the paintings on the walls and graceful chairs and sofas covered in blue and green brocade. Narcissa selected a tiny table apart from the rest beneath a large window. Once they were seated, the older witch removed her gloves and patted her hair, although not a smooth blonde strand was out of place. Hermione took a moment to dry her clothes and face with her wand. Her tight hairbun had exploded into a bushy ponytail, and all she could do was gather up the extra tendrils with a red ribbon, which she did a bit tremblingly under Narcissa's cold eye. A large pot of magical merlin and a plate of your pumpkin scones, Narcissa told the waiter. Hermione nodded agreement, not that it mattered anyway, and tried to look pleased to be there. I understand you are to be commended, Narcissa said after a short silence. Theodore Notch is a fine young man. Hermione said nothing. She certainly wasn't going to thank Narcissa for complimenting her on bagging a pure blood. 
Such a lovely piece in the Prophet, Narcissa continued. Such stories help promote healing after the war. The money didn't see how headlines screaming, Son of Death Eater, healed anything, but she nodded anyway. Narcissa's eyebrows rose slightly at her taciturnity. This is your party, honey, Marnie thought. I'll talk when you bring up something worth talking about. The tea and scones arrived at that moment, giving the two women at least something to do. Narcissa was certainly right about a cup of hot tea. Marnie downed two cups immediately and felt much better. What brings you to Diagon Alley, Lady Malfoy? she asked, pouring her third cup from the bottomless pot. A bit of shopping, Narcissa answered. She was still sipping her first cup of tea and hadn't touched her scone, while Hermione had already eaten two. Some warm blankets, a knit hat, a scarf and gloves, and a few books. Tomorrow is my day to visit Lucius, you see. Perhaps you can suggest a book, Miss Granger. Hermione's fingers tightened on her teacup, but she managed to set it down on its china saucer without a clink. What subjects is he interested in, Lady Malfoy? He enjoys history, biographies of famous wizards. His collection of ancient texts is one of the best in Wizarding Britain. He always had a particular interest in ancient runes. Hermione cleared her throat. Ah, uh, well, Danbert Donaldson just published volume six of Unraveling the Elder Furbacks. It's a fine analysis of the topology and graphic variation among the North Sea cultures. She looked down at her sea cup. Was she really sitting here brainstorming gift ideas for Lucius Malfoy? He will certainly be interested in that. Runes have been a lifelong passion. In fact, until recently, Miss Granger, the Malfoy Library held a copy of the Codex Runica. The Codex Runica, Hermione repeated, still staring fixedly at the teacup. That is a significant manuscript. Priceless, of course, Narcissa said. Such precious heirlooms should be protected and properly cared for, yes? Yes, and they should be in a museum or another public venue. Marnie thought, looking up again. She kept her mouth shut and dabbed a little more clotted cream on her scone. Clearly, a speech about hoarding cultural treasures wouldn't go over any better with Narcissa than it had with her son. That was a lovely photograph of you and dear Theodore in The Prophet, Narcissa said, returning to her original topic. Your hair looked especially charming. Hermione froze, a bit of scone raised halfway to her mouth. Fuck all. She knew. Narcissa knew. She'd recognized the diamonds in Hermione's hair from the newspaper. How could she miss them? And Hermione would bet her last knut that Narcissa had personally delivered those very diamonds to her son at Hogwarts after his Quidditch injury. She had probably assumed the set was for Astoria. Ye gods, Malfoy, what have you done? Hermione sighed and lowered the scone again. There was no sense in hiding it. It was out there now. Thank you, Lady Malfoy, she said. I suppose I had your son to thank for that, since my curls usually have a mind of their own. You can imagine my surprise upon seeing that photograph, Narcissa said icily. That happen was unmistakable. I find it mystifying that Draco would present you, Miss Granger, with such a gift. Perhaps after seven years of insulting my hair, he decided to be part of the solution. I do not find this a joking matter, Miss Granger. Narcissa snapped, a spot of red appearing in each cheek. Draco is betrothed to Miss Astoria Greengrass, and that he would present this particular family atom to you, beggars the imagination. The younger witch shrugged. It was my birthday. Narcissa looked ready to break her in half, so Hermione dropped a light tone. Lady Malfoy, these are questions best put to your son. I honestly don't know why he gave me something so significant. He certainly couldn't have given those diamonds to a more ungrateful recipient, Narcissa said, her cheeks still red. That jewellery, Miss Granger, is the fabled Gloriana set from the 1500s, resized for modern use. That you would wear it to dinner with another man is a most grievous insult. I didn't mean to insult anyone, Lady Malfoy, Hermione answered earnestly. I know it was foolish of me to wear those diamonds that night. I sincerely apologize. I wore them out of vanity and spite, and I regret doing so. Narcissa blinked at the ready apology, but she was not appeased. I simply don't understand, Miss Granger. I don't either, Hermione said frankly. Again, you'll have to ask Malfoy. 
I had no idea at the time that he'd given me a family album, let alone one with such an, uh, history. But now you know what this gift signifies, and why your possession of it is deplorable, an affront to the proprieties. Well, it's fucking balls, the bitch wants the jewels back, Hermione thought, mouth hanging open slightly. She clutched the beaded bag against her hip a little more tightly, hoping it could repel an Accio spell. Surely Narcissa didn't know she had the diamonds with her now. Then it must be on your person, Granger. Narcissa's cold voice brought her back to her surroundings. I will forgive you your fault in accepting such a gift, since it was through ignorance of your ways. She said magnanimously, But this state of affairs cannot be allowed to continue. My only fault, Lady Malfoy, was wearing that jewelry to dinner with Theo, and again, I apologize for that. Hermione said, frowning. The gift itself I consider nothing more than the careless, extravagant gesture of a rich noble with a guilty conscience. I do not agree with that assessment, Narcissa said. Oh, you see no reason for guilt or remorse? Hermione asked. Your son may not have killed anyone, Narcissa flinched, but he has caused enormous pain and suffering and has insulted and persecuted me and my friends for years. She met Narcissa's gaze unwaveringly. Words have power as well, you know, Lady Malfoy, since you are so quick to describe my actions as deplorable and ignorant. My son is a gentleman, and you? Oh, is he now? Multiple times in my dealings with Malfoy this term, I have had to draw my wand, Hermione grinned suddenly. And trust me, when I tell you, you do not want to know the circumstances. Her implication was clear, and the blood drained from Narcissa's face but she was made of stern stuff. Obviously, the two of you have a complicated relationship. Hermione snorted at that, earning a slight glare from her companion that was much like Malfoy's. But surely you understand that the Gloriana set is part of the Malfoy legacy and belongs with our family. Narcissa's voice was cool again. She obviously felt on firm ground here. I must insist on the jewelry's return to us this very day. Hermione poured herself another cup of tea and leaned back in her armchair, just sipping and watching the rain spatter against the window. She needed time to consider, and like her son, Narcissa seemed inclined to let her have it. The tea shop server, seeing a temporary cessation in hostilities, took the opportunity to whisk away the uneaten scones and bring more sugar cubes and milk before running for his life. The interruption gave Hermione additional time to ponder, which she desperately needed. It was a tempting thought to simply pull the flat velvet box out of her bag and hand it over. Malfoy had obviously made a huge mistake giving her those jewels, and returning them would help rectify the error. Well, really, it wasn't her job to clean up Malfoy's messes any more than it was her job to pander to Theo's ego or instruct Ron on what to do with his life. They were all grown men, after all, even when it didn't act like it. Hermione added another dollop of milk to her tea and stirred it absently. But perhaps she should take the high road here if Mava was too pig-headed to do so. Perhaps it was the right thing to give back this Gloriana said. It wasn't like she would ever wear it again. She opened her mouth to say the words, Certainly, I will return a jewelry, Lady Malfoy. Nessa looked confident enough, sipping her own tea with a faintly smug air. Maddy could practically read her thoughts. Narcissa had presented her case with an unsaleable logic. Surely even a commoner like Hermione Granger had the wit to see the only appropriate choice. Come, young lady, show a little class for mudblood. Don't try to ape your betters. Why do you think he gave me those diamonds, Lady Malfoy? Hermione asked, tilting her head slightly. Narcissa froze in the act of drinking, her blue eyes sharp over the teacup's gilt rim. I don't pretend to know him well. He's your son, after all, Hermione went on. Why would a pure blood noble, steeped in your traditional Malfoy customs, do something so unconventional? Narcissa's expression was poisonous. Apparently, your company has caused him to temporarily forget his duty to his family, his betrothed, and to himself. Hermione Granger, seductress, she said, chuckling. Another headline for the Daily Prophet. She leaned forward and set down her own cup. She made her decision, and she was done with playing games. 
She had a three-foot charms essay to write and a certain blonde Slytherin to yell at, and it was time to end this and head back to the castle. She sat up straight and clasped her hands before her on the table. Here's the thing, Lady Malfoy, Hermione said in her best lecturing tone. Despite your efforts to infantilize him, Draco Malfoy is not some wayward heir. When Lucius Malfoy was deservedly sentenced to life in Azkaban, his right to hold property and legally controlled assets were revoked. Draco Malfoy is of age and now the head of your family. He holds the Malfoy ring. Narcissa looked too incensed to speak. Clearly she didn't enjoy being instructed on family inheritance laws by a muggle-born slip of a girl. She even gave another small wince at Hermione's mention of the ring. Perhaps she knew why her son refused to wear it. Hermione rolled on, holding up fingers to emphasize her points. Draco Malfoy didn't steal those jewels from the family vaults. Hermione continued in her best note tone. He owns those jewels. They are his to do with as he pleases. Perhaps he didn't bother to consider the ramifications. Perhaps it was a reckless thing to do. But he was fully within his rights to ask you to bring those jewels to him, and fully within his rights to give them to me, for whatever reason. Narcissa's eyes were burning slits. Within his rights, she choked. Draco is betrothed to Miss Greengrass. Is he now? Hermione asked. A certain idea simmering in the back of her mind since her visit to Bargain and Burks now blazed forth. I've made it my business to learn about those jewels from an independent source. I understand that this Gloriana said has traditionally been what's called an interest gift in the Malfoy family. Once presented to a witch and accepted, these jewels are bound to the given recipient. That is correct, isn't it? Narcissa gathered herself and gave a reluctant nod. Hermione smiled. Now, Lady Malfoy, would such a powerful magical set of jewellery allow itself to be bound to me if he was betrothed to another? She raised her eyebrows. Hmm? Tell her which stared at Hermione so long that she became nervous. Was Narcissa going to have a stroke? How could she explain that to Malfoy? No, Narcissa said decidedly. It can't be true. You can't be bound to the set. Oh, yes, I can, Hermione said, a glint in her eyes. I thought there was something strange about those jewels. Other men have touched them and come away with cuts and scratches. But not Draco. Hermione drew his name out, much like Astoria did, and Narcissa's blue eyes flashed with anger. So you are determined to marry Draco, then? She bit out. This business with young Theodore is just a ruse. Merlin, no, Hermione said. I have no plans to marry your son. We'd probably kill each other within a month. I've no plans to marry Theo, either. Muggers typically marry much later than witches and wizards. She returned to her earlier pedantic tone. I'm simply saying that your son was completely free to give this jewellery to somebody besides Astoria. Completely free? Those words seemed to echo in the air. If nothing else, Hermione's visit to Borgen's shop had proved Ginny correct. Malfoy and Astoria were not betrothed. The thought swept through Hermione's mind like a fresh breeze gusting through suddenly open windows. She stood almost knocking her teacup off the table. She couldn't sit here anymore. She had to move, run, jump, something. I'm not giving you the Gloriana set, Lady Malfoy. Draco wouldn't like it. She sat smiling down at the astounded witch. If he personally asks me to return the jewels to him, then, of course, I will comply. Until then, I consider the diamonds merely a thoughtful birthday gift. Thank you for the tea. I really think your husband will enjoy the Elder Fulbox book. Hermione managed to walk out of the tea shop without hurrying, accepting her cloak from the hostess and clutching her beaded bag to her chest. Once outside the shop, she immediately twirled on one foot and apparated to Hogsmeade. She couldn't get away fast enough. Not that she was scared or anything. She just had a transfiguration, as they do, in ten days with only a first draft finished. Once in Hogsmeade, she wrapped her sun cloak around her and followed the passageway to Hogwarts, wishing for nothing more than a warm bath and a shot of fire whiskey. Maybe two shots. Merlin Malfoy, she thought as she trudged. Why didn't you just give me a book pin? One thing was for sure. Never again would Hermione complain that a birthday gift was too impersonal. Chapter 31 Shifting Sands I solemnly swear I'm up to no good. Hermione sat, tapping the marauder's map with her wand. She stood in the middle of her bedroom, 
her black robe slung over her desk chair, that damned Gloriana sat sitting on her bed. It was a free afternoon, since there was no defense against the dark arts on Mondays, and the perfect time to talk to Malfoy. For Hermione's mind was made up. She would return the diamonds to him personally. Malfoy's dot was in Stockholm's office, where he was likely marking potion assignments so the professor could dance off to some ministry reception or ribbon-cutting. Honestly, it seemed like the Southern had just taught potions in his spare time. Hermione pushed a flat velvet box into her beaded bag, which she stuck into her uniform skirt pocket. Her wand and the map she tucked into her other pocket. She took a moment to straighten her jumper and try to smooth her hair before heading down to the sixth floor. She didn't fear running into Theo. He was at a charm study group this afternoon. He and Malfoy had spent all day Sunday together serving detention in Bluebell's Meadow. Theo had arrived at the library afterwards, tight-lipped and a little shaken, refusing to provide details. He had recovered well enough by Monday, but Malfoy was colder and more distant to everyone than before. Hermione ducked into a dark alcove just past the trophy room, lightening the map with her wand. Malfoy was still there and still alone. He must be pretty thick with slug on these days to gain access to the professor's precious office. Her pounding heart sounded loud in a tiny space. Don't be a coward, she told herself. Just give him the diamonds, thank him, and go. He might not be engaged to Astoria, but purity will always conquer. Money refused to be a part of Malfoy's little rebellion against his family. He would just have to put the Gloriana set away for his grandson, or Godric willing, great-grandson. And she realized she was clutching her magical purse to her chest, the pink beaded back feeling suddenly heavy. You can't keep them, she told herself silently, hating the tears pushing behind her eyes. You're being greedy and selfish. Maybe she should talk to Ginny, but no. She knew what Ginny would say. She'd hear family diamonds and go spare. She'd have Hermione and Malfoy practically married in no time. Hermione snorted at the very idea. Sure, and then they'd go live with Narcissa in Malfoy Manor, and Hermione would sit in the drawing room where she was fucking tortured and knit scarves for Lucius while Draco went around removing all the state's muggle-killing traps and curses so her parents could visit. You can't have them, you idiot. You can't have... him. She took a deep breath. You can do this. And left Yakov, only for a young Southern boy, scroll in hand to reach the office door first. Excuse me? He said to the portrait hanging beside it. Oh, I need to. Nasty little slunk! shrieked an old woman's voice. Trying to sneak in with an avidy essay. Slunk, I should chop you up. Yes, you would make a tasty addition to a liquor death potion sliced fine with a pinch of salt. The boy squeaked and fled in terror, and Hermione quailed slightly. Sarkon's portrait, she knew was the famously ill-named potion master's Galatea Mary thought. She thought of just waiting in the corridor for Malfoy to leave, but that seemed unworthy of a Gryffindor. Hermione strode up to the door. I... Attention! Mary thought wrapped out. Ah, oh, there's one split open, a chest pair for a carapace. The eater to a venomous tentacular, Hermione answered promptly. It will eat a chest puffer and spit out the carapace. Mary thought opened the office door with a snarl. Hermione entered, grateful that she'd made some kind of list. Darkon's office looked much more impressive when it wasn't packed with people, as it had been during his silly Christmas party in Hermione's sixth year. The large room was rich and opulent, all heavy brocade and dark polished wood. A single petal floated in a large glass bowl of water, and Hermione watched as the petal sank and turned into a silver fish. Two sofas flanked a stone fireplace covered by an elaborate brass screen. Malfoy was stretched out on one of the sofas in his socks, looking perfectly at home, his tie loosened, a stack of essays on the floor beside him. He held a piece of parchment with a broken seal in one hand and a drink in the other. "'What is it, Granger?' he asked, looking displeased to be interrupted. "'We need to talk.' No, we really don't, he said, eyes back on his letter. Hermione sat down on the sofa opposite him anyway, prepared to wait him out. 
She had planned to throw a giant fit. I'd been looking forward to it, actually. But Malfoy's face was aligned with worry despite his relaxed posture. She cast about for something else to look at. On a table behind Malfoy's sofa sat a large hourglass, its brass handles shaped like snakes, with green sand streaming swiftly into the lower bell. Hermione was intrigued. She'd read somewhere that the sand ran according to the quality of the conversation. If stimulating, the sand fell slowly, and vice versa. How did you know I was here? Malfoy asked, her, frowning at the parchment. That's a secret. Having me followed, Granger. No, nothing like that. Malfoy tossed the letter aside and plucked a scroll from the pile. I have work to do. He set down his drink and dipped his quill into a red ink pot floating beside him. Amani just waited, listening to the snapping fire and the scratching of Malfoy's quill. A brass-bound clock ticked softly. He watched him rapidly mock essays without spilling a drop of ink as the hourglass sand spurred downward. The fish in the glass bowl turned back into a petal and floated back to the water's surface. She felt like she was back in the Gryffindor common room at the end of that fateful party, except this time she was the one watching Malfoy. And she had the agenda. Perhaps she should pour her own drink. Slakon's liquor was likely top-notch, and swelled the ice, saying, I don't like this pattern, Malfoy. You doing and saying all these weird things that make me think you... Hermione shook her head. Focus. Time was passing, and Malfoy looked determined to ignore her all night. She cleared her throat. I had tea with your mother on Sunday, she said. That did it. Malfoy looked up, eyes wide, a red ink blood spreading like blood on the essay on his lap. I see. He cast aside a ruined essay and sat up a little higher on the sofa's large satin pillows. That would explain this letter I just received. The scroll with the broken seal floated off the sofa and over to her. Hermione used a bit of wondrous magic to flatten the parchment. She scanned the first few words, then looked over at him. Malfoy, I shouldn't be reading this. Read it, he commanded. His tone earned him a sharp look, but she complied. There was no salutation. The note read, I am dictating this missive to your mother, since my current residence does not allow ours. Be aware that I am sacrificing precious time with my wife to communicate with you instead. However, the intelligence she brings demands immediate action. When I entered this place, never to return to my ancestral home, my only comfort was that I was in possession of an heir prepared to take on the mantle of the Malfoy legacy. But as word of your recent activities reaches my ears, I wonder if perhaps the Dementor's kiss would not have been a kind of fate than being forced to watch as my only son disgraces the name he has the honour to bear. I speak of your abandonment of the most advantageous alliance and the surrender of family treasures cherished for generations into ignorant, ungrateful, and undeserving hands. I demand the immediate return of our property by any means necessary to Malfoy Manor. I look forward to your reply confirming that it has been accomplished. Only then will you again have the right to call me father. Hermione read the letter swiftly, but pretended to need more time to calm her breathing and consider the implications. She should have expected this. Hermione knew that Narcissa was visiting her husband the following day. But this cold, poisonous letter convinced Hermione that even after years of fighting Death Eaters, she understood nothing of Lucius Malfoy. He gave a tiny sigh, rolling up the scroll with a flick of her finger. Then she looked over at the recipient of these words. Well, he is a fine one to talk of disgracing the name of Malfoy, she said. You think this is funny, Granger? He asked, dropping his black stocking feet on the carpet and leaning forward. His face, hair and white uniform shirt shone golden in the light of Slughorn's lamps. I find it anything but funny. Hermione said calmly, floating letter back to him. How dare he defy your authority? Yes, exact. Defy my what? She huffed in exacerbation. You know, I try to be perfectly clear, but people, they just don't want to listen. What are you talking about? 
Hermione stood and looked down at him, hands on hips. I explained all this to your mother very carefully yesterday. I said, your son is not the heir. He is now head of the family. He owns the Malfoy treasures. They are his to do with as he pleases, to give them to whoever he pleases. Malfoy stared up at her like he'd never seen her before. You explained this to my mother? I didn't care for her tone. Hermione sniffed. Malfoy's jaw dropped. And by extension, she continued, although I did not admittedly spell this out, you are fully within your rights to enter in or out of any betrothal agreement unilaterally. A curve fell into her eyes and she impatiently pushed it back. I was there when Lucius was sentenced. I clearly remember the law as it was read, and your father is in no position to demand anything. She scowled. Neither is your mother. Merfa's eyes narrowed, and she stepped back as he also stood facing her, rising up and up. Godric, he was tall. The sun in the hourglass behind him, Hermione noticed, had slowed to a trickle. What did Mother say to you? he asked tensely. Hermione tilted her head up at him. She demanded that I return the diamonds, of course, and she's unhappy that you took the codex and probably the runestone from the manor. Anyways, she was willing to forgive my ignorant acceptance of the diamonds as long as I gave them back to her that very day. He winced at the word ignorant. Obviously you didn't return them, he said. No, I didn't, she answered softly, holding his gaze. I told her Draco wouldn't like it. You were right. Malfoy's voice was husky. I wouldn't like it at all. He stepped closer. You call me Draco. Oh, yes, she grinned. It drove your mother wild. Malfoy smirked. No wonder my parents went mental. Serves them right for questioning my judgment. Oh, they should certainly question your judgment, Hermione said. Your judgment is horrid. He blinked, startled. You gave me the Gloriana set, Hermione cried. What in the name of all that is unholy were you thinking? A priceless heirloom and you just toss it through my window. What did you expect to happen? Well, I didn't expect you to get it on the prophet's front page with Theo, Malfoy snapped. I could have done without that. Hermione sighed and fell on the sofa again. I know, I'm sorry, Malfoy. I apologize to your mother too. It was stupid of me, but Lavender... Uh, she gritted her teeth. Theo recognized it as a significant piece of jewelry and wondered about it and then Fleur. Who? Remembered a triwizard champion from Beaubaton, fourth year. Most definitely, Murphy said, eyes glinting. The Vila? Yes, Hermione said rather grumpily. Anyway, Theo and I met her and Bill Weasley at dinner. She recognized a diamond pin as goblin made, and that made me suspicious. So I went yesterday morning to Borgen and Bucks. The shop name drew Malfoy out of his trance. What? You went to Borgen and Bags? It wasn't the first time. You've been there before. Hermione looked down. Six year, she said in a small voice. Why were you there? he asked. She didn't answer. Hermione? He joined her on the sofa, frowning into her face. Why were you there in sixth year? I followed you. Malfoy's frown deepened. You followed me there? She shrugged. After you left, I went inside to find out what you were doing. I'll admit subtlety is not my strong suit. Morgan kicked me out right quick, but... Talk about horrid judgment. He could have heard you. If I'd seen you following me, I could have heard you. The money scoffed. Like I was afraid of you. Sweet mother of... And then you went back yesterday. How could you? I knew what I was doing, Amani said. I'm not a sixteen-year-old girl anymore. War heron, remember? Fully grown witch. You forced my hand, giving me such a significant set of jewellery. You weren't supposed to know. Murphy muttered, glancing away. Hello, uh, have we met, Hermione Granger? Of course I started getting suspicious, with my car suddenly tamed and friends getting all cut up. Sorry, I didn't realise that half the men in eighth year would be petting your hair. Murphy glared at her. So then you just danced into Borgen and Burks and slept the Gloriana set down on the counter? You're lucky Borgen didn't hex you and steal the jewels. Hermione scoffed again. No, <laughs> I look like an idiot. I wanted the room and kept my hand on my wand the whole time. Borgen can take them anyway because the bloody jewels are bound to us, which means only I can wear them and only you can touch them. She looked at him levelly, trying to ignore his closeness on the sofa. But you knew that. 
And it's like on Sparty, you prompted me to thank you. Then you touched the pin. You knew Malfoy men give out this jewellery as bloody interest gift. Again, what were you thinking? Borgen's going to spread this all over, Malfoy grumbled. Nonsense, I obliviated him, of course. Malfoy looked at her sternly, reminding her of Theo. Slytherin men were so bossy. You are not to go back to that shop, Hermione. I will go back any time I want, Hermione cried, jumping to her feet. I am not your betrothed, or your prior betrothed, or interest payment, or any other full pure-blooded pre-marriage classification. I don't care how many spell-addled hair accessories you throw my way. I will go where I want, when I want, and how I want. All right, now for your back, calm down. He took a deep breath, his hand on his knees. Just allow me to come with you when you go to Nocturnelli again. Of course I will, she said. The apothecary branch has some potion ingredients it would be very hard to get anywhere else. Malfoy stared up at her, not knowing what to do with this sudden capitulation. Then he leaned back on the sofa and shook his head, chuckling. What's so funny? Hermione demanded. You, he said, stretching an arm along the sofa back. Facing off mother? She demands the jewels, and not only do you not obey, but you instruct her. He tilted his head slightly, a silent invitation to join him, and Hermione found herself complying without thought, twisting on the sofa cushions to face him. The sand in the hourglass was practically dropping one grain at a time. Mafia was looking at her with hooded eyes, the firelight playing across his face. You defended me, Hermione, he said quietly. After everything that's happened, you still defended me. And you defended my gift. You should have jumped at a chance to get rid of Malfoy jewellery. Instead, you protected it. I will always defend your right to be an idiot, Hermione said. Even when you trick your mother into delivering family jewellery by implying it's for another witch, thereby prompting said witch to brag about your betrothal and all your little sex games. Malfoy's eyes widened in surprise, and Hermione flushed. Merlin, she had a big mouth. She turned to face forward, hands clasped on her lap. I know I'm not what you and you are used to, she said. I'm not as experienced. Her face was hot. She felt like Ginny telling Harry she'd shagged Blaze. At that moment, Hermione felt incredibly grateful that Ernie had interrupted her with Theo in that storage room. Maybe she should help him salvage that travesty of a Halloween fest. Look at me, Hermione. Nerfa commanded. Again, she complied without thought. His eyes were unusually gentle. You are enough for any wizard, he said. His mouth quirked slightly. Too much for most, I'd say. They were very close now, and she could feel the warmth of his arm against her shoulder. The faint scent of his cologne beckoned her. The ticking of the clock seemed very loud. Hermione blinked a few times, then looked away, and pulled a beaded back out of her pocket. Do it, do it now. Here, she said, tugging out the velvet box, holding the Gloriana set. Oh, I couldn't care less what your parents think, but this still belongs. No. Malfa leaped off the sofa and backed away, as if to put distance between himself and the jaws. I gave you the Gloriana set. It is yours. Hermione stood as well, holding out the box to him. This set is a family heirloom. Malfa rolled his eyes. Is it now? I had no idea. Draco, you have to take it back. Hermione was feeling a little panicked. She was trying to do the right thing here. She rushed forward, trying to shove the box into his hand, but Malfoy dodged her with seeker reflexes, grinning. This is the best you can do, he asked, circling Slughorn's desk. Take it back, she repeated. She backed him up against the carved stone pillar and slapped the box against his chest repeatedly. Merlin, you're violent, Malfoy said, grinning. Is that how you treat a priceless heirloom? What would mother say? She felt warm fingers brush back her curls. You might as well keep the diamonds, he said in her ear. It's not like anyone else can wear them. Hermione stilled, holding the velvet box against his chest and staring up at him. But I can't wear them either, she said gently. It wouldn't be right, not when. Then don't wear the set. His tone was careless as his hands left her hair and gently pushed the box back at her. Pass it on to your daughter. Give the set away to a museum. You're always going on about historic pieces being available to the masses. Whatever you decide, it's yours now. Now Hermione was backing away slowly, looking down at the box in her hands. 
Man, Draco, I... I still don't understand. Why did you give this to me? Something had to be done about your hair, he said. On such a rare price as... Will you stop going on about it? I gave it to you because I wanted to, all right? Malfoy was glaring now. When Stakon mentioned your birthday, and you were sitting there in potions with your hats, with your hair practically brushing the ceiling, and blood messages dripping all over the castle, the Gloriana said was the first thing I thought of. I knew its history, but I know its protections too. Hermione stared at him, unbelieving. I didn't care about its significance. Malfoy's voice was raised, fists clenched. I just wanted you to have it. He turned away, striding across the room to throw himself back on the sofa. Then he cleaned red ink off the blotted essay and resumed marking, legs stretched out on the cushions, ignoring her once more. The hourglass, which had stopped entirely, once again poured down its sand. Hermione just stood there by the pillow, clutching the box to her pounding heart. How could he do such a thing? How could any Malfoy do such a thing? What of Sanctimonia Vincent Semper? Pure, flawless diamonds passed for centuries down a pure, flawless line, only to end up in the crowded pocket of a muggle-born daughter of dentists? Hermione was suddenly humbled by the gift, no matter how reckless it may have been. She tucked the box back into her beaded bag and walked over to stand before him. Malfoy looked up at her warily, quill in hand. All right, then, Lord Malfoy, she said. Thank you. I'm honoured to accept it. She bent down and kissed him lightly on the cheek, then quietly left the office. Hermione skipped dinner that night and went to bed early with her textbook, but she didn't study. She just lay in bed, fingering the letters carved by Bellatrix into her arm. The cold, implacable tone of Lucius' letter still made her tremble. It basically ordered Draco to hurt her or worse, if necessary, to get the diamonds back. What must it have been like to have such a man as a father? It was a wonder his son was sane at all. She found she couldn't even attempt to sleep without getting the Gloriana set out of her trunk and putting it under her pillow, warding her window and bed with every spell she remembered from the Horcrux hunt. Anyone entering the bedroom wouldn't be able to even see the bed. By any means necessary. She shivered. The room was very dark now. Jenny had come in and gone to sleep immediately. She was exhausted, her mind knew, worn out from her studies and quidditch captain duty. Her relations with Blaze were strained again. Something had happened, but Jenny wouldn't tell her what. Money hadn't pressed it. It wasn't like Jenny knew every in and out of her and Malfoy's relations. Hermione lay on her back, listening to her breathing, for how long she didn't know. Didn't know. But the moon had risen and she pulled open her bed hangings a bit to let in the light. Moonlight glittered on the hairpin in her hand. When had she taken it out of its box? She settled under her covers again and lifted up the pin, admiring the diamonds. She hoped she was just lonely and the damn thing wasn't casting a spell on her. Closing her eyes, she lay on her side, the pin clutched against her chest. At least she and Malfoy might be speaking again. A little bit that husky tone. You are enough for any wizard. And that phrase had joined, I'll kiss you if you tell me, and it must be on your person, echoing in her mind, slipping in when she was tired or tipsy, when her defences were down. You are enough for any wizard. His mouth quacked slightly. Too much for most, I'd say. She licks her lips. Too much for you. His hand side under her cast to the back of her neck. Never. He whispers into her mouth, his other hand sliding up her thigh. I want all of it. I want everything. Hermione sat up and opened her palm. Her hand had clutched the pin so tightly that the jewels had dug into her skin. She was panting and her other hand was inside her knickers. She had to stop this. Malfoy was dangerous for all kinds of reasons. She shook her head almost violently then pulled out her hand. It was slick with need. This has to stop. She dropped the pin and grabbed her wand, targeting her hand before replacing the pin carefully in its box and tucking it under her pillow. Then she led her thoughts to Theo, their broad body and slow smile. She closed her eyes, but her speculative fantasies 
kept drifting from soft, hairy skin to supple, muscled smoothness. Finally, in desperation, she dropped them both and fell asleep to dreams of an angst-ridden American actor with dark hair and eyes. He didn't play the hero of the story, though. He was the villain. A villain searching for redemption. Hermione went down early for breakfast and was leaning against the wall outside ancient ruins the next morning, working on her pawn when Malfoy stepped up with a scroll in his end. Another one? Hermione asked, raising her eyebrows. Next, he'll have your mother send a howler. This was my reply, he said, holding it out. He looked fully in command except for a little tightness around the eyes. Oh, I thought you'd like to see a copy. She flattened out a scroll and read, Dear Sir, I regret to say that I'm unable to accede to your request. The object in question is in the possession of an individual more than worthy of receiving it, and I will not accept its return. Two more objects remain in my personal possession to use as I see fit. As for disgracing my name, I clearly remember a day at Flourish and Blots in my second year when Arthur Weasley said to you, We have very different ideas of what disgraces the name of a wizard. His words proved prophetic, I think, and undoubtedly there will be many times in the future where you and I disagree on how to best honour the Malfoy legacy. Sincerely, Lord Draco Malfoy. Again, Hermione pretended to read more slowly, allowing her to marshal her emotions. She rolled up the scroll by hand, blinking back a thin film of tears. Well, aren't you a big deal? She said, smiling up at him. Don't start blubbering, he said, his mouth curving upward as well. It's just a letter. I remember that day, Hermione said, recalling her parents' wariness of the strange, sneering wizard, shrouded in dark power, cane in hand, pale hair streaming around the shoulders of his rich cloak. I was outraged on my father's behalf, of course, at the time, Malfoy said, but I remembered Weasley's words. She held out a scroll to him, and he took it, his warm fingers brushing over hers, like their first time standing together outside ancient rooms. Malfoy leaned forward slightly. I mean it, Hermione. You are more than worthy, he whispered. There is nothing too good. Hermione stared up at him, uncertain what to say, but just then McGonagall came sailing down the corridor with the rest of the class. Malfoy stepped back and the students eyed them nervously. Are they going to fight again? She heard someone whisper loudly. After class backed off. Not today, Malfoy said, stepping aside to let Hermione enter the classroom first. She smiled at him again and walked through the door, ignoring the goggling students. Sitting at her desk, she fuzzily arranged her parchment, quills and ink pots all the while trying to put a name to the swelling, soaring feeling in her chest. As the rest of the class settled and McGonagall began the day's lessons, at this rate they'd never reach the elder fool box, he finally identified the emotion. He'd felt it for Harry, for Ron, for Ginny, and certainly for Neville. And now for Malfoy and herself. It was pride. Chapter 32 Moaning Myrtle Hermione's pride faded a bit when she entered her next patient's class on Wednesday and saw Lavender absent yet again. Her former roommate was staying away, and Hermione had a dark suspicion why. She lingered in the patient's supply closet to check the marauder's map, blocking the door shut so nobody could see. Since nearly all the students were in class, Lavender's dot was easy to find in Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. Hermione sighed. Nobody went into Myrtle's bathroom to celebrate the good things in life. Levena was likely crying in there, too scared to go to potions. Hermione returned to the table and flung down the ingredients. You'll have to brew this confusion concoction alone, she told Malfoy with a slight glare. I have a mess to clean up. He looked at her quizzically, but she just shook her head and walked off to wheedle a pass out of Slughorn. Pass obtained, she wove through the corridors towards Myrtle's bathroom. Levena owed her big. Hermione had to agree to another dog and pony show on Saturday night before Stockholm would write the pass. Godric forbid a Slytherin just did something without a favour in return. She could hear the sound of wild, uncontrolled tears as she approached a bathroom door. Hermione was no stranger to crying in a bathroom herself, over Harry, over Ron, over other students' insults. She'd cried many a time over Malfoy's words too. Boys were wretched beings, every one of them. Levena was sitting curled up on the stone tower floor, 
Myrtle's ghost floating before her, the bathroom half flooded as usual. Neither noticed Hermione's entrance. And between her legs, Lavender was singing. What else did you say? Myrtle asked, her voice filled with excitement. Oh, he said it was hot, and then he likes it rough. He's saying naughty. Do you think he likes it rough? Oh, yes, he probably wouldn't be romantic. He'd just push you against the wall. Merlin? Hermione had to stop this conversation before she threw up all over the bathroom. Hello, Lavender, she said loudly, stepping further inside. You! Myrtle's face convulsed with rage. Hermione wasn't her favourite person anyway, and now she'd interrupted what was probably the ghost's most titillating conversation ever. Get out of my bathroom, Kitty! Hermione ignored her and knelt before Lavender. She could see the deep scars on the young woman's legs and felt a twinge of guilt. Lavender, she said again. Lavender looked up and her face was streaked with black makeup lines. Come to finish me off, have you? She snapped. No, Hermione said, settling back on her heels. You weren't at patience again. Oh, I tried, Lavender said. Oh, I just couldn't. Fine, Myrtle shouted. Ignore me. Everyone wants to talk to Myrtle until somebody living comes along and it's back to the toilet. She started sobbing. I'll never get to have that blonde. Don't say it, Lavender and Hermione shrieked together. Fine, the girl shouted again. Be that way. She flounced off and they could hear her sobbing in the toilet in the last stall. That was close, Hermione said. Lavender smiled a tiny smile, which grew into a snicker, and soon they were both giggling. Every time they managed to stop, Myrtle would give a loud moan and set them off again. Lavender, Hermione said when it finally calmed down. Please tell me, she tried to keep her voice gentle. Why did you do it? Why did you say you shagged Malfoy? Her former roommate sniffled. Because you're so mean. Hermione's jaw dropped. Because I'm what? Lavender pouted. You're mean. You're very mean to Draco and Theo, too, and which is terrible because they're so handsome and charming, and they like you anyway. You're always snapping at Draco and telling him to fuck himself when I'm sure he doesn't deserve it, and you keep making not study. Lavender's face turned increasingly red as she continued to list Hermione's sins against the Slytherins, and Hermione couldn't even stop her. She was so astonished. Let me get this straight, Hermione finally choked out. You think I'm mean to Draco Malfoy? She didn't address Lavender's words about Theo. She probably was a little mean to him. And Malfoy doesn't deserve it? Lavender looked at her resentfully. Draco's nice to you, only to you, and you just don't care. And there you were that Saturday night getting ready for your fancy date with not an acting all. She flapped her hands. Superior? You told this story because I was acting superior. Hermione repeated. Lavender nodded. Of course I was acting superior. You were lying on your bed in your underwear and insulting me in disgusting ways, Hermione said. It wasn't a high bar. Lavender glared. And now you're doing it again. You're crying in a flooded bathroom because you lied about shagging a wizard. Again, not a big hurdle to clear. And these men don't choke people or hurt people or scare people. Levina snapped. I don't know why you came off acting like you know what the hell you're doing. You treated Ron like shit, and now you're treating Draco like shit, and not like shit. They might think your little is perfect, but we know better. And Martin looked down at her hands. You're right. And watching you swan around like, um, what? You're right. Hermione handed her tissue, which Levina looked at curiously before dabbing her cheeks. I'm sorry, I scared you in our room. Hermione said. I didn't mean to break that window, honest, she sighed. Ever since the war, I've been having trouble with self-control. I keep breaking windows in her body, too. Lavender sniffled. I heard about a story at Greengrass. Yes, that wasn't great either, Hermione admitted. She probably deserved it, Lavender said. Oh, she definitely deserved it. Hermione sat down on the cold tire next to Lavender, who eyed her nervously. Lavender, you're right, she repeated. I don't know what I'm doing, and these Slytherins are driving me crazy. She sighed. I'm not shagging Malfoy. I'm not shagging Theo either. Merlin, I just came back to school to take my nudes. You are such a swat, Lavender said with a reluctant smile. Only you would find a group like Pawn. You have Pawn? Myrtle popped out of her stall and looked at them hopefully. I've heard of Pawn. Oh, Merlin, 
lavender groaned, and the two women collapsed into giggles again. Myrtle, offended, returned to the toilet. She has a terrible crush on Draco, lavender said. She says his eyes shine so pretty when he cries. Okay, Hermione said, desperately trying to get back to her purpose for being here. Look, Lev, you've got to come back to patience. You can't let all this drama compromise your education. Lavender's face, which had gained some colour during their giggling fit, went pale again. I... I can't. Hermione touched her arm. Lavender, tell me, is it Malfoy? Did he say something to you? Do something? He... he came up to me Monday after breakfast, pulled me into an alcove. Did he want to snog you? asked the voice. That's what I thought at first. I was like, finally, but... Did he touch you? Just my arm, firmly, but gender, you know, like I think he'd... Myrtle! Hermione shouted. Oh, this was going to be excruciating. Lavender, let's stay focused here, okay? What did Malfoy do then? Lavender looked down. He was so angry. It was scary. He asked me if I'd been spreading that lie around, and I said, no, I just told you, and I said, you shut at that window, and his face... What about his face? Hermione asked before she could stop herself. Uh, just... Crumpled? Lavender shook her head. Well, then he was really mad. I I thought he was going to hurt me. They like the hurt. Is that what you mean by rough? Maybe a little, but I really like myrtle. Hermione shrieked again, red-faced. The ghost had snuck up on them again, eager for more. Myrtle stuck her tongue out at them and swelled away. Lavender, what else did Malfoy say? Lavender started to cry again. He said he'd never be desperate enough to fuck me, and if I have ever bothered you again, he'd also shed a window, and, and... Go on, Lavender, Hermione said softly, and slit my throat with the shards. Lavender sobbed. Oh, Draco. Hermione stood closer and put her arms around the crying girl. I'm sorry, Lavender. It was a terrible thing for him to say. You didn't deserve that. He said he'd call me. She hiccuped. I know, but he would never do that. How do you know he wouldn't? Lavender whispered. He's Draco Malfoy. He's a death eater. I just know. Lavender sniffled. Easy for you to say. He's trying to change. He's just really bad at it sometimes, Hermione said. She let Lavender and backed up a bit so she could see her face. Levina didn't look convinced, and Hermione sighed. She'd never had anything so unhealthy. Malfoy was a deadly death eater, but he was handsome with pretty eyes, so Hermione shouldn't be mean to him. The war had truly fucked up everybody. Look, Levina, she said with decision, you'll still have to come to patience. I won't let anything happen to you. Levina shook her head violently, her dark blonde hair covering her face. I can't go sit with him. Hermione bit her lip. This wouldn't be easy to fix. She took a moment to consider the situation, listening to the gurgle of water and Myrtle's faint moaning. Levina, listen, she finally said. Malfoy feels terrible about his behavior. Levina blew her nose. Really? He asks about you every day in potion. He's, ah, uh, terribly upset, Hermione said, lying with impunity. She'd paint Malfoy crying into his pillow every night if it would help. He is? He is devastated, haven't you noticed? Levina shook his head. He was smiling at breakfast today. Yes, but he was crying inside, Hermione said. He is so desperate to apologize, but he is afraid you won't talk to him. Desperate? Levina's eyes were shining. Yes, desperate. Hermione tried not to roll her own eyes. If Malfoy tries to talk to you again, will you listen? I don't know, Levina pouted. He was very mean to me. I know. Hermione said, loathing herself. Do you think you can forgive him? Maybe, Lavender said. He is very handsome. Hermione's mouth fell open. Lavender pulled herself to her feet and staggered to a nearby sink. Merlin, she cried, looking into the mirror. I can't leave looking like this. Hermione fidgeted while Lavender primped, keeping a weather eye out for Myrtle. Finally, Lavender pronounced herself fit to be seen, and Hermione dragged her out of the bathroom and shooed her over to Gryffindor Tower. Now, Lavender, don't tell anyone about this, she instructed. Malfoy will be quite angry if you spread around that he wants to apologize. Give him a chance to earn your forgiveness. Lavender nodded a beatific smile on her face. And don't approach him, Hermione added. 
You can't have Levener pestering the man. He is the one in the wrong. And let him come to you, all right? Levener nodded again. She had some fantasy going on now behind her eyes that her mind did not want to know about. The whole thing was making her ill. She'd never felt so Slytherin, and she was not happy about having to clean up Malfoy's mess. Well, she wasn't doing it for him. She was doing it for Lavender, who had deserved better at his hands, even if she did lie like a cheap... Well, enough to say she deserved better. He gave Lavender a final reassuring pat on the shoulder and set her to the common room to relax until lunch. Marnie herself touched tiredly back to the potions dungeon. It was barely 10.30 a.m. and she was already exhausted. Harry always said she sacrificed herself too much for other people. When Hermione returned to the patients, all the cauldrons had vanished and the tables had divided again. Students were sitting in pairs, side by side, pretending to be writing, but mostly chatting while Stockholm slept in an armchair. She hopped onto her stool besides Malfoy, who was doodling dragons on his parchment. "'What happened?' she asked. Malfoy shrugged. "'Everyone's finished their patience, so Slughorn's having us work on our lace-wing essay. "'The one due next week. That's the one.' Malfoy tapped his parchment with his wand, making the dragon's wings flap, and little inky fire burst out of their jaws. Hermione glanced around to make sure nobody was listening, then turned toward him on her stool. "'This is good, because I want to talk to you.' Malfoy immediately put down his quill and turned to face her, their knees touching. Oh, "'I like this seating arrangement,' he purred. "'Cozy.' He'd become increasingly friendly since their chat outside ancient ruins, something Hermione had not anticipated. He was finding this new, darkly flirtatious Malfoy quite unsettling. "'It's important,' she said primly. Oh, "'I'm listening.' Malfoy stretched one arm along the table, so that his hand touched the sleeve of her jumper. Their knees were still touching. "'It's about Lavender,' she said. Malfoy frowned and withdrew his end. "'Let's talk about something else. Anything else. Let's talk about lacewing or porn.' Hermione opened her mouth, but he went on. "'Fine. Pupil organization for reviewing nudes.' He leaned closer, eyes bright. "'I know. Let's talk about the weasel. How does he like being a shopkeeper? So nice to see someone accepting their limitations.' Ye are foul, Hermione said. Ron is happy with his family, and we need to talk about Lavender. She hasn't been to patience this week, and this is unacceptable. She told me what you said. You have to apologize. Malfoy straightened, and his face hardened. I am not speaking to that lying slag. That's enough, Hermione hissed. Other students looked over at their table, and she lowered her voice. You threatened her. His face hardened further. Oh, I certainly did. She lied to you about. I know what she did. I was there, remember? She leaned closer. There has been bad blood between Levin and me for years because of Ron, and she lied about him, too. Hermione glanced around. Half the class was watching them now, including Theo, far away at his back table. Slytherin partners sat pouting at the lack of attention. Never mind, she continued. That was still horrible, what you did, threatening her like that. She's afraid of you now, afraid to come to class. She's going to fail patience if she keeps staying away. Malfoy chuckled and straightened, turning toward the table again and picking up his quill. If she's fool enough to allow us to scare her away from class, I bet potion marks are on her, he said. His voice a perfect imitation of Lucius at his most snifty. He drew a long, curling line, the beginning of another dragon. She's not being a fool, Hermione said. I mean, she's always been kind of a fool, but it's more than that, she sighed. Malfoy, look at me, please. Draco. Put down his quill and turned to face her again, bumping his knee against hers. Mmm, I like it when you back for my attention, Hermione. Hermione ignored this. She has every right to be afraid, she said quietly. She was attacked by Fenrir at the Battle of Hogwarts. She almost died. She still bears the scars, and you threaten her. Threaten her with cutting? Malfoy was silent a touch of pain in his eyes. The sound of students chattering of quills scratching on paper, dark on snores from the front of the room, all seemed to recede. There were only the two of them looking into each other's faces. A brass bell hanging in the corner began to ring, signalling the end of class. Malfoy and Hermione both stood, and he put his hand on her wrist. All right, he said. I'll talk to Brown. I'll apologize. His eyes held hers. I went too far, I know, I just can't bear. 
I apologised to her too, Hermione said. I completely overreacted. Even if her story was true, I had no right to be so angry. Malfoy stepped closer, his warm finger sliding down from her wrist to intertwine with hers. Well, that's the thing, Hermione, he murmured in her ear, which was exposed by the white, black headband holding back her cause. I want you to have the right to be angry. His lips brushed her ear lightly, then he released her and walked away, leaving Hermione red-faced, wondering if Jacob Malfoy had just said what she thought he'd said. Chapter 33 Flying High I want you to have the right to be angry. Hermione spent the rest of Wednesday not thinking about that statement. She didn't think about it in arithmancy or during lunch or in herbology. She didn't. Pouring that night was a disaster. Malfoy made proper concentration almost impossible since he insisted on standing against the back wall and, well, looking at her. Hermione could hardly hold her wand properly, what with, oh, I want you to have the right to be angry not playing in a continuous loop in her head. Why did Malfoy say that? What did he mean? Why wouldn't he explain himself? And what was the expression he was wearing now? It wasn't sneering or haughty or flirty or even amused. He almost looked content, just stood there watching Hermione make paper origami shapes, float or expand or change color, and when she glanced at him, he just nod encouragingly. What the hell was that? After pawn, she stomped back to the Gryffindor Tower, found Jenny in the common room, and dragged her upstairs. Jenny sat on their small sofa as Hermione stood before her, practically acting out her morning conversation with Lavender. A description of morning Myrtle had Jenny laughing so hard that Hermione had to threaten to leave before she would calm down. Can you believe that? Hermione shrieked when she'd finished describing the scene in the bathroom. Can you believe that? <laughs> Which part? Ginny asked. It all sounds unbelievable. I think I'll visit Myrtle myself, give her a little thrill. Blaze does this thing where... You're disgusting, said Hermione, hands on hips. I'm talking about where Lavender lied. She lied because I'm mean to Draco Malfoy. Who does that? Who even thinks that? Well, you do yell at him and hex him quite often. Ginny said, sitting back so Crookshanks could jump on her lap. But don't worry, I think he likes it, she winked. I bet he remembers your punch during third year quite fondly. Talk to Luna, she's into all kinds of kinky things like that. She says the... You're mad, Hermione said. Stark, raving, mad. But it's not the worst of it. I go back to patience and... She described her and Malfoy's conversation. And then he says, I want you to have the right to be angry. Her roommate's eyes widened. He said what? Hermione repeated the statement. What does that even mean? Ginny tilted her head slightly, considering. Oh, I don't know, she said finally. You don't know. Everything else, you have a hundred opinions. But on this, you don't know? Ginny pushed Crookshanks off her lap and grabbed her rope and toiletries bag. I wouldn't care to speculate. What? Hermione was ready to bust out the windows again. You love to speculate. You spend hours speculating about the stupidest things. Please, Ginny. Hermione followed her friend through the door. I need you to speculate. I simply can't extrapolate from that sentence without additional data. Ginny, however, would not be moved. Her attitude, which had only been strengthened by nearly two months of dating Blaise Sabini, was that Slytherin simply could not be passed out. Hermione, she stated, would have to Gryffindor up and ask Malfoy directly what he meant. Just be careful, Jenny said, winding her hair into a clip in preparation for a shower. Don't ask a question unless you're prepared to hear the answer. Theo was waiting by the portrait when Hermione left the Gryffindor common room Thursday morning, asking if he could join her table for breakfast. Hermione accepted immediately. It's nice to see a cheerful face in the morning, she said, sitting opposite him in the great hall. There was only a smattering of students at the table this early, either bright-eyed early risers or desperate students working on last-minute assignments. How early do you wake up? he asked. About six o'clock, she said. It gives me a chance to work on my loop. Loop is that you're knitting. My life optimization organization plan. Hermione poured herself some chocolate. I list five things I look forward to every day. 
review best practices, and write about my life goals. What are your life's goals, if you don't mind sharing? He asked with every air of interest. So refreshing. Certainly superior to past deep discussions with Malfoy. Marnie smiled back at him. At the moment, my goals are to finish my education and determine my career path. I have a rubric. Oh, Godric, is she talking about Lube? Jenny asked, crashing heavily into a seat beside Hermione. Quick, Theo, distract her. Willingly, Theo said, leaning over the table and giving her a light kiss, much like the one at the spangled veil. Hermione couldn't help glancing at Malfoy, who was passing on his way to the Slytherin table. She expected a scowl, but that smug look of his didn't waver. She narrowed her eyes at him, and he winked back. Git? Anyway, Hermione continued briskly, Professor Sinastra is advising me on ministry applications. He looked over at the head table. I don't see her this morning. I hear she's leaving Hogwarts, Jenny said. Theo shook his head. No, she didn't get that ministry job after all. He smirked at Hermione. You might need a new advisor. You're spooky, Theo, Jenny said. I bet you knew that before she did. Who says she knows yet? Theo asked, raising his goblet of pumpkin juice with a graceful hand. Knowledge is power, little Gryffindor. But up a chair and be instructed. Is he always this arrogant? Dean Thomas asked Hermione. He's a Slytherin, Hermione said, shrugging. I agree that knowledge is power, but I don't see the value in knowing who's fighting with his parents or flunking her bology. You'll find that you'll need such knowledge to advance in the adult world, Theo said. Hermione finished her chocolate and poured a cup of tea. I'd rather advance my own merits. I'll leave you to play politics. You bring the cleverness, I'll bring the connections, Theo said, tipping the goblet slightly towards her. Together, we'd make a great team. Jenny dropped her fork, opened mouth. You talk a lot of nonsense, Hermione said, trying to keep her tone light. I have to get to ancient rooms. Theo stood as she left the table, giving the still-seated Gryffindor men a slightly contemptuous glance. But he made no move to walk Hermione to class, just resumed his seat and started talking to Ginny. Hermione left the great hall, pleased that Theo, anyway, saw the benefits of inter-house unity. She could feel Malfoy's eyes watching her as she entered ancient ruins, but he made no effort to approach her. There was no potions class on Thursday, and Hermione spent her morning free period alone in the potions lab. The blood potion was developing well with an appropriate, if rather disgusting, film spreading on the surface. A week, perhaps, maybe less. She considered adding some dewberries to hasten the congealing action, but deemed it too risky. After lunch, she arrived at Dada to find a note on the door instructing the advanced students to head to the grounds and help prepare for the Halloween festival the following night. Hermione shifted her too heavy bag and stumped back down the stairs, grumbling under her breath. It didn't seem right to forage your educational opportunities just because Ernie couldn't manage his prefects. The skies had cleared again, and a rare October sun had dried out a broad, grassy area between the castles and the school's entrance gates. Hermione joined a small clump of Dada students just outside the castle. A harried-looking Ernie was directing prefects on raising a giant tent in the space. Jenny volunteered to take over the task, and the head boy had the rest of the class assemble tables and place them on previously marked locations on the grass. Bluebell took Theo and Luna to pick up pumpkins from Hagrid's garden, and Hermione was assembling a table with her wand when she saw Malfoy approach Lavender, who was staring, baffled, at her pile of table parts. Malfoy was obviously set to apologize, and while Hermione couldn't hear what the two were saying, their expression and body language were eloquent. Malfoy, I'm sorry for going all death eater on you, Brown, because you lied to Granger for patently ridiculous reasons. Lavender, oh, Draco, I accept your apology. You can say anything you like because you're handsome. Malfoy, I've already adequately apologized, but because I'm Draco Malfoy, I have to overdo everything. So I'm going to continue apologizing in a ridiculous, suave voice. Lavender. Hey, Draco, you can say whatever you want. Your lips do such cute things when you're threatening to kill me. Malfoy. All right, then. You seem entirely too happy about this, so I'm going to back away slowly. Lavender reaching out to grasp her sleeve. Oh, it's too late, Draco, darling. I'm completely mesmerized again, and I'll stop at nothing to prove my devotion. 
Why are you going to come back? At this point, Hermione was overcome with giggles. She did not cackle dementedly, no matter what Ginny had said at the party, to the detriment of her half-assembled table, which now had a leg sticking out the top. She glanced up to see Malfoy standing before her, looking a little drained. Don't tell me you heard all that, he said, waving a hand back at Lavender, who watched them closely, likely on the lookout for signs of meanness. Like Hermione, he'd shed his robes and jumper and loosened his tie to soak in the rare sunshine. I didn't need to, Hermione answered amused. You're obviously forgiven. Malfoy looked over at Lavender, who beamed and waved at him. I hope I don't live to regret this day's work, he said. Ernie strode by, still barking orders. All right, folks, we're putting all the tables on the east side of the meadow by the entrance gate instead of the west. Oh, Hermione! Ernie stopped and turned beet red. Hello, Ernie, Hermione said, resisting the urge to close the two top buttons of her shirt. Ah, uh, ah, uh, change the marks, so you'll know where to place the tables. Ernie said to his shoes. Malfoy looked from Hermione to Ernie, eyebrows raised. Ah, Macmillan, excellent work here, said a condescending voice, and Hermione nearly groaned, for Theo had arrived in all his slithering glory. So glad to see you found everything you needed from the storage room. He rumbled on, ignoring Ernie's flushed face and Malfoy's frown. Did you form a committee, as Hermione suggested? She can be quite persuasive, can't she? Hermione glared at Theo, then turned to the head boy. Ernie, you're doing a wonderful job with the festival. She lied calmly. I'm going to make sure the headmistress appreciates all your hard work. Ernie preened. All it takes is an organized mind. Yes, very few people appreciate the value of time management, she said. Ernie, Ginny called. Now tense up. Is it now? said Theo. Be right there, Ernie called back and walked away quickly. Hermione crossed her arms. I would consider it a personal favour, Theo, if you didn't embarrass my friends in front of me, she said in freezing tones. Now, Hermione, Theo began. He stopped and gave Malfoy an irritated look. Don't you have somewhere else to be, Draco? Not at all, said Draco. He was detaching the leg from the top of Hermione's table and repairing it with his wand. Carry on. I believe you were explaining to Hermione why you bullied her pet Hufflepuff, who apparently had the misfortune to walk in on the two of you. Surely he has suffered enough. I expect you to apologize, Theo, Hermione said. I'm still cross. Fine, Hermione. I'm sorry I... Not to me, she said through gritted teeth. To Ernie. Theo cast both Hermione and Malfoy a look of equal dislike, then stalked off towards the large tent, which was already collapsing on one side. I spend a lot of time making you boys apologize to people, Hermione grumbled. We find it difficult to live up to your righteous Gryffindor standards, Malfoy said, as he expertly attached the table's remaining legs. Then he righted the table with a wave of his wand. For someone who's supposed to be so morally upright, you're quite effective at bullying the two of us. He leaned closer, hands on the table between them. Do continue on. Theo might kick. But I rather enjoy it. You are mean to him, Ginny's voice suddenly echoed in Hermione's head. What I think he likes it. Malfoy's eyes glittered. You're blushing, Hermione. Interesting. Hermione waved her wand, pulling the assembled table out from under Malfoy's hands, and he staggered slightly to keep his balance. She began levitating it toward an appointed spot. I was thinking of Theo, she said haughtily. Yes, quite splendid, isn't he? Malfoy said as they crossed the meadow with the table floating before them, trying so hard to appear fully in command, adopting the superior indulgent tone with you. His tone was light, but his displeasure was clear. I'm surprised you can stomach it. I'm a very tolerant and forgiving person, Hermione said. She gave Malfoy a sideways look. Obviously. Ah, and there it is, Malfoy said as they passed Theo and Ernie. I'm sure he's making everything better. Hermione almost groaned. It was obvious from Ernie's expression that Theo's apology wasn't soothing any sore feelings. Most likely, he strolled up to Ernie and said, So, Macmillan, I'm here to apologize for embarrassing you, especially since that scene was probably the closest you'll ever get to Ormond's breasts. Lovely, Hermione grouched. I'll probably have to volunteer at the Halloween festival to make it up to Ernie. Topless. Malfoy raised an eyebrow, but said nothing. 
she landed the table on the very edge of the meadow near the entrance gate. A copse of trees, a more benign outgrowth of the forbidden forest, lined the field here. What a dull little chore that was. Let's take a stroll, Malfoy said, walking off towards the trees. What? No, you can't wander about, Hermione protested. You're banned from the grounds now that the class is finished. Except for Quidditch, he called back. Except for Quidditch, she sniffed. No mere school rule was ever considered as important as this stupid sport. That's enough, dawdling, called Malfoy, who had almost reached the trees. Come along. Malfoy, Hermione hissed, trailing behind him. You could be expelled and that would break your probation. You could go. Oh, look, a path perfect for exploring all these shrubby things, Malfoy said, disappearing into the copse. Malfoy, she hissed again, hurrying after him. Get out of there! He looked around the meadow, but no one else was nearby. The big tent was billowing up again, with a few remaining students standing around it, once raced. Jenny had already left for a quick quiff in a quidditch practice. Malfoy's voice floated out of the trees. Oh, come see, I found bits of an overgrown hatch, and a rotting stump. Charming! Get back here! Hermione snapped. Ugh, he was such a toddler! She followed the path into the trees, mostly small oaks, with a thick carpet of red gold leaves. He was nowhere to be seen. Malfoy! The path curved deeper, and a few bedraggled fierce appeared, stark green against the other tree's turning leaves. He stopped by a crumbling brick wall and looked about. Malfoy, where are... Looking for me? Malfoy appeared from behind a large oak, suddenly standing before her. He was only inches away, but he made no move to touch her just looked down at her intently. That warm sunshine smell filled her senses. Not cologne or champagne, just him, so close. She raised her hands to push him out of the way, but the instant her hands touched his chest, they stilled, feeling the warmth of his body under his white shirt. His hands closed over hers, trapping them on his chest. You haven't asked me, he said gently. Hermione glared at the knot of his green and silver striped tie. Ask you what? About what I said in potions. She gave a small huff of annoyance. I haven't thought about it. All right, since you demand to know. Now if I sat into her hair, still holding her hand against his chest. This is what I want. I want you to terrify anyone who comes to you with a story about me and another witch. Then I want you to find me and threaten all sorts of hexes and hideous curses for even looking at another witch. And I want you to feel entirely justified in doing so. Hermione stared up at him before she could stop herself. You are quite disturbed, you know that, right? I'm not going to play into a little dominatrix fantasies. His eyes shone silver. And what do you know about dominatrix fantasies? Have you been reading on the subject? Hermione flushed and pulled her hands out of his. She stepped back, feeling the wall's rough bricks behind her. Malfoy stepped forward, keeping a thin distance between them. We're not discussing this, she said hoarsely. I'm with Theo, and... Are you really? he asked, leaning closer. Do you really want him, Hermione? That farce you like to play with Theo, or those little kisses in the great hall. Do you think they could fool Malfoy? His tone made Hermione tremble and their lips were only inches apart. Hermione cleared her throat and took on a lecture tone. Now, Draco, let's be reasonable. It simply wouldn't work. I won't sneak around in woods and dark corners with you when I can have a real public relationship. Oh, you and Theo are public all right. Malfoy sat, still standing too close. That doesn't make your relationship real, and I'm not talking about some secret affair. This has gone quite beyond that. His voice grew rougher. I finally worked it out, you know. You thought I was going to keep the old ways. You thought I wanted to hide you while I courted us Toya. As if anyone could hide Hermione Granger. Malfoy gave her a disappointed look. No wonder you rejected me. How could you believe that? You said you wouldn't tell anybody. I thought you wanted to hide me, Malfoy said. He backed off slightly, the leaves rustling under his feet. I'm too dark, too tainted, and my future... My children's future. He choked, and his face suddenly looked so bleak that Hermione wanted to fling her arms around him right there. She clenched her hands into fists, trying to keep her body under control. 
Oh, I'm so sorry, Draco, she whispered. I didn't mean what I said that day in her bology. Astoria said, I can guess what Astoria said. Malfoy's voice was harsh. She certainly didn't hold back about you to me in the Southern Dungeons. Merlin now almost hexed her myself. I didn't mean it, she repeated. Now her voice was choked. She was near tears. You have every reason to hope for a real future. Your children will be very proud of you. Everything you've done matters, and in time, and perhaps less time than... Malfoy stepped forward just enough to put a hand on her wrist, but no closer. Shh, it's all right. I know you didn't mean it. Hermione nodded, swallowing hard. We understand each other now. He went on, his grey eyes determined. I want you, Hermione, and I need you, he said. You're mine, and I'm yours. You won't deny me in the end. Hermione's mouth fell open in shock. I, uh, I'm with Theo, she repeated. Malfoy looked smug. For now? Hermione stumbled away from both him and the wall, practically falling down in the leaves. He didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to think. He didn't know what to do. Hermione Granger, no at all, didn't know anything. You want me, and you need me too, Hermione, Malfoy said. His voice was conversational, like he was discussing ancient runes. This isn't over. Hermione's eyes narrowed. He couldn't help but think of the charms classroom. He would not be hurried into anything. Keep in mind what happened the last time you told me what I wanted and needed, Draco, she warned. Yes, I was quite the idiot, he said, his voice calm, almost distant. But I wasn't entirely wrong. He gave her a thin smile and turned to rejoin the path disappearing among the tree. Theo found her as she re-entered the meadow, picking leaves out of her curls. Few students had lingered to enjoy the sun, and a quick scan revealed no Malfoy in sight. I have apologized to Macmillan, Theo said, in a tone that invited staggered admiration. Good, she said. He walked back to where she had assembled a table and pulled on her jumper, tucking her rape into her back. She needed to talk to Ginny. Theo put her hand on her arm. Oh, are you still angry at me, Hermione? He asked. She smiled and shook her head. No. He was just being Theo, and Ernie was a big boy. Theo loosened his tie. It's good to be out of the castle. Oh, I think we could walk a bit as long as I'm in sight of the prefect. No! I mean, no, thank you, Theo. Hermione stammered. No more walks with Slytherins today. I'm headed to the Quidditch pitch. Theo raised an eyebrow. You're still going to Gryffindor practices. I have to talk to Ginny. Um, Gustav. Theo looked sceptical, and Hermione was again struck by how different other men were. Girl talk was a magical phrase around Harry and Ron. They immediately backed off when she invoked it, possibly terrified they'd be drawn into a discussion of tampos or mango body wash. Then he shrugged. All right, he said easily, kissing her on the cheek. Perhaps we'll do something later. Maybe, Hermione said, trying to sound light and flirtatious, but it just came out awkward and breathy. Theo didn't seem to mind, however, probably thought she was overcome with shyness in his sexy presence. Sometimes those giant Slytherin egos were a real advantage. Ginny was on her broom, about forty feet above the pitch and yelling at her team. Hermione held a wand to her throat and cast a sonorous, Ginny, I have to talk to you. A friend waved to her to fly up, pointing to the extra brooms lying on the grass, and Hermione groaned. She hated flying and heights. But her need was too great, so she dropped her back and grabbed a broom, rising slowly upwards until she hung in the air beside Ginny. Her broom rolled slightly, and she grabbed its handle in a death grip. All right there, Hermione, Ginny asked, looking amused. She looked over the pitch. Carter, she shouted. The snitch is by the quaffle for Merlin's sake. Get it! Londy and Londy, block him. Robbins, look to your left. Maybe this isn't a good time, Hermione said. Well, you're up here now, Ginny looked her over. You look a bit mental. It's been a day. Carter, it's right there, Ginny shouted. She eyed Hermione again. Say, what's up? Malfoy wants a public relationship, Hermione said tersely, hoping to keep her time in the air as short as possible. Carter, look over by the... What? Ginny stared at her, wide-eyed. Oh, I saw you with him earlier. Don't tell me you went and asked Malfoy about his intentions like a normal person. 
No, he lured me into some woods, backed me against the wall, and shared his rather disturbing line of thought. I said it sounded like a dominatrix fantasy. Jenny raised her eyebrows. You too are a bit odd, you know that, right? Hermione couldn't deny it. The whole right to be angry bit was basically permission for me to be a violent, jealous nutcase, which is clearly typical behavior in Southern relationships. Tell me everything, Jenny commanded, dark eyes boring into Hermione's. Not up here, I won't, Hermione answered, wobbling precariously. Tell me something, Jenny demanded. I know. What about those diamonds? Where do they fit in? I have said. Turned out to be a priceless family heirloom, a pure-blood courtship gift. His parents found out and went spare. Malfoy got a note from his father telling him to get a jewelry back by any means necessary. That phrase still made Hermione shudder. Sweet baby Merlin, Jenny breath. What did Malfoy do? He wrote Lucius back, basically telling his father to fuck himself. Again, Hermione felt that flush of pride. He quoted your father, actually. He quoted who, my... Hey, Jenny, I got this snitch, cried Carter, a pudgy kid with hair almost as light as Malfoy's. He held up the golden ball triumphantly. Great, Jenny shouted. Release it again. Everyone else, you play seekers too, to all of you. Everybody chases the snitch. She turned back to Hermione. He was biting her lip and trying to keep her legs together. That ought to keep them busy. Did you say Draco Malfoy quoted my father? Hermione nodded. No time in the bookstore, your first year when Lucius slipped a diary into my cord and Jenny breathed, her face suddenly pale. Tell me, Lucius said, what's the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard if they don't even pay you? And your father said, we have a very different idea of what disgraces the name of a wizard, Malfoy. Jenny clutched the sides of her head, and when that wasn't enough to express her feelings, she spun around her broom a few times, looping up and down. She ended up in front of Hermione again, her broom hanging still and straight. Oh, I don't believe it. Believe it. I tried to return the diamond set to Malfoy on Monday. Practically beat him over the hat with it. He won't take it back. Oh, this is crazy. Have you two even kissed yet? <gasps> you have. Oh, how was... Oh, shit, they're early. Ginny spun on her broom to look back at the castle. What? Hermione tried to do the same and nearly fell off. Slytherins, they get the pitch for practice at five o'clock. Oh, no, Hermione would have wrung her hands in horror, but she was afraid to lose her grip on her broom. That means... Why, Hermione Granger, said an unwelcome voice behind her, do my eyes deceive me, or are you sitting on a broom? I'd say flying, but that word implies some basic skill. Hermione started, then turned to look, causing the front of the broom to point upwards. She clutched the handle desperately, trying not to slide backwards. Malfoy hovered to her left in his green and silver Quidditch gear, looking supremely entertained. He knew his little confession in the trees had driven her straight to Ginny. Oh, he was foul. Malfoy, Ginny groaned. Just push down the handle, he told Hermione. She did, and the broom straightened, but then Malfoy flew right under her, missing her by inches and causing her to shriek and do a complete roll. She ended up on her stomach on the broom, hard pounding, her legs spread. Nice skirt, Malfoy said wickedly. Hermione clamped her legs together again, and he sailed off, laughing. Ginny watched him depart. Are you sure he likes you? she asked. Hermione straightened herself again, glaring after Malfoy. Unfortunately, yes. Look sharp, Ginny warned. Here comes Astoria. The Southern Catman flew up to the two of them, an elegant sight in green and silver, her blonde hair streaming behind her. Weasley! Astoria said, halting with a graceful swirl. She looked at Hermione. I'm surprised to see you up here with us, Granger. Feet of clay and all that. Hermione narrowed her eyes at Astoria, disliking the reference. Aspiring to greater heights, are you, Granger? Astoria continued. One should be content with one's own level. Oh, shut it, Greengrass, Ginny snapped. Astoria's eyes, blue eyes, swept the skies. Where Ginny's team was aimlessly flying, the snitch nowhere in sight. The Lundy brother was snarling something at Malfoy, who looked at him like he was a particularly disgusting beetle. Your team appears a bit... Why, what? Astoria said. Jenny flushed, break red, and moved slightly away, turning her back to Hermione and Astoria. Everyone back in! she shouted. The southern captain eyed Hermione again. 
What? No pithy response from the griffin or Nigel? Can't I destroy catch me? Now? Astoria's wand moved in her hand, and Hermione's broom suddenly bucked, causing her to lose her grip. Hermione's legs parted, and she tumbled left, hands scrambling to grab the handle, but missing. Then she was falling like a rock from fifty feet up, the green pitch below rising up to meet her. She heard Jenny scream, Hermione! But there was no time, no time to grab her own wand, or even to remember one less spell that might arrest her fall. She closed her eyes against the impact, hoping for merciful darkness. Fear I to fall. Fain would I climb, yet fear I to fall. Sir Walter Riley is said to have written on a window with a diamond to Queen Elizabeth I. If thy heart fails thee, climb not at all. The Queen's response. Hermione crashed into a hard surface, expecting the snap of broken bones, but the hard surface was soft as well, and she found herself clutching Malfoy, but it flung directly beneath her. He had caught her in his arms, one arm around her waist, the other under her knees. Oh, I've got you, he said hoarsely, climbing again. He wanted to bury her head in his shoulder and bow, but Astoria was undoubtedly watching, so Hermione just nodded. Her arms tightened around Malfoy's neck as they rose until he began gasping for air. Hermione loosened her grip slightly. Malfoy swung around on his broomstick, using only his knees for control. He hovered high over the pitch, holding Hermione to his chest, before a frowning Astoria and a white-faced Ginny. "'That was a dangerous, vile trick, Astoria,' he snarled. "'It's not my fault that Granger can't control her broom!' Astoria sneered. The hand under Hermione's leg began twitching. Malfa was trying to summon his wand. His breath came in rapid pants, and the arms around her waist was like iron. Don't, she said to him, her voice low. She released one hand to place it on Malfoy's spastic one beneath her. Draco. Not you there, Astoria drawled. Yet so desperate to fly. Malfoy snarled again, and now Ginny had her wand out. Hermione pulled her hand from Malfoy's to draw her own wand, punching it at both Ginny and Astoria, her other arm half choking Malfoy once more. No, Hermione said in harsh, commanding tones. We start trading hexes up here, and someone will truly end up dead. Ginny's smile was cold. You can't stay up here forever, Greengrass. No, Ginny, Hermione said, looking straight at Astoria. She's mine. Astoria blanched slightly, then tried to cover it with a disdainful sniff. Enough. I'm taking Hermione back to the castle, Malfoy said. You are certainly not, Astoria said. We have practice. Fuck your practice, Malfoy snapped and turned his broom away. Draco, Astoria called, you leave this pitch and you won't be playing Quidditch at all. He continued his course. Then I won't play. Malfoy, I'm fine, Hermione said. That's what you think of me, he asked. You think I'd just dump you on the ground and fly off with Astoria? As soon as we get back to the castle, we are reporting. No, Hermione repeated. I will handle green grass. She frowned up into his face. No reporting, no Slytherin revenge, no little accidents in her body. She squeezed a hand under her legs again, now distractingly warm against her thigh. Trust me. Merfoy's jaw tightened, but he nodded, turning the broom again. Where are we going? Hermione asked. Over the forbidden forest, he said. You are getting over this ridiculous fear of flying before you kill yourself. Hermione nodded, slipping her wand back in her pocket and linking both arms around Malfoy's neck again. Her anger had faded, but he couldn't stop trembling. Hey, Malfoy said, halting the broom. It's all right, he whispered, just as he had during dance at Slacon's party when she'd had a flashback to the Ministry's fall. We're all right now. Placed her on the broomstick before him, both of her legs dangling off one side, and wrapped both arms around her. Then they sat silently, the broom hanging still in mid-air, waiting for both of their breath and heartbeats to slow. Hermione didn't know how long they remained like this, but eventually she emerged from her contented days to feel Malfoy's soft lips on her temple, crushing down the curve of her cheek, and she straightened and released his neck. She now felt secure enough to look around, 
still holding his arm, and see they were already far beyond the pitch. She carefully did not look down. I hate brooms, she muttered as Malfoy put one hand on the broom handle and flew forward again. Is it the height? he asked. Have you ever flown anything else? A hippogriff, and a thestral, oh, uh, and a dragon, too. Malfoy stopped dead in the air, staring at her. His arm tightened around her waist. A dragon? She tossed her head. I don't want to talk about it. Tell me about the Thestral, then, he said. Come on, Hermione. I just saved your life. Surely that's worth a story. His grin widened. Unless you'd like to thank me another way. So it was the summer after sixth year. Hermione began immediately leaning away from him. He was flying in slow white circles now, so smoothly that it seemed they hung suspended while the world turned around them. The sun was low in the sky, turning streaks of clouds pinkish-orange. The order of the phoenix was moving Harry from his aunt's house to a secret location. I remember that, Malfoy said quietly. Sure he does. Voldemort was at the manor that summer, Hermione thought. She took a deep breath, looking at a silver embroidery on his chest. We hoped to move him without Voldemort knowing. He knew, Malfoy said. Severus told him. Yes, Hermione said sadly. He blinked a few times, her cheeks now resting against his jersey. To improve Harry's chances of escape, the Order created six more Harrys, each with a trunk and a stuffed owl. We drank polyjuice potion and flew off in different directions, each of us with a protector. What? Malfoy's body stiffened, and Hermione looked up at him, startled at his tone. You were one of the Harry Potters? He looked furious. That pothead, he doesn't care how many bodies he has to hide behind. Don't say that, Hermione snapped. He absolutely refused at first. The Order had to threaten force to get his hair for the patient. There you go, defending him. I will always defend him, you prat. I thought you liked it when I defended people. Not when you defend suicidal heroes with a saviour complex. Well, it's better than defending egomaniacal former Death Eaters, but you don't seem to mind that. Hermione snapped. She turned away from him and crossed her arms. Malfoy huffed and steered the broom around the forbidden forest. Fine, go on then. I've told you enough. Take me back. You haven't told me anything but the order's daft plan. Where does the Thestral come in? She sighed. I was paired with Kingsley Shacklebolt on a Thestral, since they knew I didn't like brooms. We were headed to his country house, but as soon as we left, she trailed off. His arm around her tightened again. Go on. They found us. We were surrounded by Death Eaters. Hermione closed her eyes, leaning against his chest, her cheek rubbing against the scratchy embroidery. Malfoy's scent was all around her, his lips at her temple again. But she barely noticed, remembering the ring of black-cloaked flyers, one's race to kill. The Thestral climbed above them and dove straight into the clouds. Two were right behind us, throwing curses blindly, hoping to get lucky. One knocked a trunk off the Thestral's back. It was so wet in the clouds, so cold. Another hand was in her curls, and she could feel the weight of his chin on the top of her head. We flew that way for ages, then suddenly descended out of the clouds. There was a vast forest below. The Death Eaters were right behind us, still casting killing curses, but now we could fight back. Hermione began to tremble again. That's enough, Murphy said above her. You don't have to say any more. I want to. She said, her eyes still closed, clutching his jersey. She hadn't talked to anyone about this, not even Kingsley. Kingsley was shooting killing curses back, she continued. He launched one after another, so fast. I, I couldn't do the same. You have to mean those hexes. But I tried binding hexes, stinging hexes, anything I could think of. They flew in silence for a time. Malfoy continuing to make slow and steady rings over the forbidden forest. Then Hermione spoke again. Kingsley steered the Thestral straight down into the trees, tried to lose them. The leaves were so thick we couldn't see, and I constantly worried we'd be brained by a branch or smashed into a trunk. Then we shot upwards again, and there was one of them, like he was waiting for us, and I... I... Open your eyes, Malfoy commanded. Look at me. She obeyed, looking into his grey eyes, so soft and serious. Gave her the courage to finish. 
Oh, I shot a full body bind curse, she whispered. His arms and legs immediately sewn together, and he and his broom fell into the trees. I don't know if he died. He must have. He didn't, Malfoy said. That was Jackson. He was found the next day hanging from a tree, perfectly fine but unable to move. There was still one more. But before we could take him out, that damned stuffed owl, Hermione sighed, it fell off the thestral and the Death Eater hexed it, slicing it in half, and all the stuffing fell out. It was obvious it was a fake owl and that I wasn't Harry Potter, so the Death Eater vanished. Malfoy sighed with relief. Thank Salazar for that owl. No! Hermione straightened in his arms, to enrage suddenly to care that they were now a hundred feet over the forest. We failed! Our job was to lure the Death Eaters away so Harry could make it to the safe house. When our cover was blown, there was one more Death Eater Voldemort could call to him. Malfoy was angry too. His face was flushed and his short hair streamed in the wind. His arm around her felt like iron. You could have died. I was ready to die. It would have been worth it, she yelled. The broom hung still in the air and their faces were inches apart. Malfoy leaned forward and his lips brushed hers. Her entire body thrummed at the contact, and her ends on his arms tightened. No, we're not doing this, she spun around, slinging a leg over the broomstick, her back to him. She grasped the broom handle with both hands, hitching forward. We need to go back to the castle. Malfa said nothing, just steered the broom smoothly downwards until they landed on the grass outside the castle entrance. Hermione awkwardly hopped off, and they stood facing each other both still rattled by what had happened in the air. He was shaking his head. By Zalazar, you'll defend anybody, won't you? You went on a suicide mission to save Potter. You faced off your best friend and the aura who saved your life to defend me. You even defended those beaters to me. He rubbed his hands through his wind-blown hair. Merlin, you talked me into apologizing to a girl you don't even like. He stepped closer. But you're being a coward about us. You won't accept what's going on. You won't admit what you're feeling. Don't tell me what I'm feeling, Hermione snapped. You made my life and my friend's life miserable for years, bullied us, tried to thwart us at every turn, and if I'm a little skittish about jumping into bed. I'm not asking you. We both know what we're talking about, she said coldly. You think this is about fucking? Because if that's all I want, there's no shortage of willing partners these days including another eighth-year Gryffindor in a certain bathroom goes. Hermione snarled, hands on hips, feet planted wide. Fine, go play with them, then. That's the point. I'm not playing here. Malfoy was flushed, and his hand clutched his broomstick so tightly his knuckles were white. I made that clear back in those wretched woods. My feelings for you are serious, and you feel the same way. The business with my parents proved that. You continue to defend me. You believe in me. You understand what I'm trying to do. Hermione sniffed. As I said, I didn't like your mother's tone. Malfoy sighed. You're putting up walls again. Some Gryffindor, are you? I'm trying to be patient, Hermione, but watching you deny what's in front of your face and fool around with Theo fucking not makes me wonder if you're so brilliant after all. Don't you try to bully me, Malfoy. I'll date whoever I want, when I want, and... Yes, yes, I've heard this too many times. He rolled his eyes. Fine. I know I'm a prime asshole, and you have every reason to run the other way, but here's the thing. He stepped closer, suddenly more cheerful. You like it. You like all of it. When I was teasing you up there on the Quidditch pitch, you were creaming your knickers. I could see it on your face. You're disgusting, Hermione said, crossing her arms. I am, he whispered in her ear. And you like that, too. A faint bell tolled from the castle, six tolls. Dinner time. Malfoy stepped back with a mocking grin. Excellent. Worked up an appetite, haven't we? I'll leave you to ponder all of this. Maybe draw up a nice prose cons chart, you know. He went on conversationally. I look forward to your loom plan. Loom! Now, don't get bugged by semantics, Hermione. Wacky feigned. Raw. Ah, oh, nice one. Just think of the lovely charts you'll draw up after this is all resolved in the way I intend. The pros and cons of various sexual positions, and five nice things a day I can do for Draco. Number one. 
Hermione slapped her hands over her eyes so she didn't have to see his smirking face. Stop, just stop, she begged. I'd rather talk sex with Moaning Myrtle again. No, that is one story I don't want to hear, she heard him say. Don't be late for dinner. He walked off towards the castle, or at least she assumed so, since his whistling grew fainter in that direction. She cautiously brought her hands down, leafed to see his green and silver bag slipping through the giant front doors and Jenny walking forward to meet her. Hermione took out her wand and summoned her book bag, which obediently streaked her way from the direction of the Quidditch pitch. Then she went to join Jenny, thinking about how wrong Malfoy was. No matter what madness lay ahead, he was never writing a list of five nice things a day I can do for Drake. Chapter 35 Halloween Part 1 Dawn found Hermione at her desk, working on her loop. She stood to push heavy red curtains aside to let in the golden light, her gaze falling on the framed picture of herself and Ron waltzing at Bill and Fleur's wedding. Or trying to waltz. Ron was pumping her arm up and down, and Hermione stumbled twice, just in the photo's brief loop of movement. But Ron's wide smile. It was perfect like that, she thought, sitting down again. That was us. Her thoughts turned to the sweep and euphoria of another waltz, with a different partner, also perfect. Also us. Hermione opened a drawer and extracted a newspaper clipping of a couple kissing over a sparkling dinner table, diamonds in her dark hair. Quite perfect. But was it really us? Hermione replaced the clipping in the drawer and resumed scribbling. She was working up a whole new life plan centered around four ranked priorities. 1. Newts. 2. The blood potion. 3. Regular schoolwork. And 4. Learning to fly properly. The plan carefully did not include Draco Malfoy, except for his role in number 2. Theo was incorporated into number 3, since work-life balance was vital to any sustainable organizational plan. A half-formed plan for Astoria was also part of number 3, listed under Hobbies. Satisfied, she closed the notebook on the last page, a ten-part agenda for her first flying lesson. Then she tucked the notebook into the drawer with the clipping and left to desk to begin her day. Thea was waiting when she stepped through the portrait hall. Are you all right? he asked. I heard you had dinner in the infirmary. Yes and yes, Hermione said. Jenny had frog-marched her straight to the infirmary, where Hermione had to listen to all her arguments against Quidditch. Madame Pomfrey was passionate about the dangers of reckless joyriding on brooms. You should be studying for your needs, Miss Granger, the matron said. Now Theo was looking her up and down, frowning. They are saying you lost control of your broom? Yes, Hermione said again. Only Ginny and Malfoy knew Astoria hexed her broom, and Hermione wanted to keep it that way. Astoria was a menace in the air. She must be stopped, and now Ginny could be a target as well. Oh, I understand that Draco saved you, Theo continued. Hermione nodded. Yes, he was nearby. He usually is. Hermione blinked at the edge to Theo's voice. Then his face softened slightly, and he wound a hand in her loose hair. Oh, I'm just glad you're all right. I'm fine, she said. Theo's hand in her hair gently pulled her head back, and then his lips were on hers, deepening the kiss, needing reassurance. The creak of the portrait hall opening broke them apart, and Pavati gave them an impish smile as she walked by. Hermione mulled over Theo's words as they walked to breakfast. Obviously, Astoria had lost no time spreading her version of the incident, so it was important that Hermione appear calm and collected. Dean, I was holding on with both hands, he was screeching five minutes later. She and Theo had arrived to find the Gryffindor table locked in a passionate debate over her fall. The Lundy twins were listing Hermione's likely blunders, including improper altitude excessive speed and failure to account for wind direction. Chaser de Melsa Robbins scolded Hermione for not brushing the broom's straw before flying. An untidy broom is an unbalanced broom, de Melsa said, and the whole table nodded in agreement. Her hand position have always been terrible too, Seamus put in. I'm surprised this hasn't happened before. Hermione viciously tore apart her scone. Splendid, 
The entire school now thought she'd almost died through sheer incompetence, only to be saved by Malfoy. She didn't know what was worth, the pitying glances from the other Gryffindors or Malfoy's face as eager Slytherins asked him if he was still the seeker. She appreciated his discretion about Astoria, but he didn't have to look so smug. Well, that's up to our lovely captain, isn't it? She heard Malfoy say cheerily. Let me know when you find out. Great, Hermione grumbled into her toes. I'm the idiot and he's the hero. Well, Malfoy did save you, right? Neville asked her. Hermione and Theo gave him an irritated look. Right? Yes, he did, answered Ginny, slipping onto the bench beside Theo. Hermione could have been seriously injured or even killed, and if he wants to lord it over everyone for a while, that's fine with me. She looked sternly at Hermione. I hope you thanked Malfoy. Uh, uh. Hermione couldn't remember she'd actually thanked him. I told him a story. I will need to thank him. Ginny said, stuffing a muffin into her mouth, run style. Yes, said Theo, taking the high road. He slid an arm around her shoulders. I, for one, am very grateful. Thank you for saving me yesterday, Hermione said to Malfoy in a sourly tone before patience began. Malfoy eyed her over their cauldron. You told me the Thestral story. Apparently, that's not good enough for some people. Yes, well, I hope you've considered what I said about flying lessons. I did, she answered, setting her patience book out. Jenny's too busy, so I outrun. He's begging to teach me for years. That wasn't exactly. Malfoy began, but just then Lavender arrived and took her old seat beside him. Hello, Draco. Lavender breathed, eyes wide. She wore her dark blonde hair in a mess of curls today, piled up on the top of her head and fastened with purple metal pins. Hello, Brown, Malfoy said smoothly lightening their cauldron with his wand. "'You were so brave yesterday, Draco,' Lavender said. "'Everyone's talking about it.' She looked coldly across the table. "'You should be more grateful, Hermione.' "'She really should,' Malfoy agreed in velvet tones. Oh, "'I can think of many ways Hermione could show her gratitude.' Patience went downhill from there, to Hermione's way of thinking. Lavender spoke at length, about if she was safe from certain death, she would certainly be grateful instead of scowling all the time. Malfoy nodded sagely and scribbled runes on a piece of parchment, leaving Hermione to brew the day's potion, a solution for magical aquariums, all alone. The task was complicated by Levinus' hairstyle, which began to fall apart under the steam and shed hairpins. Every time a pin fell into the cauldron, Hermione had to vanish the contents, since the potion had to be absolutely metal-free for use in magical aquariums. She was finally able to finish the potion and pour it into a bottle while Lavender was in a supply cupboard. Malfoy also took advantage of their partner's absence, handing Hermione a list of suggestions for demonstrating proper gratitude. Malfoy! Hermione choked as she read the rune-filled parchment. Do take note of number six. I found our conversation in the woods quite enlightening. Hermione's face was fiery red now. Malfoy, you're the most appalling... Mean? rapped out Lavender, who had returned with a jar of pickled toad they didn't need. You are so mean to him, Hermione. She truly is, Malfoy said sadly. Slughorn's brass bell rang, and Hermione flounced off, discreetly tucking the list into her bag so Malfoy wouldn't notice. But judging from the low chuckle behind her, he definitely had. Afternoon classes were cancelled in honour of Halloween, and most of the students rushed outside, eager to begin their weekend. Hermione spent the time studying in the Gryffindor common room. She was not hiding, no matter what Ginny said before heading to the Spangled Vale with Blaze. Hermione skipped the fees and curled up on the sofa with Crookshanks, reading the Elder Fubark's book and eating the entire bag of sugar-free Halloween candy her parents sent. She was relaxing, not hiding. At seven o'clock, she headed down to the festival and regretted it immediately. Hermione had approached Ernie at lunch, offering to help. There was still time to set up a proper volunteer sheet, for example, and she had some last-minute ideas to promote into house unity, but Ernie wouldn't listen. Theo's antics had offended the Hufflepuff's pride, and he was convinced Hermione had been in on the joke. 
The people got the idea Hufflepuffs were humble, Hermione had no idea. Obviously, they'd never spend time with Ernie or Justin Finch Fletchley, not to mention the squeaky mice. Nothing Hermione could say would change the head boy's mind, and Ernie had stalked off in high dungeon, muttering that all Slytherins should be in Azkaban. The end result was a school event that failed on nearly every possible level. Its theme, the Forbidden Forest, would likely scare the first years and traumatize every war veteran in the castle. The forest was Voldemort's headquarters during the Battle of Hogwarts, and Harry had confronted Voldemort there, ready to die. Hermione was surprised that McGonagall had allowed it. All the Hufflepuffs dressed up, and many of the Gryffindors, but few Ravenclaws participated, and not one Slytherin wore a costume. Some students dressed up as spiders or unicorns or centaurs, deeply offending Ferenzo, who left early and spent the evening sulking in his classroom. Nobody could sulk like a centaur. Hermione came as one of the forest's black flowers, wearing tight green robes and a large black petal on her head like a sun hat. Neville created a wingweed costume with Luna's help and went around asking people to try to intimidate him. He'd apparently planted a few wingweed cuttings in the forest, although he considered them unlikely to flourish. Hermione disagreed, and what she had seen of the wild plants, the wingweeds would likely love the Forbidden Forest and would spread to terrorize unwary Hogwarts students for generations to come. Ernie's planned activities failed as well, mostly because the squeaky mice, all dressed as black forest mice, sabotaged every one of them. They put spiders in the cauldrons for apple bopping and added so many dead ends to the hedge maze that nobody could get out. They talked the little Slytherin girl into wearing mouse ears too, and then they all charmed the pumpkins to scream in pain when anyone tried to cough them. Hermione saw no sign of Theo as she wove through the crowd. The lighting was lovely, she had to admit. Flirting light, though it was tall, gave off a ghostly glow in the dark sky, standing torches burned beside every table, and lanterns strung on silver ropes lit up the dance floor. Poor Ernie was manning the raffle table, but a grand prize, courtesy of Professor Sprout, the Hufflepuff head of house, was the complete collection of Herbs of Desire, Loving the Plant Life Around You, Volumes 1 to 14. Hermione sighed. Another opportunity lost, since she could have arranged for Weasley's Wizarding Weasel's merchandise. He stopped by the refreshment table and loaded a tray with cauldron cakes and a flagon of punch. How are sales? she asked, placing the tray in front of Annie. There's more, the head boy said, too depressed or perhaps too hungry to snub her. The table's glass bowl held only a few folded half tickets. Careful, she said, the punch is spiked. Thank Merlin, Annie said, pouring a glass and downing it. I'm really sorry about Theo, Annie. Hermione said, scribbling her name on a ticket and handing him two sickles. These Slytherins are driving me crazy, too. She stood by the table's extra chair, and Ernie nodded for her to join him. Then they munched silently for a time, looking out over the crowd. Bit of a shit festival, isn't it? Ernie finally said. The music is nice, Hermione said. Slughorn had lent his floating orchestra for the occasion. Never was dancing with Pavati, who tried to avoid his writhing vines. Theo was still nowhere in sight, but there was Malfoy checking with Pansy by the dance floor, dressed in his usual black. "'I've decided to take your suggestion from earlier this time, and he said, "'about hosting a prefect brainstorming retreat. "'I'm thinking a three-hour session tomorrow with dinner brought in.' "'That's marvellous,' Hermione said, "'failing to plan is planning to fail.' Annie looked hopefully at her. Oh, "'I know you said you wouldn't do student government this year, but... I'd be glad to attend, she said. I'll even write up some possible activities. Ernie gave a relieved sigh. Why don't you go have fun, Ernie? she went on. I'll stay here for a while and sell tickets. Really? Ernie sounded pathetically grateful. You don't have to, really. It's all right. I oh, know you didn't. Hermione smiled. Oh, you want to. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Hermione. Ernie said, regaining a bit of his old pompous manner. He stood and shook her hand. Hermione bit her lip to keep from smiling. Be sure to fold the ticket stops before putting them in a the bowl. That's a good girl. Hermione rolled her eyes as the Hufflepuff showed off, 
but it felt good to see him happily bossing the prefects as they tried to de-spider their apple-bobbing cauldrons. Well, don't you look lovely in green? purred a voice beside her. She knew that voice. He was probably here to deliver another shocking list. Liz from Potions was now in her trunk, bordered along with the Gloriana set. It wouldn't do for Jenny to find it, and possibly add to it. Her cheeks heated at the very idea. Hello, Malfoy, Hermione said. Halloween Part 2 Hello, Malfoy, Hermione said, brightly polite. Here to buy a raffle ticket. Malfoy's lip curled. Hardly. A pair of snifty little Slytherin boys then stepped up to the raffle table, looking like mini Malfoys with their hair slicked back. Raffle tickets? Hermione asked in the same cheery tone. Proceeds go to St. Mungo's. The boy looked at the fourteen-volume stack of Herbs of Desire and sneered identical sneers. Forget it, the taller boy said. Hermione gave him a look. Ah, uh, no thank you, Miss Granger. Two sickles each, Malfoy said. He casually pushed up his black coat sleeve and shirt cuff, revealing just the edge of a snake and skull on his forearm. The boy stared wide-eyed, then practically broke their arms, getting coins out of their pockets. Hermione handed them the two tickets and watched them flee. Draco Malfoy using the dark mark to sell charity tickets? She said with a grin. You're giving Death Eaters a bad name. She touched a chair beside her. A silent invitation. Malfoy stood gracefully into the chair, but didn't look at her. His pale profile shone in the lamplight. They're still out there, you know, he said soberly. Scattered and leaderless, but watching. Yes, was all she said. She knew Harry and the other Auras were chasing every lead in their hunt for the Death Eaters still at large. She was surprised Kingsley hadn't returned with another warrant to question Malfoy. Aren't you afraid knowing they're out there? he asked. Not right now, she said, sipping her punch. It did taste rather awful. He snorted lightly in disbelief, still looking out at the rather listless crowd. You feel safe at Hogwarts? I feel safe with you. Malfoy's profile froze. Then he slowly turned his head toward her, shifting in his chair. Hermione didn't look away. It was a truth. Of course, Hogwarts was a dangerous place. She'd known that since first year. The war might be over, but danger still lurked in dark corners, and Hermione never felt safe these days, unless she was with the wizard beside her. Malfoy was still staring at her. Nobody, it was clear, had said such a thing to him before. His warm hand found hers under the table. Oh, I can't believe you said that, he whispered, a slight tremble to his voice. Number three, she said, trying to keep her own voice steady. Malfoy blinked at her, confused. Number three on the gratitude list. Say something nice to Draco. He gave her a predatory smile. Feel free to skip ahead. Hermione flushed. You and your lists. You could develop your own life optimization organizational plan. I could help you. A faint eye roll. I think not. At least let me review your study guides. Malfoy bent his head closer to hers. Soft breath against her cheek, and still holding hers. I look forward to you touching many things of mine, Hermione, but never my study guides. Ah! Uh -huh! Hermione cried. Malfoy jumped back in his chair and dropped her hand, startled. She beamed at him. I knew it! I knew you couldn't do so well in classes without study guides! Good on you! Do you use a subject-based or time-based system? I find a hybrid! My study guides are my own private business, Malfoy snapped, nettled. Yes, very true, Hermione said cordially. One should always respect others' personal planning documents. Malfoy ground his teeth but said nothing. Hermione followed up with a few useful suggestions about estimating time blocks as they watched the dancers. Annie was now attempting to waltz with Luna, who insisted on following some tune inside her head. Blaze was leading out Ginny, who had traded her dinner dress for slashed and tattered pink robes with a pink bow in her hair. Ginny had obviously followed through on her threat to dress as Umbridge after running with the centaurs. Hermione could only be grateful that Firenze had already left. All right, sort off, a snippy voice said. Pansy stood before them in purple brocade robes. She held a bottle of siren scotch in one green gloved hand. 
Finally, some decent liquor, Malfoy drawled. Not for you, Pansy said, waving him away. Sod off, I said. Oh, I think Hermione would prefer. Malfoy began smoothly in his best Lucius voice. Hermione grinned. You heard, Parkinson. Sod off. Oh, I didn't know you two even spoke, Malfoy said, eyes narrowing. Pansy smirked and splashed scotch into two cups, handing one to Hermione. How about a raffle ticket, Parkinson? Hermione asked, sipping her drink. These Slytherins were spoiling her. Pansy sniffed at a stack of books. Oh, I hate plants. Which is ironic if you think about it, Malfoy said. Why, Malfoy? Hermione said, acting surprised. Are you still here? He's very needy, Pansy said. Can't bear it when he's not the centre of attention. Malfoy's ass darted between them. I find the situation, frankly, terrifying. Did you hear something? Hermione asked. Not a thing, Pansy said. Malfoy stood scowling at them both and stalked off. Hermione and Pansy tapped their cups together and drank. That was fun, Pansy said, settling in the chair he had vacated. Hermione eyed the dark-haired woman over the rim of her cup. I suspect you're not here to help me sell raffle tickets. Sellers or no? Pansy looked over at Malfoy, who'd been stopped by Percival and Bertie, and Cupcake by the face-painting booth. Both boys were snake faces with glowing red eyes, and someone had turned to pygmy puff green. They looked like tiny Voldemorts. Honestly, where was McGonagall? This whole cursed festival would give everybody nightmares. Strange seeing Draco with her baby Hufflepuffs, Pansy said. I suppose that is your influence. Hermione glowered. He enjoys corrupting them. The scotch was tingling through her veins, and the smell brought her back to Starkon's office. You're right, I wouldn't like it at all. Danger! Pansy snapped. Vakus, I want to talk about Draco. Last time it was Theo, Hermione set down her cup. Will we be discussing Blaze next week, or are you stalking Ginny as well? Pansy shrugged and put another drink for each of them. Blaze can handle Weasley. Draco, on the other hand. She glanced around, then leaned closer to Hermione. His behavior towards you has not gone unnoticed, Granger. At first, I thought it was part of his plan, befriending you, helping you with that potion. Now I suspect feelings are involved. Hermione said nothing, just took another drink. What could she possibly say? I don't like it. Uh, not just for Theo's sake, Pansy said, her eyes intent. Draco is now pursuing you openly, any fool can see it, but a public relationship between you two could only hurt him. How do you think the Wizarding World would treat a Death Eater who seduced the innocent Gordon Princess? Um, hardly. It will matter, Pansy sighed. That will be the story it already is. Theo receives some threatening else and howls after the Prophet picture. He's a nut, which is as good as a Death Eater to many. Hermione sat up straight. He never told me. It would be even worse for Draco, Pansy went on. The Wizengamot could open his case again. Hermione slammed her drink on the table, liquid sloshing out of the cup. No, Parkinson, Malfoy is not going to Azkaban. I will not allow it. Harry would not allow it. I will bring down the fucking ministry before he spends one day. A loud snap made both women jump, startled. Pansy stared at the large crack in the glass bowl holding the raffle tickets. So you can just dart on the threats. Hermione continued calmly, repairing the bowl with a touch of her wand. I appreciate that you care about your friends, and like I said in the leaky cauldron, you're not entirely out of line. Yes, the aura office is interested in Malfoy, and yes, I know that linking his name with mine will harm more than help his reputation. Hermione gave Pansy a hard look. But don't you dare say that caring for me will lend him an Azkaban. I would not allow it. Pansy swallowed. I believe you. Excellent, Hermione drained her drink. I hope we're done here. Not quite. You want to watch yourself? Astoria, Hermione said. Pansy nodded. I'm in her way. Pansy nodded again. Hermione just smiled. Let's just say that Astoria has my attention now. You're planning something? A crafty smile curved Pansy's mouth, heavily painted in dark red lipstick. I want to help. It's just an idea. I need more time in the library. What's this? Asked an amused voice. Pansy Parkinson and Hermione Granger making plans to go to the library? Over scotch? Hermione looked up and smiled. Hello, Theo. 
The Slytherin looked entirely at ease, his long black coat open to reveal a grey jumper and black trousers, but his gaze was watchful. "'It's just a charms project,' Pansy said airily. Theo gave Pansy a sharp look, clearly unconvinced. "'Would you care to dance, Hermione?' "'Yes, thank you.' Hermione jumped up and set down her cup, wobbling a bit. "'Oh, no, Granger,' Pansy objected. "'You are not leaving me here, too.' "'Is it too late to buy tickets?' Neville appeared in front of the table, looking eager. He had shed the most obnoxious features of his winkweed costume, which is to say nearly all of them, including the vines and big flower hat. Now he looked quite dashing in dark green robes, standing an inch taller than Theo and his shoulders nearly as broad. Hermione caught the gleam in Pansy's eyes. "'Parkinson will help you, Neff,' Hermione said, taking Theo's hand. "'She is very interested in plants.' Hermione tugged at Theo, who was frowning in confusion, and led him to the dance floor as Neville asked Pansy, Really? Do you prefer flowering plants or arboreal? What was that all about? Pansy kills any plant she touches, Theo asked her, pulling her into a waltz. Really? Did Slughorn's instrument know anything else? And when did you and Pansy start drinking together? And studying? Hermione shrugged. Into house unity. Extra credit. Oh, I didn't know Pansy cared about either of those things. People change, Hermione said. Theo smiled but said nothing, and they waltzed in silent for a time. Theo danced as elegantly as Malfoy, but held her more firmly and led more aggressively. While Malfoy enticed her when they danced, lightly drawing her where he wanted to go, Theo kept her close, his body leaving her little room to manoeuvre. Oh, I love seeing you in green, he murmured in her ear. You should be draped in emeralds. And what do emeralds mean? Hermione teased. Ambition, cunning. Rebirth? Theo said. Love. He smiled down at her. We Slytherins aren't all cold calculation. Hermione stumbled, blushing. Maybe she should have paid attention in Bluebell's class. She hoped to Godric that Theo didn't have some emerald bauble in his coat pocket passed down through generations of knots and enchanted to scream horribly whenever another man complimented her. The sound of flapping wings made Hermione and Theo look up to see a rather bedraggled owl circling above them. Theo instantly released her and moved off the dance floor to where the owl had perched on a chair. The owl's brown feathers were ruffled and matted, its eyes dull. Theo pulled a tightly rolled message off the bird's leg and opened it. Theo, I think it's injured. Hermione said, stroking its rumpled feather. It hooted softly. Can you make it to the owlery? She asked the bird. There is food there, and you can rest. The owl hooted again and awkwardly flew off. Oh, I must go, Theo said. Hermione looked up, startled. The note had vanished, and he was buttoning his coat. Urgent business, oh, I'm very sorry. He gave a quick, hard kiss and strode off towards the castle, apparently considering that a sufficient explanation. It wasn't. The owl! Hermione called, running after him, a black flower that flopped wildly. Where are you going? Theo! He stopped and turned, his broad, handsome face lit by a floating light above them. It's nothing for you to worry about, Hermione, he said, trying to smile. I will see you tomorrow. Something's wrong, she said. Where did it all come from? Tell me. He brushed her cheeks with his fingers. Oh, I can't, Hermione. Go back to the festival. Have fun. Tell me! She repeated stubbornly. He dropped the half smile and gave her a stern look. No, Hermione, I don't think I will. He stared up at him, open mouth. Oh, I didn't press you last Sunday when you rushed out of the castle in a black cloak. Theo went on, his voice cool. I haven't asked you what you were doing in those woods yesterday, and I won't ask you again why you're scheming with Pansy. Her green eyes held hers. I only request the same courtesy. This, this is different. Hermione stammered, Theo. Don't worry, he said, patting her hand. Oh, I'm not angry with you. Hermione frowned. I don't care if you're angry at me. I want to know why bloodstained owls are dropping urgent messages on your head. No, Hermione, you're making a scene. Hermione glared. I'll make a scene if I want to, Theo or not. I'll yell when I want, where I want. Did you just kiss my forehead? She screeched. He just kissed her forehead and patted her on the top of her flower head. She couldn't move. She was so outraged and thus lost valuable time, allowing Theo to dash through the castle door. Hermione ran after him, 
hiking up her ropes, pounding through the entrance hall and down to the dungeons. She stopped at the portrait of a snake charmer guarding the Slytherin common room. What's this, a nosy little Gryffindor dressed as a black hellebore? The charmer sneered. Oh, come in. Did Theo did not come through here, she panted. The charmer shrugged. Oh, I really can't say. Hermione stamped her foot in frustration and the portrait looked even more contemptuous if that were possible. Even his bloody snake was sneering at her. But she locked eyes with it anyway. Theo was a parcel mouth. Tell him I'm here, please, she begged the painted cobra. The hooded snake swayed for a few seconds, then slithered out of the frame. Hermione waited, tapping her foot for several agonizing minutes. Finally, the snake returned. Is he there? she asked. The snake shook its head and called up at the snake charmer's feet. Marnie slumped, defeated. She hoped Theo wasn't trying to sneak out of the castle. Stubborn man. Why wouldn't he just let her help? Run along, little Gryffindor, the charmer said and began to play a slow, haunting tune. The cobra uncoiled and swayed, red eyes fixed on Hermione. She stomped off, back straight. You gods, the dungeons were a horrible place. She couldn't bring herself to return to that wretched festival, so she went up to her bedroom instead and sat on her desk, wrapped in a blanket, so she could look out the window. Jenny was still off with Blaze and likely wouldn't return that night. The sky was cloudy and dark, with only an eerie glow from the celebration far below. Hermione cracked the window open, allowing the faint sound of Sakon's instruments to drift into the room along with colder air. Lean her cheeks against the cold glass, thinking of the look in Malfoy's eyes when she said she felt safe with him. See, I can admit what I'm feeling. Mani dozed off to the music, pressed against the glass, dreaming of waltzes, sweeping heady waltzes high in the air, so high she couldn't possibly fall. To be continued. Thank you for listening to this chapter of The Gloriana Set by Theba Moon. If you would like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on Spotify, YouTube or AO3.